This is Audible. Volponi Glory by Nick Kime. Read by Andrew Wincott. In the year 791, the Sabbath Crusade had reached a crucial juncture. In an effort to hasten the end of the war, Warmaster Makaroth had withdrawn from the primary corward assault against the Archon Erlok Gower to focus his attentions and those of his battle groups to nothing less than the destruction of Anarch Sek and the securing of the vital forge world Erdesh. Under the proven and capable leadership of Lord Militant Eirik, the Corwood assault against Gower continued unabated in the Arinyi's group of worlds. But it was a bitter and frustrating campaign against an entrenched and well-disciplined enemy. Several key theatres were believed crucial as to whether the Imperium's gains in this region became a foothold or a footnote. Pivotal amongst these ground war campaigns was the liberation of Nostes, a major world that had long been under Arcanate occupation. Of the many conflicts that raged across the planet, one of the most curious was that of the reconquest of Agria, a modest island chain inhabited by a rugged and dour people. Several Militarum regiments were charged with this task, most notable of which were the Royal Volponi, an esteemed breed of soldier well known for their discipline and professionalism, but also their arrogance. What exactly transpired during the Agria campaign has become a matter of conjecture, but what is clear is that the war for the island chain took a bitter toll and left many unanswered questions in its wake. From A History of the Later Imperial Crusades Chapter 1 If he wanted to live, Darian knew he should take the pistol. The dead man had no use for it, but the lowborn were not permitted to bear arms they would likely hang him for taking it, or whip him to death. He'd seen a man take five hundred lashes before finally expiring. Darian didn't want to die like that. He didn't want to die at all. But death was coming all the same, and it wore a devil's face. Maybe he could hide it, wedge it beneath the belt. He might need it. In a last-ditch moment of desperation, a pistol would be useful. The east flank had collapsed. That was the word, rushing down the line like a sea of hellfire. Panic rode its waves. The earth shook again, spilling clods of dirt into the trench, as the barrage pounded the Ankish line, and the air grew thicker with aerosolized blood and soil. It was like pitching through fog, only adhesive, and it caked the body like a second skin. A heavy cannonade answered the barrage, drumming in staccato. Our guns, their bombers. An ampass about to be overcome. Our forces would prevail, they had said, those men in the finely tailored uniforms with metal clinging to their chests, like it was any sort of guarantee. The blood cults were coming, this much Darian knew. Just like he knew he should take that throne-damned pistol and put it to use. The enemy had broken the flank, and soon the line would be overrun. He might be very glad of a las gun then. Darian regarded the weapon clutched in a dead hand, and the blank-eyed officer with half his face missing. The gun remained, but he could not. 
He hefted the belt of canteens across his shoulder and trudged on. It had been a decent trek back to town, and from there a return to the trench, its long and winding course like an arterial vein, poised to be severed. Darian passed the burnt-out shells of tanks in the mustard camo of the Pardus Armoured, slumped like lonely metal bunkers, distant islands in the fog, eerily still and inert. A ministorum priest murmured solemn words over a row of quiet men lying on their backs, seemingly unconcerned with what was coming. A band of tunnel rats in dirty ochre fatigues and bucket-shaped helmets ran the other way. They were grinning. Darian looked back despairingly as he watched them disappear into the fog. He hastily made the sign of the Aquila to the priest to show that he was pious and hurried on. As he worked his way deeper into the trench network, he passed other men, some in the rugged drab of the diggers, others in plainer uniforms wearing the caduceae of medics. A second platoon in ragged forest green came his way, stern-faced and swarthy. Darian didn't recognize the regiment as they trailed past, headed towards the sounds of a distant skirmish. There were so many auxiliaries, reduced to bits and pieces in an ill-fitting puzzle. He saw spotters and riflemen, a few crews served heavy stubbers and missile tubes, a voxman tinkering with a boxy comms unit, but eliciting only static. As the bombardment persisted and the guns answered, most of the troopers with more mediocre weapons hunkered down and waited. Few paid Darian any heed. As a mill serve, he was largely beneath their notice, a servant and a non-combatant. Most didn't understand his purpose, but no one reached for his canteens. They all knew not to do that. His cargo wasn't for them. Even the burly diggers, fearsome and headstrong as they were, knew the pecking order. And the blue blood sat at the top, the bastard royal Volponi. They didn't stir as Darian entered the Volponi part of the trench. Not the sentries who had been posted there should the enemy get this far into the trench, nor the ranks who kept their hooded eyes forwards waiting for something to materialize out of the fog. Standing in line, their finely made las locks gleaming, their grey uniforms pressed and nigh pristine, their fine armor and iconography shining. What proud popinjays they were! But rigidly focused, no casual chatter here, or fatalistic camaraderie. Darian kept his eyes down, nonetheless. The trench opened out, chambers breaking up the labyrinthine monotony, the edges reinforced with additional steel revetments and flackboard. It delineated the entire southern edge of Lawton, the fortified town they had occupied for the last six months. Several firing holes had been cored out, tripod-mounted heavy bolters sitting snugly within all praxis pattern, well made. Three more gunnery nests were in process. Diggers hacked at them with shovels and picks, dark sweat patches under their armpits like old bloodstains. The Volponi watched, but did not participate. Menial work was not for the Blue Bloods. Though a few of the sergeants congratulated the diggers on the quality of their labor, and had stronger drink brought down the line to them. A phonograph was playing, the sound tinny, and the needle scratching. The rousing strains of Volponi on to glory led Darian to the officer's bunker where some of his lords had amassed. An ornate electro-sconce hung over the room, swaying as motes of dirt spiraled from the ceiling like dying moths. The light flickered, illuminating a map table, three chairs and several charts affixed to the wall. A sweaty-faced adjutant was pulling files from a cabinet, 
and stuffing them hastily into a large pack. Another mill serve stood nearby, ready to receive it. Lena, she gave Darien a quick smile, and he felt warmer despite the chill air, returning the smile when he thought the officers weren't looking. The officers stood together. There were three of them surrounding a vox, listening intently to a scratchy broadcast. A cadre of silent adjutants attended them. All had grim faces. It's done then, uttered one as the broadcast concluded, leaning across the map table to switch off the vox. We're giving up the town. We've lost the guns. Fair-haired like many amongst the Volponi, with a sharp nose and clear grey eyes, he was the youngest of the three and the least scarred, a lieutenant called Armand Kalkis. He had a strong bloodline and a good family history, fourth-generation blue blood. His family were amongst the middling nobles of the Volponi aristocracy, hence his officer's rank. Darien knew the history of all of the officers in the 50th. Not an insignificant number, but it was wise for a vassal to know his kings and which of them he should be wary of. Shitting hells, Schiller growled and started pacing. I need a damn drink. A slab of a man, Isaac Schiller had the hooded eyes common to the Volponi aristocracy with shoulders like the bulwarks of a fortress, and a red beard that framed a portcullis of a mouth. Schiller was sixth generation, a captain, and from a long line of high-ranking military men. He had lofty aspirations, but bad habits. As he paced, Schiller looked up and caught sight of Darien. His expression changed from disconsolation to annoyance. Ah! You're here at last, just in time for our disgrace. Schiller glared, taking in Darien's disheveled appearance. And look at the state of you, a bloody shambles. I should have you reprimanded. Darien murmured apologies into his dirt-caked boots as he gave a canteen to the red-haired officer. Schiller took a swig, swallowed, and then scowled. What's this piss? he snapped and tossed the canteen back at Darien, who caught it. This only irritated Schiller all the more. Give me spice wine, you useless dig! In the background, Lena looked afraid. She had been on the receiving end of Schiller's temper before. Darien raised his hand surreptitiously to signal it was all right. A bomb hit close, shivering the walls, and sent a decanter crashing. Glass shattered. Schiller swore. He was still writing himself when Darien offered the wine. Fegging dig, Schiller spat, his gaze like a lance thrust. Kulkis interjected. Is that strictly necessary, Captain? Turning his ire on the lieutenant, Schiller looked about ready to unleash another barrage when the third officer, Major Regara, took an interest. He had been reviewing the map table intently, lost in thought, stoically bracing himself against its sides when the room shook. Decorum, Captain Schiller, he warned, and glanced at the canteen, and also a modicum of restraint. If that explosion and the snap fire I can hear not so far away is any indication, our withdrawal is imminent. I need you sober. I'll have good order when we leave. Schiller called immediately, his respect for the Major ingrained. Some of the color returned to Lena's cheeks. Of course, sir. Where Schiller was thick, Regara was trim and sharp as a knife edge, with graying hair that made him look distinguished rather than old. He also wore fine armor and carried an artisan's saber, his left leg was a chrome-plated bionic. Darien didn't know how Regara had lost it, possibly the same war that gave him the scar across his face. Vasquez Regara was thirteenth generation and could trace his lineage back to the Makarian Crusade. 
upper-tier nobility. "'And give that man a drink, will you?' he snapped, turning his attention back to the map table. "'He looks like he's run ten miles,' Darian blinked. "'Well, go on, then!' urged Schiller, when Darian didn't immediately partake. Take a pull of the water, mind you. Can't have the degs rolling around drunk now, can we? The word deg meant degraded, and was a slur some of the officer class used to describe the mill serfs. It was frowned upon, but had yet to be stamped out. Darian declined with good grace, though he was parched as a dry desert wadi. Suit yourself, said Schiller with an irked glare, and drained the wine, supping it like milk from his mother's teat. Kulkis stepped into Regara's eyeline. Sir, what is our course of action here? Regara took a calming breath, a vein pulsed in his neck. We have no choice. This position has become untenable. We'll reoccupy the town, said Schiller the blue blood in him reluctant to accept defeat. They're in the bloody town, Captain, all over it. We have to withdraw from Loddon entirely and retreat, as per Voke's order to mark a nine. That's Ankishberg, sir, Kalkis interjected. I know where it bloody well is, Lieutenant. Mark a nine, he repeated platoons to fall back along the town outskirts, keep them in staggered formation, and do it by degrees. He muttered an expletive, stretched across the length of the damn map, and have the Agrians mind the trenches. I want the damned Arcanate writhing in blood and earth when they retake it. And the guns, sir? Can they be spiked? Do we have time for that? The Magos reports that we can wreck the turning mechanism and limit their function, but that's all. Regara swore under his breath again, then said, Have the Martian do it. We don't really have authority to destroy them anyway, or the time to seek approval. I want us long gone before the pact get them facing in our direction. Schiller, you've got Lance and Shield Company, the second and third auxiliaries, and the Pavis. Have the tanks maintain a barrage for the rank and file to retreat under. Put some heavy metal on the east flank. It might slow the collapse and give us more time. And get the bloody platoons back together for throne's sake. Schiller gave an ugly smile. I'll have them pounded to the hells and back. See that you do, Captain. Regara stood up straight from the map table. They were spread out, too far. Voke had tried to match the Arcanate line to engage on every front. It had left them vulnerable and the town at risk. The entire Ankish line, Regara shook his head. It won't stand, he said bitterly. It won't bloody stand. Then he walked over to Darian, took a canteen of spice wine and drained it. The leg ached. Despite the fact it hadn't been there for years, it ached. Old memories returned of Nasidon and everything Regara had lost there. Some pains didn't go away, not really. Are you all right, sir? asked Colchis. The Major waved off his lieutenant's concern, though he knew he must look grim. His eyes drifted to the sky and the silhouette of the Arvus lighter slowly disappearing as it spirited away General Voke and his command staff. Regara had declined a seat, preferring to see out the retreat on foot with his regiment. Besides, Major Pallard was dead, and an officer of rank was needed to coordinate the withdrawal of the other Volponi companies and the auxiliaries. It had seemed a noble gesture at the time. Now, with his leg hurting like a bastard, he couldn't see past the folly of it. They were half a mile from the extraction zone, lodden well behind them, and trudging through sodden earth and persistent rain. It was sparse terrain, a few farms and outhouses the only structures. 
Chimera transports trundled past, fighting through the mud, and flanked by teams of Agrian 22nd sappers, in case they needed rescuing. Regara watched the armoured carriers with undisguised longing. He had also refused the offer of a ground transport when Colchis had managed to scrounge it up, leaving it solely for the ferrying of the dead and injured. Even then, the armoured carriers weren't enough, and trains of stretcher-bearers trailed through the ever-worsening conditions. The entire regiment was strung out, weary and defeated. They kept good order, even the auxiliaries, though most had been reduced to scraps. Damned leg, he admitted, scowling at the state of his boots as he lumped through the mire. Martian forged, chrome-plated, but doesn't like the damp. Or maybe I don't. Regara cast a glance to the eastern flank. Now they were out of the trench and well on their way, he could fully appreciate the guns, the weapon they had been forced to abandon. Thrown above, Kulkis, he rasped. What have we allowed to happen? God's sword, the men called it, because it was said that the effect where its power fell was like the sword of the Emperor himself. It was well named. Its four long macro-cannon barrels stabbed into the sky, like huge funnels tilted on their axis, their ends blackened by explosive expulsion. Lesser but still devastating weapon batteries surrounded it, a defensive measure, but Regara couldn't see these. It had anchored the line, conjoined with the fortified town, a marvel of Martian engineering that was supposed to have been the key to unlocking the way south into arch-enemy territory. The pact had let them raise it, even fire it, and then they had taken it. Six months, and God's sword was theirs. Reinforcements are incoming, sir. The guns will be retaken. Regara didn't comment. Through a magnocular, he watched as red-plated ants scurried across the macro-cannon battery the pact feasting over their hard-won prize. He didn't know how long it would take their engineers to fix the rotatory mechanism that enabled the immense machine to turn. He only hoped it would be long enough for the Volponi and their auxiliaries to get out of range. He lowered the magnocula, and the weapon grew far away again, a towering spear thrust into the smoke-choked air above Lodden. Distant booms revealed that the main enemy forces had met the trench line and the mines left by the diggers. A score of lesser detonations undercut it as the Pardas kept up their barrage, but the tanks were pulling out now to join the rest of the retreat, wary of the massed infantry headed their way. Setting off again, Regara noticed the mill serve from earlier, floundering with his heavy belt of canteens. Colchis, he said to his lieutenant, indicating the other man. The mill serf was young, maybe twenty-five Terran standard, though war made men look older than they really were. Dark stubble covered his head, like a skullcap, from where his hair had been shaved. Despite his low-born provenance, he had a strong profile and fierce blue eyes. Sir? Tell him to leave it. No one falls behind, not even the servants. I'll have every man and woman accounted for by throne. Colchis nodded, then turned and raised his voice. Cut the strap, Deg, he yelled, and move your ass quickly now. The mill serf nodded, unbuckling the canteen belt and letting it fall. At once his pace increased. And Lieutenant, Regara added, a hard glance at the mill serves slogging across the earth. Sir? Don't call them that. He is either mill serve or you learn his name. Bad enough that Schiller is an ignorant swine with no breeding, without having to put up with it from you too, Lieutenant. Sir, answered Kulkis, suitably contrite. The mill serve suddenly stopped and turned. Something had made him look up, and then he started waving frantically at Regara, shouting, 
My lord! My lord! The Major followed his gaze to a growing speck on the horizon. A low buzzing materialized on the breeze, audible above the general retreat with the conclusion of the tank barrage. Several of those tanks, those with enough elevation on their primary armaments, angled their long cannons skywards. The speck became several, and then the forbidding shape of a fuselage and wings, pregnant with a bulky payload underneath. The pact had few bombers, and hoarded them jealously, but without God's sword to worry about, the arch-enemy could afford to be bolder. Over five hundred men tramped this stretch of earth alone, with hundreds more strung out along the line. A few had stopped to prime rocket tubes and launchers, hastily affecting firing positions. Get those men down, Rigara roared, as the buzzing grew into a nerve-shredding whine. He threw himself to the ground as the first of the bombs hit, mud and bodies thrown upwards in a spray. A spatter against his cheek felt too hot to be rain. A stone struck his helmet, the metal ringing in his ears. Something warm and syrupy oozed from his ear as vertigo overwhelmed him and Regara lost all sense of direction. The bombs kept coming, and he found himself crawling, bellowing for his men to follow, but he didn't know which way he was headed. Pushing with his elbows, half sinking in the mud, Regara knew with cold finality that he was lost. He needed to stop and get his bearings, but the barrage shook the earth, rattling his senses. Then a strong hand wrapped around Regara's wrist, and at first he thought it was Kolkis, but then the face of the millserve appeared. He shouted, This way, my lord! And then he pulled. Regara let him, a blind man led away from peril, churned earth raining down. The millserve had found an old foxhole, and they scrambled inside. A half wall surrounded it. The foxhole, a basement room of a ruined outhouse partially filled with rubble. The frantic grip on Regara's jacket was Kolkis, the lieutenant hauling Regara to him. Gratitude would need to wait. Teeth gritted. They hunkered down as fury reigned above, and the world turned white with fire and thunder. Chapter 2 The wounded stretched deep into the camp, a shanty town of rain-soaked tents and grey stone buildings. It had a rustic air, but its character was slowly being eroded by the demands of the war. Exhausted medics worked in the light of the crackling sodium lamps, hurrying between makeshift beds to treat burns and cauterize amputations. A shrine house served as an infirmary for the worst cases, and pyres of the dead would burn long into the night. The bombers had taken a heavy toll upon an already decimated army, a slaughter Colchis could scarcely believe he had survived. Three days ago they had reached the extraction zone outside of Loddon, owing to the bravura of the 81st Merlin and six squadrons of vulture gunships. Kulkis hadn't witnessed the engagement. He only knew the bombardment had paused long enough for them to get out of that basement of some half-destroyed outhouse and herd what was left of the infantry to the waiting transports. A posthumous Medal of Valor had been awarded to the Wing Commander, who had led the daring aerial intercession, but with no uniform to pin it to, it would sit in some Lord Marshal's drawer like all the rest. The flyers ferrying the infantry had arrived early in the evening of that first night, several hundred soldiers descending on the town piecemeal. Many dispersed, heading off to find decent lodgings or distraction, in the absence of orders to do otherwise. Even days later, cohesion was still being asserted, with many men still at large. Most of the town was still intact. It had suffered lightly during the war. As the men had returned or were corralled by their officers, the communal structures slowly filled, some as billets, others for the high-ranking officers and their staff. Little had changed since then. 
Several of the men had taken to sitting around fires, their electro burners flaring blue in the late evening shadow and providing a little warmth against the cold. The rain had continued for three days straight, though eventually reduced to a miserable drizzle that saw makeshift awnings unfold like sails at the fronts of abandoned commercia and alehouses. An old bell tower stood in the heart of the town, fortified and currently occupied by sentries with magnoculars and a censor array. The lookouts called out stragglers who stumbled in here and there, far fewer than Colchis had hoped. Despondency had set in, and laxity. That had to change, hence the lieutenant's mission to the quarter. A secondary camp had sprung up to supplement the first, dubbed the Quarter, a place of vendors and hawkers scratching for coin as they sold their wares, seeking to turn war into an opportunity, or perhaps just to blunt the hopelessness of it all. Men survived however they could, Colchis supposed, as he moved amongst the traders and merchants. Most of the auxiliaries could be found here, but some Volponi too, their ingrained elitism softening in the face of necessity. The Agrians, or diggers to give them their colloquial cognomen, engaged in barter and trade. Ankishberg was their town after all, though Colchis doubted many of the indentured men actually came from here. The conscripts had joined the royal Volponi at Vardish, a major port that lay far to the north. Fifty thousand diggers had signed up, dispersed amongst three different war fronts. Men and women, though Colchis found it difficult to tell them apart, clad as they were in furs and skins. He had heard even the women had the beards for which the Agrians were so famed. Bound with ingots and leather, the Agrians placed great stock in their facial hair. It was seen as a mark of station amongst their kind, or so the commissariat briefing had told the Volponi officer Carter prior to shipping out. He watched them now, moving amongst the stalls and benches, picking at homespun cloaks and skinning knives. A few had coin and used it lavishly, like they weren't planning on returning from the next sortie. Colchis thought that a shrewd judgment. The 19th Talpa, or Tunnel Rats, smoked kappa root in shadowy conclaves, their dirty faces lit by the flame of narcotics. They spoke in a chittering argo, and took to low Gothic poorly, though their officers appeared to have a greater grasp of language and acted as translators where necessary. The Talpa had earned a reputation in the trenches. The knives and spiked mattocks they favoured put to good use there against the enemy. They were similar to the Roane Deepers, tunnelers whom the Blue Bloods had fought alongside before, only less civilised and more savage. Even the Pact didn't like fighting against the Talpa, but their numbers were few. Only a handful of companies had made it back from the battle. The other regiments were also casualty-ridden. The 4th Oryk Rangers, 37th Royal Sloka, and the 10th Pardus Pavis Armoured, who had been reduced to a single division. He caught glimpses of every uniform, like staying with like, though some swapped trophies or shared smokes, the territorial nature of soldiers softening as the evening grew darker. For the natives it meant custom and trade. An old Agrian woman offering pungent-smelling broth pushed a bowl at Kulkis as he walked by her ramshackle stall. Gruppe, Gruppe, she croaked, smiling through cracked teeth as she offered her wares. Kulkis took one look at the watery, leafy stew and turned away. One of his men lingered, tempted. We're not here to sample the local soup, Grice, said Colchis, without a backward glance as he pushed through the crowd. Grice did as he was told, 
and caught up to the other three men Colchis had brought with him. And calm yourselves around the natives for throne's sake, said Colchis, having caught the nervous glances of his men. The Agrians are simple folk who'll take to anger poorly. Remember your station. He was eager to be gone from this place and its rustic charms. Mud clinging to his boots, uniform stained from collar to cuff and reeking of days old sweat. A bath, not broth, was what he craved. A few of the steam houses remained intact, though getting into one took an officer's rank above lieutenant. Perhaps the major would accommodate him. The smell of Obscura was heady on the night breeze, wafting from Talpa tents, and the sweat stink of the brothels grew thicker the further he went. It's rather rough, muttered Hanmar, grimacing. His olive-skinned and aquiline face wore the expression well, his white hair like a dusting of snow. An able corpsman, Hanmar had a deft hand for digging out bullets and shrapnel. He wore a rapier on his hip, a family heirloom he had brought to war. The scabbard was well worn, but Hanmar bore no scars on his face or body. The raven-haired Grice nodded, the strap of his helmet flapping under his chin. Colchis couldn't remember ever having seen the sergeant not wearing it. He had a neck like a bullgrocks, with shoulders and a demeanor to match. He had won the regimental weightlifting medal five years in a row. And the smell of it, declared Rake, scowling. It's richer than your boots after a forced march, Dresk replied, winking at the other troopers' mouthed invective. Rake and Dresk were cousins, both blond-haired and grey-eyed, and joint heirs to a large dynastic estate they would probably never inherit. In the ranks they were gunners, and Manda crew served heavy stubber with ruthless efficiency. Rake had quick hands, and Dresk a steady nerve. Neither looked comfortable. Settle down, all of you, said Colchis. Allied encampment or not, they needed their wits about them. I sharp he added, bulling ahead. A little further on, the hawker's market opened out into a broad square. An old dry fountain stood in the middle. Raised voices caught his attention, notable because he recognized the accent. Even wayward men seeking distraction couldn't entirely hide their ingrained refinement. They had found them. Four soldiers in unkempt uniforms, faced off against three burly Agrians, Volponi's soldiers. A table and several chairs had been upturned. A deck of cards lay scattered beneath, scattered coins too. The diggers looked angry, speaking in their native tongue and gesturing furiously to one of their number, who was pulling at his beard like it had been insulted. Colchis saw the silver ingot in the hand of one of the Volponi, a trooper he didn't immediately recognize, and quickly discerned the narrative. Bloody hells, he murmured, before striding into the middle of the fracker to demand, What is the meaning of this? The Volponi stood to immediate attention, shocked to have the officer suddenly in their midst. Colchis didn't give them any time to adjust. Answer me, then! An innocent game of cards, sir, piped up one of the men at the back, eyes front. Colchis dismissed him with a glare. I am not addressing you, trooper. You there, he said, chin jutting like a dagger at the man holding the ingot. Explain yourself immediately. He didn't get the chance. The disgraced Agrian lunged for the ingot with one great, meaty hand. Colchis stopped him. Turning on his heel, he caught the man's wrist and twisted it. Howling, the Agrian plunged to one knee, seemingly paralyzed. The roar of retribution from his allies couldn't drown out the lieutenant's stern voice. Stand down, he said, putting the incapacitated Agrian between him and his aggressors. They didn't appear ready to be dissuaded. Colchis turned the wrist a fraction, eliciting howls of pain. If you wish for me to break it, I will, he warned the others, 
who backed down but glared furiously at the soldiers who had wronged them. A crowd had begun to gather. A few talpa and the odd orek came to see what the fuss was all about, but mainly sympathetic agrians who only saw the persecution of their kin. Sir, warned Grice, balling his thick fists. Now then, sergeant, uttered an icy voice from the periphery. A man stepped forwards, a lieutenant's rank pins on his shoulders. The battle ended hours ago, and as I recall, these men were not our enemies. Bertram Fink wore a cold smile. He had just been using a bayonet to pick dried blood from under his fingernails, and now he had finished, he slid the long, sharp blade back into its sheath on his belt. Dark-haired, dark-eyed, Fink ever had the look of a man who knew more than he was letting on. Unlike most blue bloods, who were muscular and well-nourished, Fink had a whipcord physique, rangy, but also taut and not an ounce of fat. He had longish fingers like a pianist. He gently wagged one at Kolkis. I am surprised at you, Lieutenant, he said, turning his eerily placid gaze onto his fellow officer. Kolkis felt his jaw tense involuntarily. To raise a hand to our allies, it makes for poor interregimental relations, wouldn't you say? Thank, came the tart reply. Kulkis released the Agrian, who shrank back to his cohorts, rubbing at his sore wrist. I acted as I saw fit. Lieutenant Bertram Fenk nodded, and as he stepped into the gap between the disputed parties, the diggers edged back again. All of this for a silly lump of metal. Return it, he said calmly, addressing the trooper holding the ingot but keeping his eyes on the Agrians. Return it, Corporal Redfern, Fink said again when it didn't happen immediately. I won't repeat myself again. The trooper handed it over, and Fink took it without looking and gave it back to the Agrian. The burly man looked pleased, but his smugness faded when Fenk swept in close, the bayonet drawn, and beneath the Agrian's chin, the point touching his flesh. A piece of advice. Do not make a wager you aren't prepared to lose. Do you understand? Yes, muttered the Agrian in an angry rasp. Good, said Fenk and let him go. The Agrian and his allies shuffled back into the crowd. The onlookers dispersed, as did the tension. When Fenk turned to face his own troops, the blade was sheathed as if it had never been otherwise. But Kulkis had seen it, just as he'd caught Fenk watching from the other side of the square as the violence unfolded. I presume you're here for me, Lieutenant, said Fenk. What the hells are you doing here, Fink? Preventing a messy incident, I would say. I saw the bayonet. What did you see, Lieutenant? You saw a fellow officer of the Royal Volponi defuse a situation you had allowed to escalate. I see more than that. Oh? A moment of silence passed between them. Kulkis reminded of a recent campaign when they had faced each other in the ruins of a city called Titus. This was before Nostes. Kulkis had learned something of the other man that day, something of his nature, or so he thought. Now, just as he had then, Fenk narrowed his eyes ever so slightly. I know, and I don't care, they said. The moment passed. Kulkis gestured to the disheveled Volponi. Yours, I presume. I'll see them reprimanded, Fenk assured him. Regara is pulling the officers together for a briefing. Makes sense. I'll make my way there now, Fenk nodded and walked away. 
Colchis called after him. Lieutenant! And he stopped and turned back. Captain Schiller, is he here too? Fenk smiled again, his expression ripe with barely disguised loathing. Of course. Where, precisely? Colchis gestured to the expansive market. Where else? The rundown alehouse was busy, mostly with soldiers, and a pall of tabac smoke hung in the air like a fog. As with the hawker's market, the auxiliaries were everywhere, sharing tankards of black ale over fizzing electro-braziers. The murmured conversation halted as Colchis entered, and a few dark glances came his way, but most of the patrons had their eyes down and thoughts elsewhere. The door atmosphere quickly resumed. Much of Ankishburg was now abandoned, or occupied by imperial soldiers, but a few of the businesses in the town still traded. Either the proprietors saw an unparalleled opportunity to turn a profit, or they simply had no means of getting out. In the case of the Ursa, Kulkis assumed the latter. It was a small establishment, and he didn't want Schiller thinking he'd come mob-handed, so he'd sent Grice and the others back to camp. Sweat and the reek of stale alcohol stuck to him as he moved through a throng of bodies, slowly edging towards the bar, where he planned on asking the tender if he'd seen a Volponi captain with red hair and a neck as thick as a mortar shell. He need not have bothered. Lieutenant! As he turned at the sound of the voice, Colchis found Schiller propped up in a corner booth with a mostly empty bottle. Won't you join me in a little drink, he said, cheeks flushed like distress flares. I've decided to rough it with the natives. Colchis noticed Schiller's jacket hung open, and his shirt had several brass buttons undone. Despite the cold outside, the Ursa felt like a furnace. It didn't excuse Schiller's lack of decorum, roughing it or not. But then the captain was not a man to be overly concerned by such things. The Major has sent me to collect you, Colchis uttered briskly as he stood outside the booth, raising his voice above the hubbub. Has he now? Well, I shall be along promptly, but only after you've had a drink with me. Nothing sadder than a man drinking alone, Lieutenant, don't you think? Schiller pushed an empty glass across the table. Really, Captain, I should be... Drink. I should really be getting... Sit your ass down. Schiller's flare of anger faded as quickly as it had appeared. And take a drink with me, Armand. The man was fairly deep in his cups, but a feral awareness glinted in his hooded eyes as he beckoned Colchis to sit. Colchis gave in with a conciliatory gesture and took a chair. Still no word on when we can expect reinforcements, Colchis began. Apparently they are being pulled from the other fronts. Always straight to business, mocked Schiller. He poured Colchis a measure. It's only been three days, he nodded to the glass. Strong stuff, this native swill, be warned. Colchis had a sniff and decided it was indeed strong stuff. He put his glass down. If it's swill, why do you drink it? Because I like to drink, and this place is selling. To forget? Colchis ventured, and Schiller gave him such a vehement look he thought he might lash out. To remember... Colchis held his gaze until Schiller looked down at his empty glass as if an answer he was seeking could be found in its dregs. How many dead? Still to be properly tallied, but early reckonings are around two thousand men across the entire Ankish line. We had them, Armand. Schiller shook his head, clinging to his empty glass. We had them. It's a heavy toll, sir. 
Isaac, he said. We're in a damned tavern, Armand. No need for formality here. I disagree, sir. Schiller swore under his breath. Suit yourself. He took another drink. Regara said we were stretched too thinly, that the flanks were weak to counter, but that bastard folk... Schiller raised his eyes. He'll hang for this. Kolkis said nothing. Voke had reprimanded Regara for his insolence, for daring to suggest he had seen something the colonel had not. The truth of it was, Voke had lost his edge and had mistaken arrogance for acumen. Nine months in this grind and the colonel's obsession had been within apparent reach, a fortress, Rakespur, that the Arcanates had been using as a base of operations. Imperial spies had learned that the sanguinary tribes had something within their ranks that could put the entire Nostis campaign at risk. The precise nature of it remained unknown. The final vox of the infiltrators, a frantic, half-heard testimony of tortured screaming. No further covert operatives were risked after that, but Rakespur became a major objective, and one Voke meant to take. Lodden was supposed to have been the staging ground. Break the line from Lodden, and momentum would carry the Imperial Army the rest of the way. A few weeks, maybe a month, two at most, and the war on Agria would be over. Voke believed Lodden was the linchpin, for why else would the enemy have fought so tenaciously and fiercely? Win here, win everything. Voke was wrong. He had overreached, and two thousand men had lost their lives. Regara had voiced his doubts about Voke's plan, but in the end had been overruled. I heard a deg save the Major's life, said Schiller, apropos of nothing. That true? I heard it from a sergeant who got it from a vox man who said he saw Regara crawling on his belly like a worm until that deg pulled his ass out of the fire. Kulkis nodded, but did so reluctantly. They had lost sight of the mill serve shortly after they'd reached the transports. Kulkis wondered where the lad was now, and if he even realized the import of his actions. Schiller chuckled at the thought. He had always disliked Regara for his rank, his record, and his rapport with the men. Yet he did respect him as a commander. Bloody shameful, he said, rising to his feet and tidying himself up. A man of rank in debt to one of none. I expect Regara is seething. I expect he is also glad to be alive. Schiller shrugged like he doubted it. Are you leaving, sir? Kolkis asked. You should, too, Schiller replied. This is an insalubrious establishment to be found in for men of good breeding. He winked, shouldered his way out of the booth and left, muttering, Shameful, bloody shameful, Kulkis stood up just in time for the bartender to come for the coin that Schiller owed, but evidently hadn't paid. Muttering in irritation, Kulkis settled the captain's bill for him and made his way back to camp. Regara had brushed his uniform, or rather his manservant, Balis, had done it for him. A shave had dealt with the worst of his unkempt facial hair. He had washed the dirt of the camp seemingly ever-present. His polished armor shone with reflected firelight. A scabbarded saber hung from his belt on its gilded chain, and an ornate pistol sat in its holster on his left hip. Standing before the colonel's billet, Regara wondered if he would have to use it. He checked his pocket chrono, waited three more seconds, and then entered the billet. It had been a clerk's office prior to the war, and as such carried all of the austerity of the Imperium instead of the rural trappings of Agria. 
Voak had made the place his own. Fine rugs hid the floor. He had hung a portrait of himself in military uniform, a window onto better days. A painted winter landscape depicted Konisberg, the Volponi planetary capital, its Teutonic spires draped in snow. A rich oak desk sat in one corner, parchments and vellum stacked in neat piles, an ink pot to one side, an auto quill with its servo armature at rest nearby. A high backed chair tucked under the desk, upholstered in tanned leather. A chandelier held a brace of electro flambeaux, their light drawing a long shadow from the severe looking figure standing on the right hand side of the main room. Voke wore his finest parade regalia, every inch of his magnificent attire gleaming as he admired himself in the full-length mirror hung upon the facing wall. Armed, too, Regara noticed, pistol and saber, polished to a glittering sheen, their inset gemstones flawless. A fire crackled in the hearth at the back of the room, and Regara let it fill the silence. Voke didn't speak straight away. He was a proud man, Broad shoulders held back, silver-gray hair immaculately combed. Only his eyes had lost something of the emerald fire they once possessed. Upon arriving at Ankishberg, he had gone into seclusion. Three days in his quarters, and now a summons. He gently adjusted the brocade of his uniform jacket. His plumed helmet sat on a stool nearby, Gold and red and glorious. It is a sight to behold, wouldn't you say, Major? The resplendent panoply of the Volponi. There is none finer in all of the regiments of the Astra Militarum, sir. Vogue smiled and brushed a hand across his coat. Well spoken, Major, well spoken. Regara wanted to remonstrate with the man, to rail at the decision he had made that had left two thousand dead and godsword with the enemy. He wanted to shout and tear at the medals on his chest, to throw the colonel's vainglorious art upon the fire and watch it burn, like he had watched their men burn as Voke had fled aboard a gunship. He wanted to do a great many things, but in the end he did nothing. His silence would provide the rope. I am being replaced, Major, Voak said. He had yet to make eye contact. I see, sir. They want me off the line, back end position. Something logistical, I expect. I understand, sir. Say I'm unfit for the front. Voke's gaze wandered to some midpoint. Perhaps he was back amongst those wintry spires. He looked lost all of a sudden, all his pomp and starch bleeding away until only a man remained, defeated, ashamed. Regara almost felt sorry for him. You shall assume temporary command, said Voke, recovering. He glanced over. I know you'll do a fine job of it. It is my duty and my honor, sir. Indeed, indeed. Is that all, sir? I believe it is, Major, said Voak. Though, if you wouldn't mind, he gestured to his belt and cinched scabbard. Can't get the devil to sit quite right. Of course, sir. Regara stepped forwards, taking a knee as he untangled the scabbard's chain. As the major was carefully arranging the links, Voak laid a hand upon his arm. I should have listened to you, Regara. I thought I had glory within my grasp. I believe I may have erred. Fourteen generations of Voak, a lineage that reaches back beyond Macarius. Never tarnished. Not until. The weight of Vogue's shame made his hand tremble, and he let go of Regara's arm. 
You have old blood, don't you, Major? Makarian heritage? Yes, sir, Regara stood. You are ready, sir. Am I? Voke glanced down at the chain now hanging in perfect order from his scabbard. It would appear I am. Regara saluted. The Emperor protects, sir. Voke nodded, a tacit gesture that Regara could take his leave. He had walked no more than ten feet from the billet, and only paused momentarily when he heard the shot ring out. Regara carried on. There was much to be done. Chapter 3 Hauptmann checked the fuel gauge for the third time, tapping it with a gloved finger and hoping the dial was stuck. He was getting low, and the Volper's engine let him know it. Rattling close to empty, the laboured clunking as he shifted gears, the coughing protests of the exhaust stack. They'd need to find them soon. But Agria had a lot of territory, and the wilds of Crag Hill were as rugged as it came. Hills and depressions rumpled the land like waves, sharp ridges as their crests. He fed three signal clicks into the Vox and slewed the bike to a halt. All stop! All stop! A host of mimicked confirmations came back as Hauptmann pulled his canteen and took a sip. That was running low, too, and the water was warm, but at least it was wet. He leaned down to retrieve his map and then unrolled it across the Vulpa's handlebars, the waxy material well-weathered but enduring. Not unlike me. He lifted his goggles and the caked film across his vision lifted too. South lay Ankishberg, Lager and Vasher, then Loden. Kobor to the east. He could see Ankishberg if he squinted hard enough, even with the dust in his eyes. North was Thrake, and further on, Lanchatek, which according to the map was more than a hundred miles away. Lanchatek had an intact airfield and a Munitorum field depot. That's where they'd be coming in. Only one major road led south from the city. Should be here by now, Hauptmann murmured, and winced at the ache in his back. Six hours in the saddle already. The bike was heavy, the Volpa's dirty mustard chassis armored, its mudguards like pauldrons over the thick tires. He leaned it onto its hefty kickstand, grateful of the relief. The stamp on the metal chassis stated Pavis in thick, stenciled writing, and the Volpers were part of the light mechanized division of the tenth, armored carriers, walkers, and bikes. The latter harked back, sentimentally some might say, to the Pardis' origins as a cavalry regiment, one of several in fact. Hauptmann still considered himself and his fellow rough riders as cavalrymen, though he was a scout by trade and by training, but also ran escort and rapid interdiction. Only at this moment he was struggling to locate his quarry. A pair of magnoculars sat in a dusty pouch on the opposite side of the seat. Pinning the map with one hand, Hauptmann took the scopes with the other and tried to see something. A marker, a smoke trail, anything. He chewed his lip, missing his usual tabac, and muttered, Something to the east. Hauptmann turned a dial on the side of the scopes to up the magnification. A dust plume, maybe half a mile out, a large one. Stowing his kit, he got on the Vox. Objective sighted, east. Map coordinates followed. Riders, Saddle up and move out. Before he moved off, Hauptmann took a worn piece of paper from his pocket. Unfolding it, he revealed a pict of a pretty young frontierswoman cradling a baby. He whispered, Chari, and kissed it for luck. Two, he'd seen two dust plumes, one to the east and then a second coming in from the west, closing rapidly on the first. 
Hauptmann checked his weapons and gunned the engines. The column hadn't seen them. A long train of around thirty armoured Chimera troop carriers and lighter Tauros jeeps, headlamps blazing with the onset of night, were driving heedlessly into an ambush. Hauptmann kept the rough riders dark and their vox silent. To reach out now, to make any overt sign, could tip off the flankers coming in from the west. He rode one-handed, scopes in the off-hand. The bumpy terrain jerked the view, but Hauptmann got a decent look via night vision. Pactus, a light skirmish force, maybe forty or fifty riders, part mechanized, mostly bikers, and part animal. Equine, he thought, or maybe large canine. The darkness made it tough to tell, bulked up, cybernetics, trailing hooks in the dirt and hefting long pikes, nail guns and spikers, low armor, a few jeeps with heavier munitions, marauders, little more than tribal bandits. As they closed, they picked up speed and began to split into two groups, a serpent with two heads. Standard raiding tactics. They would hit the column at the front, disable the first vehicle to create a roadblock, and force the motorcade out of position. Then they'd hit the rear to prevent retreat, like wolves harassing a herd. Confuse, keep them at distance as they panic, and try to break out and get tangled in their numbers. Then separate, pick off. Little cuts, a slow bleed. Hauptmann saw it all play out ahead of time. Some thought the blood cults barbarians, and they were, but to believe they were simple-minded savages, too, was to gravely underestimate them. He knew different, and had the losses to remind him. Light flashes stabbed out from chimera firing slits, sporadic las bursts from part of the column as it finally apprehended the danger. Search lamps roved the darkness, seeking targets. One shattered, shot out by a nail gun. A marauder took a lucky hit, mount slipping under him as he lost control. The bike kicked as if flung by a spring, then crashed down. Those who followed weaved around it, deftly avoiding the debris as return fire cracked all along the line. A big cannon chugged from one of the heavier rigs, its salvo ripping off a wheel and forcing a chimera to skid, then stop. The closest group of marauders attacked the head of the column, nail guns sparking and hurling tomahawks before peeling off in a snaking line. Hit and run. A few headlamps shattered, but a spiker thrown from the saddle embedded in the lead chimera's chassis, latching prongs biting into metal. An explosion tore out the side of the carrier a few seconds later, sheared metal flapping like parchment. It drove on, unable to slow its momentum, and soldiers spilled from the breach, bundling out of the hold to bounce off the ground and roll to a dead halt. Nail guns raked the bodies, making sure of the kills. Burning, venting smoke, the lead chimera ground to a stop. The marauders wheeled out and back, hooting and crowing as lasbeams chased them ineffectively. Dust billowed in their wake, pumping into the air like a smokestack. They were coming back. The move brought the bandits into Hauptmann's sights, within striking distance. He went loud, ditching the noise baffled to let the engines roar. Never the last ride, he bellowed. Headlamps turned up to full beam better than a flash grenade if the enemy doesn't know it's coming. A few of the equines panicked at the sudden light and noise. One barreled into a bike and both went down. Another ran into the path of a heavy rig and the jeep bucked as it drove over the jean bulked body, then flipped. More bikers pulled away from the crash and the marauder's formation started to fragment. Tribal headsmen shouted orders, tried to reposition, but by then, the rough riders were on them. Hauptmann unhooked his shock lance, easing it into his padded shoulder and lowering it into the cradle on the vulpa's forward glasses. In his peripheral vision, he saw the other cavaliers converge, sweeping in from the wide zones into a perfect spear tip. The vulpa was built stocky, 
which made it good for terrain and capable of withstanding small arms fire. It also meant it hit like a battering ram and excelled as shock cavalry. Snapfire pranged harmlessly off the vulpa's bulky armor. A nail embedded in the forward glasses but went no further. Hauptmann didn't even blink. Head down, eyes up. Leaning over his lance, he found a target. Then he roared as the charge of twenty rough riders hit. He tore his enemy from the saddle, the horrific momentum punching the marauder up and back. The smell of burnt flesh wafted on the air from the lance's shock charge. He speared a second, impaling a jeep gunner, and nearly lost his weapon before the body shucked loose. Hauptmann hung on, rode harder. No pulling away, now they were committed. Another impact. He felt his shoulder jar, but the padding took the worst of it. A flash of electrical discharge. A beast squealed, sounding porcine more than equine. Blood spattered noisily against the vulpa's chassis, like hot rain on metal. He kept going, plowing through the bodies, motion blurring, alive to the thud of metal against flesh, against metal, and the shrieking of man and animal alike. Petrochem smell filled his nostrils, and he breathed through his mouth so it wouldn't overwhelm him. Something exploded, the heat of flames lapping at his skin and then gone in the same instant. Mo through! Mo through! he urged his cavaliers, and heard the whip-crack of Laz pistols as some of them switched to their sidearms. Hauptmann clung to the lance like it was part of him, the air crackling with corposant. The rush of noise, the blur of images, the desperate tension as it neared a tipping point. And then he was out, and felt the blessed relief of clear air washing over him. Hauptmann turned, making a quick head count. Three cavaliers hadn't made it, left behind with their mounts in the scrum. He'd mourned them later. A few had lost their lances, too. The marauders had it worse. He raised his fist, the signal to come about and close into formation. As he wheeled the vulpur and led the others, Hauptmann saw the carnage they had left in their wake. A dozen maimed and dead, a collision of bodies twisted up in their machines, the bleating of the beasts, limbs broken and ripped up like offal. A few marauders staggered drunkenly out of this morass half clinging to weapons, seeking safety. Hauptmann gave a sharp, chopping motion, and the rough riders shot them down without mercy, las beams snap-cracking on the air. Fewer still had survived the charge intact, but they didn't look in the mood for vengeance. Several of the chimeras had zeroed in on the marauders now, and harried any stragglers with bursts of heavy stubber fire, Muzzle flashes spoke loudly and were mostly ineffective. Another marauder went down, though, stitched by solid shot as he rode unwittingly into a crossfire. The others fled, hooting and shrieking into the night. Hauptmann led the squadron into a wide arc away from the column. The larger rear group of marauders had peeled off from its initial target and were coming to intercept, a mistake on their part. Prepared and numerically superior, the enemy appeared to have the advantage as they bore down on the Rough Riders. Hauptmann knew better. His men turned sharply, a fan of dust arcing high behind them, and dragged the marauders after them like they had tow cables attached to their rigs. The rearmost cavalier took a hit, a lucky shot to the back of the neck that tore out his throat. He lurched, then collapsed out of the saddle, bike slipping under him. Hauptmann lost sight of him when the bike struck a piece of debris and a spark exploded the ruptured fuel tank. A fireball bloomed, then faded. Hauptmann scowled. That made four. On, 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 he urged, the throaty putter of the vulpa's exhaust stack and the hollow echo in the fuel tank more or less a death knell. He only prayed he had given their allies enough time, as he sighted a ridge line. Running on fumes, he burst up and over and sighted the column. 
The cavaliers followed him, then split, sweeping through the gaps left in the chimeras, who then opened up with turret weapons on the chasing pack. The marauders realized too late they had been baited and rode right into the fusillade. Easy to lose sense of the battlefield in the dark when your blood is up and dust is everywhere. Heavy stubbers and heavy bolters sang out in staccato frenzy, accompanied by the shrill barks of multi-laser fire. The troopers in the carriers had disembarked, ranking up in firing lines. Laz and turret fire erased the marauders as they crested the ridge in a storm of ionized beams and solid shot. It ended quickly. Nice and tidy, cavaliers. Very nice. One for the textbooks said Hauptmann across the Vox. He and the other rough riders had deliberately overshot the column by a few hundred yards and now turned to make their way back. His fuel had run out before he'd stopped, momentum taking him the additional twenty or so yards that he had to claw back under his own steam. At the column, more troops had begun to disembark, as well as a cadre of engineers who were inspecting the damaged vehicles. The dead were already being recovered, dragged off and laid together, while a ministorum priest murmured rites over the bodies. Scouts had been placed, two squads taking the high ground with scopes and sensor arrays. Only one vehicle remained sealed and silent. Slate gray, where the others were lighter, it didn't carry iconography or any regimental designation. As Hauptmann pushed his heavy Volper towards his allies, he wondered idly who was inside. Hauptmann gave a hand signal to a delegation emerging from the near side of the column. They wore the grey and gold of the Volponi, and held their finely made las guns at ease across their chests. One wore an officer's helm. Apologies, the woman called out, her tone crisp and businesslike for our lateness. Hauptmann frowned, but quickly shrugged off his surprise. He had thought all Volponi were male. She was attractive, not just on account of her looks, but also her presence and confidence, though she couldn't hold a candle to his beloved Chari. Broad-shouldered, tall too, and light on her feet, a short sword strapped to her leg looked more expensive than Hauptmann's Volper, guilt chasing. She was hawkish, like most Volponi, clean skinned, and with eyes the color of rich brown wood, and haughty, another trait shared by the blue bloods. A small scar distorted the lower lip, but didn't detract from her appearance. In fact, the small imperfection enhanced it. Hauptmann was an old soldier with an old soldier's values, and he felt the urge to tidy his appearance before coming into contact with the female officer. In the end, all he managed was a dirt redistribution. He even tried to remove a glove so she wouldn't have to shake the grimy garment, but ended up making a hash of it. No need on my account, sergeant, she added, observing Hauptmann's rank pins. Her basso voice quietened to a conversational level as they stopped in front of each other and she shook his gloved hand. The grip was firm. Eight hours in orbital transit, another three in a damn chimera. I have smelled and felt better. She smiled that cold, appraising smile common to the aristocracy and released his hand. Captain Aramis, Volponi 86th, you must be the escort. Hauptmann nodded, surreptitiously flexing his fingers. Her grip was very firm. What gave us away, he said, adding Hauptmann when the joke failed to land. Tenth Pardus, Rough Rider Corps. Don't see many motorized units these days of the war, she said, by way of what Hauptmann assumed was small talk. She had a certain poise about her, a readiness that put him in mind of a coiled spring. Volper class? 
The sergeant brightened a little, impressed at Aramis's knowledge. Jovian pattern, yes. I don't think they make them any more. That's a shame. It looks a fine vehicle. It is a rare breed. Hauptmann found that candle he held flickering a little. You know your engines, Captain. I know a thoroughbred when I see it. Hauptmann raised a querying brow. I raised horses back on Volponi, she said, at Pascalon, on the southern continent. My family is part of the landed gentry. There's a lot of prairie in the south, good grazing pastures, not like this wasteland, though I suspect the war has had something to say about that. She turned her eyes from the wilds of the Crag Hill and back to him. Your bravery saved the column, Sergeant. Every man and woman here is in your debt. I did begin to wonder if you weren't coming, Captain. An unavoidable delay, unfortunately. They walked back to the column together. She noted Hauptmann pushing his bike. You hung on to the last dregs, though. Hauptmann nodded, then asked, How many are you in your party? Just over three hundred souls, but were only the advance guard. Further reinforcements are on the way. Not easy pulling troops from the other fronts, mind you. There's more than just Agria at stake here on Nasties. I wouldn't know much about that, ma'am. Aramis laughed, and there was a little steel in it. Ma'am is what I call my mother, Sergeant Hauptmann. Captain is perfectly fine, or sir, if you feel the need to be particularly obsequious. Noted, Captain. Aramis gave him an approving look. I've never seen a female Volponi officer before, Hauptmann remarked as they neared the column. If you don't mind me saying, I mean no offense. None taken, Aramis replied airily. We are a rare breed. Hauptmann laughed despite himself. Very good, Captain. I thought so. She sniffed, raised her chin imperiously. It looked as natural as breathing to her, probably bred in all blue bloods. Most of the Volponi female population are embedded in state matters. All royal households have their queens and duchesses, after all. She side-glanced at Hauptmann, a wry look in her eyes. And someone has to run things whilst the men are at war. Tithes won't pay themselves. Only we're running out of men. Aramis's command squad had filed in around them, acting as escort for the Rough Riders. One trooper offered Hauptmann a canteen. He took it gratefully and had one long pull to quench his thirst. He noticed they were headed for the grey, unmarked chimera. He has asked for an introduction, said Aramis, eyes front, demeanor hardening. Her camaraderie ebbed and flowed like a tap. Who? The door in the side of the slate-grey chimera opened, and a soldier in bulky carapace stepped out. The man was built like a barricade, his stim-bulked physique intimidating. The hell gun across his chest looked custom-made, targeter, autoloader, oversized power pack. The black-on-black -black stock matched the soldier's armor. Also black was the badge in the middle, a clenched fist surrounded by barbed wire. He couldn't see the man's face. It was concealed behind dark green eye lenses, and the black rebreather mask attached to his helmet. A head taller and considerably wider than the sergeant, he practically radiated aggression. Hauptmann recognized a tempestuous scion when he saw one. No one had told him in the briefing that the column was traveling with stormtroopers. A second scion joined the first, the two like carbon copies straight off the factorum conveyor belt, brimming with testosterone. Why, the general, of course, answered Aramis. 
She stopped, snapped her heels together, and held a salute. Hauptmann felt lost, but flicked out the kickstand so at least he didn't have to hold up the weighty Volpe for whatever came next. I'm not sure I'm dressed appropriately for meeting, he began to say. Nonsense, Sergeant Hauptmann, said a man emerging from the shadows of the Chimera's hold. You are perfectly attired. He wore a finely pressed Volponi uniform, his epaulettes strung with gold chain, a line of medals pinned to his breast. Lean of frame, he filled his tailored jacket and trousers well. Orange piping ran up the legs, discreet, tasteful. High boots reached almost to his knees, and they were polished to a mirror sheen. A veteran officer, his gilt-threaded cap proclaimed as much. A silver Volponi badge was pinned to the middle, a golden griffin rampant. His weapons were ornate, doubtless artisanal and vanishingly rare. A dark red cloak hung nonchalantly across one shoulder. It was cinched to a silver guard fashioned into the face of a snarling lion. His cheekbones were finely cut, and there was evidence of rejuvenate in the false tightening of his skin. He had a rich pallor, his short hair turning to charcoal from lustrous black. His moustache was trimmed and oiled, but it was the eyes that told his story, the wisdom and experience, the vibrancy of a younger man still in his prime, despite the older body he found himself in. Brigadier de Vere's, said the man, as if he could be anyone other. I understand we owe you a debt. He didn't offer his hand to shake, which Hauptmann was profoundly grateful of as he crafted a hasty salute. Forgive my disheveled appearance, sir, he blathered. I did not expect, I thought that... De Vere's tapped his nose, an amused glint in his eye as if he and Hauptmann were sharing a private joke. Kept it all rather close to the chest, Sergeant. If the enemy knew I was in transit, well, they might have really had a go at us. I warrant even your men, as capable as they obviously are, would have struggled to fend off that attack. Indeed, sir. Hauptmann tried to recover, but found himself a little starstruck. Orator Donesque de Viers, of the Renhalt de Viers, sixteenth generation of the royal house of Bizamund. For pony aristocracy did not get much higher. Hauptmann knew de Viers only by reputation. All the men fighting on Nostis had heard of the brigadier general and seen his grand orations on the propaganda reels issued by the commissariat prefectus. He had led the reconquest of the Northern Isles, a daring amphibian assault on Arca Beach, and had pushed back the Arcanate occupation of Serdberg during the Baskian Peninsula conflict, victories that had led to a significant imperial foothold on Nostis. To have brought in De Viers from the Western Front suggested Agria was more important than Hauptmann had realized. But as he had said to Captain Aramis, he didn't know much about that. The general's reputation as a philanderer was also well known, but much less publicized. The bastards he had sired could make up a platoon, or so the joke went. Regarding the easy manner, the vim and vigor in the general's eyes, Hauptmann could well believe it. It was in sharp contrast to the cold aggression radiating off the pair of scions who stood two steps behind him. The crusade needs men like you, Hauptmann, said de Viers, with genuine bonhomie. You are a credit to your regiment. Who is your commanding officer? Colonel Ganser, sir. Ah, yes. De Viers replied, as if mentally grasping the image of the man from some compartment of his mind. Tank commander, a fine officer, the armored push at Beltane. Yes, sir, that's right, sir. Were you deployed during that conflict too, sergeant? 
I was, sir. We ran supplies for the medics. De Vere's was nodding, but his mind was shifting to other matters, and Hauptmann could tell their conversation was drawing to a close. I shall recommend you be decorated, Hauptmann, in recognition of your valor. Hauptmann was slightly agog. The Volponi gave out medals like they were ration tins. I was merely doing my duty, sir. Nonsense, Sergeant, de Vere's cut in briskly. A medal will look fetching on your uniform at the next officer's dinner. Hauptmann didn't have the heart or the gall to tell the general that sergeants didn't attend the officer's dinner and that he kept his battle honors in a box at the bottom of his kit bag. Instead, he gave a shallow bow. I am honored, sir. He was about to step forwards to shake the general's hand out of appreciation when Hauptmann felt a hand like a hunk of iron against his chest, and the barricade of a scion was suddenly in front of him. He had to suppress the instinct to reach for his sidearm. Such was the level of aggression on display. De Vere's didn't see any of it. He had already turned and was heading back to the Chimera. A credit to your regiment, Sergeant, he said. See that Hauptmann gets whatever he needs, Captain Aramis, he added, before disappearing into the shadows. It was the first and only time he had acknowledged her during the entire exchange. The tension lingered in the air for a short while as the scions re-embarked, and Aramis steered Hauptmann away to another part of the column. I think he likes you, said Aramis once they were well out of earshot. Her face creased a little with a wry smile. Hauptmann barely took it in. He was still reeling. I wouldn't know. He glanced back at the gray chimera. And the bodyguards? Who are they? Look like scions. Aramis stared ahead, a tiny vein standing out on her left temple. They're called the First Sons, and yes, they're Militarum Tempestus. Not Volponi, then? Aramis gave a loud, mirthless laugh. Throne? No. You don't approve, Captain? Let us say that there is rivalry of a sort, and leave it at that. Of course, not exactly friendly, are they? You mean they are pugnacious bastards? Another smile, like sun glimpsed through parting cloud. I wouldn't have phrased it as eloquently as that, Captain, but yes, I agree that they seemed like assholes. Aramis laughed loudly. It was a good, rich laugh. They were headed to where the rest of the Rough Riders had gathered, the cavaliers checking and securing kit. Hauptmann noticed four of the bikes now carried an additional burden on the back, bound up in a corpse shroud. He'd need to write four letters later. De Vere's will honor his promise, said Aramis, without prompt. I'd never met him before, Hauptmann admitted. He has a certain presence. He is a remarkable man. Aramis replied, though it felt slightly forced, almost by rote. So then, sergeant, she said, smartly changing subject as they reached the lager of bikes. What is it I can do for you? She faced him, and Hauptmann was struck again by her unshrinking confidence. You would be in my utmost debt, captain, said Hauptmann, if we could borrow a little fuel. Aramis's smile turned as pleasant as a summer sunrise. It would be my genuine pleasure, sergeant. Hauptmann watched her leave to fulfill his request, and decided he'd need to visit a confessor as soon as he returned to camp. Chapter 4 Regara watched the officers slowly filing into the command room to take their seats. The building had once been a printing press, its original function usurped for military use. Most of the machinery it had once contained had been broken up and stripped for parts years ago, 
when the war on Nostes had first started. A few pieces remained, an old frame serving as a map table, the cylinders and wheels stacked out of the way until needed for some as yet unknown purpose. Vintage propaganda leaflets from earlier in the war littered the corners, covered in dust. They proclaimed swift victory for the Imperium, and issued a call to every able-bodied man and woman of Nostes to take up arms in the name of Makaroth and his Sabbat crusade. The ink had run in places. It was a hurried and defective batch that had been left unused. These days the faulty leaflets were deployed as latrine paper when the departmento stocks ran out. No one commented on this mildly blasphemous pragmatism. As well as the map on the table depicting the current conflict, a larger continental map summarizing the relative battalion positions across the southern, eastern, and western fronts had been pinned to the wall behind Regara. He kept the light low, apart from the sharper sodium lamp overhead, to focus attention. A servitor stenographer sat nearby, its cybernetic body hardwired into its pulpit. It had quills for fingers, and when it wrote, it looked like it was performing a piano concerto, not taking the minutes from a war briefing. As the last of the officers took their seats, Regara reviewed his notes via data slate. It was like experiencing a detailed memory shunt. Upon making planetfall on Nostes, the initial six weeks of the renewed campaign to take the largest of the southern isles, Agria, had gone well. Towns occupied by the Blood Pact had capitulated against imperial military might and the Volponi began to believe they would conquer the island and cleanse it of the arch-enemy in a matter of months, even under a year. But then came the collapse of the eastern flank and the siege of Beltane. Those two conflicts alone had accounted for two years of brutal fighting. Earlier victories were chalked up to a misapprehension of arcanate military strength. The Volponi thought that by sacking Thrake and retaking the airfields at Lanchatek, they had delivered a telling blow, when in fact they had been routing bands of skirmishers and petty tribal warlords. The further south the Imperium pressed, the more entrenched the enemy had become, and the greater his numbers and martial fortitude. It had caught the Volponi unprepared. It took months to make even small gains, with Ankishburg and its surrounding satellite towns the only foothold that had any permanence. Lawton had come next, and the construction of Godsword. It was conceived of as an advanced outpost, but enemy shelling had taken a toll upon it. Still, it was fortified and made reliable as a forward base. Two miles south of Lawton, and you met the Myerland, an unimaginatively named tract of dirt. It was a twenty-mile expanse, a hard slog through mud and slurry. The wastes were littered with packed outposts, some abandoned, others in a state of serious disrepair, judging by limited aerial reconnaissance, but petered out at Vigath's moor, a chasm a mile and a half wide at its narrowest point. Several bridges spanned this gulf, a jagged strip that ran four hundred miles from nose to tail, the largest of which was Ganad. Beyond that lay the province of Carcass and the old fortress of Rakespur, where a major Arcanate army was believed to be encamped. It was one of several abandoned sea forts that ran along Agria's western coast, Rakespur being the largest. This had been and still remained the imperial objective, to breach the nigh-on impenetrable carcass border wall, and then oust the archenemy from Rakespur. Regara had attended briefings concerned with experiments, the Imperial Intelligence Directive believed were being perpetrated in the old fortress. 
but they were little more than rumours at this point. With the attendees now present, Regara roused himself from his review and stepped up to the lectern. The hubbub in the room ebbed to silence. A Volponi majority made up the officer Carter, but there were other regiments represented. Pardas armoured, wearing tan fatigues, Orek rangers garbed in rural camo, Royal Sloka in their fine armour of enamelled silver and scarlet uniforms, ever the second-rate peacocks, Scruffy Talpa in whatever scraps and oddments they had scavenged or appropriated, and Agrians, of course, the conscripts in a mixture of flak armour, furs, and tribal gewgaws. Even after all this time, the natives looked ill at ease in the presence of bona fide imperial soldiers, but Regara couldn't do much about that, so he didn't try. Instead, he tapped the rune key on the vox amp in the lectern and addressed the men. General Voke has been relieved of duty. A furore rose amongst the gathered officers like a storm wind. Despite his recent errors in judgment, Voak still had admirers and allies. Several of them chafed at the decision and made their displeasure known. The Slocans were particularly vociferous. Others, Captain Schiller amongst them, knew better. That Amadeus Voak had died by his own hand, rather than suffer the shame of demotion and court-martial. The regimental commissar, Ithor, was absent. He would be dealing with the body, ensuring its removal and passage back to Volponi. For now, Regara was on his own. The major brooked no dissent. His strident voice would have carried even without Vox amplification. And in his stead, command is mine until his replacement is with us. The unhappy officers simmered a little, their discontent fading to a dull murmur that Regara quashed as he went on. We have suffered, he said, regarding the proud but war-weary soldiers. Several carried injuries. One lieutenant had walked in on crutches. A few had bandages peeking out from under their uniforms. The defeat at Loddon and the double loss of God's sword are difficult to take. He paused, his words carrying to every ear. Stern, impassive faces met his own. Regara was merely stating facts to establish continuity. But take it, we must. This is war. Our duty demands it of us. And so it shall be. He let silence fill the room, took it as an opportunity to meet eyes with every man and woman present. When he was satisfied, Regara commenced the briefing proper. Reinforcements are inbound from the Western Front, and we are grateful to have them. The majority of these recruits will be with us within days, so billets will get cramped and we'll need more temporary shelters setting up for the new intake. A few displeased mutterings greeted this announcement, but Regara stamped them out swiftly. Endure it. We won't be here for much longer. Now, for strategic disposition, the Major tapped another rune key on the lectern, prompting the map on the table to activate and deform into a contoured Tri-D image. Our forces are split across three settlements, Lager and Vasha to the west and south, respectively, and the majority here in Ankishburg. He tapped a third key, and part of the map illuminated, depicting the position of Godsword. A red field radiated from it, denoting range. It came within a few miles of the three settlements. Based on the loss of the guns and their effective range, a second push towards Loddon is untenable. The announcement was met with disapproval, as soldiers worn down by defeat and fatigue felt their chance to exact vengeance stripped away from them. A few raised their voices, 
Regara noticed Captain Schiller in the throng, rabble-rousing, loud from the drink again. I should have you on charges, you loutish bastard. And in the meantime, asked Hercule Ganza. The dark-skinned Pardus colonel removed his cap when speaking, tucking it behind his back as he stood proudly. His barrel chest stuck out, sturdy and round as a tire from a cargo tractor. Are we expected to lick our wounds and wait? I have four brigades dawdling in the mud, Major, slowly going to rust. Should I just let them? How many engines did you lose during the retreat, Colonel? Rigara quickly held up a hand to ward off a disgruntled protest. I ask sincerely without offence intended. Ganza smoothed his thick, mousy moustache. As he reached for the answer, it was high. Not four brigades, but still high. And that was just from their bombers, without God's sword to ward them. We may have successfully cancelled out the former, but what of the latter? He turned his attention to a robed figure, a red wraith at the edge of the gathering, loitering like an uninvited guest at a feast. Magos, Regara intoned, please calculate for us how many more engines we would lose against our own macro cannon battery. The wraith shifted in its red robes, Rivulets of bloody silk rolling to the hem as it moved. Limbs writhed beneath, metallic and whirring. Its hunched back suggested further appendages concealed beneath oil-stained material. A lens flare of deepest green illuminated the inner darkness of the hood. Pale, corpse-like flesh was revealed, puckered with steel and iron. The voice that came from within sounded inhuman, a mechanized death rasp. Tenfold, it uttered coldly, and ice cooled the temper of every man and woman who heard it. Tenfold, Regara repeated. Have them dawdle in the mud, Colonel, rusting or no. Ganza retook his seat. We cannot make a direct assault. Not while the enemy hold our keenest weapon and turn it to their own ends. It's a simple and brutal calculus, for which any act of bravura cannot compensate. We could send a small force to the Loddon outskirts, suggested Captain Brandreth, a milk-skinned Volponi officer who had more piss than vinegar in his blood. He had fair, thinning hair combed over his balding pate out of vanity, and an ugly scar up the left side of his face from early on in the war. Infiltrate with scouts, set up a watch post in one of the old farms, observe and measure. Observe and measure. That was Archibald Brandreth's mantra. All he ever wanted to do was wait and watch. He carried an antique chrono on a gold chain and was ever consulting it, in lieu of actually doing something. Several amongst the officer Carda thought he had lost his courage. Regara agreed with them. The enemy will have set up their own forward scouts by now, said Regara. I won't risk an advance force, only to have it captured or killed. And we've seen what happens to soldiers the blood pact take alive. They had, and the memories weren't pleasant ones. How many men come from Lunch Itik? asked one of the Agrians. He pronounced the word Lankitik and had a thick accent, but his low Gothic was good. A hetman officer, judging by the talks on his dusky arms and the silver ingots in his long beard. It looked like one was missing. He had a group of Agrian Cossacks around him, sub-officers. We have been promised significant numbers from the Western Front, said Regara. This is how seriously the Lord Militant ranks the Agria conflict. Carcass must be breached and Rakespur taken. And from there the rest of the Southern Isles will fall. Makaroth demands it. 
These last words rang hollow, even to Regara. They hadn't heard from the War Master in years, and Lord Militant Eirik, who was in overall operational command of the Second Crusade Front, had sent barely two missives during the last half-decade of the war. The Sabbat worlds were burning, and even the officer class had its hands full, trying to douse the flames. Have we received any word from Lord Militant Eirik or his staff? asked a captain in the hunting garb of the Orek Rangers. He was oak-skinned and athletic, with a bald head like a polished knob of wood. Regara recognized him as Kobel Ombi, a fine soldier, if a little idealized. He liked the man, but groaned inwardly at the question, as if his own misgivings had summoned it from the other officer's mouth. None recently, but the Lord Militant has capable generals in the field, and Nostes represents an important objective to the campaign, as does our part in achieving that objective. But how many exactly? the Agrian interjected. Captain Omby scowled at the interruption, but the native had an insouciant air about him, almost lounging in his seat, and carried on regardless. Do we know numbers, disposition, anything? We know they are coming. Regara answered honestly, and we must be ready as soon as they arrive. Now, I believe this is the best and most viable approach. He lit another part of the map, a town several miles southeast of the current war zone. Kobor is currently under packed occupation. Deemed of secondary tactical importance, it is ruled over by a petty tribal warlord, no death brigades. It also lies outside the range of Godsword. And this mountain chain here, leading out of the town, he identified it with a Laz stylus, will offer cover for a flanking maneuver that will circumvent Myerland and hit east of Carcass. Now, strategic analysis. Have at it. That's a three-day march through a red zone, Major said Lieutenant Kulkis, his grey eyes narrowing as they took in the map. Are we sufficiently equipped? Munitorum stores are low, but we can manage, Regara replied. We can skirt the Rad Zone and stay clear of Godsword through a narrow cordon. Again, he deployed the last stylus to illustrate. That would string us out, Major, said Schiller. A column that long will be vulnerable to attack. Security will be a challenge. One we shall rise to, Captain. The Cavaliers are able outriders, and more than qualified for the task. He inclined his head to Ganza, who replied with an appreciatory nod. And it poses significantly less risk than marching on Lawton. Regara let the officers have their head. It kept their minds on the task and away from the recent defeat. He invited challenge and wanted agreement, not blind obedience from his officers. Better to be shrewdly politic than ruthlessly authoritarian. He needed them to see the validity of the plan. An easterly approach on carcass, offered Lieutenant Fenk, Assuming we bridge Vigath successfully means we'll have to push through most of the adjacent region before we hit the border wall. That's a lot of ground to take, sir. Bloody work. He said it without emotion, his dark eyes cold, as if he were discussing stacking munitions rather than killing men. It wasn't a concern for Fenk, just a fact. He excelled. At bloody work. It's what made him such a valuable officer in the field. By then we'll be adequately reinforced, Regara countered. It's a hard route, but a necessary one. A direct push south is beyond dangerous. With the guns in enemy hands, it's that simple. Yes, uttered the Agrian officer again, still not placated. 
Regara wished he could remember his name, but the natives were hard to distinguish. This word, simple, I have heard it used several times during this campaign. War is never simple, Regara replied. No, not for us, Major. Agria is our home. You come, you fight, and when you leave, we will remain. Most of the officers here haven't seen their homes in over five years, Hetman. Many of them a lot longer than that. Ah, but you have homes to return to. What will we have but the ruins of our towns and cities, the graves of our dead in their thousands? The hetman sat up in his chair, leaning forward. We were promised swift liberation, but instead you have delivered death and disrespect. He sneered, scars creasing his face like cracked leather. You royals seek glory. You worship flags of triumph, trumpets and parades. I have only this. He held a fistful of soil that he slowly let drain, like sand through an hourglass to the floor. The earth of my land, and it cries out in pain and anger, as do my people. They had planned this, Regara realized. It was a statement of discontent. Things were worse with the Agrians than he had thought. I ask for patience and forbearance, he said. Our ways are not so dissimilar. If we remain committed, we can... I see the way you regard us as lesser men. And some see us not as men at all. You believe because we dig the dirt that we are dirt. No, Major, said the hetman, shaking his head. We are not similar, not at all. He threw down the rest of the soil, and it hissed as it struck the ground. He and his men got to their feet, chairs scraping loudly. A few of the Volponi and Slocan officers began to object, also rising. Regara sat them back down with a gesture. Patience is like grain, Major, declared the hetman. If you waste it, you will have no more crops and your tribe will die. He turned, and the Agrian delegation made to leave. Tulkis had taken a seat at the edge of the room and got up to stand in the hetman's way. He looked calm, but Regara saw the coiled aggression in his posture. You'll leave when dismissed. The Agrian leaned into the lieutenant, his voice low and threatening. If you wish for me to break you, I will. Kulkis ignored him and looked to Regara, who gave a furtive shake of the head. The lieutenant stepped aside, but didn't climb down from a state of readiness until the Agrians were gone. I think that's enough excitement for one briefing, Regara declared. He smiled at the gentle laughter, but saw no amusement in this. Three platoons from Shield Company will remain on guard duty in the town. Captain Schiller, see to it. Schiller gave a curt salute. As for the rest of you, patch up whatever platoons you can, and have them mustered and prepped. It's been a long three days, and an even longer night, so let's use what remains of it to get some rest. Longer days yet await us. Regara let his gaze roam around the room, studying the reaction of the other officers. It wasn't the news they wanted, but at least it represented forward momentum. We are not out of this fight, not nearly out of it. He made the sign of the Aquila, said, The Emperor protects, and heard it echoed back to him. That is all, officers. Thank you. That is all. As the gathering broke and the officers departed to their billets, Regara descended from the lectern. Catching Colchis's attention, he took the lieutenant to one side. I need you to do something for me, lieutenant. Of course, sir. 
Find the mill serf who saved my life. I would like to meet him. A reward, sir? Perhaps, or a position. I saw no household allegiance on his attire. Nor I, sir. Ask our the camp. He can't have gone far. Very good, Regara replied. And one other thing. Name it, sir. Have you upset the natives, Lieutenant Kulkis? The way that hetman looked at you, that depth of enmity, doesn't just happen. It's earned. A minor altercation, sir. Nothing serious. We need the Agrians on side, Kulkis, for the sheer numbers, if nothing else. And find out that hetman's name. If we're to achieve any kind of unity after this, then we'll need to start with him. Chapter 5 Fenk left the gathering with the others. They departed into the camp in dribs and drabs, the officers who had become friends over the years of the war, sharing a joke or remark until they reached the billets of their own companies and platoons. Fenk took part, as convention dictated, smiling when he was required to smile, laughing at all the right moments. The Volponi mainly kept to their own, but a few had made bonds with officers from other regiments. Ever since the retreat, the Blue Bloods had been forced into cohabitation with the Auxiliaries, into close proximity with regiments they believed less professional, less effective than their own. Most were disdainful of anyone who wasn't blue blood. Such arrogance. Fenk played his role. It suited him. In truth, he didn't care about status, about legacy and lineage. These trappings were falsehoods that hid a man's true instincts. But these instincts drove Fenk. They had once appalled him, but he had come to live with them, for he could no more cast them off than he could willingly shear off his own arm. They were part of him. But he had mastered them, in a way. As Fenk peeled away from the slowly dispersing throng of officers, he found himself drawn back to the quarter and the hawker's market. He had been there for a while when Kulkis had shown up earlier that evening, even preceding his men and their ill-fated card game. Fenk had no time for gambling. It didn't interest him. He had spent most of his adult life limiting risk. It wasn't overstating it to say his life depended on it. Night had come to the quarter, and though fires blazed and sodium lamps flickered, the shadows pooled like inkwells, and brought a certain anonymity. Fenk had a knack. He tended not to be noticed unless he wanted to be. Another mask. He wore several, depending on what was called for. He had cultivated a ruthless reputation on the battlefield, a useful half-truth. A killer lurked inside him, another self that, like a sleeper, sometimes awoke and fought for expression. Fenk gave it to him. He thought of this other Fenk as the Grey Host, a sort of faded version of himself to which he ceded temporary control. He could be sated, sent back to slumber, but only after he had gorged. The Grey Host stirred now. Fenk felt him in the itching of his fingers, the hypersensitivity of his skin. He bled through the crowds, the mood turning from commerce to revelry as the night wore on, and the libations flowed. A shadow, Fenk drew no attention or regard. He had donned a storm cloak to ward off the chill air. He seldom felt much of anything, cold or warm, but it served as a useful disguise. On he went into the bustling stalls, past the rowdy sing-song hubbub emanating from the Ursa. The tavern turned from melancholy to bawdy fatalism at night, when the natives filled it with the tinny strains of pipe organs, 
and their brazen ditties about voluptuous women and honest labor. The crowds thinned, reduced to passing drunks and melancholic soldiers weeping in the shadows where they thought no one would see them. Fenk passed them too, until he reached the end of the quarter entire. A ribbon of land separating one part of the encampment from the other, an unofficial turnpike that led to where the Agrians made their billets and pitched their tents. And Fenk sighed, the loudest sound he had made since being on his own, and felt the anticipation of the grey host steal upon him. Chapter 6 the shrine house teemed with the wounded, a flurry of grey-smocked medics moving amongst them. Despite its status as a hospital, it could not entirely shake off its previous incarnation. The statues of saints looked on with stony disregard from their alcoves. Priests murmured benedictions or last rites to dying men. The heady aroma of sweat and copper warred with the tallow from prayer candles and hung heavy like a shroud. Low light cast the dusty chamber in sickly yellow, its ornate arches a sharp contrast to the more functional surgical benches, rows of closely compacted bunks and bags of counterseptic hooked to intravenous poles. Trolleys that had once been used to ferry books and scrolls from the library were now heaped with blood-stained rags and clumps of sticky gauze. Spent transfusion bags gathered underfoot like deflated balloons. Med-grade servitors lumbered through the dingy passageways between bunks like tired undertakers, dispensing aerosolized sedative to keep the injured quiescent. Skull-faced cyber cherubim laced the air with holy water from aspergillums. It worked in a fashion, though those in the grip of fever would claw at the grey-fleshed servitors as they passed, desperate for relief, but receiving only the dead gaze of a lobotomized cyborganic. After the first day, Darian had become inured to the screaming. Such an inhuman sound when they screamed like that. It laid a man open, revealing his fears, his true metal. The anticipation of pain to come, or the reality of actual nerve-shredding agony as the scalpel cut or the soldering iron cauterized. Amputations were worst. The wet tear of flesh, the dry shriek of bone as it parted. The grunting of the corpsman as he did his best to make the cut quick and neat with a ruddy saw. It was not like sawing timber for the trench spikes or revetments. Timber didn't spasm when it was cut. It didn't scream. Then there was the hiss as the stump was sealed. The stench of iron-rich blood like hot metal in the nose. A cook preparing a steak, fat sizzling in the pan. Darian held the trooper down, pushing hard on the man's chest, and tried not to picture that stake as he closed his eyes. He couldn't stop from salivating and almost threw up. The lie dissipated the moment he opened his eyes to the sight of the wide-eyed man thrashing against the bench. The skin was charred where the stump of the trooper's arm ended. A Volponi private torn up by shrapnel and only half alive, Gangrene had set in, leaving the medic no choice. Lena held his hand, the one he still possessed, whispering soothing words in an effort to alleviate his pain. She appeared thin in the yellow light, and Darian wondered if she was getting enough food. And then the trooper grew still as the hypodermic punctured his arm, pumping him with morphia. Lena released her hand a moment later. Darian saw it was blanched from the injured trooper's grip. She looked pained, but hid it behind a weary smile. That's it, said the medic, wiping his brow with his wrist, his hands still swaddled in blood-smeared synth rubber. That's it, 
he repeated, standing back and releasing a sigh of relief. He's under. Will he live? asked Darian. A shade lay on the bench in place of the man it had been, bleached of color, its breathing shallow. The medic had begun removing his gloves, the thin material snapping loudly as he pulled it off his skin. He has a better chance now than he did an hour ago. He regarded the mill serves kindly. You did well here. A man still lives because of you. I only held him, that's all, Darian replied. And what a fierce mess it would have been had you not. The medic, Morgan, washed his hands in a basin. The water foamed with counterseptic scrub. But there's more to be done, he said, shaking his hands of any excess and donning a fresh pair of gloves. Come on. He led them off down one of the passageways between bunks, towards the sound of screaming. Rodri Morgan was of the Slocan contingent. Stockily built with a strong jaw and short dark hair, he wore a red uniform under his smock, with a stylized caduceus on the left arm. A belt around his waist contained pouches for morphia files and other farmer. He wore a sergeant's rank, but had been a civilian medic who had signed on as a conscript and now found himself in the field, patching up broken bodies. Here, this one, he said, the mill serves hurrying to keep up. Every decision in the shrine house was an act of ruthless triage, the medics exhausted but bravely pushing through. The next injured soldier was a talper, a scrawny wretch of a man with more dirt than skin, it seemed. A piece of shrapnel jutted from his leg and he was keening like a madman. Tie off that bleed, Morgan instructed with calm assertion. Make sure it's above the wound, tight as you can. Lena found a strip of rubber hose, passing it to Darian so he could make the tourniquet. Good, good. Now, Morgan gripped one edge of the piece of shrapnel and glanced at Lena. A piece of cloth, a stick. We don't want him biting off his own tongue. Lena looked around, before the talper, in a rare moment of cogency, tapped his belt. That'll work, said Morgan. Lena nodded, unhooking the belt, before folding it onto itself. She mimed for the talper to open his mouth wide, which he did. Then he bit down on the dusty leather as Lena fed it to him. The talper's eyes were roaming again, rolling back and forth in agony. Here, soldier. More firmly from the medic this time. He tapped the side of his head when he got the talper's attention. My eyes, right here. The talper nodded weakly, tears streaming down his face. Morgan reasserted his grip on the piece of shrapnel. Darian, he said. Understanding what was needed of him, Darian gripped the other edge of the piece of shrapnel. The talper let out a muffled squeal through the belt clenched between his teeth. Keep it steady, Morgan warned. Don't jerk it. Now, on my count, you and I will pull. One hard pull up and out, all right? Darian nodded his eyes intent on the talper, who looked like the nine devils were at his heels. Lena was on standby with medical wadding for the blood. Ready, Darian? Morgan asked. Ready? Morgan gave the count and they pulled as one. The shrapnel came out smooth, leaving a gash like a red smile in the talper's leg. The man screamed, spitting out the belt and lashing out in agony. His flailing arm struck Lena across the face, knocking her back and into the path of a Volponi officer. She squeaked as Captain Schiller seized her wrist, his grip like a man-trap. Darian was preoccupied with holding on to the injured trooper as Morgan hurriedly stuffed the wound with wadding and then gave the man a morphia shot. It left Lena on her own. Dig snarled Schiller, his icy gaze on the millserve squirming in his grasp. How dare you accost an officer in such a manner? He yanked her around so she faced him, a scolded child hung up for punishment. Look at my boots. 
ruddy-cheeked and red-haired. His head was like a flame, burning on alcohol and anger. Lena turned her eyes down to Schiller's blood-flecked boots. Her eye was already bruising from where the trooper had struck her. Please, sir, I meant... Be quiet, snapped Schiller, forcing her attention back on him. You'll speak when I give you permission. Let her go, murmured Darian. Schiller took in the scene before him. What's that? Morgan stepped forwards. Darian felt his face burn and his fists clench behind the medic. He wanted to hurt Schiller, hurt him like he was hurting Lena. It didn't matter that it would mean his death. In that moment, all that mattered was the anger threatening to boil over. They're assisting me, Captain, said Morgan. Schiller held the medic's gaze for a few seconds, weighing up what to do next. He released Lena, who fell into a heap and immediately clutched at her red wrist. Schiller was a large man, stoutly built and easily three times her size. A bully. I have three men in S.H.I.E.L.D. Company who need patching up for duty. It's a matter of priority. Of course, Captain. I will just finish up and then... Immediately, Schiller interrupted. Morgan's expression was implacable. I will finish up here and then attend to your men. Schiller cocked his head a bemused look on his face, as if he couldn't believe what he was hearing, and therefore must not be hearing it at all. I am giving you an order, Sergeant. In this place, Captain Schiller, I have complete authority. According to the charter given to me by Major Regara, I make the final determination as to whom I attend to and when. He pointed at the Talpa lying insensate on the bench, this man has had a piece of shrapnel jutting from his body for three days and will almost certainly die if I do not clean and stitch his wound promptly. You are at liberty to stay and watch. Now, if you don't mind... Morgan went back to his patient. Schiller was stock still, his flaring nostrils the only indication that he had not in fact somehow died standing up. A vein corded his neck, and eventually he growled, See it done quickly. Then he made a sharp about face and stalked away. Darian watched him depart, watched every step. His jaw cracked. He felt a cool touch on his arm, looked down, and saw Lena. It's all right, she said. I have balm in my medikit for that eye said Morgan, and started rooting around in a satchel on the floor. I want to kill him, Darian hissed between his teeth, still glaring at the captain's wake. Bloody Schiller, that bastard. Lena gently touched his cheek, brought his face around to hers. Don't say that out loud again, she told him, deadly serious. Never. Promise me now that you won't. Darian hesitated, then, reluctantly, he nodded. Chapter 7 Kulkis had been heading away from the Shrine House when he heard the shot, a single, solitary report, as loud as a siren in the late hour of the night, large caliber, explosive. He knew of only one round that made a racket like that, bolt shell. Come with me, he ordered the mill serve, who nodded, eyes a little wider, a little more alert. I want to keep an eye on you. The Major will have to wait a little longer for this audience. Kulkis broke into a run, not too fast, as he had no desire to cause an unnecessary commotion, but he wanted to reach the source of that shot sooner rather than later. Other soldiers had heard it too emerging from tents and billets. A few had armed themselves and made for the gunshot. At least the bell tower wasn't ringing. None of the sentries had triggered any sort of alarm. That was something. He caught sight of Grice and Hanmar, outside their billet having a smoke, and gestured them over. You two, follow. 
What is it, sir? asked Grice, rushing to stub out his tabac as he adjusted his lopsided helmet and cracked his trunk of a neck. Hanma was busily doing up the buttons on his uniform jacket as he ran to catch up. On attack, Grice fired a glance back at the billet where he had presumably left his lasgun in the platoon armory. Should we go back for our rifles, Lieutenant? asked Hanma, following Grice's gaze and the meaning in it. Colchis noted he still had his sword. It's not an attack, snapped Colchis, and added more quietly, at least I don't think it is. He jerked a thumb at the mill serve. Taking Regara's advice, he'd learned the lad's name was Darian. Keep an eye on him. He should have told him to get gone, but it had taken Colchis most of the evening to find him. He didn't want to have to do that all over again. Blind luck that it found the lad coming out of the shrine house with a pile of bandages for cleansing. Regara wanted an audience. The sooner that happened, the sooner Kulkis could get to his bunk and maybe catch a few hours sleep. Perhaps he could parlay this favor into an hour in the steam house. Then he reached the cause of the commotion and all his thoughts of rest and steam houses vanished. They had stopped just outside the hawker's market, right on the threshold of the Ursa. A few of the tavern patrons had drunkenly wandered outside to look at the throng of furious Agrians who had gathered out front. Drum fires and hefted braziers lit shadowed, angry faces. Several carried weapons, but no one had drawn, not yet. Another throng of soldiers opposed them, some in the garb of the Slokans and the Orek, nervously fingering their sidearms, but most wearing Volponi Grey, a look of stoic aggression in their eyes. A few had sodium lanterns and stab lights. Kulkis counted around thirty or so on each side, with more gathering by the moment, himself and his men included. A narrow strip of empty campground stood between them, about twenty feet, and the dam holding back this burgeoning flood of violence was a woman in a black leather coat. She held a silver-chased bolt pistol above her head, smoke still escaping in a lazy plume from its barrel. The skull on her black cap marked her out as Prefectus, a commissar. Not one that Colchis knew. He had met Ithor on several occasions, a lithe, attenuated man who smoked profusely and had the emaciated features to show for it. Grey and ancient was Commissar Ithor, like a corpse exhumed from a grave. This one was much younger, stronger, and female, of course, a stormtrooper in the form of a prefectus officer, barely keeping her righteous anger in check. Her coat flared, the inner lining red as the dawn, revealing the hilt of a finely crafted sword. Kulkis assumed it was a chain blade, judging by the telltale machinery in the handle. An angry shout came from a long-bearded Agrian at the heart of the mob, thickly built and hirsute like most of his kind. He wore a hardy-looking officer's coat, tanned to match his brethren, and his scalp was shaved the veins standing out like tributaries that wound through the old dark inks of tattoos. This is perfidy here. They liked old words, did the Agrians. It spoke to their rustic roots and traditions. So did lynching. The commissar's retort was firm. You shall disperse, and a trial shall be convened if deemed necessary. Colchis noted she didn't lower her bolt pistol, he reached the edge of the crowd and started to work his way inwards. A man lies dead, replied the Agrian, murdered while he took rest. Slowly, the camp was awaking to this furore, soldiers drawn to it like metal filings to a magnet. It served only to inflame as the Agrian saw their mob grow too. Something or someone was shuffling to the front, but through the increasing press of bodies, Kulkis couldn't see exactly what or who. 
not liking where this was headed. He looked over his shoulder at Grace. Get him out of here, he referred to Darian, who was trying to get a better look at what was going on. Then they breached the front rank of the Agrian contingent, and Kulkis knew this was bad. The Hetman, the one Regara had asked him to find out the name of, the same Hetman whom he had been forced to restrain a few hours earlier, was dead. A band of Agrian soldiers, the four Cossacks from the briefing inferred Astrakhans, gently laid him down on the ground like a sacred offering. His dead eyes looked like pale moons, the wound around his neck an angry red cord. Look at your marks. It wasn't the first time Kulkis had seen the effects of strangulation. He also noticed that another one of the ingots was missing. We demand recompense for Uzra, said the long-bearded Agrian. Several of his cohorts chimed in with their agreement. Only the Cossacks remained still and silent, which was more disconcerting than the more obvious displays of aggression. Desist, repeated the now somewhat beleaguered commissar, very literally sticking to her guns as her eyes darted from one native to the next. For emphasis, she lowered the bolt pistol. Even with a full clip, she only had nine rounds left. Nine rounds would make a mess, but it wouldn't stop a mob. Not this mob. Not in such ferment. Kulkis thought of dogs, barely at the leash, barking and snapping, but he quickly realized it wasn't as wild as that, as primal. It spoke of rage, of a deep and inconsolable hurt, only salved by the proverbial eye for an eye, but also measure and the need for restitution. That meant it could be salvaged, but only if that damn commissar put down her gun. An attack against the Prefectus is an attack against the Emperor himself, she warned, eyes wide. Now here was an attack dog, jack-booted and clad in raven-black leather, the urge to exercise authority like a drug, and her the addict. Not thinking about the identity of the dead man for a moment, Kulkis pushed his way to the front of the throng, quietly berating the Volponi he passed and telling them in no uncertain terms to return to their billets. A few complied, many others didn't. He saw no help in the masses, no sign of Schiller or Fink, that bastard. He thought he caught a glimpse of Brandreth pocketing his antique chrono, but the captain quickly melted away in the crowd, no doubt content to observe and measure the damned coward. Kulkis hadn't considered what he'd say. He'd never had to talk down a commissar before, and hoped the experience wouldn't end in his summary execution. But the need to act and prevent something worse impressed itself upon him. One of the Cossacks had turned his way, and he saw something sharpen in the man's eye. Kulkis was just about to open his mouth to interject between hurled threats and invective when the words stopped in his mouth and he breathed a sigh of relief. Enough! Regara's voice rang like a clarion, clear as ice glass, the natural orator in him coming to the fore. The crowd of Volponi and assorted auxilia parted to admit the major, his cybernetic tread whirring and grinding as if in empathetic annoyance. He slowed as he emerged from the masses, a second man accompanying him but content to remain in his wake, also a physio prefectus, also not Ithor. This one was slight of frame, a long dark shadow in his storm coat, his features angular and sharp. Colchis was put in mind of a bird of prey in human form. Green eyes glittered from beneath the shadow of his cap. The gold piping suggested a high rank, yet he gave the major the floor. I say enough! Regara approached the young belligerent commissar, who now had to split her focus between the aggressors to the front and her superior officers behind. I have this under control, Major, she said, looking askance at Regara. 
Lower your weapon, Commissar. The Commissariat does not observe the Militarum chain of command. It is its own separate entity and has specific charter. Ganika, the other Commissar's voice held a warning, like a master chiding an errant servant. It had a slightly lilting quality, smooth and urbane. Stop quoting the charter and holster your weapon. The order was calm, composed, as if the one issuing it was possessed of the confident predetermination that events would transpire as he willed them. The young commissar did as she was told, and straightened her coat afterwards in an effort to save some face. Lord Rensaint, she said, and went to stand by her lord. Better, said Regara, and turned his gaze to the corpse lying on the ground. This is a matter of utmost severity, and I assure you, he added, looking the long-bearded Agrian in the eye, it shall be treated thusly, but not here, not like this. There are procedures. We have no interest in your procedures. We demand... Regara cut the native off before he could go further. And these procedures shall be observed. When you joined the Imperial Army as conscripts, you swore an oath to abide by the Lex Militarum. Your governance as Imperial citizens also binds you to the Emperor's law. Regara raised his chin a little, imperious as any Volponi blue blood when he wanted to be. He stated simply, do you renege on these oaths? Another voice from the throng answered, lighter, wise, and female. We shall abide, Major, she said, pushing past her kin. She was an older woman in her middle years, but handsome with a proud bearing. Her long hair was honey brown, her temples shaved, the remainder a tufty crest. She did not, Colchis noted, have a beard. She did wear Agrian torques on her arms, and the ingots tied to a single dangling braid clinked together as she tilted her head. Though do not mistake our patience for placation. Shorter than most of the other Agrians, she had a dancer's poise and physique. She accented her rural garb with munitorum fatigues and flak body armor, as several of the other natives had. Her thick boots were loosely laced. The leather tongues peeled over the vamp. Her rank pin made her a Golova, the equivalent of an imperial colonel. It had no bearing on her position in the greater imperial war host, however. A massive Agrian warrior, a protective detail perhaps, stood in her wake, massive arms folded. Uzra was hetman for his clan, she went on, and also the United Agrian Fellowship's liaison for military matters. His position is esteemed amongst our people, and so his unlawful death requires recompense. These are the words of Makali, and so they are spoken, they are written. Regara bristled at that, and the woman's superior tone. You threaten? I see no threat here, the Lord Commissar, Rensaint, cut in smoothly. Only a desire to balance the scales of order. He had advanced from his slightly refused position to stand more prominently. Is that not accurate, Gulliver Macaulay? She nodded, and raised her hands, the palms ingrained with the dirt of years of labor. They are merely my words and what is written. I speak only of what is right and just. Well then, said Wren Saint, his manner collegiate, and turned to the major. Regara stood a moment in silence, studying this Makali, and then the natives that obeyed her. Again, he was reminded of how little he knew of the Agrians, their ways and traditions. Even after all these years, 
he felt dumb and blind to their mores and motivations. He resolved to do better, though that might not matter now, what with Ren Saint's arrival and those whom he accompanied. I have your agreement to a cessation? Regara asked. She spat into her dirty palm and offered it to Regara, who raised an eyebrow. That isn't necessary. Makali shrugged, wiping her hand on her munitorum issue fatigues, and with a few shouted words disbanded the mob. That went well, said Ren Saint with a wry smile. Regara watched the Agrians depart, even as his officers chivied his own troops and the auxilia back to barracks. At least they didn't kill anyone, the commissar continued. Regara caught the look of the Cossacks as they retreated with their hetman's body, the coldness in their eyes like shard ice as they glared at someone in the crowd. Regara couldn't tell whom. Don't be so sure they won't, he said. Chapter 8 Grice kept his lasgun close, running the cloth over the barrel for the umpteenth time. He had his sleeves rolled up, his thickly muscled arms like Volponi red oaks. You can't polish accuracy into that rifle, sergeant, said Hanmar, digging around in the supply room for a bedroll. It was an old joke. Grice was actually a perfectly competent marksman, but he had once missed an enemy combatant at nearly point-blank, a misfire that skewed his shot and had never managed to live it down. He took the jibe with typical good humor. Bloody heathens, Grice muttered, having shown no sign of hearing Hanmar, but growing more agitated with every pass of the cloth. I don't trust them. You don't trust anyone, Hanmar found what he was looking for, and tucked the bedroll under his arm as he closed the door to the supply room. It's kept me alive and handsome so far, hasn't it? Grice said to the corpsman, with a little wink of the eye. Hanmar frowned. Second part's debatable. He tossed the bedroll to the mill serve loitering by the bunks. Grice was looking down his gun barrel. Sights a little off. Hanmar raised a white eyebrow questioningly, then turned his attention to Kulkis. You think they'll abide by their word, Lieutenant? he asked. They have so far, Kulkis replied. He was sitting down on a chair, taking in the view of the camp outside their billet window. The makeshift barracks had been a wool yard before the war. It had a vaulted ceiling and precious few rooms. A small overseer's office had been repurposed as a supply room and store for platoon kit. The old metal tool shed in one corner served as the armory. Other than that, the building contained a host of bunks, and glassless windows let out most of the warmth from electro stoves and heat lamps. The lieutenant's gaze drifted to the mill serve, Darian. After the major had left sharply with the two commissars, He'd had little choice but to bring him back to barracks until morning. He'd seen a convoy of Chimera armored carriers arriving at the camp's northern perimeter, right at the edge of town. Distant, but the plumes of blue petrochem were distinctive. Reinforcements. A sentry coming off watch duty by the name of Penrath had told him a motorcade of some thirty or so vehicles had arrived less than an hour prior to the altercation outside the Ursa. He didn't know who or what, but most of the livery was Volponi. Hauptmann had returned too, apparently, but Kolkis hadn't seen the Pardas, Sergeant Cavalier. He owed the man some money from their last game of covenants. "'I'm sorry to have missed the altercation with the diggers,' said Rake, poking around amongst some bottles, sitting on a table. Wasn't much to see, really, Grice chimed in. Rake carried on delving. What are you looking for, Corporal? snapped Colchis, the incessant tinkling irritating. Dresk answered. The brandy, sir, just a snifter to ward off the cold. What with us bunking in the ruddy goat pen? 
he gestured to the gaping windows. Sleeves rolled up, dress could dismantled, and was in the process of cleaning and reassembling the belt-fed heavy stubber. Ha! Rake declared triumphantly, bottle in hand. Colchis gave a small shake of the head. The Volponi were born to plenty. Every soldier in their ranks, even down to the lowliest private, had an aristocratic heritage. These men served and did so proudly for their families, for their lineage, for the emperor, of course. Three generations of blue blood preceded Colchis. His was a modest line compared to some, but carried esteem. He had aspirations of command greater than that of platoon. His father had been a major in the Volponi, a decorated soldier whom Colchis aspired to emulate and even overtake. Ambition, it was as natural to a blue blood as breathing. Regara was his mentor in many respects, and the man he hoped he would one day replace. Not all men of Volponi had such ambitions. Not all men of Volponi were of the aristocracy. It was a striated society, the landed gentry beneath the royals, and beneath them the vassals and then the peasants. Serfdom had its own hierarchy, but in war all the mill serves wore the same stripe. Sons and daughters willingly indentured by their impoverished, low-born families for a munitorium stipend. Others simply served the royal houses and accompanied its scions when they left for war. It was far from uncommon. Batmen, valets, even tailors had left aboard tithe ships for the great void, for the Sabbat crusade. Kulkis wondered at Darian's provenance as he watched the lad find a place for his bedroll. He served no royal household as far as the lieutenant knew. Perhaps his master had died and left him bereft, a camp wanderer. Darian, he said, trying to heed Regara's lessons about using the Millserve's name. The lad returned the lieutenant's gaze. Yes, my lord? Did you arrive here as part of the peasantry, or did you serve a royal house? Neither, my lord. I am a camp orphan. I see. Colchis thought on that, at what it must have been like to have lived your life amongst an army, never knowing a home or where you came from. So, you're part of the retinue, then? I've been for as long as I can remember, my lord. Learned a thing or two, have you? I tried, my lord, yes. Darian opened his mouth again as if to speak, but then shut it. Colchis noticed his hesitation. Speak, he said. You need not fear reprisal here. Unless you're about to blaspheme against the emperor, Rake cut in. Because then we'd have to. He drew a thumb across his throat in a slashing gesture. Colchis scowled, and Rake held up his hands contritely. I want to serve, said Darian his eyes on the lieutenant as serious as a perfectus firing squad. As you do, it's all I've ever wanted. I see. There are many ways to serve, Darian. The water carrier serves, the valet serves. All play their part, high-born and low. And yet I wish to fight and die if necessary. But you aren't an aristocrat, so you're not allowed? No, sir. It was the law of Falponi. To fight, to wield arms in the name of the emperor, was a noble calling meant for noble blood. Most did it for glory, to further their standing and that of their royal house, others for less salubrious reasons. It had always been thus, and so Colchis had accepted it. But now that he was confronted with a man willing to fight and die, not for glory, but for duty and that alone, well, a pity. But change was not an easy thing, he supposed. Colchis suddenly had an idea and gestured to Grice, who was still tinkering with his rifle. You know weapons? I've seen a few, my lord. Can you field strip a las gun? It's a duty I've performed before, a part of my service. Sergeant, 
said Colchis. Grice looked up, realized what was expected, and handed over the rifle. Best take care of that, he warned. Darian took it carefully, solemnly, Colchis watching, and then the others watching him keenly too. Rake cleared the bottles, making some room on the table. Here, he said, Darian obliged. Well then, invited Colchis. The barracks had begun to fill up as troopers returned to their bunks. Lights began to be doused. You're on the clock now, added the lieutenant. A murmured prayer to the weapon's machine spirit, and then swift hands went to work, unscrewing the barrel from the body casing, removing the holding lug to disengage the short stock. It happened in seconds, like a conjurer at a carnival. Darian sat back when he was finished, the pieces laid out precisely before him. Only the power pack was missing, because you didn't polish a las gun when it was loaded. Rake gave a whistle. Pretty fast. Colchis gave a facial shrug, but he was impressed. And reassembly? Nimble fingers snapped the stock to the casing, a thumb pushing in the holding lug, then screwed in the barrel. It was even quicker than the stripping back. Really bloody fast, said Dresk, who had stopped to observe the show. Impressive, uttered Hanmar, with a surprised but urbane smile. Grice took his rifle back as it was proffered to him. Then he peered down the barrel. Sight's perfect, he looked up, first at Darian, then at his comrades. Well, bloody hell, as chaps. And Colchis smiled. Well done, he said, nodding. Well done. You'd have made a damn fine soldier, I think. Pride burned in Darian's eyes. And something else. Kulkis couldn't quite put his finger on exactly what it was. Four men were waiting for him as Regara returned to his officer's billet. One of them he knew very well. The others he had never formally met but knew by reputation. Only one was seated, two others by his side, and a third lurking at the penumbra of the crackling fire. The men wore Volponi grey and were of rank, all except for the fourth man, who wore black tactical apparel. He also held a visored helm under his arm, a breather mask hanging loosely by its strap. He looked mission-ready, a tempestuous scion. It was warm, and the firelight cast the room in red and orange hues. It fell on books, several uniforms hanging on a wire frame, an antique desk with a map laid over it, held in place by an empty mug, a recaf gurgitator, phonogram, a simple bunk, and a godolka sitting in one corner, its polished strings shimmering. I hope you don't mind, Major, said the man sitting, none other than General de Vere's himself, Regara noted with a frisson of unease. But I had your man stoke the fire. Regara could see no sign of Barlis, and assumed he had already been dismissed. That and the entourage suggested this wasn't a social call. Welcome to Ankishburg, General, said Regara, and made a swift salute. Officers, he added for the benefit of the other men in the room. His gaze lingered on the black-armored scion edged in shadow, the only one not to return a greeting. Even de Vere's gave a nod of acknowledgement. Commissar Rensaint slipped in behind Regara, and the meeting commenced. A pity about Vilk, said the officer on de Vere's left, a colonel by the name of Grussman. He started to poke around the major's desk, prompting Regara to gesture to a bookcase. Behind the copy of Lord Solar, he said. Grussman, who was a solid sort of man with thinning blonde hair and perfect white teeth, pulled out the volume, appreciating the subject matter as he reached for the bottle of resk Regara kept for special occasions. Macarian conflicts, eh? Grossman remarked, finding a glass and filling it. He wore eyeglasses and squinted at the label on the bottle. 
De Vere's politely refused, as did Rensaint and the other officer. Regara had no idea if the scions even drank, but wasn't surprised when the stormtrooper didn't partake. Such an inspiration. And a warning about the dangers of the cult of personality, Ren Saint cut in. He struck up a thin-necked ivory pipe, the bowl embers glowing as he inhaled. His avian features sharpened. Regara wondered if that was also a jibe at Voke. He chose not to engage, letting this part of the shadow theatre play out before de Vere's decided to discuss what he had really come here for. Instead, he addressed the man on the general's right, a man he knew very well. Philip, the other man nodded. He had an athletic frame and carried a certain quiet air of refinement that suggested good breeding. His expression was warm and genuine. It's good to see you, Vasquez. Ah, of course, said de Vere's, clapping his hands together as a thin smile played out over his lips. You and Lieutenant Colonel Barbastian are old comrades, aren't you, Regara? We fought together at Grimoire, Barbastian replied, the shadow of a good memory briefly crossing his face. Parted ways just before Titus. Regara smiled, his eyes meeting Barbastian's and not disengaging. On to greater glories, Lieutenant Colonel. Indeed, Major. Indeed. De Vere's broke the spell. Well, isn't this a fine thing, old friends reuniting and new ones becoming properly acquainted? Grisman gave a tip of his glass. He was already sweating from the fire. Rensaint betrayed no discomfort, though his eyes narrowed. The scion merely stood, still as rock Crete and just as personable. I assume you wish for me to brief you on tactical operations, sir, said Regara, and was headed over to the map table when the general gestured for him to stand down. Not necessary, Major, I have been fully apprised, and I'm here to notify you of a change. He smiled again, that thin smile that could be charming when he wanted it to be. But Regara knew better. A change? De Vere's had left the bonhomie behind and was all business. I see, sir. Regara gave a furtive glance to Barbastian, but received nothing in return. You don't, Major, said De Vere's, and then more cordially, not yet. Grusman leaned on the antique desk, his weight causing the wood to creak. Regara bit back his annoyance, but filed the insult away for later analysis. Rensaint watched like a bird on its perch, clouds of pale violet smoke gently whirling around him in a translucent cloak. I concur with Colonel Grusman, said de Vere's. It is a great pity about Voke. An able officer, one would say, but prone to overreach. He turned his attention back to Regara. You had reservations, did you not, Major? They are a matter of record, sir. Indeed, indeed, said de Vere's. But he had already moved on to his own thoughts. He stood, spry for an old man, and started to pace. You are right to call out, Vogue. Had he listened to the counsel of his officers, he gave a facial shrug. Well, I might not be standing before you. That the man felt it appropriate to take his own life speaks to the depth of his error. Regara tried to hide his surprise. For such a short amount of time in camp, de Vere's was well informed. The general acted as if he had just commented on the weather as he went on. Godsword in enemy hands and our allies, the Agrians, in uproar. He stopped and turned to look at Regara with just the hint of amusement in his eyes. An eventful few days. Ren Saint paused in the smoking of his pipe to offer, The Major has the latter well in hand, General. The natives are restless but compliant. 
Regara gave a slight nod of appreciation, which the Lord Commissar reciprocated. Good, good, de Vere's replied. We'll need strong morale for what comes next. And here Regara sensed it, the change, the real reason they were all here. De Vere's had reviewed Regara's orders. Next, sir? Yes, said de Vere's and he stopped and braced his hands against Regara's desk. The retaking of Lawton, of course. Regara paled. He almost laughed, until he saw the utter seriousness in the general's face. He looked to Barbastian, but the man had averted his gaze. Grussman returned his glance, taking a sip of Regara's vresk as he measured the major's response to the news. Amongst allies... Regara suddenly felt alone and vulnerable. My plan was to press east, to Cobor. Revisions, Major, said de Vere's, after leaving a long enough uncomfortable silence. All plans must face revision. This isn't revision, it's suicide. The words came out unbidden, spilling away on torrents of emotion. Regara was happy to cede command, his charge had only ever been a temporary one. But to casually throw away the lives of the men he had fought to preserve. Watch your bloody tone, Major, rumbled Grossman from the back of the room. He stopped leaning and stood up straight. Regara gave him a half glance, unintimidated. He had dueled better men than Matthias Grossman. Those men were all dead, and he yet breathed. De Vere's wafted away the tension with a lazy gesture. Grossman returned to heel, leaning against the desk again. It's all right, it's all right. Major Regara is merely adjusting to the shock. Not so many days ago he was facing certain defeat with death breathing down his neck. Isn't that right, Major? He knew about the mill serve, saving Regara's life too. A camp had many spies, it seemed. Regara gave a small inclination of the head, said, I apologize, sir. A long few days, a difficult war. Isn't it just, Major? It is about to become easier. De Vere's sat back down, his cue to the scion in black to take the stage. The shadows around him had deepened as the fire waned in its hearth. He didn't move, but to part his lips and speak. A covert insertion force will enter Lawton in advance of the main army group, he began, his voice a gravelly half-rasp. Regara had heard its like before. Forty men with special equipment will infiltrate the enemy position, eliminate the guards and crew, and then neutralize the weapon with charges. You will accomplish what the Magos could not, and with forty men? There must be a hundred blood packs surrounding that thing, a thousand in Lawton. One hundred and twelve, the Scion corrected. He didn't comment on the Lawton numbers. Regara scoffed. Doesn't exactly invalidate my point. The point is, Major, de Vere's cut in gently, that we must have God's sword, or the enemy must not have it. Those are the only two outcomes I can permit. Respectfully, sir, the Pactors will fire the weapon as soon as they see our forces advance on the town. My men won't be seen, asserted the Scion. And how many to take the town and hold it? At least six companies. Can you conceal that many men? Regara asked this of the scion, who still hadn't identified himself. He didn't answer. You're right, Vasquez, said Barbastian. And all of a sudden Regara resented his familiarity. Which is why we'll need to divert the pact's attention elsewhere so the main army group can get into position. Regara felt his blood rising. You want to bait them? Barbastian nodded, 
A sizable flanking force will head east in the direction of Kobor as per your original strategy. I'm still waiting for the punchline. It's not a joke, Major, said Grossman, and Regara did not like the barely concealed relish in his tone one bit. The flanking group will deliberately stray into the weapon's range. Regara's fists bunched at his sides. War requires sacrifice, he said, voice barely louder than a whisper. Is that it? Don't be so dramatic, Major, said De Vere's, betraying the slightest iota of annoyance. We'll use armored carriers crewed by servitors. Barbastian was doing his best to be placatory. But not only servitors. Of course not. That weapon will devastate a mechanized group. Not if we silence it first. What's the attrition rate? asked Regara. I assume it's been calculated. Far less than if we were to attack Lawton directly, said Grossman. They will be threading the needle, said Regara, ignoring the colonel. The rad zone, the range of the guns, even to skirt the edge, it's a very narrow margin for error. It is worth the risk, Major, added Rensaint, the Lord Commissar looming in Regara's peripheral vision. As ever, his tone was diplomatic. Morale is delicately balanced. The men need a symbol. God's sword is that symbol, in our hands. Functional or not, but in our hands. Grossman snorted at the back, swilling down the last of his drink. Told you he wouldn't like it. I don't believe we've ever formally been introduced, sir, for you to make such an assumption of my character. Regara stated levelly, using the kind of formal language that preempted a challenge. He took a step forwards, his hand resting on the pommel of his sheathed sword. Now, now, said De Vere's. Let's not bicker, gentlemen, it's unseemly. Regara glanced at Barbastian for support, but received only a gentle, near imperceptible shake of the head. Let it go, it warned. I leave a missive of your orders in full, Major, added De Vere's, brandishing a scroll that he tapped on the table edge and then left there for Regara to read. He rose sharply, adjusting his uniform jacket, and waited for the major's salute, which was duly given. Revisions, Regara, he said again, wheels within wheels. You just focus on your spoke, and let me worry about the others, eh? He clapped him on the shoulder, the blow firmer than Regara expected, and left. Rensaint followed directly, as did Grossman, who had a thin smile for the Major as they parted company. The scion had already gone, slipped away into shadow without notice, which left only Philip. Regara felt his jaw tighten. Did you know? he asked stiffly. Of course I bloody knew. The vehemence of the response took Regara aback put his anger briefly in check. It's the glory, said Barbastian. It's always the damn glory. We are sending men to their deaths. Such is war. Other men will live because of it. They are unneeded deaths, Philip. Barbastian opened his mouth to rejoinder, but it quickly turned into a resigned shake of the head. With God's sword against us, we can press no further on this front. It's that simple, Vasquez. I hope you're right, Regara replied, nodding ruefully. I hope you're all bloody right. We all have our part to play. Only some play it better than others, is that it? Never been one for games myself. He stormed off to drink what was left of the vresk. Barbastian looked on with a hurt expression. It is good to see you again, Vasquez. 
he said softly, taking his leave. Regara watched him go and drained what was left of the bottle. Chapter 9 The campground thronged with troops. Unkempt Talpa and stoic Orek rubbed shoulders with imperious Sloka, trussed up in their best panoply, each in their modest contingents. Even the Pardas were represented by a small cadre of tankers accompanied by their commander, Colonel Ganza, their backs ramrod straight, chests outthrust. Regimental and company banners fluttered gently on the breeze, stirring hearts as well as fabric. The dawn spilled red, watery light over a jagged horizon and gave the Agrians a savage pallor. By far the most numerous amongst the auxiliaries, the diggers had claimed a portion of the campground for their own, a colony both mentally and geographically. At least they had turned up for muster. The female Gulliver Makali, who had shown such uncharacteristic restraint outside the Ursa, leading the clans. She gave the slightest wink to Lieutenant Kulkis, who maintained his composure, despite the sense of disquiet the gesture provoked. They had stuck to their word so far, and made no move towards retribution. Talk in the billets suggested the Agrian Hetman had been killed by his own men. They were certainly belligerent enough, Colchis reflected, as he watched the Gulliver disappear from his sight. A squad of Cossacks went with her, geared for war. Laz guns were slung over shoulders, together with picks and shovels. They had combat knives sheathed to their thighs, hardy flak armor the color of tilled earth, blasting charges and grenades on bandoliers. One even carried an obsolete mark of flamer. Farmers become soldiers. The bulk of the fighting men, though, were Volponi, soldiers of 50th and the newly arrived 86th and 101st, all in perfect rank and file, a sea of grey uniforms, drowning out the colour and variety of the rest. Over the course of the previous evening and into the late hours of the night, more reinforcements had come into camp, fatigued from the long journey from Lanchetek, but otherwise fresh off the landers and unblooded. Not that you could tell. Every Volponi had the pressed and pristine appearance of the parade ground, their mien as refined as their uniforms. The sight fired Kulkis's prideful blood. Over six thousand men mustered, together with supporting Departmento Munitorum logisticians in plain olive drab. Mechanized contingents of Chimera, Tauros, and Sentinel, and the brigades of heavy armor idled at the outskirts of Ankishburg, awaiting the order to advance. Ancillary, non-militarum personnel skirted the edge of the muster field, including an Ecclesiarchy confessor in purple vestments, a brutal-looking chainsword strapped to his back, and a cadre of lesser priests in Hessian smocks at his side. These men and women would come amongst the troops during battle, inciting religious fervor. Already they appeared restive, beating their chests with one hand, a murmur of prayer on their lips. By contrast, their counterparts in the Adeptus Mechanicus were much more sedate. The red-robed tech adepts huddled in secretive conclave. In Lager and Vasha, similar musters were taking place. The entire Ankish line readied for battle. A large space had been cleared on the streets of Ankishburg in the early hours just before dawn and a stage erected. A short run of stairs leading up to it. Vox Amps stood either side of the stage. The Lord Hailers were fashioned into iron cherubim, thick cables snaking from the backs of their heads into a generatorium out of sight behind a raft of scaffolding upon which the stage had been raised. A hollow projector placed in front, its lens angled towards the would-be speaker, 
was receiving benediction by a cowled tech priest. A wooden effigy of the emperor dominated the space. It stared down at the troops, instilling in them a hushed reverence that not even the talpa would break. Colchis recognized the statue as the emperor triumphant, an eagle standard in his hand in place of his sword, a high crown replacing his iron halo. It had come from the Ankishberg Library, brought here by servitors and hauled into place by labor men with ropes. A piece of solid Ankish cedar, it shimmered, the dawn light tanning it the warm gold of reflected fire. It represented glory and victory. The general had chosen unsubtle symbolism for his formal speech to the troops. Murmured prayer crossed the lieutenant's lips as he met the stern regard of the effigy, entreaties to not be found wanting in his sight. As Colchis opened his eyes, he saw Regara moving across the field. He had Schiller and Brandreth with him, though the two captains quickly peeled off to join their own companies. Colchis gave a crisp salute as the major fell in amongst the men. It was the first time he had seen him since the altercation outside the Ursa. He looked a little greyer than usual, a slight redness about the eyes, which were hooded and suggested the partaking of strong drink and a lack of sleep the night before. This, too, was unusual. Woken in the early hours just before dawn, Kulkis could relate to the dearth of sleep. A pair of Valkyries had taken off from outside camp. It was a small strip not suitable for bulk landers like the one at Lanchitek. Though the engine roar was quickly baffled, reduced to a soft thump of rapidly spinning turbines that soon faded, it had roused Kulkis from an overly deep slumber that had left fatigue nipping at the edge of his awareness. At first, in those blurry, half-imagined moments, he had assumed it was the Merlins, but they had all but been crippled by their bravura extraction and were now reduced to supply drop and emergency operations. Someone had taken flight prior to deployment, though. He hadn't imagined it. "'Good morning, Lieutenant,' said Regara, snapping Colchis back to the moment. The Major made the sign of the Aquila, thumbs interlocked, fingers spread in simulation of eagle wings, and bowed his head before the Emperor triumphant. Colchis waited for him to conclude his observance before answering, Good morning, sir. A fine day for war. None finer, sir. None finer, Regara replied, and left a short pause before asking, Did you find the mill serve, Lieutenant? Kulkis sensed a coiled tension in the Major, like an overwound clock straining at its gears. It manifested as uncharacteristic fidgeting, Regara's gloves creaking noisily as he clenched and unclenched his fists. I did, sir. And is he in your charge? Yes, sir. He is in the company billet and ordered to wait at camp. Good. Then let us hope we survive the day and I am able to express my gratitude personally. Emperor willing, sir. May he be our shield, our sword. He protects, said Regara, with a shallow nod at the effigy. Our shield, our sword, he protects. Vox amps crackled, prompting a small cohort of uniformed men to troop out and gather at the side of the stage. Lord Commissar Rensaint and his second Commissar Gannica. Commissar Ithor, who had been attached to the 50th since Planetfall on Nasties. Two officers, Colonel Grossman and Lieutenant Colonel Barbastian. The latter, Kulkis had met before. The former was known to him only by reputation, but he had seen Picts and three aides of corporal rank. This was merely the preamble. A beautiful aria spilled from the mouths of the cherubim, the vox-corded voice filling the air with its righteous hymn. It swelled, climbing to a soprano pitch, and as it neared its apex, deeper voices joined it in chorus. 
Then came the general, striding to the front of the stage in full regalia, like a politico at a rally. He wore the Volponi grey, but was clad also in a golden cuirass. Greaves sheathed his boots and forearms, the griffin rampant fashioned upon every piece in ornate filigree. The medals pinned to his breast shone like captured stars, the physical legacy of his service and accomplishments. A white horsehair plume sprang from a gold helm, the cheekplates forged into wings. A silver shoulder guard accented the gold, a dark red cloak cinched to it and flowing like blood. Nobility bled from him like light from a sun. Had the man upon the stage asked it, Colchis would have followed him into the very eye of terror itself. He knew him, of course, from the propaganda reels and the parchment renderings celebrating his victories. He was Horator Donesque de Viers, the savior of Nostes, and a man who had made a career out of winning battles. Credited for marshalling the eastern and western fronts, responsible for the breaking of the siege at Beltane, his list of victories and personal accomplishments had its own wing in the Museum of Military History at Konisberg. Upon his death, it was speculated amongst high-ranking Volponi that he would earn a banner on the mile-long processional of the Eternity Gate. Sainthood beckoned for men such as he. Then the general did something Colchis did not expect. He removed his helmet and let it clatter to the stage. Agog, the lieutenant watched it roll around, the plume like a bent rudder, guiding it aimlessly across the stage floor until it came to a halt. Then de Viers unclasped his armor, the entire cuirass landing with a resounding metallic clang as he discarded it. The greaves followed, until de Viers stood before them wearing only his uniform, a sword belted to his waist by its scabbard. Unsure of the appropriate protocol, Colchis ventured a half-glance at Regara, but the Major looked unmoved, as if used to such histrionics. He was the only one, as the shock in the crowd was felt palpably around the campground. Even the auxiliaries exchanged unsure glances. The general had them enwrapped. With a gesture, de Viers silenced the vox amps, the chorus abruptly cut off. Here, now, he declaimed, voice carrying despite the lack of augmentation. Colchis reasoned he must have possessed some kind of vocal enhancement, but if so, it was cunningly hidden. We are not fighting for nasties alone. We do not shed our blood, our very lives even, for Agria. No. Our dream is nothing short of mankind's preeminence. It is the dream of Imperium, and one we all share. So as one people, as one tribe, we must meet this challenge before us. There are those who would persuade us to lay down our arms, that our safety and sovereignty do not hinge on victory here. Let the arch-enemy have nasties, they say. It is but one world. These are the words of fearful men, and only tyrants fear. Let them. I put my faith in you, good men and women of the Imperium, to fight by your side, to live by your honor and trust, to lead you on to victory, on to glory and liberation. I pledge my allegiance to this, and I vouchsafe my unswerving conviction to lay down my life amongst yours, for my God Emperor, may his glory reign on terror eternal. He shall be my judge in this, as he will yours. I am but a man, and what is a man in the fathomless multitudes of our galaxy? But I have the heart and spirit of a warrior, 
And when I think of the lesser men who ravage this world, who have taken up with craven gods, who have reneged on every oath of fealty ever sworn, an arch-enemy we must defeat in absolute totality, then I am possessed of such wrath that these wretches would see us put asunder. I defy it. I defy them. You want to make reprisal, as do I. You want to honor the dead, as do I. You want the glory we were all promised, and to liberate Agria from arconate tyranny, as do I. War does not hinge on the outcome of a single battle. We are all warriors, and our will is the stronger. It is said they are cunning architects of malice, and have aligned themselves with all manner of dark artifice. I do not fear it. They have erred, these occultists, these tyrants. They have roused our anger, stoked it, until it is white hot and burning. And with that holiest of fire, we shall drive them out. We shall fight for every yard and inch. We will throw them back to hell itself. And I promise you, we shall not rest until this world is free. He roared, For God, Emperor, for mankind. And the crowd roared back. Chapter 10 The rad counter clicked into amber again, and Hauptmann found himself peering into the dust wastes. He couldn't see much of anything, but he felt it, the danger. Too close, he muttered, tapping the needle of the rad counter just to be sure, and saw it align as it had a few seconds ago. The chalky taste of anti-radiation pills dried his mouth. A fierce wind had hit almost as soon as the column had left Ankishberg, raking the flanks of the armoured transports with grit and swirling across the Craghill wilds. Squalls of dust thickened the air, forcing Hauptmann to regularly clean his goggles. Roper, he called out, and a man in full cavalier garb turned at the mention of his name, a magnocular in his gloved hands. Anything? Roper shook his head, pulling down the scarfs wrapped around his mouth in order to speak. The dust had coated his thick moustache anyway, turning it from dark brown to sandy. Hauptmann could remember when the man had been clean-shaven in his youth. War changed everything, though, even grooming habits. Thought I caught a whiff of movement, Roper grimaced. All that bloody dust, though, sir... There could be a ruddy battalion out there, and we wouldn't see it until it was right up our noses. Hauptmann signaled that he understood. Lennox! The other cavalier had brought his vulper to a complete stop, the kickstand in position as he balanced a long rifle on the handlebars. Nothing through the scope, sir. Young was Lennox, had a wife, having made the mistake of getting married on Padua before shipping out a romantic. He was also a bloody excellent shot with a rifle. But what could survive in all this? That's what bothered Hauptmann the most. He gave the signal again. Garrison, any change to those rads? The most advanced of the scouts answered over Hauptmann's vox, voice muffled by the rebreather mask hooding his nose and mouth. Checking into red every few yards, Sergeant, he paused, and Hauptmann heard a tongue lick dry lips. Garrison was a smoker. He missed the taste of tabac in his mouth. Reckon we must be pushing the edge of it, sir. He was about three hundred yards out, slowly idling back and forth, partially obscured by the storm. All right, Corporal said Hauptmann, marking Garrison's position on the canvas map he had unrolled against the front of the bike. Come back in. Report to the Medicaid when you do. 
The anti-radiation pills were meant to be proof against the poisonous atmosphere in the rad zone, but Hauptmann didn't trust them, not really. He opened the Vox to all the advanced scouts. Reform and regroup. I've seen enough. He packed away his kit and gunned the Vulpes engines, headed back towards the column. The others fell in behind in a dispersed formation, with only garrison lagging. A long trail of tanks bled away into the distance, numerous chimeras and tauros, and three of the colonel's four brigades, tracks churning up dust, a bloody great column of it spilling into the air and giving away their position, as intended. There were walkers too, loping in squadrons, and a baggage train of other transports boxed in by the rear guard. As he rode closer to the column, Hauptmann saluted the other outriders as he passed them, lances upright in their saddle locks, heads down and hooded against the dust. Two columns of distinct lines resolved, approximately a hundred yards apart. Those nearest Hauptmann had soldiers hanging off the guide rails, or sat nonchalantly on the forward glasses, sharing room with roped-up supplies and other kit. Mainly Volponi from the 86th, though there were a few diggers and talpa too. The OREC had refused, demanding to be a part of the main push, and there weren't enough sloka left that anyone much cared where they threw in their lot, a cause of much consternation for the heavy infantry. The farther column, the one to the south, had no soldiers hanging off Chimera chassis. Each vehicle had a driver only, and the formation mainly comprised the ramshackle and patched-up rigs that were barely fit for service. Several had broken down already since the excursion began and had to be fixed. Most hung together by haphazard welding and scraps of wire, as well as the prayers of the carder of engine seers travelling with the column. How they had also repurposed the servitors to actually drive the rigs went beyond Hauptmann's understanding. He knew engines. He knew how to fix a Volpa or a Vox unit. Mystical mechanics were the Martian's domain, and he had no desire to surrender any part of his humanity to learn them. His gaze drifted beyond to the ruins of Lawton, its burnt-out shadow still visible on the horizon as the column's route took it east. The town had suffered during the war, and now they were going back to it. This diversion, he had been told, was a precautionary measure. The weapon would be neutralized by the scions before it could be fired. Hauptmann had never met one of those glory boys he didn't want to punch, and the first sons were no exception to that. They were excellent soldiers, however. The god sword loomed a reminder of its threat, a black silhouette, like a spear thrust into grey cloud, piercing heaven, promising judgment. He prayed then. He prayed the calculations of the Martians proved accurate, that the first sons lived up to their reputation. It prompted an ill feeling seeing that thing, a weapon upon which they had so relied now turned against them. They had deployed macro cannons at Beltane, a desperate act not without some credence. It had been a bitter conflict, not only the siege but what preceded it. Some of the stories he had heard the tunnel fighting, and what the embedded troops had been through, horrors unending. The Pardus had arrived later, there to exploit the work of the heavy guns, those damn macro cannons, stygis and thunderstrike patterns, weapons intended for use against god machines, against titans and starships, not men. Bodies had atomized in the barrages. No bone or blood remained, just absence. The resulting craters had nearly sunk the city. The vaporized masses, they had been the fortunate ones. Those at the fringes of the blast zone, the limbless, 
the shattered half-men he had run medical supplies back and forth to preserve. Thrown above, it was a grim undertaking. Eyeing the head of the column at last, two Lehman Rust tanks and a chimera with a hefty comms array, Hauptmann engaged his vox. Captain. Go ahead, Sergeant. Aramis sounded distracted, her many sentries around the column doubtless feeding her regular reports. We're running about 300 yards shy of the rad zone, but the storm's messing with our parameters. It's coming inwards, right at us. Your assessment? We're skirting too close. Noted. There was a pause. A few clicks of Vox static. Is there anything further? If we stray into that rad zone, or it strays into us, we'll have a lot of sick men on our hands, radiation pills or not. The risk is acceptable, Sergeant. We have our orders. If we pushed another hundred yards or so south, we would mitigate any... And move both columns within range of Godsword. I'm sorry, Hauptmann. We're between Horus and the Eye here... The radiation risk is acceptable. Aramis. I told you, Sergeant. In the field, I am captain or sir. Now is that all? Hauptmann turned his gaze to the dust storm and then back to the ominous silhouette of Godsword. Yes, sir. That ill feeling he hadn't quite been able to put his finger on, that elusive sense of disquiet, he now knew what it was. He knew what it made him feel like as they rode the invisible tightrope. Bait. Aramis scowled as she reviewed the report. Radar or specs had them riding close to the edge of Godsword's range. And on the other side, a dust storm was widening the rad zone and pushing it right at them. A narrow isthmus existed between these hazards, one Aramis was expected to chart. She shouldn't have taken her frustration out on Hauptmann. If they survived this, she vowed to make it up to him. She had a decent bottle of resk she thought the sergeant might enjoy. Fifty yards south, she said, the navigator signaling her understanding as she relayed the message across the Vox. Did you piss him off? asked Hennessy. Yes, thought Aramis, but her aide wasn't referring to the sergeant cavalier. The shadows in the armored hold softened the usually hard edges of Hennessy's face, but couldn't hide the rueful humor in his eyes or the tilt of his thin lips. The left eye was a bionic, chromed bronze with a blue iris, but the right was human enough. He had a plate stapled to his head, a reminder of an old injury, and the rest of his scalp was shaved practically to the knob. By existing, I piss him off. By being necessary, Corporal. There was a pause, filled by the vox chatter coming through the master feed. A small cadre of Militarum comms operators manned stations, watched radar outputs on screens of green monochrome. Permission to speak freely. Aren't you all ready, Corporal? Aramis looked up, which Hennessy took as consent. She trusted everyone in this hold. They were hers, after all. Grossman is a bootlicking, malicious cur. Noted, Aramis replied, utterly deadpan, and returned to the reports. Though you forgot shit-eating, she added with a wisp of a smile. Indeed I did, Captain. A shit-eating, boot-licking, malicious cur. And misogynist. I really am failing in my duties, Captain. Aramis laughed, confident the conversation would go no further. The colonel was not universally liked amongst the 86th except for those men he took into his inner circle. Too busy playing politics was Grossman, his nose entirely up De Vere's shiny golden arsehole. 
He must have been a fine officer once, Aramis supposed, but she had found men were often addicted to self-destruction when it came to the desire for advancement. She turned from the report, sliding back a wall panel so she could look out of a view slit. Squinting against the sudden rush of dust and air, Aramis peered past the flanking chimera and its drone pilot. Aramis saw the weapon, stark and forbidding in the distance. She swore she saw it move. Chapter 11 Soldiers advanced on Loden. They did so quietly, in fear of the weapon that loomed above them in the distance, one part of the vanguard sent to reconnoitre the town. Kulkis led them, and as he reached the northern outskirts, he crouched behind the ugly stump of a perimeter wall. Troopers followed him, most in the pristine uniforms of the Volponi, others in the forest green of the Orek, or the grubby ochre of the Talpa. They took up positions either side of the road, or in a low ditch, or the lee of a collapsed watchtower. Anywhere cover could be found. Rubble and debris lay everywhere, and though the bloodstains were old, the memories they stirred were not. Men had died to take Loden. More had fallen losing it. And now they had returned to do it all over again. Definition of madness, Sergeant? He asked his command squad nearby. Sir? Grice was tucked behind an old barricade and frowned as he adjusted his helmet. Kulkis wondered if perhaps the soldier had been born wearing it. Doesn't matter, the lieutenant replied. The OREC force leader, a master sergeant called Ganu, moved up stealthily with three of his riflemen. His dark eyes flashed as they caught the light. Looks quiet, lieutenant. His voice was rich and deep, and he had a noble bearing like a lot of the OREC. A short-stocked Laz repeater was slung over one shoulder, a thick combat knife sheathed on his thigh. I don't trust it. Where are the citizens? I see no sign, not even of the dead. When the Ankish line had collapsed, many of the citizens of Lotten had fled, but not all. Not all could, and many had been left behind. Now they were simply gone. A good question, Master Sergeant, said Kulkis, appraising the main gate into the town through a lascope. He couldn't see any movement, any sign of occupation. In the time it took for him to look, the Talpa Lieutenant Puck had joined them. Unlike the Orek, he came alone. Are we going in? he asked. His teeth were black from kappa root, and he possessed a grubby, well-worn aroma. The Talpa had wire for limbs, it seemed. His disheveled uniform was almost hanging off his body, and he had an unkempt scruff of grey hair that Kolkis assumed must be lice-ridden, judging by how many times he removed his coal-bucket helmet to scratch at it. Upon closer inspection, a patch of dirt on the Talpa's right cheek actually turned out to be the tattoo of a coiled rat. You have city fighting experience? Kulkis asked. The Talpa nodded, a vicious look in his eye, and patted the spiked mattock he wore on his hip like a beloved pet. Kulkis had approximately sixty troopers in his charge, a full platoon of which were Volponi, including his own command squad. The rest were auxiliary. He looked to Ganu. I need eyes, he said. Ganu nodded, and at a gesture a band of rangers swept up crisply and quietly. All carried las repeaters and frag charges, and wore urban camo over the forest green. At the lieutenant's signal, a second squad, Volponi, joined them. One of ours, one of theirs. Even deployment had politics. Kulkis made a short downward chopping motion with his fingers, and the two squads broke from position and advanced up the roadway that led to the town's northward gates. Lasguns held close to their bodies, crouched low and sprinting. They reached the gatehouse without incident. A Volponi sergeant called Edrin held out his hand, palm flat to indicate stop. 
Two troopers took the left side of the gate, one high, one low. Las guns trained on the town beyond. Another two took the right side, same positions. The rest of the squad hunkered next to the outer wall, propping their rifles against cratered gaps where they could, holding them upright against their shoulders where they couldn't. A crew served weapon team lugged an ammo belt, and a collapsed heavy stubber still wrapped in canvas and tied off. The OREC sergeant pulled a telescopic sight and swept it slowly back and forth. A flamer bearer held his weapon low, the igniter flickering lazily, a spotter with his hand on the trooper's shoulder watching for enemy movement. A weak sun bled through the cloud, but a dust storm was in effect turning the day a brownish overcast that filled corners and crannies with deep shadows. Buildings encroached, turning Lodden into a darkened warren. A faint vox crackle made Kulkis swear aloud. He hadn't realized how tense he was feeling. Schiller's voice resolved at the other end of the feed. Anything, Lieutenant? Kolkis passed his gaze across the severed razor wire, the collapsed bunkers and burnt-out pillboxes. The northern outskirts were quiet. No attempt had been made to rebuild its defences or repair anything, let alone occupy it. Negative, Captain. No sign, Schiller replied quickly. Then what the bloody hell are you waiting for? A silent exchange passed between the two sergeants running point, then Edrin turned and rotated his hand in a clockwise fashion, rally on the gatehouse. Kolkis patted Puck on the shoulder, felt the sharp edges of the man's frame through the fabric of his uniform. Two fire teams, he whispered, advanced positions. Two five-man squads of Talpa peeled off from the rest of the vanguard, reached the gatehouse and scurried inside. Fast, silent, they put Colchis in mind of vermin, despite his best efforts to think otherwise. As soon as the Talpa were in, he gave the order to move up, pumping his fist in the battle sign for hurry. Thirty Volponi advanced on his signal, moving by squad, and the air filled with the soft clamour of jostling equipment. Sergeant Edrin met them at the gatehouse. The main street was dark, most of the lamps shattered. The shelves of old commercial buildings lay open on either side. A checkpoint sat about halfway down, but there were gaps torn into the barricade and the watch house had been flattened. A munitions yard stood at the end of the street, roads projecting left and right, leading further into the town. Its roof had collapsed, and scattered brick still lay where its east wall had been blown out. Craters pockmarked the roadway, some filled with off-spilled petrochem. Wet earth churned underfoot. It's like a blackout, sir, griped Edrin, referencing the near-dark conditions brought on by the storm and the cluttered layout of the town. Could be anything out there. I'd suggest some stab lamps. Kulkis nodded to indicate it heard Edrin's recommendation. And what do your eyes tell you, Master Sergeant? Ganu hadn't stopped interrogating the shadows since he had reached the gatehouse. He did so a moment longer before answering. There is nothing, Lieutenant. He faced Kulkis. I see nothing here. He offered a slight smile except for our malodorous comrades. He was referring to the Talpa, though Colchis could find no sign of the trench fighters. I'd hardly say that constitutes certainty, Lieutenant, Edrin cut in, bristling at being so casually brushed off. Colchis silenced his protests with the raising of his hand. He believed the Blue Bloods were the finest fighting men in the entirety of the Guard, but he wasn't so proud as to not recognize the keen instincts of the OREC, honed from years of dense nocturnal forest warfare. The Volponi brought precision, discipline, strength. They were heavily armored and well armed. However, though they had lighter troops, the OREC and even the Talpa made for better scouts, even in urban terrain. But he wasn't about to explain any of that to Edrin. Map, 
he uttered instead, and Edrin unfurled a sketched layout of the town, pleased to be of service again. Grice pulled out a stab lamp and smothered it with a rag to dim the light. It was just bright enough for Colchis to mark two avenues of ingress and a second rally point at a communal square with a grease pencil. The rest of the battle group was somewhere behind him, likely nearing the gate as they advanced on the northern outskirts. Schiller was impatient and wanted this done. Three hundred men in the advance party on this part of town. Kulkis divided the platoons, then gave a sharp signal with two fingers waving them left to right. The group split into two columns and pushed down the street, eyes high and low. No stab lamps. The shadows seemed to thicken the deeper they went. A smell of sour milk and spoiled meat threaded the air. No bodies, though, alive or dead. About halfway to the munitions yard, the formation still in column, Kulkis raised a clenched fist, and the squad sergeants cascaded his signal down the line. Every Volponi froze, hugging the buildings, spoiling vantage points. The lieutenant glanced at Hanmar, who was by his shoulder, but the olive-skinned corpsman shook his head after he had checked the bioscanner. Think we're getting some interference, sir. The dull green glow of the screen fizzed and crackled. Seen something, lieutenant? Hanmar asked. A feeling, Kulkis replied. See if you can get it working. Hanmar nodded, adjusting dials on the scanner, but yielding no results. Kulkis looked over his shoulder at the Voxman, a trooper called Hauger. Anything? A shake of the head from Hauger, who then said, Not since we entered the town, sir. Kulkis swore under his breath. There must be a Vox jammer in effect. Somewhere ahead of them, the Scions would be making their infiltration. Without the means to contact them, and having seen no sign of them or their passing, it was impossible to gauge the success of their mission. It was impossible to gauge much of anything. Lawton appeared deserted. Fenk should have entered the town on its eastward facing by now. Two platoons in his charge, another three hundred men following under Captain Brandreth. Their orders were simple. Advance, clear, and occupy. Take and hold the weapon until the larger battle group could move up and secure. So far, the first part of that had proven easy. Kulkis thought too easy. Where the hell is everyone? He didn't believe the pact would just abandon Lawton, for it would mean abandoning Godsword, too. Why fight so hard to obtain it just to surrender it? Situated at the southern edge of the town, the weapon had been worked into the defensive wall, raised up on an artificial plinth of rockcrete and surrounded by a riveted metal shell. A compound of entrenchments, manned turrets, and other minor defences encircled it like a keep. It was supposed to be impenetrable, an anchor on the east flank of the Ankish line. But the pact had wrecked all that. Those boasts rang hollow now, made by men prone to hyperbole. Regardless, it still dominated the horizon. Even amongst the press of buildings, Kulkis could see it through gaps in the ragged townscape. The dust clouds did their best to obscure it, but the weapon was still there, a sleeping sentry, or perhaps just waiting. Are we moving, lieutenants, or waiting for reinforcements? whispered Grice, his tone suggesting he was prepared to do either. Kulkis spared a glance at God's sword. Why haven't they fired it, Grice? I don't know, sir. And where are the enemy? The pack should be crawling all over this place. We may find them yet, sir. No sentries, not even skirmishers. Perhaps they've withdrawn. Do you think that's likely, Sergeant? No, sir, I do not. That leaves only two outcomes, said Colchis. Either they've pulled back for another reason, or... They're still here, and we haven't found them. Precisely. Shall I try to vox Captain Schiller? Stall the advance? Kulkis shook his head. He doubted it would work, but that hardly mattered at this point. 
We're in its eye now, Grace, he said, looking up at the distant barrel of God's sword. There is no more stalling. He gave the signal, and they moved out. Chapter 12 Regara stood atop a ridge a quarter of a mile from Lotton and scoured the town through a pair of magnoculars. Schiller had commenced his advance, three hundred men descending with bayonets fixed and rifles charged. A pair of hellhound flame tanks trundled beside them, the armoured rigs touting bulky fuel canisters, a terror weapon when deployed in close-quarter engagements. Pardus urban camo patterned their hulls, mustard yellow traded for grey and black, and a clutch of talpa hung onto the cargo netting strewn across the forward glasses. They're moving in, Regara uttered. Below and behind him, the rest of the army waited in disciplined ranks. He had three other officers on the ridge with him, Ren Saint, Grussman, and Barbastian. Should have sent in the bloody tunnel rats to smoke them out first, groused Grussman. Scared up the quarry a notch or two. And announced to the pact that we're here, countered Barbastian, eyebrow raised, not exactly subtle. Nothing subtle about a flame tank either, Grossman countered, to which Regara found he had to concede. If you want hornets, Lieutenant Colonel, then use a sharp stick, that's all I'm saying. They had kept most of the auxiliaries back, including most of the Agrians, preferring discipline to expendability, though not even Ithor would admit that and he was a callous bastard on his best day. Besides, city fighting played to the Volpone's strengths. Their equipment, their superior armor, their tactics and training. The Slokans had little left in the way of military strength, despite their assertions to the contrary, and the Orek were better suited to rural terrain, though a few had been utilized in the advance party as scouts, whilst the Agrians were farmers and trench-builders conscripted into military service. As for the Talpa, Regara had seen death-row penal legions that were less savage. Still, they played their part. The truth of it, though, was far less finessed. Glory motivated everything the Volponi did. Another laurel for the banner, another gilded honor, a victory to erase the stain of defeat. Blue Bloods knew only how to win. Anything else was anathema. The leather of Rensaint's gloves creaked noisily as he gripped the hilt of his sword. Why haven't they fired the weapon? he asked. A similar thought had occurred to Regara. According to the Magos, they were well inside the range of God's sword. It either meant the first sons had been successful, in which case why had there been no reaction from inside the town, or something else had happened. The not knowing bothered him the most. He lowered the scopes and pointed them in the direction of Kobor. Column's moving, he said, tweaking the magnification, but it was a fair distance, and all he really saw was a large dust plume. Should be in range of the guns soon. Isn't it obvious, said de Vere's, as he climbed up the ridge, a pair of scions in tow, the bastards want a fight. He had emerged from his command vehicle, armoured and armed. Not in his parade finest, that he had so histrionically discarded to appeal to the common masses, but in his Volponi grey carapace, his helm and sabre, his snub-nosed las pistol. Even the crimson half-cloak was absent, though he still wore the silver lion-headed shoulder guard and we're going to give it to them by the throne. Regara blinked back his surprise. Sir? De Vere's unsheathed and sheathed his blade, testing the smoothness of withdrawing it. Did you think I came here just to make speeches, Major? He smiled, that charming, savage smile. I came here to win a war, to lead. The only way I know how to do that is from the front. Even Grussman, a long-time confidant of the general, balked. 
Brigadier, I must protest. There is no need for this. There is every need, Colonel Grossman. I pledge to fight alongside these men. I won't break an oath. I only just swore. Grossman drew in close to the general, his voice low, his eyes flitting to the other officers, searching for supporters. By the way he was acting, Regara assumed de Vias had done this before. The man was known for his acts of bravura. It had won wars. There are soldiers for this, Grossman began. De Vias turned and held his gaze. There was steel in it, unbendable steel. This, Colonel, do you mean fighting? Dying? I am a soldier. We all are. Volponi glory to the end! Regara had heard of it before. Vainglorious officers who sought out the worst of all war fronts, always craving the heart of the battle. Not for bloodlust, for the honor of it. Such men did not last long, but de Vere's had some years on him. Thrown, Regara knew he himself had more than a few, but the rejuvenate the general used was primus grade, and even it couldn't hide every crack. He trooped on, leaving a frustrated Grussman in his wake. You'll have strategic command from here, Colonel, snipped de Vere's, a parting shot for the Colonel's apparent insolence. Major, he ordered. Regara stepped to, handing off the magnoculars to Barbastian, who would remain to see to field command. Two squads fell in, all hand-picked men, blue-blood veterans, every one. De Vere's had a small cohort of scions, his two shadows and three others making up a fire team. A chimera stood nearby, engines already idling. De Vere's apparently meant to join the front with only a small retinue. His next words confirmed it. We'll join up with Schiller. Ensure he's prepared for us. A voxman the general had turned his attention to saluted. Rensaint had watched the entire theatre with apparent cool reserve. But as the troopers filed out, he swept down off his perch to join them. Only the slightest pinch around his eyes suggested his annoyance. Although he had only spent a few hours with the commissar, Owen Rensaint struck Regara as a man who planned methodically and in detail, considering every potential exchange and scenario. Almost a form of prescience. Evidently, he hadn't foreseen this. I think I'll stretch my legs, General, if you'll permit me to join you, he said cordially. Commissar Ithor has matters in hand here. I see no need to remain. Ithor lurked below amongst the masses. If he felt anything about being left behind, he didn't show it. The man was as emotionless and inert as a corpse, a sharp contrast to the smoothly politic Rensaint. De Vere's paused as he was climbing into the back of the transport, favoring Rensaint with a curt, backwards glance. As you wish, Lord Commissar. The Prefectus must go where it is needed, by the Emperor's will. Ren Saint gave a shallow nod. His will, he murmured, and followed de Vere's and the Scions aboard. Regara went next. His leg was bothering him again, phantom pain he knew, but it often presaged trouble. The Major wasn't a particularly superstitious man, and he didn't consider himself credulous either. But he would have been a fool not to heed this sign. He looked back as he mounted the ramp and saw Barbastian watching him from the ridge. A sudden pang seized him, akin to a loss not yet experienced yet still felt. In that moment he wondered if he would see Philip again, but by then it was too late and the press of bodies had shuffled him on into the interior and the red-lit dark of the transport's hold. Fink was good at spotting when something was out of place. He had the knack. It was the very same knack that made him good at moving unseen, unnoticed. He knew almost every soldier in Lance Company. 
and the only reason he had any gaps in his knowledge at all was on account of the casualties they had sustained during the retreat. Troopers from the 86th and 101st had filled in the ranks, made the company viable again. So Fenk accepted there would be troopers he didn't know. But fighting men stood out. They had a look, the eyes, the way they moved, a wariness, a readiness that spoke to a shared experience. The Commissar Gannica didn't have it. She had something at once cold and fiery behind her eyes, a taut string tension that made her stiff and jerking like an automaton. But it wasn't her, Fenk had noticed as they crept stealthily across the threshold into the eastward-facing gates of Lodden. It was a trooper he didn't know. Young, but moving with practiced skill, like he had watched someone do it over and over again and had managed to replicate the behavior. An imitator. Maybe 86th or 101st, maybe somewhere else. It didn't matter. Wherever they had come from, the trooper didn't belong. Redfern, he said, summoning the corporal as they crossed an empty arcade, the columns and porticos riddled with bullet holes. Do you know that trooper? Fenk tipped his knife in the direction of the trooper, who was running on ahead with his squad. Redfern frowned, his face a patchwork of old scars and skin like leather. He was a bruiser, was Redfern, a gutter noble who cared nothing for standing or prestige, only that he had and others had not, and that this gave him a measure of power over his lessers. Never seen him before, sir, he said, his voice a raw-edged growl that rattled in his throat. Probably 86th or 101st. The advance squad were establishing sentry positions, watching rooftops and corners, still no engagement, and the quiet was unsettling some. Is he a problem, sir? Redfern had a glint in his eye, the one that usually preceded violence. He had killed before, and not just on the battlefield. A taste for the blood, some said. Fenk would agree. The Grey Host might have dealt with Redfern long ago, but Fenk liked having a mad dog that was his to unleash. Not yet, Fenk answered truthfully, and gave the order to follow. Chapter 13 Kulkis stopped at the edge of the square. He felt his breath catch in his throat, and wondered why his heart had begun to beat so fast. His troops were hunkered down, poised at the lip of a wide set of steps leading down to the square itself, and spread out amongst the fronts of abandoned commercia buildings and behind half-collapsed columns. The hum of redded lasguns trembled the air. The last time Kulkis had seen this place, there had been people, citizens of Lawton, the ones who hadn't been able to flee to the wilds, and imperial soldiers patrolling or gathered in small groups, talking, eating, smoking. The square was empty now, and against the lieutenant's will, it filled with his fear instead. Only he couldn't understand why. What is that? he hissed, and turned to see Garnu's eyes wide, like two silver coins glittering amongst his dark features. The master sergeant was within a few yards of the lieutenant, crouched down, weapon trained on the shadows. He murmured in native Okrish, but despite the language barrier, the meaning was clear. It was a warding prayer. Kulkis squinted against the dark, trying to see anything. It occurred to him the square would be a good place for an ambush, a large expanse with little to no cover higher ground on all sides, and limited visibility. The Militarum had a term for it, kill box. Hanma, the corporal shook his head, the bioscanner still strangely silent. His attention never left the square, eyes roaming, searching. No word from the scions, no sign of the enemy. Schiller was coming, they needed to clear this zone, and yet... 
It was darker here than the rest of the town, the square enclosed by tall buildings that stooped like decrepit men. Old scraps of fabric hung on vox wires. Sheets of plastic, drawn over windows, creaked in the breeze. A large fountain stood proud in the middle of the square. It was made of iron, but the metal had succumbed to rust, and a mire of stagnant, dirt-flecked water stood in its large basin. The beast it had been crafted to represent had three heads, bovine, ursine, equine, their mouths agape. A rope of stringy algae drooled from one, clinging to its iron fangs like spittle. There was something standing in the stagnant fountain water, four towering scaffolds that reminded Kulkis of gibbets, though he could see no noose, and during the imperial occupation they had never used the square for executions. The scaffolds had been added recently. Something hung from each of them, but it was hard to discern, like a smear on a picture lens that wouldn't wipe off. A sigil, he couldn't think of a better way to describe it, floated above the fountain, faintly luminous, as if a dagger had made a cut in the air and left a wound in its wake. Colchis blinked, once, then again, but he couldn't focus on it, so he turned his gaze on what lay ahead. Sixty men awaited his command, even the Talpa having returned to the ranks and fallen conspicuously silent. Their lieutenant, Puck, was looking at his boot. Something marred the toe cap, where he had inadvertently scuffed it against the ground, sticky like tar. He sniffed at it, scowled. Tell me that degenerate has not stepped in shit, muttered Grice, but the thick-necked sergeant's disgust couldn't hide his trepidation. Hairs stood up along the bare skin of his arms, and he swallowed. The talpa was mouthing something to his comrades, his chittering dialect difficult to pass. Sang! He was saying, Sang! Garnu was looking down, not at his feet, but at the ragged line daubed against the pavers. Colchis followed it, followed the Orex gaze as it tracked the line. It ran the circumference of the square. As he completed the circuit with his eyes, Garnu turned back to the lieutenant and gave a small, near imperceptible shake of the head, a plea. Colchis was drawn back to the fountain, to the basin, fuller than he remembered, just a catch bin for the rain. At least it had been. The water level had since risen, thickened, darkened. A tiny movement caught his eye, the surface of the water disturbed by an escaping air pocket and something beneath. It bobbed gently, breaching the placid scum that had developed on top. It looked pale, organic, not unlike bone. To his dismay, his troops were already moving, already down the steps. He couldn't remember giving the order, and he was moving too, every man amongst them drifting like sleepwalkers across the square. They advanced left and right of the fountain, hugging the high sides of its ornate basin, casting wary glances at the rusted iron beasts. And that's when Colchis saw it, the orange-red patina that had built up over the ironworks shone. Rust was dull, flat. This was wet and coagulated. Sang. Blood. The order to withdraw on the bow of his lips. The lieutenant's gaze led him up, back to the sigil and to one of the scaffolds. Details resolved, as if he was seeing it for the first time, as if it wanted to be seen. The thing hanging from it resembled an animal carcass, made of scrap metal, intertwined with wire and stained almost black, with a long chain wrapped around, pulling all the spikes and edges together like a mismatched jigsaw. A hollow bovine skull stared back at Kulkis, and he felt its regard like a cold touch at the nape of his neck. Then, an ember flared in one of its eye sockets, quickly burning into a crimson flame. The bioscanner bleeped abruptly, half a second of sound stretching on into forever before Colchis roared, To arms! To arms! 
The hurried clatter of raised las guns rippled across the square, men backing off in swathes, their fingers trembling against triggers, eyes pressed to iron sights, trying to deny the evidence of their senses. It unfurled, the bovine thing, long, far longer than it had seemed all entwined like that, claws and teeth and anima, hunched and long-limbed, furnace heat bleeding through the joints, lowing like the flesh creature it scarcely resembled, spoiled meat and sour milk ripened on the air. Sergeant Edrin was weeping, a desperate prayer repeating over and over as he barreled past Kulkis to lift his shaking rifle. The charge block whined, high-pitched, tuned to full power. Then he died. A spear of metal pierced his chest, lifting him bodily, legs dangling, helpless. Edrin was spitting blood all over his chest and face, his weapon hanging from a nerveless finger. Still in a state of shock, the seconds like stretched elastic in his mind, Colchis traced the spear back to the segmented tail that had impaled Edrin. Not a tail, a limb. It hunched, the thing that had killed Edrin, a broken-backed monstrosity of gangling legs and arms. A second gibbet stood empty behind it. The same sentience blazed within it, like tangible malice. It took three unsteady steps, whatever infernal energies that drove it, leaking out of joints in gouts of crackling fluid. It slumped and expired. Confusion and relief warred within Colchis, before a heavy thud made him turn as the first one, the bovine thing, landed on all fours. It was built like a tank. Colchis tried to give an order, but the words scraped like sand in his mouth, his tongue a strip of cured leather. He almost screamed, Fire! Fire at will! Staccato las beams went off like firecrackers, fizzing and snapping. The bovine thing leapt, raking sparks as it pushed off the ground. Hauger split in half, the voxman slit from groin to crown, by a trailing claw, the red pieces of him spilling out in a slurry of innards. It trundled on, the creature goring Vesha, lifting up the blue blood like a sack of meat, and smashing the poor bastard against the side of the fountain where he left a smear. Men scattered before it, as if reacting to tank shock. Others took aim. Lasbeam stitched it, high and low, hitting limbs and torso. It bellowed, driven back for a few seconds, before charging down two of Garnu's rangers and shredding them. It sprang, propelled by its hindquarters, into a talpa. The tunnel rat barely had time to unhook his mattock before it tore into him. A crack grenade thrown by Garnu staggered it. Blood, oil, and something else spouted from the ruined joints. A flamer doused it, and it screamed, the voice uncomfortably human. Still burning, it brought down two blue bloods, Krellish and bleak. A talpa leapt at it, a war shout on her lips, mattock and axe raised. A swipe of the horns and she fell in two perfect halves, cut across the midriff. Kulkis was trying to get his scattered troops into formation. Grice fired unerringly, hitting the bovine skull with five shots out of six, before thumbing the lever to rapid fire and hosing it. Ejecting the smoking power pack, he slammed in another and kept going. It wasn't enough to stop it. Rake! cried Kulkis. Rake flicked out the standing feet on the heavy stubber, Dresk feeding the ammo belt. Muscle flare roared a moment later, solid shots punching the bovine's flank as the rest of the squad fusillated it with lasfire. At last it gave ground, hemmed in and hurting from concentrated fire. There was an infinitesimal moment of respite to think, to take stock. Bodies lay everywhere, speared and dismembered, decapitated. Garnu was getting the rangers into order, carefully marshaled shots herding the bovine thing as the talpa snapped at it like caged rats, hacking and bludgeoning. A squad of Volponi, Edrin's former men, stood next to the Orek, firing in disciplined ranks. 
Then the flamer bearer took a hit, and a stray spark cooked off the fuel in his tank. The explosion took out five men. Another four fell screaming as burning Prometheum drenched their backs and faces. Colchis turned his cheek from the heat, shouting, Rally! Rally! Trying to reach Garnu, trying to stay alive. Six rangers remained, two with knives after their Laz repeaters had depleted. Only Puck was left from the Talpa. His brethren cut up like offal. Orek Laz repeaters chased the monster, but it weathered the shots, seemingly impervious. Puck flung his axe, and it spun end over end to embed in the creature's mass. The bovine let out a rage-filled bleat, the flesh leather of its torso still aflame. Colchis shot it in the eye, a marksman's shot, and the embers there died. The explosion that followed took Narva, Gonfried, and Jethri, a sudden electrical detonation that left scorched black bones behind it. But at least the thing was dead. Nothing left of it but scraps of twisted metal scattered across the square. The lightning was still dying away when the third and fourth scaffolds began to rattle. Back! Kulkish shouted, blood in his eyes, turning his view red. Retreat to the stairs! They went up, backs to the steps, moving gingerly as two half-seen figures moved in the shadows towards them. It was even darker now, the sky cast in sackcloth black, and all color bled away to anemic monochrome. A las beam cut the dark, blue and faltering. It lit a tall figure ambling on two legs, like a man but not a man, an ancient knight in cobalt iron, too tall, too thin, too many edges. Fire glowed within it, but gave off no light. Horns protruded from a distended equine helm. It stooped, as long forelimbs extended, unhinging like a flick knife, trailing and grating on the ground. A second las beam cracked off, then another and another, as the men fired and climbed, fired and climbed. A trooper fell, and the knight lashed, its long fingers coiling around her ankle like a whip, before pulling her away screaming. Her head hit the ground as she was dragged, and the scream cut off, the skull cracking as loud as a grenade. Las beams chased her into the shadows, but she was gone. Colchis reached the top of the steps, Grice hauling him by his arm. They'd lost at least half the men, Garnu and two other rangers. Puck, the last Talpa, and the Volponi remained. Holy Emperor, protect us from evil, Hanma was murmuring close to his lieutenant's side. The useless bioscanner was gone, and he held his las carbine to his shoulder as a fourth creature loped into sight. Hanmar's shot struck metal, sparks flying off segmented wings held protectively in front of an avian body. Its beaked head turned as it issued a plaintive shriek. It jerked, awkward but mercurial, like it was moving out of phase, in one position one moment, and then another the next, without any visible transition between. Kulkis called for the heavy gun. Strafe it! Rake had abandoned the stand. He braced the heavy stubber against the wall, Dresk lugging another belt into the hungry ammo feed. It chugged out rounds the size of canteens, rupturing pavers and sending the pieces into the air in rapid eruptions. Unearthly fast, the avian creature darted from the worst of it, and circled wide, forcing the fire to follow. Its murder mate was less bold, and flung out a limb, snagging Colchis by his boot and yanking him off his feet. Colchis felt the earth slip violently beneath him, then pain as his back hit solid stone. He smelled burned leather, and the world lurched again as he was pulled towards the steps. A firm hand grabbed his arm. It was Grice, teeth gritted, Laz gun discarded so he could try to save his lieutenant. The muscles bunched in the sergeant's arms, both hands now gripping, as Colchis felt his leg pulled. He screamed in agony as the joints stretched, the bone resisting. In pain-flooded half-awareness, he imagined the limb shearing away, taking most of his pelvis with it. His boot was burning, 
fire lapping where long blackened fingers touched it. A flash of bright silver registered as Hanmar slashed with his rapier, trying to sever the arm that held Kulkis, but his blade was meant for dueling and had little effect. Puck stepped up, armed with an axe, and hacked down two-handed. Take the limb, roared Kulkis, half blind with pain. He meant his own. Puck hacked again, wires and sinew parting, as his blade sheared black iron. Hanmar jammed his rapier in the wound, levered it wider with two hands, as Grice held on. Kulkis pleaded, Cut it! Now! His hip cracked, muscle tearing, the flesh of his ankle burning as the leather of his boot turned to ash. Puck hacked a third time, and the thing's wrist parted, spewing blood and other fluids as the limb flailed away like a streamer. A plaintive howl confirmed they had hurt it, the knight retreating to lick its wounds. Kolkis sagged like a taut rope abruptly released, the sudden absence of tension upending Grice, who sprawled onto his back, gasping with relief. A Volponi fire team led by Puck stepped up to shield the lieutenant as Hanmar administered a hurried shot of morphia. The pain ebbed, a dull wall of numbness between it and Kolkis before he almost blacked out. He heard a voice in his ear, distant and soft like a bad Vox return. Need to move, Lieutenant, Dresk. Take his arm, cousin. That was Rake. Kulkis groaned. Get back on that damn heavy. Stop us empty, sir, Dresk again. Dry as a talon's ass crack, sir. Definitely, Rake. The fire team began to shrink as the cousins dragged him. The pain felt distant, as if it belonged to someone else, and Kulkis looked down to find his ankle burned, but the fingers that had seized it gone. They were all retreating. Back into the column-lined avenue that led to the square, two shadows in pursuit, hungry and hurting, driven by pain-fueled instinct and caged sentience. Less than twenty men from sixty. A memory stirred, something from just before deployment. As Kulkis brought it firmly to mind, a briefing on known enemy combatants, a name resonated. It evinced a sort of primal fear in him that he couldn't explain. Wire Wolf. And it was only then that he realized he and his men were dead. Chapter 14 Shadows moved in the storm. Hauptmann knew it as surely as he knew the fingers and calluses on his hands. He signaled his squadron, and the rough riders fell in from positions along the edge of the column. Thirty men, all mounted, engines growling as the intakes coughed and spat. I can take a look, Garrison had ridden up alongside, and pulled down his scarf to speak. His chin was shaped like an arrowhead, his thin lips always twitching, except for when they had a tabak stick between them. Hauptmann shook his head. Stay close, he said, and waved Roper up to the front of the squadron. See if you can get a few of those Tauros to join us. He gestured to the armored jeeps flanking the column as outriders. Roper nodded, took Mathis and Vecca with him, and went to round up some heavier guns. They rode steady, Volpers bouncing lightly against the terrain. The dust was thick, thicker than it had been when they left camp. It had taken on the cast of a sand wall, tan brown and churning. Eddies whipped in the mass as the air turned and twisted, and through these vortices of dirt, shadows, a darker brown against the storm, like muzzy silhouettes refusing to take form. Could be nothing, remarked Garrison. Hauptmann nodded. That's what I'm hoping. Lennox rode one-handed, also out front, a scope in the other hand. He adjusted the magnification, nimble fingers doing what was needed blindly, a deftness born of repetition and the cavalier's natural talent. 
He was a pious lad with a strict upbringing, sober as an arbitrator until he smiled, and mindful of his manners. So when he swore aloud, Hauptmann knew they had a problem. How many? Hauptmann asked. He would have reached for his own scope, but frankly Lennox had younger, better eyes. The lad had pulled his rifle, had it sat over his lap as he rode, and attached the scope with one hand. Many more than thirty, sir, he replied. Garrison kissed the Aquila necklace he wore. Wish it had been nothing, he said, unsheathing a stub-nosed combat shotgun. Should we engage? Hauptmann thought of Chari then, and the boy he hadn't seen in twenty years who would by now be a man. In that second, he considered everything he had missed, all the days gone, and the grief of that wound up inside him like a tight ball before he swallowed it. Hold for now, he said, betraying none of these feelings to his men. Even masked up, we can't ride in that. How can they, sir? Lennox asked a damn good question. The radiation would kill anything human, which didn't leave many comforting possibilities. Hauptmann couldn't answer, so he asked a question of his own instead. You see how close they were? Scope gauged at five hundred yards, sir. Shit. That was a little close. Roper and the others were headed back, three Tauros in tow, six wheelers, the heavier Venator class, their armored frames and chassis painted mustard yellow and equipped with autocannons and missile tubes. The sight of them eased Hauptmann's nerves a little. Then he heard the howling, an inhuman, animalistic cry reverberating out of the storm. From the briefings, Hauptmann recalled this of Kobor. It is a settlement of low importance, though fell early to the Arcanade onslaught. Militarum intelligence is limited, but suggests one of the sanguinary tribal warlords rules it like a fiefdom. They are of a particularly barbaric caste, this racial offshoot, allegedly active in several other war zones. More spurious reports claim the proliferation of abhumans amongst its ranks. Such notions come unsupported by evidence and therefore are given little to no credence. The silhouettes solidified, and Hauptmann didn't need Lennox's young eyes to see what was coming for them, or how many. He raised Aramis on the box, and she answered curtly. Captain, he said, his eyes on the herd, as it swept out of the radiation cloud like some unholy tide. Prepare for all-out attack. Fenk heard gunfire and urged his men towards it. He knew Militarum issue gear. It had a certain cadence that every soldier with enough battlefield miles in his boots recognized. Praxis pattern, crisp report, perfect pitch. Mainly las guns, but the rattle of solid shot from a heavy stubber, too. The drumming staccato of the inferior repeaters, favored by the OREC. Noisemakers, no precision. The louder bangs of explosives. A crack grenade meant they'd encountered something heavy. He ran, careful but still quick, focusing on the echoes and the gradual decline in ferocity, the lengthier gaps between bouts of sustained fire. They are falling back. You, private, he snapped, and the lad he didn't recognize turned at the lieutenant's voice. Sir? He knew the routine at least. What's your name? the slightest hesitation. Unsworth, sir. They were running between rubble, the part of Lodden that had taken the worst the war had to throw at it, and had never been rebuilt. Redfern scurried by the lieutenant's side, face grim, eyes everywhere. A survivor was Redfern. Are you fast, Unsworth? Fenk asked. Sir, yes, sir. I want you a scout, fifty yards ahead. See anything coming and you shout, understand? The lad nodded and was on the cusp of herring off when a stern voice cut in. Lieutenant! It froze the lad still, 
A fear instinct cultured within him at the sight of an officer of the Prefectus entering the chain of command. Fenk brought the group to a halt, and they took covering positions as Commissar Gannica came over. Madam Commissar? Where are you going? she asked, the words so starched they had edges. To where our fellow guardsmen are fighting and dying, Commissar. Our orders are to reach Godsword. And we'll get back to that after this. To reach it with all haste, Lieutenant. Her belt holster was already empty, a silver-chased bolt pistol in her hand. To her credit, she didn't level it at him, not yet. Or shall I assume command? Fenk licked his lips, his eyes recording every aspect of Commissar Gannica's face, the bright, fiery eyes and pale skin, the hard line of her lips and jaw. Any softness had been beaten out of her long ago, and sculpted marble remained. The scholar Progenium had turned this imperial orphan into a machine that followed and gave orders. Fenk had met servitors with more warmth. I take it compassion was not on the curriculum, Commissar. Summary execution was. Noted, Fenk replied, not missing a beat. And the men that are selling their lives? Do so with honor in service of the throne. No more tarrying. Orders, Lieutenant. Fenk smiled, but his eyes narrowed as he did so. Orders, Commissar he replied, and they headed back in the direction of God's sword, leaving the dying sounds of battle and of soldiers behind them. Regara and the others met up with Schiller in the main avenue, Lawton northwards. The troops made way for the Chimera, and it had barely stopped when the ramp unfolded and De Vere strode out. The captain had nearly shat himself at the sight, managing little more than a bewildered, Sir? before the general was taking charge. What is he doing here, Major? Schiller asked under his breath, as the rest of the party were disembarking from the hold. Leading, Regara answered. But he's the... Yes, he is, Regara supplied, watching De Vere's ahead, accompanied by Rensaint and the stormtroopers as he disappeared into the crowd. Saints piss, Schiller remarked beneath his breath. Let's hope it doesn't come to that, shall we, Captain? Regara took command of the rest of S.H.I.E.L.D. Company, leaving Schiller with Lance. As they advanced down a wide street, the Vox static that had dogged them passing into the town persisted. It was quiet, but the black outline of Godsword loomed like a promise. Death or victory... The knife edge was keenly balanced. The lack of Vox was a problem. It meant they were effectively cut off from the advance party led by Kulkis, so De Vere's had wisely sent out scouts ahead of the main force to forewarn of danger. The blue bloods dispersed by squads, spilling amongst the town as they broke into smaller groups better suited to close-quarter engagement. Regara kept his men close to De Vere's, a contingent of Agrians accompanied Schiller's force, and a portion of those split off and joined the Major. He saw the Golova he had encountered in the quarter, cradling a Laz carbine to her chest, a belt of skinning knives circling her waist. She favoured him with a wink as she advanced alongside her troops. They looked eager, the diggers. This reckoning was long coming for them, but the object of their vengeance had yet to appear. As they penetrated deep into the town, the continual lack of opposition, the ghost-like avenues and buildings, made Regara uneasy. He exchanged a look with Rensaint, and could tell the commissar felt the same. They were here, though. He could feel them. The pact. Though the side alleys were still, and the window frames and doorways hollow and the shadows unmoving, they were here. It wasn't until a ragtag bunch of scouts came running into Regara's sight, fear in their eyes, that the blood pact finally made themselves known. 
a missile struck a hellhound in the flank, and the tank went up like a tinderbox. Eight men died instantly, burned and shredded, before a chorus of Volponi vox horns sounded the alarm. Everything happened fast after that. Regara saw the Agrian Golliver kill the Pacta holding the missile launcher, a pinpoint shot through the throat. Fire and blast wash from a secondary explosion lit her savagely, ruffling her hair. Makali punched the air, triumphant, bellowing something in her native tongue that Regara took to mean first blood or first kill. A death brigade emerged from the shadows and the ruins, las guns and stubbers lighting up. They wore stained flak armor reinforced with an amalgam of barbed metal plates. Some carried ritual knives, pistols or grenades in the other hand. A surda, low officer class, wielded a long-bladed cleaver sword. Not a man or woman amongst them revealed their face, hidden as they were behind their grotesques. A smell of smiling devils and monsters swept in to engage the militarum. Regara was shouting the order to return fire as the Blue Bloods opened up with their las guns. Stand-mounted heavies were hurried into position, gunners and loaders working in tandem. An intense, short-ranged firefight ensued, a storm of overlapping las beams searing the air from either side of a paved plaza. Bodies fell on both sides. Taking a knee behind a flakboard barricade, Regara snatched off shots into the gloom. He had Rensaint beside him and two squads of blue bloods along the stretch of improvised shielding. De Vere's and his retinue were twenty feet away, hunkered behind a plate of tank armor, shored up by sandbags and razor wire. The scions fired in perfect rhythm, every las bolt a kill. They were conversing between shots, and though Regara couldn't hear them above the roar of the battle, he knew they must be calculating how to extract De Vere's. The man's bravura would get him killed, and so much for all his laurels and victories then. An arcanate heavy gun was really starting to chew up the flak board. A Volponi trooper losing an ear and crumpling to the ground screaming as a stray round clipped him. Ren Saint noticed too and took aim through an alarmingly widening gap in the barricade. A crackling beam speared from his sidearm, a Volkite serpenta of exquisite manufacture. It turned the packed gunner to ash and fire, the ammo hauler dying shortly after, as the gunpowder cooked off and exploded. We can't stay here, Major, he said, shouting to be heard as he snapped off another excellent shot. A rasp wine discharge, and a packed surda fell, torso caught through and burning. Remind me never to duel you with pistols, Commissar. Regara replied, indicating a partially collapsed wall further up the street that would provide better cover. I am also an excellent swordsman, Ren Saint remarked with a wry smile, then nodded his approval at the Major's choice. That might be a more even contest. They moved fast and low, two officers and almost twenty men in train. They lost one, an unlucky ricochet hitting Ethel in the neck. He bled out, choking on his own blood, and all Regara could do was watch. He cursed, firing back, shooting the crown of a pactor's head, the helm and skull exploding messily. Ren Saint was no less effective, the commissar's aim as measured as his wit. The death brigade were the blood-packed elite most of them ex-guard veterans, broken by the war, and turned to the worship of occult gods. Others were mercenaries, swapping coin for dark religion. They fought with discipline and precision. De Vere showed little respect for any of that. He had pushed up with his troops, the scions flanking him either side as he shouted orders to advance. Fingers of energy spidered across the blade of his sword, and he held it up like a beacon, a challenge. He lost a scion, the stormtrooper taking a bullet meant for the general, but it bought a few more yards, and the pressure on the dwindling death brigade increased. They retreated by degrees and in decent order, but de Vere's had the scent of blood, 
a nobleman on the hunt, and the enemy casualties mounted. Schiller snapped at his heels, an eager hound, drunk on more than just the whiff of glory. Regara gave the order to break cover as the fire coming in at his men lessened. He'll get himself killed, he meant De Vere's, of course. Or he'll win the battle single-handed, Ren Saint replied, but the rueful look in his eyes told the entire story. They fell in on the flank, but De Vere's was really pushing now, his grip barely on the leash of his rampant men, who fired on the move, from the hip, sacrificing accuracy for saturation. Amidst the chaos, a runner approached the major, darting between cover. Without functional vox, the old methods held sway. The pale-faced private looked out of breath as he delivered the general's orders. Rally with Brandreth and join the assault on Godsword. Ren Saint's expression suggested he didn't like it, but he was politic enough to keep that to himself. You aren't bound to my command, Commissar, said Regara, pulling his troops together to carry on southwards into Loden. My responsibility is ensuring Godsword returns to Imperial hands. Lead on, Major. The knife was low, and his grip on the haft reversed, as Fink withdrew the blade from the sentry's neck. The body crumpled quietly, Fink taking the weight and gently lowering it to the ground. He signaled, a curt back-and-forward slash of the hand, and Redfern and Koppel moved up. They darted between scraps of cover, using the low light to their advantage. Laz guns slung over shoulders, each man also held a knife. Fenk and his troops had reached the southern quarter of Loden, the ruins of the town slowly giving way to fortifications. It was the fringe of Godsword's domain, where Mechanicus engine seers and Militarum sappers had swept away the old commercia and hab structures, replacing them with barricades and bunkers. The guards were surprisingly light. Two more sentries in blood-stained flak armor and ragged ex-militarum uniforms wandered into view. They wore masks, black iron grotesques, that were the signature apparel for pacted troops. It had the air of the theatrical about it, the mask, possessing a long sloping nose, high cheekbones and brow, and a row of grinning teeth. Through the eye sockets, though, sadism burned brightly. One sentry had an old stubber hooked over their shoulder, the strap and stock well-worn and clearly wore spoils. A blade sat in their grip, thick, serrated, stained with sacrificial blood. The grey host stirred, and Fenk felt the righteousness of the kill it demanded. He pushed it down, content to observe as Redfern slit the neck of the first, but Koppel snagged his own coat, his strapped lasgun smacking against a barricade loud enough to alert his prey. The second sentry turned, a barked invective in packed dialect signaling surprise and contempt. A lasgun with a razor bayonet rose up out of instinct, and Koppel froze, flinching before the beam that would kill him. The trigger was never pulled. A knife, jutting from the second sentry's throat, left them choking on blood. Redfern swept upon them with feline grace, a hand across the mouth of the mask, the other pulling his expertly thrown knife and holding the sentry down until they stopped wriggling. A scathing glance told Koppel he had erred. Recriminations would follow, but not now. Fenk urged them on. Heads down, split into fire teams, they moved through mostly abandoned defenses before hitting a trench line that led right to the edge of the main bunker complex and got sword. So close now, Fenk could smell the ion charge on the air produced by its capacitors. But still, they were a hundred yards or more away from the weapon itself. They descended into the trench, and Fenk dared a glance over the Aegis Wall where he and the others waited. The pact had staved a row of spikes halfway between the defense line and the macro cannon's walled bunker. 
The dingy light made it hard to see why, so he held out his hand for a scope and put the device to his eye a moment later. Only then, his vision enhanced, did he understand. Bloody throne, he rasped. Gannicus' firm grip on his shoulder was a silent plea for explanation. It wasn't the rows of blood-packed troops standing behind the barricades that chilled his already cold heart. It wasn't even the bodies of twenty scions, their eyes cored out, left to rot, tied to those awful spikes. It was the warrior, armoured in baroque, crimson warplate, down on one knee in front of them. And then, Fenk felt the air change, grow heavier. The actinic scent of the capacitors ramped up, and with mounting horror, he knew what was about to happen. Hauptmann was on fire. A stray flamer burst from a four-wheeled Tauros had caught him, and he patted his arm furiously until the fire was out. The heat barely registered. They were moving, cavaliers left and right of him, snapping off shots like riders circling a lager of wagons. Tauros behind them, autocannons a perpetual heavy rattle in his ear, attempting to stymie the tide. Never the last ride, he shouted across the Vox. A las pistol bucked in Hauptmann's fist, a heavy gauge hot shot. It actually kicked the recoil like a punch. The beast fell, half its head burned down to scorched meat, smoke trailing from its eye socket as it hit the dirt and disappeared. They might have been human once, the beasts. They cantered on two legs, reverse jointed and hoofed. They were brawny, frothing at the mouth and draped in coarse, wiry hair. Hauptmann had heard rumors, they all had, of some guard units using so-called beast men in their ranks. Usually penal regions or murder squads with low life expectancy. He had chalked it up to tall tales from soldiers with too much grain alcohol in their cups. Stories about amalgams of man and beast. Ovine, caprine, bovine. Variations on an abhuman theme. He estimated hundreds, a great herd of rad-scarred creatures too tough or too stubborn to die. A few carried auto-guns and other crude firearms, though they used them poorly. Others had swords or improvised clubs. Overseers in gas hoods and riding cyber equines drove the beasts with whips and electro-goads. They looked human enough, their cruelty as well as their appearance suggesting as much. Hauptmann watched as a group of the beasts staggered through the Prometheum fire of a flamer, only to reach the Tauros that had burned them and fall amongst its crew, hacking and feasting. A grenade went off, rupturing the vehicle's fuel tanks, and Hauptmann turned his gaze from the sudden flare of light and noise. More were coming, pressing at the edges of the column and pushing it further southwards. Lennox took sniper shots with his rifle, aiming it for the overseers. A gas-hooded rider was struck and slipped off his mount. The herd barely paused to rend and devour them. Fall back, Hauptmann was shouting. He rode up and down the line, fighting to get his cavaliers to coalesce. They were strung out, vulnerable. He'd lost sight of Vecca and feared the worst. Roper acknowledged the order with a curt wave of his hand, gathering up nearby riders. Garrison fell in beside his sergeant. Mathis was on his wheel. How many? asked Hauptmann, bouncing in his saddle even as he eased off the throttle. The stink of the beasts was heady now, their grunting and howling almost deafening. I counted twelve amongst mine, Garrison replied. Another ten with me offered Roper, bringing in his vulper alongside. With Lennox, that made twenty-three. Hauptmann swore, then glanced over his shoulder. The last of the Tauros were right behind them, a mass of beasts swarming several hundred yards in their wake. Ahead, the short distance to the vehicle column closed at an alarming rate. A few of the guardsmen had started taking pot shots from Chimera firing slits, but it was as effective as shooting into a sea. 
We can't hold that, damn it. Not a tide like that. Hauptmann opened up his vox. Captain, he began. Tell me we're winning, Sergeant. Wish I could, Captain. We have to retreat, or they'll hit the column. In your estimation, can we weather it? The herd is in the hundreds, Captain, and moving damn fast. Aramis swore loudly over the box. Retreat takes us well within range of God's sword. We're already on the cusp, Sergeant. It's too risky. Once that herd hits, it won't matter either way. The crackle of Vox feed answered. A few moments of dead air filled with the urgent drone of Vulpa engines as they barreled away from certain death. Then we stand and fight. Prepare your troops. The Vox feed cut out abruptly. Hauptmann gave a long exhale. Then he raised his hand and turned it in a circle. Rally on me. Throttling the engines, he peeled off, and the other cavaliers followed his lead. They rode to the front of the column as the chimeras began to slow and come to a halt. Hatches opened, soldiers clambered off chassis and filed out, ranking up in firing lines in front of their transports. One trooper stayed on the mounted guns, turrets turning to face the enemy. Only the secondary column ploughed on, the servitor drivers following their protocols without an engine seer to countermand them. Hauptmann watched them go and saw snatches of the herd follow, but it did little to thin their numbers. They were meant to be a diversionary force and weren't equipped for pitched battle, but that hardly mattered now. Aramis would have to do the best with what she had and pray to the throne it was enough. As he circled back along the south edge of the column, Hauptmann saw her alight from the command chimera, the two battle tanks either side. She strode over to her men, helm and armor shining, a half cape flapping in the breeze at her shoulder. The blue bloods waited in disciplined ranks, their las guns held at the ready. She had drawn the short sword from the sheath on her leg and held it high above her head, poised. Her pistol rested at her side, held loosely. Volpone interspersed with Talpa, though even the tunnel rats had fallen silent. A few Slocan fire teams lurked amongst the line, too, desperate for some measure of glory to justify their high-born notions of war. Three hundred soldiers, all told, several armored carriers, and a pair of Lehman Russ battle tanks. Even with the addition of Hauptmann and his remaining outriders, it wasn't much, not nearly enough. The herd grew louder and the scent of them thickened. It drew a sneer from Hennessy, who had donned his officer's cap and had a lasgun slung over his shoulder. Such debasement, he said, hard to believe they are part human. Aramis never took her eyes off the enemy. Is it, Corporal? I'm not so sure. Plosive detonations had started up as the Lehman Rust tanks fired their battle cannons. Plumes of dirt and animal bodies were flung skywards as the ordnance found its mark, hammering the edges of the herd, corralling the beastmen so they didn't spill too wide and encircle the militarum forces. Hauptmann's cavaliers would sweep up any stragglers or strays that broke the cordon. The emperor would need to see to the rest. To have a chance, any chance, she had to keep the beasts in front. Aramis estimated three hundred yards or so between them and the herd now. Soon the din would be difficult to compete against, so she chose this moment to address her troops. Soldiers of Volponi, she declared, not bothering to reference the others, who she deemed no better than militia. Rattle cracks of fire snapped from a few places amongst the line where Talpa and Sloka had already begun to shoot, it was fear, she knew, but it was also ineffectual. The blue bloods held firm, their martial discipline etched into their bones. At my signal, you shall fire as one, front and rear rank. Sergeants carried the order down the line, and her words echoed back to her several times. The standard pattern lasgun had an effective range of approximately 330 yards, it was a fine, reliable weapon, 
but only at short range could it be truly devastating. Confronted by a solid wall of baying, snorting beastmen, Aramis could conceive of only one path to victory. Let them get close and hit them hard. Inflict as much damage as possible at once. Induce panic. She calculated the Volponi would have two rounds of fire, possibly three if Fortune smiled, before the herd was amongst them. At two hundred yards, she said to Hennessy, Volponi glory, corporal. Volponi glory, captain. At a hundred yards, she slashed down with her sword and the gloom turned to light and fire. Dozens fell to the first volley, Laz beams ruthlessly scything. The smell of burnt meat grew heady and nauseating. The herd trampled the dead and the dying, heedless of them, driven only by pain, by the need to vent that pain on others. Second volley! roared Aramis, sword slashing as the Volponi fired again. The beasts faltered, their horde coherency starting to break down as parts of the herd attempted to slow and turn, to flee. Precious seconds were gained. Aramis raised her sword again. It was about to descend when she felt the detonation rumble through the air. She half turned, sword wavering, and saw the spit of flame reaching from the lofty mouth of Godsword's primary cannon. A cold realization hit. The science had failed. They were too close. There was no time. It roared like thunder. The vast artillery shell, as it bore down with the fury and purpose of a comet. She met Hennessy's gaze, saw fear, and knew her own eyes would convey only sadness and regret. I'm sorry, Gavit, she mouthed, before there wasn't time enough to say anything else. A tremor shook the walls of Lawton, the anger of a god-weapon given voice. Colchis felt it through the pavers beneath his feet, and saw it in the dust motes spilling from the wooden beams overhead, as he stumbled from the threat in the shadows. His fear of the immediate was briefly eclipsed by the harrowing sense of failure and what followed it. The blood packed still held the weapon. An alleyway encroached on either side, heavy stone walls braced with cedar wood and bolted firmly. Mugger's Row, they called it. Little light penetrated this dingy hollow of Lodden, made darker by overcast skies. His leg was agony, the morphia already fading. He could scarcely stand. Morbid thoughts intruded as his death drew nearer. The others fought as Colchis staved off despair. Garnu was out front, depleting the last dregs of his Lazrapeter as he strafed the avenue beyond. He lost his footing as the ground trembled under him. His dagger took him forwards, and a flash of metal tore his bicep. Garnu cried out and clutched his arm, the repeater falling from his grasp and sagging on its shoulder strap. Another ranger took his place, a half-born war shout on his lips, before the snick of a blade removed his head, releasing a fount of arterial crimson. Park shouted down his revulsion, blood bathing his upper body as he hooked Garnu around the waist and pulled him back. The other troopers took the Talpa's lead, recoiling in horror. Scarcely ten men remained, the stragglers lying dead in the avenue where the wire wolves had steadily picked them off. Form ranks, snapped Colchis, finding some resolve. Hold on, another few seconds, and then another. If you know you're going to die, make the enemy fight for it. The words of a drill sergeant, long dead but not forgotten. A man didn't survive because he was the best fighter or the finest tactician. He survived because he refused to give in. Colchis would not give in. He heard Grice shoulder the door again, using every inch of his bulk and strength. It was stuck, bent inwards by a grenade blast, and led to an old machine shed. If they could get inside, they might last a little longer. Another few seconds. The dead-end alley was precisely that, after the blind scramble from the fountain in the square, running from the dread creations of the arch-enemy. In his half-panicked state, 
Colchis recalled only fragments about the wire wolves. It was a local cognomen. The Militarum classified them K-weapons or kill weapons, murder makers as some had dubbed them, a melange of metal and arcana, ritual science, the incongruity of which had made Colchis scoff. He wasn't scoffing now. A solitary chink of light remained. The wirewolves had slowed. It was the only reason any of the guardsmen yet lived. Though the creatures were still predatory, the early vigor that had seemed to most of the lieutenant's men had ebbed, a tide pulling away from the shore of their patchwork forms. Like their namesake, however, they had begun to circle their prey, that furnace gaze burning. A clutch of Volponi lasmen led by Hanmar ranked up, one kneeling in front, another standing behind five abreast. They fired at the lieutenant's order, retreating a step after each volley, but it barely made a dent. The wirewolves took ponderous strides through the las fire, hunched over as if their heads and forelimbs were too heavy for their frames to bear. The avian thing dragged its wings, a wretched, flightless horror. Grice, said Colchis, regretting the edge of panic in his voice. Another grunt, a creak of protesting but unyielding metal. The Laz men fell back again and Colchis joined them, Laz pistol flaring with azure discharge. Make the bastards bleed for it! Only a few feet stood between the blue bloods and the machine shed now. No more backward steps, and still the wire wolves refused to fall. A cross street cut Mugger's Row in half, a junction they could not reach. All other avenues of escape denied to them, with the machine shed effectively sealed. As the wire wolves moved across the junction, a shout echoed from nearby, just out of sight. The things half turned, as if some dim part of them recognized the imminence of their dissolution and wanted to look their slayers in the eye. A storm engulfed the wire wolves, full bore and ferocious. Black iron wilted against it like paper exposed to a flame. White light scorched his retinas before Colchis had to turn away. The high-pitched shriek of energy discharge ringing long after the fusillade had faded. Corpusant played across shattered pavers, fingers of charred black stone grasping from the epicenter of a violent detonation. A moment later, a band of blue bloods hustled into view with Regara at their head. He took in the dead, the ragged state of Kulkis and his men. In the guard, said Regara, a soldier is not judged by the manner in which he lives. He is judged by how he meets his death, Kulkis replied. And we are not dead yet. Kulkis straightened, defiant. His men did too. No, we are not, sir. The pride in Regara's eyes almost hid the grief. It swiftly turned to resolve. Can you fight, Lieutenant? We can, sir. Then fall in, and by throne, let's take back what's ours. Chapter 15 The warrior was praying. Hiding behind the Aegis wall with his men, Fenk found his attention pulled towards him like a black hole, unable to look away. Head bowed, scarred lips moving softly, coal-ringed eyes shut to better see his gods. Tiny scripture riddled his scalp. Baroque armor of black and crimson clad a hulking body. A black iron gorget encircled a thick neck. Scripts of parchment, some dark with old blood, others burnt by ritual fire, fluttered from shoulder guards that curved up and over the arms. A horn arched from one, three small skulls rattling against it. A large blade lay reverently across the warrior's gauntleted palm, and it was this to which he prayed, or rather to the act it had recently committed. Blood shone wetly in the light of yellow sodium lamps. The knife had been used to carve the sigils into the scions, 
symbols of hate and anarchy, a beseeching to old gods. A feeling rose within Fenk like heartburn or a bad piece of meat twisting in his gut. With an odd sense of detachment, he realized it was fear, primordial and instinctual. He didn't know the warrior's order. Such knowledge was not for men like him, nor did he care to know. Let the universe have its secrets. Fenk would keep his own. Fenk knew what he was. He knew the pieces within him were misaligned, aberrant. Empathy was an unfamiliar emotion to men like him. In spite of that, of what war or ill-breeding had made him into, Fenk could still recognize evil when he encountered it. A traitor Astartes. This one was like a priest or warrior monk, a son of ruin, spat from hell to malign all of mankind. He stole a glance at Redfern and found the corporal clenching his teeth, pupils like pinholes. Are you with me, corporal? Fenk hissed. A hundred yards away, he didn't know if the warrior could hear him, but he took no chances. Redfern didn't move. His knuckles whitened on his bayonet knife. Corporal, Fenk tried again, and this time Redfern turned to nod. In the distance, the warrior was rising, his devotions at an end. What do we do? asked Redfern. Fenk stole a glance at Creedy. The man reminded the lieutenant of a Skolam teacher, with a bookish face and a pair of wireframe glasses hooked behind his ears. The Vox man, who had the receiver cup pressed to his ear, shook his head. Fenk's chrono ticked over, bound to his wrist by a strip of leather, the metal plates of the face folding over half by half and revealing that Brandreth was overdue. No Colchis or Schiller either. Something must have waylaid them. Either that, or they were already dead, and Fenk and his platoons were the only guardsmen left alive in Lawton. Gannica appeared in his periphery, a tacit reminder of Fenk's duty, having shuffled up through the ranks as she navigated along the Aegis Wall. That is a traitor Astartes before us, Lieutenant, she said, keeping her voice and her head low. There is no greater foe a true servant of the throne will ever face. Fenk barely held back his scorn. I know what it is, Commissar. Are you telling me to engage it? No, Lieutenant, Gannica replied crisply. I am saying that if you choose to, I shall be at your side. Fenk saw the resolve in her eyes. It was bred in them, the progenium cadets. A useful trait for certain, but it couldn't shield everything. She was afraid, too. Fenk had never considered himself heroic. He liked killing. He could acknowledge that about himself, but this was different. A hundred yards between Fenk's men and suicidal glory. He smiled ruefully. We have to take the weapon ourselves. Redfern blinked, incredulous. How, sir? By any means necessary. Fenk made a quick assessment of the terrain. A hundred or so blood-packed defended the weapon and its immediate compound, several guarding the wall itself. Static defense guns ringed this perimeter, surrounding a metal dome that housed the capacitors for the macro cannon array, but these were lightly manned. Beyond that was a command bunker that he couldn't see, but which he assumed must also be guarded. And then there was the traitor Astartes. He had begun to make his way back to the main body of pacted troops, waiting behind improvised outworks in front of the weapon and soon disappeared amongst them. The capacitors had begun to cool and recharge after the first barrage. A second would follow. This channel runs right up to the compound edge, said Fink. I'll take two fire teams along the Aegis Wall, infiltrate the inner perimeter, and take the main nest, static guns and all. The rest will make a feint against their main forces, keep them occupied. 
Those sturdy guns can be turned on the yard below the compound. We create a kill box, hold it for as long as we can, and hope that help arrives before we're all dead. You have a somewhat perfunctory leadership style, don't you, Lieutenant? Gannaker observed. I'm still alive, aren't I? Fenk replied. I'll lead the faint, offered Redfern, his earlier fear tamped down by the focus on action. No, I need you with the second fire team, Corporal, Fenk countered. Leave that to me, Lieutenant, said Gannaker. Fenk nodded his opinion of the commissar ever-changing. He looked around at his men, the squad sergeants already daisy-chaining the plan as Redfern picked the fire teams. They had clustered together as close as they were able, as if sensing the import of the moment. Every face was a hard, resolute mask. He was proud of them, these bastards. I won't say good luck, Fenk told them, only the credulous trust to luck. So I'll say this instead. Die well, and die bloody. As speeches went, thought Fenk, it wasn't bad. A savage grin spread across the faces of the men in his charge, each as eager and fatalistic as their commanding officer. The two groups separated, Gannica's faint bleeding back down the Aegis line to a secondary position amongst the ruins, from where they would attack. Fenk and Redfern's fire teams remained, stripping out of their webbing, ditching any non-essential gear. They had to be light and fast. As he was shedding his rations and canteen, Fenk caught Unsworth's eye. The lad looked transfixed, gazing up at the monument to death, that was God's sword. Fenk clenched his shoulder and brought him around. Are you up for this, Private? The lad nodded, and what Fenk had at first taken to be fear, he now realized was something else. It was zeal. Die well, die bloody, he replied, to which Fenk gave a feral smile. Hauptmann couldn't move, nor could he see. Smoke and dust had filled the air, his senses a cacophony of distant pain and disorientation. The air tasted of metal and rapid ionization. He heard shouts, cries, bestial snuffling. He remembered the light, first of all, a searing magnesium fury that eclipsed everything and turned it white. Then came the noise, a rising crescendo, a world's ending cataclysm that split earth and turned sand to glass. His ears still rang with it, and vitrified fragments cracked beneath him as he tried to crawl. Belatedly, Hauptmann realized his engine pinned him by the left ankle, a faithful servant now turned betrayer. His efforts only dug a shallow grave to lie in. About to shout for help, he saw shadows staggering through the murk, snorting and grunting. One paused, stabbing down with a crude blade, and a strangled gurgle followed. Other shapes slowly resolved. The wrecked husks of armored transports, bodies hanging across torn stanchions like limp garments left to dry in the sun, or else slumped on their backs from hatchways, or draped on embarkation ramps like discarded mannequins. Several of the bodies had the bulky artificiality of servitors, and the breeze stank with aerosolized oil-blood amalgam. Others mewled, with all too human frailty and pain, only for the beasts to snuff the sounds out. They roamed drunkenly through the carnage, reeking of ordure and hot animal sweat. A shining spar of chimera chassis glinted in the clawed grip of one, employed as an improvised spear. It thrust, and a plaintive cry abruptly cut out. They were heading his way. Hauptmann reached for his sidearm, but found the holster empty. He kept a knife on the kit bag strapped to his vulper, and searched for that too, but it was gone. He cast about in the dun-coloured haze, the murk slowly lifting as the dust and smoke began to dissipate, but there was nothing, no weapon, 
not even a piece of shrapnel he could use. Nearby he heard the crackle of flames, suppressing a moment of panic as he considered the vulpa's fuel tank, but the burning came from behind, from the vast crater torn into the earth from the macro cannon's impact. He had been caught at the very edge of its destructive potential, and he assumed thrown. Of the other cavaliers there was no sign, but he felt a coldness in his heart at the thought of them that could not have just been sentiment. Arching his neck, stretching to its fullest extent, Hauptmann tried to gauge the magnitude of the devastation, but just saw black, endless and engulfing black, shimmering and glassy like a dark obsidian sea. A sharp bleat alerted him, and Hauptmann looked ahead again. His desperate movements must have given him away, because the beasts were coming now. Bovine and caprine, they emerged through thinning dust, blooded yet hungry. Madness burned in their dark eyes, devoid of humanity. Panicking, Hauptmann's breath stabbed out in short, sharp hikes as he looked around. Frantic, he raked through every pouch and stowage on his bike that he could reach, pulling out maps and compass, an empty canteen, nothing of use. He pushed again, trying to lever himself from under the heavy engine, but his leg remained stuck. The stench intensified, abattoir ripe and noisome. He gagged, bile stinging his throat, and fought back the urge to vomit. An insect was buzzing in his ears. A cloud of flies followed the foul creatures and their passage through the banquet of the dead. Hauptmann saw them properly now, their gait cautious as they approached him, the caprine gnawing the last hanks of flesh from a blooded human femur. Scraps of uniform clung to it like tendrils of hair, and it devoured these too before casting aside its vile repast. Thin ropes of saliva drooled from the bovine's upthrust jaw, its flat-headed teeth already grinding in anticipation. As they closed, Hauptmann lost the creatures from sight for a moment, as the vulpa came between them and him. He dared to believe they had lost interest and moved on, as beasts are sometimes wont to do. But a few seconds later they crept around the front of his treacherous mount, brimming with savage intent. He wanted to roar, to cry defiance, knowing he could not overpower them in his current state, and that cannibalization by abhuman half-breeds was a poor way to die. But instead he stared, eyes wide, close to mania, as the thought of his own dissolution almost overwhelmed him. He thought of Chari, and of the son he would never meet, of the man he might have become, and hoped he would think of his father fondly and forgive him for leaving them. It was a pleasant fiction, but not enough to shield him from the horror of that bestial moor sinking down to take its fill. A las beam flashed, close enough to burn Hauptmann's cheek, and he hissed in unexpected pain. Warm, stinking blood splashed his face, like a ritual anointing, and the bovine fell back with the impact of the shot. The caprine squealed, spooked, and suddenly afraid. Turning tail, it clopped a few feet before a second beam found its back and caught it like a rotten apple, the blast pitching it headlong into the dirt. Hauptmann let out a breath he hadn't realized he was holding and felt strong hands grasp his arms. Aramis looked down at him, stern, as she holstered her pistol and then tried to free him. Keep a watch! she said to someone off to the left, where Hauptmann couldn't see. These bastards are everywhere. Her uniform looked a little disheveled, the breastplate stained with spots of blood. The cape at her shoulder had a large tear in it and flapped like a pair of vibrant carnival streamers. Captain, said Hauptmann in a hoarse croak. I thought you were dead, Sergeant, she said, pulling. I'm a hard man, Hauptmann winced. The captain's touch was none too delicate. To kill? Right enough you are, she said. 
and beckoned the person she had spoken to forwards. He wore a Volponi corporal's uniform and had a bionic in place of his left eye. The entire left hemisphere of his skull was shaved, a plate over the parietal bone. As a trained cavalryman meant to operate as scout and wayfinder, Hauptmann had received some medical training. He hadn't had much cause to use it. Strange how the details returned sometimes. It was a deflection technique, he knew, to stave off the agony of the vulper being lifted from his trapped ankle. On my count, Hennessy, Aramis said to the corporal, letting go of Hauptmann's arms to snap off a quick shot into the shadows. A canine yelp confirmed the kill. She took up her previous position and counted down from three. On one, she cried, Pull! Hauptmann screamed. He wasn't proud. It hurt like all the nine devils of Horus had stabbed him in unison as Aramis dragged him free. She was strong, stronger than she looked, which was actually pretty considerable. He felt a sting in his neck, and as the fiery agony deadened, realized he had been given a morphia shot. His head floated, senses blurring before they snapped back like a sudden focus adjustment on a picture. He was being dragged again, both Aramis and the corporal she had addressed as Hennessy, pulling him bodily through the desert wilds. Where? he slurred, the pain meds thickening his tongue. There's a redoubt, said Aramis, not far. A few of the chimeras, one of the tanks. Hennessy and I went back in to search for survivors. The conversation was a juddering cascade of hurried words and half-snatched images. Hennessy looking down, trying to appear calm and supportive. Aramis's concerned glances behind them, where Hauptmann's booted feet limply bundled along, giving him away. Back in, asked Hauptmann, struggling for the words. He strained, pulling his chin to his chest to see the way they had come. Close up, it had felt intense, claustrophobic. At a distance... There was only horror. A crater spread out across the Crag Hill wilds, a yawning black desolation ringed with the hollowed frames of Militarum vehicles, still burning, their hulls partially melted in the blast heat that had killed their crewmen. Ash and bone remained, candle flames guttering in eye sockets, metacarpals and phalanges as thick and brittle as fire-blackened twigs. A banner burned fifty feet away, its bright material steadily devoured. Hauptmann wept as he beheld hell itself, a fiery pit in which nothing lived. What survivors, he rasped, and let his head fall back. Chapter 16 Gannica had engaged, her exhortations to the Emperor loud and bullish. Whipping snapfire cracked from behind the columns and fallen rubble where her troops took position. A heavier plasma beam droned alongside, a deeper beat against the pitchy crescendos of las carbines. Then the thudding report of the Commissar's sidearm, bursting bodies with its mass reactives. It was a spirited attempt, thought Fenk who caught snatches of the battle as he scurried along the Aegis Wall with two fire teams in his wake. Heads down, nimble and unburdened, but for what weapons they could carry and the bandoliers around their waists. The blue bloods hit the edge of the compound wall as the firefight in the wide road below intensified. A wicked crossfire lashed over the scrap of open ground between the two forces, Rockcrete chips and puffs of grit exploding across barriers of low cover. Here and there, a soldier would be hit, a lucky shot or a bad call as they scrambled for advantage. The pact fought hard, as they had been trained to do. The cracks of stubbers and purloined lasguns, a violent rejoinder to Gannica's opening salvos. At first they held back, caught between their barbaric urge to rush the enemy and the orders of their Damagawa to man the defenses. 
Then they bellowed, blades rattling against pieces of metal chest plate, the belligerence of their voices distorted through their grotesques. Va neck, va neck. Fenk knew enough of the enemy's feral argo to recognize this for a name. A channel parted in the ranks, spiked helms shuffling as the pacted admitted a huge armored figure, the warrior priest, he who had slain the scions. Vanek. Poised at the compound wall, Fenk watched Vanek move slowly, like a prize fighter about to take the ring. Closer now than he had been before, the sense of sheer inviolability the warrior priest evinced made the breath catch in his throat. Fenk held out the flat of his palm behind him, signaling for his men to wait. Not yet, not yet. Laz beam splashed against Varnek's crimson and black as he climbed the outworks, a pattering of rain for all the trouble it caused him. A full helm hid the scriptured face, horns of ebony twisting from the brow, a cold iron mask like a portcullis gate. Unperturbed by the solid shot dashing his greaves and breastplate, the warrior priest pulled a long, chain-toothed sword from his back. A throaty engine growl and the teeth began to churn. A brave lasman stepped out from cover to hurl a grenade, the warrior priest shot it partway through its arc, so quick Fink hadn't even seen the pistol being drawn. Fire and shrapnel spread across the air like a spill of ink. A second shot took the plucky lasman in the hip before he could step back, leg and pelvis separating violently, bloodily, as the brass round detonated as soon as it embedded. Flung by the blast, the blooded corpse landed in the street. The warrior priest advanced purposefully, but unhurried. The pacted, swilling in his wake as they left behind the barricade, eager to share in the slaughter. He uttered something, the words unknown to Fenk, but ringing hot like bee stings in his ear. The blood packed on his heels replied with a rabid cheer, Varnek's oratory whipping them into a frenzy. Ganneke gave her own impassioned shout, her words lost to the bitter firefight unfolding, but a flurry of Laz fire followed. About eighty yards between both sides now. A plasma beam missed its intended target, the warrior priest fleeter than he had any right to be in that armor, but cooked a pactor down to the bone. The death scream barely made it past the scarred lips. The commissar fared better, striking Varnek's bolt pistol with cold precision. After the explosion died off, he was left nursing three fingers in a ruined left hand. The right clenched the chainsword as he picked up the pace, the angry revs an expression of the warrior priest's wrath. He took most of the pectors with him. Rifles and auto guns were discarded for ritual blades and sidearms. Fink had seen blood packed at close quarters. They were ferocious, more like animals than men. Only a handful surrounding the Damagawa remained. All death brigade, as well as a few pactors manning the wall guns, who had not even bothered to take aim. Against the traitor Astartes, Fink reckoned Gannica had minutes at most. Her troops were already falling back by degrees. He gave a succinct slash of the hand, back and forth, back and forth, move, move, move. Redfern took point, boosted up the wall by a fellow blue blood, and then he was clambering over the lip. A hand thrust down, and Unsworth took it, as eager and scared as any of them. Both fire teams scaled the outer defenses quickly and quietly, the attention of the packed gunners on the unfolding carnage below. Fink caught a glimpse through the north-facing barricade, Gannica with chain blade aloft and bolt pistol blazing like a poster child for imperial propaganda. Then the warrior priest was amongst them, hewing and rending, and all of that jingoistic fervor faded. An illusion founded on sand. He revised minutes down to seconds. 
The fire team split. The defensive guns that ringed the inner part of the compound ran on a rail bolted around its circumference. A bridge led from this ramped section to a large platform and a hatchway to the bunker where God's sword had been amalgamated with Lawton's outer defences. Within, the gun could be readied, primed, and fired. A small cadre of operators would be inside, probably at least two guards. Redfern's men went left, headed for the defensive guns, while Fenks went right, going for the bridge and the bunker. One of his team, Fife, carried a Praxis pattern fusion gun, not unlike the plasma weapon venting below. That and the brace of crack grenades Fenk carried should see them through the armored hatchway. Already the air had started to vibrate, a background hum that made his teeth itch. Iron saturation. A second barrage from God's sword was imminent. Fenk pushed up. A guard walked into his eyeline and paused. As if suddenly wrong-footed, Fenk dropped him, last shot to the neck, and just like that, the attack commenced. He had to give the blood pact credit. They were tenacious bastards. They were all so prepared. At a Surda's keyed command, a series of auto ramparts sprang up from concealed recesses in the floor. It took Fenk by surprise, and the pactors made quick use of the impromptu cover. Fenk rolled back around a corner, chased by a salvo of retaliatory fire. Shit! Down! Get down! Fife was dead, shot in the brief panic, his fusion gun intact, but just beyond reach and trapped under the trooper's body. Carborn had taken a hit. Blood drenched his left shoulder. A big man was Carborn, heavy set like an auroch. The lad Unsworth looked unscathed, but was hunkered down and unmoving like the rest. Fank locked eyes with them both across the width of the ramp. They couldn't stay here. Gannica needed those defensive guns in her corner, and the rest of the army needed the throne damned godsword silenced. Fenk whistled sharply, signaling Creedy. The Voxman looked pale and ducked back reflexively as a burst of solid shot chipped the edge of the wall where he was crouching. Of the fire teams, only Creedy had kept his most burdensome piece of kit. He raised Redfern on the Vox, even though the corporal was but twenty or thirty yards away, albeit out of sight. A loud detonation, presumably from a grenade, sounded before the snatched report confirmed Fink's fears. The other fire team were pinned. Matters worsened further a few moments later as Varnick landed on the ramp. He must have leapt from the street, Fenk conceded, mind reeling at the implications of that. The lieutenant felt it through the floor, a violent jerk of distressed metal yielding to a heavy mass. It only briefly crossed his mind what that might mean for the commissar and those below before he heard the monotonous burring of an Astartes chainsword. He had either finished them or the weapon was a greater priority. Redfern's shout abruptly cut off. It was followed by the thud of a body hitting the inner compound wall. Heavy footfalls, like jackhammers, struck the ramp. A rapid acceleration of movement. Another scream, loud and then soft, as a man was bulled off the ramp by what felt like a battering ram. Fink could only hear it the carnage happening twenty yards away around the opposite side of the compound wall. It was part of the armor plating that encased the immense capacitors for the weapon. Power build up trembled the metal, heated it. Screw it! Fink darted from cover, pistol lit in his hand, a flurry of bolts finding two pacted who had made the mistake of relaxing their guard when the traitorous Startis had entered the fray. He took one of them in the throat, the last beam like a dart, piercing through and through. The second was shot in the head, a neat, cauterized hole through helm and skull. Both fell back. The rest surged, but Carborn and Creedy had followed the lieutenant, blasting away with manic abandon, and the momentum of the skirmish tipped. The return fire clipped Feng's shoulder, a graze nothing more, 
as he vaulted the first auto rampart. The Surda was waiting for him on the other side. He had just enough time to get his bayonet knife up to parry as the Surda swung her ritual blade. Sparks flew where metal connected, scraping apart before clashing again. Thrown, she was strong. Fenk had glimpsed Carborn, who spun in a tangled pirouette, struck in the chest. Creedy hit a third pactor, but could only wound them. He shot again up close to finish the job. He looked whitewashed, out of breath from panic, but he was still fighting. Two remained, the Surda locked with Fenk, and another running for the bridge and the bunker. Heavy reinforcements within, Fenk guessed, forced to reassess his earlier estimations. Unsworth shot the runner in the back, dropping him, and without a second's hesitation put a second las bolt in the Surda. Searing heat rasped Fenk's ear as the beam passed by and found the eyehole of a grotesque. The immediate pressure on Fenk eased as the Surda fell away, ritual blade clattering on the ramp. Shit and thrown, lad, Fenk gasped, rubbing at his scorched lobe. Thunder rattled the ramp, relief turning to horror on Unsworth's face. Varnek had found them. Creedy managed to turn his head before the chainsword ripped through him from behind. A fizz of static cut out as the boxy vox unit was shorn in two before a sheet of blood and matter swept the ramp. Fenk fell back in shock, the front of his body painted crimson. He scrambled, slipping on the gore still sluicing from Creedy. The reek of hot metal and sulphur stuffed his nose and mouth like a gag, choking him. Spits of chewed meat were still flicking off the chain teeth of Varnek's sword as the warrior priest slowed the engine to clear it. A laz burst, raked his flank, and he swept out an arm, throwing Carborn, who had survived his chest wound, into the wall. The crunch of bone left the outcome of the trooper's survival without question this time. The distraction was momentary. Ineffectual scorch marks on Varnek's armor, the only sign of Carborn's failed intervention. Fenk palmed the crack grenade hooked to his bandolier. Die well, die bloody. The warrior priest's pitiless gaze fell on him through green retinal glass. Come on then, you bastard, roared Fenk in a rare fit of emotion. Varnek uttered a reply in some dead language, the words guttural and arcane, his tone imperious. Fenk understood his meaning well enough, and thumbed the grenade's detonator stud. About ten yards stood between him and his imminent death, ten yards and less than two pounds of pressure. Varnek crossed the distance in a blink, blurringly fast, a gauntleted hand around Fenk's neck. Fenk's vision crowded with blackness. He felt his grip loosen, and then he was flying, the grenade too. He struck one of the auto ramparts, felt his shoulder crack from the impact, and bit his lip to divert the pain. A dull explosion far off signaled his plan's failure, the crack grenade spent without meaningful effect. Groggy, consciousness fleeting, he fumbled for another grenade, but found he no longer wore the bandolier. It lay a few feet away, the straps and buckles ripped apart. A deep, rasping noise emanated from the warrior priest's portcullis mouth grill. As Fenk realized what must have happened, Varnek was laughing. Then came the flash wind of an energy burst, and blood spatter from the hole cored in the warrior priest's chest splashed Fenk's face. Varnek staggered. Fenk blinked away tears of iron-rich blood, still trying to figure out what had happened as the traitor space marine sank to his knees. Gauntleted fingers gently probed at the terrible wound that had vaporized heart, lungs, and most of his internal organs. It was miraculous that he was still functioning at all. As he pitched face forward, a wild-looking Unsworth was revealed behind the dead Varnek, clutching Fife's fusion gun. For a moment, Fenk was speechless. He almost couldn't believe it. 
and brought red-stained fingers to his lips to confirm it. The effect was bracing, a concoction utterly unlike mortal blood, strong and acerbic. He tasted mild acid. Not waiting for instruction, Unsworth was on his feet, fusion gun on a sling over his shoulder and sweeping up the fallen bandolier. Halfway down the ramp, he hurled the grenade belt at the hatchway as Fenk looked on, still dazed. It blew with grievous effect. The explosive Unsworth had primed, cooking off the rest, in a massive detonation that tore away the hatch and most of the side of the bunker. The blast rocked the private onto his heels, and he held up his arm to ward off the sudden heat and pressure. Seconds later, several figures staggered from the smoky, fiery wreck. Laz beams shuddered forth, smears of light on air, ill-aimed and desperate. Fenk had scrambled to his feet, a sorry, blood-stained mess, but reached Unsworth as the lad began hosing the exposed bunker interior with the fusion gun. Pactors burned up like bonfires. It was over in seconds, just before the weapon overheated, and Unsworth dropped it like a ticking debt charge. Get on the guns, lad, snapped Fink, still unsteady, head pounding, arm numb. His voice was a snarled rasp from where Varnek had tried to crush his throat. There was still fighting going on below. He heard the guttural noises of more blood packed. Unsworth nodded, belting across the ramp to the other side of the compound. Still on the bridge, Fenk felt the de-escalation of power from the weapon and sagged before passing out. The air changed as the explosion from the compound faded, and Colchis reasoned that Fenk must have succeeded. He prayed to the Emperor for that, a chink of light in abject darkness, as a second cohort of Pactid reinforced the first. The archenemy had the numbers, having expertly pulled and picked apart the Imperial aggressors, displaced them across the ruined town. Too late now, they had to fight, hold out until the two army groups could reach them. Kulkis had Ganica in his arms, as he and Grice pulled her from harm's way. Hanmar, Dresk, and Rake guarded their retreat, she had been thrown, he assumed, or smashed aside. Her finely wrought chain blade lay in pieces and far from her reach. Something had destroyed it, her arm with it, the bones shattered. He didn't see what. They had arrived too late for that. They had arrived to find the remnants of two platoons doggedly clinging on against a host of bloody pact, though most of the guardsmen were dead and the rest falling back. Something had slaughtered them. Torn limbs, pulped skulls, spilled viscera lathered the street and made the other troopers gag. It put the reinforcements on the back foot as soon as they had made the bend into the open street. Regara and Ren Saint had pushed through it undaunted, the Lord Commissar sparing a glance for his cadet before engaging the enemy in full voice and fiery bombast. It galvanized to an extent and gave the retreating troops a few precious seconds of breathing room. The Pactors pressed hard, emboldened by the fact that they had the Imperial fighters on the ropes. A wildness affected them, but not enough to spoil their discipline. A Pact officer, a Damagawa, judging by his trappings, bellowed orders, and the men obeyed with well-drilled proficiency. A small cadre of Death Brigade accompanied him, the formidable elites armed with a purloined bolter and a heavy auto gun. It took a toll, tore up scraps of cover, and reduced them to kindling. Blue bloods piled up like sandbags, and the pactors began to press. Regara took a hit, left shoulder, but his armor bore the brunt. His face was ashen when he dropped down behind the stone pillar, though. Ren Saint had joined him, unable to hold his ground against such intensity of fire from the pact. Firing blind with his exotic sidearm, he patted the Major's uninjured shoulder and received a nod and some muted words in reply. Kulkis watched all of this from a distance. The Imperial forces were strung out down the street and struggling to maintain coherency. 
Without a nearby Vox, he had no idea where Schiller or Brandreth and the rest of the army group were. Judging by the Major's battered attire, he had come from a war zone, but beyond that, Colchis had no gauge. There had been little time to debrief after the wire wolves. A medic had patched up Colchis and his men as best as he was able, and that was that. A lonely banner fluttered, shield company. It had been driven into the earth. This and no further, it said. Burn holes admitted feathery shafts of light. Ganica looked pale as milk. Is she dead? asked Garnu, his deep voice carrying despite the furious firefight. His las repeater spent, a knife sheathed at his belt. There was little for the Oryk to do but hold his ground and wait. Puck lurked at his shoulder, an unlikely pairing. He and the Talpa had kept themselves busy, dragging injured troopers into cover. But the guard were hunkered down now, and another backward step would be their last, and the end of their ambitions to retake Laudan. Leaving Rake and Dresk at the barricade where they were sheltering, Hanmar crouched down next to the commissar to check her vitals. Still with us, he said. But for how much longer? Grice gestured with a burly arm to the defensive guns, lined around the upper tier of the godsword compound. Shadows were moving behind them, men about to take up position, between the onset of the pactors and the autocannons above. The nose of one jerked up, suddenly activated. The others followed suit, a clever network array slaving one weapon to the rest so that a single gunner could engage the entire battery if needed. Less accurate, but singularly devastating. God, Emperor, preserve us, uttered Ganu as he made the sign of the Aquila. Puck was laughing, his imminent death a source of constant amusement. Kulkis watched as the muzzle flares lit one by one, and gunfire swept the street like a scythe. Blood packed, fell in droves, torn apart, hewn down like scraps of bloody wheat. A chain reaction spread from man to man, a sea of jerking puppets, their bodies destroyed by high velocity rounds. A few took cover, others ran. They tried to return fire, but the angle and the fortifications of the compound made it nigh impossible. A guardsman manned the guns, a solitary private, spraying heavy rounds into the pactors like a farmer hosing crops. He took a horrific toll. Rensaint was first to react. Pulling the banner from the earth, he ran into the disorientated enemy, bellowing to emperor and throne, his pistol blazing like a holy flame. They followed him, of course, the men of Volponi, the rest of the guard. Regara too, urging his troops forwards. Several fell, shot down by retreating blood pact, but the return fire was poor, hurried. The line broke, soldiers fled. Only the Damagawa stood his ground, and Regara dealt with him. He met the first blow on the flat of his sword, the saber's edge crackling with energy discharge. The major's repost was expert, his form immaculate. The Damagawa's serrated blade vanished, blasted down to the nub, a smoking hilt and ragged stub all that remained. A savage thrust, and Regara impaled his opponent, the packed officer dead within seconds of engagement. Ren Saint had kept moving, reaching the fortification, then gaining the ramp. The defensive guns had ceased, their ammo hoppers spent, tenacious, the pact clung on despite their disadvantage, though it appeared the last few holdouts were about to be overwhelmed. The flood of reinforcements sweeping from the avenues, soldiers of Lance and Shield Company, led by the general, ended any further debate. At the Lord Commissar's beckoning, the private who had manned the guns stepped forwards, the banner pole handed to him. Ren Saint whispered something to him that only he could hear. The banner was raised, Laz burns and all, the griffin rampant on a quartered blue and grey shield, snapping and rippling on the breeze. Volponi glory, yelled the private, and the cheer that echoed him shook the very ground. It was fury, it was relief. 
Colchis didn't cheer. He limped forwards, his eyes tightening as he squinted in the low sunlight, which beamed through the cloud as if the emperor himself had blessed this moment. The private had lost his helmet during the battle, but it was not this minor breach of decorum that had so arrested the lieutenant. No, it was his face, a face Colchis knew, but that could not possibly belong to the soldier holding aloft that banner. Darian, he said, his voice lost amid the roar of victory. Aramis maintained fire discipline standing on the upper part of the hull. She fired one-handed, headshots with her pistol. Below her, the remnants of the Volponi and other defenders she had managed to scrounge together kept up the fusillade. Less than a hundred men left, almost two-thirds of her scratch army slain or heavily wounded. Aramis bit back her anger, focused on the moment, on survival. Recrimination could wait, for now. A few mortar teams had made it this far. She kept them back, spotters to the front calling out hasty coordinates. Earthy geezers filled the land ahead with each detonation, ripping into the huddled masses of the beasts. Bodies spiraled upwards, limbs trailing. Through the slowly dissipating dust clouds, Aramis saw what remained of the herd. It had fragmented, into smaller cohorts. Dozens fled, loping and capering into the rad-scarred wastes. How long they would last in such environs, Aramis did not know. She hoped they would suffer. After a sniper called Lennox had executed the last of the herdmasters, the scant discipline evinced by the beasts had failed entirely. They had fallen to savagery and pack mentality. It was why they had still been hunting amongst the hecatomb left in Godsword's wake. Slowly, slowly they began to retreat, the last and the most belligerent of the herd. Aramis gave the order to cease fire, mindful of conserving ammunition should they meet other foes out in the wilds. As the last echoes of high-pitched Laz fire faded on the air, she climbed down from the hull, moving with well-practiced assurance. Every man turned to her as she approached, advancing just beyond the front of the line, Hennessy in tow. Scopes, Hennessy! The adjutant dutifully provided them. Little could be seen of the beasts now, their tribes scattered and fleeing for the anonymity of the wilds. Aramis marked the coordinates from the scopes' lens display, she would recommend air support be brought in and the wilds drenched with Prometheum until nothing remained. Are they gone? uttered a hollow voice she barely recognized. Aramis started, sending a harsh glance at Hennessy, but the adjutant hadn't heard Hauptmann approach from behind either. You have a vulpine stealth, sergeant, Aramis said. They're gone. Pitiful wretches. Aramis did not bother to hide her disdain. I feel as much pity for those creatures as I would for the vermin poisoned by a watchman's traps or the roaches gassed from an old barrack house. You feel nothing for them, only hate. Aramis snapped the magnoculars together and handed them back to Hennessy. She gave Hauptmann a smile, but it was without much warmth. Hatred was a cold wind for her, a hardening of resolve under ice. It was her armor, and far more effective than any breastplate of augmented carapace. I'm glad you're on your feet, Sergeant. He had a weary sort of charm, she decided, and a resilience, but something in him had changed. He had lost most of his men. Only a handful were left, a pair of engines between them. Such was the way of it, of attritional war. No regiment could survive its rigors indefinitely, as Aramis witnessed the last scraps of the Volponi banner burning in the distance, as the flagpole caught light, its shaft already blackened and ready to collapse under its own weight. She wondered how long there was left for the 86th, when weapons could wreak such devastation. 
the greatest she had seen, all that was left of those who had stood within its radius, men and half-men reduced to glass. She walked away, Hennessy in her shadow, and left Hauptmann alone to his thoughts. Don't linger too long, Sergeant, she called back to him. We're packing up in five. So where? His voice came back, a ghost on the breeze. Where else? she replied. Back to Lawton. Back to the war. Chapter 17 In four days, Lawton had been remade. De Vere's had decreed it so. A victory celebration was planned, a triumph in the name of Volponi glory. As we must salve our wounds, so too must we vaunt our successes, gentlemen. His words had lit a fire in some, the jingoists and the toadies, or perhaps simply those who wanted to believe and found the general's rhetoric compelling. And he certainly was charismatic. Colchis could not deny that. Others were less enamored by his decision to delay. Either belligerent and eager for more death, some men could no longer function without it, the sleepless hours between battle, an endless pale nadir of meaningless existence, or simply compliant, following orders with hollow duty. The enemy dead were gathered and burned, a desultory pyre at the outskirts of town still trailed with smoke. Kulkis had heard the numbers were lower than expected. The defences were repaired and reinforced. The major arteries into and out of the town cleared. Loddon was wholly and utterly occupied, not only by those who had marched from Ankishburg, but by troopers from Lager and Vasher too. Token forces remained in the evacuated northern towns, caretakers only. Few had returned from the excursion to Kobor, though they never actually reached the settlement or had ever intended to. Those who did come back spoke of their experiences little, though Kulkis had caught the odd scrap, horror stories of monsters in the dust and the terror of the godswords touch upon the earth. These soldiers had returned burdened, a shadow behind the eyes or in a look that would never truly fade, scars of the most indelible kind. A census was taken for the honoured dead, a brief footnote to De Vere's celebrations. He wanted to recognise their sacrifice, he had said, but the hearts and minds of the living must now turn to what lay ahead. He had made a speech of it on the first day, a damn good one. Men had cheered, but there was no escaping the fact that the war for Agria had become a grind. The ritually tortured first sons were taken down and burned to ash. None spoke of them, and those who had volunteered for the task of their removal had been thoroughly interrogated afterwards by both Ren Saint and the regimental priest. The remains of the scions would not be scattered. There would be no ceremony for these men. The ash stayed in a stasis casket, a blessed Aquila nestled within. Questions remained, of course. They would be dealt with later by officers of high standing. Kulkis had no doubt. And then there was the other matter, but that was well and truly out of his hands. Though it was not widely broadcast, Kulkis had learned that the square where his platoon had fought against the wirewolves had been sealed off, science, the few that could be spared from de Vere's personal detail, stood guard at the freshly raised barriers. It had been torched, the smoke visible for over a mile, when the flamer teams had gone in, the air thick with the scent of purgation. Then came the priests, wielding their prayers and unguents like swords, cleansing words, cleansing flame and yet the walls and razor wire erected like a crown around the square remained. As for the K-weapons themselves, demo teams had rigged them with explosives after the flamers had done their work. The Magos took what was left, a carder of servitors retrieving the scrap before it was committed to secure storage. 
four days and several visits to the medique for his leg, and to the chapel for the injuries he couldn't see, and Kulkis still had the nightmares. It had been bad at first, Grice finding the lieutenant on the first night, pent up, near screaming, and lathered in sweat. He found he slept little now, preferring the night air and the dulcet susurrations of the camp, a false peace he knew, but it was a salve all the same. He thought of Darien on that rampart, the banner of shield company in his hand, the raw adulation of the troops, nearly seven hundred men, all told, once both main companies had arrived. They cheered as their fellows cheered, a soldier always ready and willing to exult in victory, even if they had little hand in the actual battle. An unworthy notion had stolen upon Colchis in that moment. As he set eyes upon the mill serf he had taken under his wing, he wished it could have been him. Ah, so this is where you are hiding. The deep voice made Colchis turn. Ganu sidled alongside him and offered up a smoke. Colchis hesitated, but only a little before taking a tabak stick with a nod of thanks. Ganu took one for himself, then lit them both, Colchis shielding his with a cupped hand to ward off the breeze. The Orek stared into the distance, smoking in companionable silence for a while, until he said, Not so long ago you and I might not have shared tabak like this, Lieutenant. How so? Well, let us say that the Volponi seldom fraternize beyond their own kind. Is that what we're doing? Fraternizing? Ganu laughed, and it was a rich sound, a tuneful bass note that put Colchis in mind of warm molasses. What would you call it? Camaraderie. A lofty word for shared tabak. Kulkis shrugged. Well, I am from Volponi. Both men laughed, and the sound carried away into the night. I hear the auxiliaries have another name for us, ventured Kulkis. Ganu played coy. Oh? The bastard Volponi was a poorly kept secret in camp. One the Blue Bloods tolerated, for it reminded them of their superiority, not that they needed reminding. Ever since Lodden, Kulkis found his view had changed. He changed tack. I'm sorry for your losses. Ganu's face darkened with remembrance. Barely two platoons are left of my regiment. That and Captain Ombi's retinue. We shall rebuild, he said, and like a shadow moving away from the sun, his expression brightened. I wish I had your hope, Master Sergeant. I have belief. He turned, held out his hand for Kulkis to shake it. And you may know me as Honor. Kulkis took his hand in a comradely grip. Armand. See, Armand, said Honor Ganu. Hope. If you and I, men of opposing kind and station, can become friends, then anything is possible. He smiled, showing perfect white teeth. If you believe in it. He finished his tabak, crushing it between calloused fingers to put it out, and patted Kulkis on the shoulder. The nightmares will fade, Lieutenant, he said and took his leave. Colchis lingered, thinking on the master sergeant's words. He stretched, taking in the evening's refrain, the distant chirrup of nocturnal rooks, and the soft hubbub of soldiers in pursuit of entertainment, or simply enjoying the company of others. Music played in the camp, and there was singing. Unlike Ankishburg, Lotten had not come with a citizenry plying their wares and distractions for weary guardsmen, but a baggage train of camp followers had reached the town in the wake of the army. Several old grain houses had become home to brewers and vintners who had brought kegs and barrels of alcoholic libations. It wasn't the Ursa, but it was better than nothing. 
De Vere's encouraged them. It would serve his desires well and make more of a spectacle of his victory celebration. Between the other camp sounds, Kulkis heard the celebration being prepared. Scaffolding for a stage, a large communal area cleared and hung with lamps. Much of the town had been cleansed, all visible taint of the archenemy removed and overpainted with imperial graffiti, one order accreting over the other, its truth preeminent. And so was history written. He took to wandering, strolling the streets, but quickly tired of the solitude. A young woman was cleaning her uniform in a water trough. She wore fatigues, braces over her shoulders, shirt sleeves up to her elbows. She looked like she was Volponi, but Colchis had met very few females in the ranks. He assumed she was one of the reinforcements, a trooper then. Suds gathered on the surface of the water, sloshing over the edges of the metal trough, a particularly large wave splashing her boots. She swore loudly. I could have a millserve do that for you, trooper. The woman paused, about to turn, but then deciding against it. Wiping an arm across her brow, she carried on scrubbing. Labor is good for the soul, or so my old dead mother used to tell me. She was a fine-looking woman, thought Colchis, strong, athletic. Long red hair fell around her shoulders, lustrous and alive. Her pale skin was like creamy opal. Ah, but what of the heart? She paused again, a wry smile curling the side of her mouth. A small scar creased the skin there, but didn't detract from her looks. What do you know of the heart? Lieutenant, Colchis provided, pleased she was responding to his charms. She turned and faced him, arms drenched in foamy soap flake residue. Munitorum issue, judging by the bland aroma. Her scent was the greater, though, jasmine and sandalwood. Her shirt was partly unbuttoned, the pale skin of her neck visible. Her eyes were rich and dark. Kulkis felt a flush of attraction. An officer, I should salute. She began to straighten up, but Kulkis waved away the formality. We're off duty now, that isn't necessary. She settled back into a casual stance. Were you taking a stroll, Lieutenant? Kulkis smiled. He had worn his uniform jacket, but it was undone and hung loosely on his muscular frame. He had no wife or significant other. Soldiering had taken the place of all that. But he enjoyed female company. It had been a while. A munitorum logistician back at Lanchitech. He couldn't quite remember her name. It's a fine evening for it. Perhaps, if you're done with your labors, you would like to accompany me. Oh, I couldn't do that, Lieutenant. And why is that? Well, I don't even know your name. It's Kulkis, he said. But please, call me Armand. And you? Ione. A beautiful name. Aramis, she added, and Colchis felt something shift in the timbre of her voice. She turned around again, fishing in the trough for her jacket, which she now pulled forth and started to wring out. He saw the patches before she uttered the words and swallowed deeply. Captain Ione Aramis, she said, fixing Colchis with a smile as cold as Valhalla's snow. A stroll, is it? she asked, still wringing the jacket, the curling of her fists against the material as tight as a sailor's rigging. No, ah, of course not, she frowned. Why ever not? I mean, my apologies, sir. I mean, ma'am. Of course, ma'am. He sketched a fairly poor salute. Mom is what I call my mother, Lieutenant. Of course, Captain, I meant no... You're blathering, Lieutenant. That's a poor quality in a man and an even worse one in an officer. Colchis kept his gaze straight ahead. 
I shall address it, Captain. Why are you out here at night? Carousing, is it? she said, appraising him with her eyes. No, Captain, I couldn't sleep. And you thought a tumble with one of the ranks would tie you out, did you? No, Captain, when I close my eyes, I see them. See what? The things that slaughtered my men. The wolves. The captain's demeanor relaxed. You fought the K-weapons. I did. Thrown, I thought that was just a rumor. How many? Four. Aramis swore under her breath. But one was still born before it could do anything but die, Colchis added. My company was on the Cobor Road, said Aramis. I see it still. The moment when the god sword touched us. Men turned to glass in a breath. Thunder, like the end times. Smoke so thick it killed the sun. And the burning, endless burning. Flesh cooking on the breeze, screaming. Colchis had paled at the account, at the captain's sudden intensity. His voice became a rasp. God Emperor, I cannot imagine. Then consider yourself blessed. She finished with the jacket, folding it before tucking it under her arm. If I can't sleep, I wash my uniform. It is very clean. Something about the water and the mundanity of the task. She sniffed, scowled. You reek of foreign tabac, Lieutenant. I have been smoking, Captain, he admitted. Did it help? Help? With when you close your eyes? Yes, I believe it did. A hundred different ways. Excuse me. To cope. To serve. Is that what it is? Aramis narrowed her eyes, as if taking his measure. Have a good night, Lieutenant, she said, and left him to the night sounds. Tomorrow we celebrate our victory. The Medicaid tents were quiet, the late hour and the morphia contributing to their stillness. Fenk felt little for the stricken troopers as he walked through the aisles between their beds, though bed was a generous term for what the wounded slept on. Many didn't sleep, their eyes open and staring at some past horror that refused to relinquish them to Morpheus. He heard whimpering and sibilant voices arguing with themselves, but couldn't discern the source. Orderlies ran the station, an old marketplace given over to a house of the dying. Thinned blood painted stone cobbles underfoot. It all washed over Fenk, slipping frictionlessly off. Suffering was a part of life, as was death. The Grey Host was quiet tonight, but it lingered in a corner of his mind, crunched up and sullen. Not even all of this mortality stirred it. Something had changed. Fenk couldn't quite put his finger on it, but ever since he had fought the heretic Astartes, things had been different. Not fear, not in the way that most men experience it, but more a profound sense of insignificance, a cold ennui. I am a minnow in an ocean of leviathans. After half an hour of searching, he found her bed. Ganica had not woken since Varnek had struck her. She looked peaceful, as if she were in state. A metal frame encased her arm, holding it together. Surgical notations marked the skin in preparation for amputation. Another man stood over her, not a medic or an orderly, or even one of the dull-eyed servitors administering files of morphia. It was a Volponi officer. Head bowed, hands making the sign of the Aquila, praying. The soft sounds between the murmured words suggested he'd been weeping too. Good evening, Captain Brandreth. 
Feng's greeting clearly startled him, as Brandreth hurriedly wiped at his eyes and turned smartly to present an ashen but otherwise professional mien. "'What are you doing here, Lieutenant, at such a late hour?' he asked, slipping his chrono from his breast pocket and checking the face as if it mattered at all. "'I imagine the same as you, sir.' He looked from the officer to the unconscious commissar. We fought side by side during the retaking. I see, Brandreth replied, also turning to regard her. A hard fight. It was, said Fink, and made harder by the fact we were alone for the majority of it. He turned his gaze on Brandreth. You were late, sir. Brandreth frowned. I beg your pardon? And your uniform looked very smart and tidy upon your arrival. Anger creased the captain's face. What are you implying, Lieutenant? That you arrived for war, dressed as if for the parade ground, Fink said, the coldness of his reply unsettling Brandreth. He was afraid, the captain, and had been afraid for a long time. He had lost something, Fink could see its absence, and it had left him half a man. Brandreth discerned what was happening and tried to rally. Are you calling me a coward, Fink? He half-heartedly reached for the saber strapped to his hip. Fink's eyes followed the gesture of his sword hand. Oh, I don't think you want that, sir. Brandreth hesitated but eventually closed his hand and let it fall impotently by his side. I lost almost every soldier during that battle, sir, Fenk went on. None could have stood against a heretic Astartes, Brandreth replied, trying not to sound shaken. So you did see it, then, as it slaughtered my men? I heard a report... He scowled, anger edged with fear. Now look here, Fink. I won't have this. I... This, sir? This, whatever this is, it's insubordination and it won't go unanswered. Then answer it. Brandreth looked flustered, uncomfortable, weak like he had seen the reflection of all of his private inadequacies, and Fink was the one holding the mirror. I won't dignify this by listening to it. I'll have you on charges, Fink. I'll make sure you... Charges, sir, for observing the state of your attire as you entered the battle. I see. Infantrymen regulations are stricter than I assumed. I'm warning you, Brandreth retorted, face reddening, hands trembling. I won't have it, and you'll bloody well address me as captain. As you wish. Captain. Bile pushed its way to the surface, oft the recourse of the fearful and the outmaneuvered. It manifested as spittle flung insults. You're a degenerate, Fink, an unwanted offcut, an inbred bastard. You should have never been given rank. Fink did not react. He let Brandreth run out of steam first, and watched stoically as he turned on his heel and tried to storm away. But Fink saw it for what it was, a retreat. He watched the captain depart, all the way out of the tent, until he could no longer see him. Then he turned his attention back on Ganneke, leaning down to tenderly stroke her cheek. "'Sleep well,' he whispered, before leaving too. Chapter 18 Regara let his eyes adjust to the paucity of light. The air smelled of stale oil and dusty metal. As he walked through the narrow confines of the machine shed, he saw the lumpen shapes of engines and other partially built devices draped in heavy cloth. Half-open crates sat stacked on shelving racks filled with cogs, bolts, and other sundries. Old servitor components, all mechanized, lay piled here and there. 
cybernetic limbs, hands, half a skull, leather bellows meant to simulate lungs. It was a bloodless charnel house, a machine morgue. Why am I here? He asked the darkness, reaching the end of a corridor that opened out into a wide yard. The lack of light wasn't abject. Low lumens limbed everything in soft grey edges, including five silhouettes, four standing and one other seated. Regara recognized Grusman's cloying cologne. He assumed the colonel lathered it on to hide the rot of his character. An autosconce flared, and hot light bathed the scene. Rensaint had activated the brazier, staring as the dulcet hiss of slowly burning fuel filled the silence. De Vere spoke first. Major, he said, his face half hidden in shadow. Thank you for coming. I assumed it was an order and I therefore had no choice, sir. It was, and you didn't. De Vere's cocked his head slightly, as if measuring Regara's response. But it would be unseemly not to recognize compliance. Regara felt a nerve spasm under his eye. Everything about this felt wrong. He took in the rest of the room in a quick sweep. Ren Saint standing by the blazing torch, inscrutable. Grossman at the back, ever toadying. De Vere's paler than usual, exhibiting all the hollow bonhomie he had built his impressive career on. And Barbastian stood to one side, as if reticent to play his part and marking his old friend keenly. Regara had received the summons late. He had been about to retire for the evening when Barlis had proffered the note. It had granted passage through a first son's guard post, one that led to a cordoned-off part of Loddon. An escort had been offered, but Regara knew the way. He had been here before, when he rescued Kulkis from the K-weapons. What better place for a clandestine meeting? And what am I complying with, sir? He asked boldly. The fifth figure, the one seated, had their arms tied behind their back and a hood over their head. Though the identity of the individual was hidden, Regara could tell from their physique that the prisoner was male. As ever, De Vere's did not immediately elaborate. Do you know how many packed it we fought at Lawton? I didn't fight in every engagement. Hundreds, certainly. Militarum intelligence reckoned on over a thousand. Rensaint answered. Four hundred. They engaged an army group of two thousand men with four hundred. Admittedly, the advance parties bore the brunt of it, but we greatly outnumbered them. They had the terrain, were dug in. Bloody K-weapons for throne's sake. What's your point? We'll come on to that, De Vere's intervened. I wish someone bloody well would. Sir, why do you think you're here, Major? snarled Grussman, eager for a reckoning. Regara was more than happy to oblige. And the monster in power armor that slaughtered almost two platoons without breaking stride, will we come on to that too? De Vere's continued. The heretic Astartes was known to us. Regara didn't bother trying to hide his incredulity. You'll have to excuse me, sir, but I thought you just said we knew about that monster in advance. It wasn't a certainty, offered Barbastian, his first contribution to the confessional. A familiar feeling wormed into Regara's gut of being deceived and fed placatory half-truths. He held his tongue, waiting to see what Barbastian would say next, if he'd say anything. The probability was low that we might engage with a heretic Astartes. It killed over forty of my men. Not only yours, Major, De Vere's reminded him. The more he talked, the less vital he appeared. Fatigue dragged on his movements, and he paused before speaking, as if to catch his breath. Regara hadn't seen much of the general after the battle, but he had received no report of him being wounded, and there was no obvious injury. 
It's why the science failed, said Rensaint. Unforeseen resistance. We won, and yet still we lost, Major. A miscalculation. As the commissar spoke, Regara felt the other militarum officers stiffen at the gentle accusation of an error in judgment. I asked for you to be brought in, Regara. Regara shared a glance with de Vere's, but he was impenetrably urbane as usual. Barbastian looked aside, a little shamefaced. I am listening, the major replied, tying up his anger in ropes of duty. Rensaint took the lead. The Lawton assault has proven costly. The ambuscades, K-weapons, and the heretic Astartes. You are right, Vasquez. We should have told you what your men were walking into. A tactical misstep, one I am trying to rectify now. He didn't look to the other officers. He kept his eyes on Regara, just two soldiers having a frank and honest conversation. He went on. Militarum Tacticae predicted a tough fight, but the enemy resisted with less and hurt us more than in our harshest scenarios. Current estimates put our fighting efficacy at just under 5,000 men, with around 4,000 from Lager and Vasha combined. But they have their own objectives, taking out secondary outposts to the east and west, cutting off supply lines to Carcass and Rakespur. Rensaint moistened his lips, the air dry and stale. Flatly put, we cannot be so profligate. In that we are agreed at least, Regara gestured to the bound man in the hood. And this man? Who is he? Why is he bound? Why is he here? Grossman edged forward to protest, but Rensaint raised a hand, briefly closing his eyes to hide his annoyance at the interruption, and the colonel shrank back again. Do you remember Lieutenant Sacker? Rensaint asked. I presume he was the scion in black at our last meeting. Rensaint held Regara's gaze, which the major took to be confirmation. He took a pair of Valkyries out of camp at Ankishburg three hours before the march on Lotten was due to commence. Twenty men headed for the town. The others did not. Rensaint nodded to Grussman, who stepped up reluctantly and removed the prisoner's hood. A first son, identifiable by his slab features and brick of a jaw, stared into the shadows, a man silently raving within his own skin. He trembled, straining against his bonds now the hood was off, mouth opening and clamping shut with clockwork regularity. Regara scowled. Emperor's mercy, he murmured. What did this? Honestly, we don't know said Rensaint, signaling for Grussman to return the hood, which he did immediately, and the prisoner became still again. Another scion picked him up on a scope outside Loden. He had been marching for days. No weapons, little to no equipment, just the uniform on his back. And it was barely that, reduced to trouser fatigues, boots, and a vest. No visible injuries, Rensaint went on, physical at least. A closed Medicaid exam revealed nothing internal, and yet the commissar made a face that said, here we are, but we don't know how we got here or where here is exactly. Barbastian cut in. As far as we know, he is the only confirmed survivor of the First Son's mission. Lieutenant Sacker is still missing. Throne, Philip, Regara shook his head. You sent forty men to do the job of twice that, and then split those men in two and gave them separate missions? Rensaint answered. Our ambition outstripped our reach. Recriminations can come later, Major. He paused, as if confirming a decision. You are about to learn something, only militarum high intelligence, and this group of officers know. Regara said nothing. 
He knew he was an outsider, not only because of his politics within the regiment, but because he had been part of the initial army group and therefore his circle was different to that of these men. Now they wished to induct him, and as distasteful as all of this mendacity was, he wanted answers, a meaning for all of this needless death. He hoped it would be a satisfactory one. The archenemy is either cultivating, or already has in its possession, an asset we have designated Scylla, said Rensaint. Our intelligence around it is limited, but the last reports from Imperial spies suggested it, or a sizable part of its research and development, was located in a stronghold southwest of Lawton. The briefings about experimentation, it wasn't just hearsay and propaganda then. No, Major, it was not. Our belief is that a Mechanicus defector has allied with the arch enemy, and that a piece of arcane technology predating old night has been unearthed by arcanate reclamation teams. We know the Heritors have utilized warp machinery before, their talent for murder inventions appears boundless. I understand one of your lieutenants fought such a machine. A K-weapon, said Regara, a little scornful. We've been fighting those ever since the war began. Hardly news. This is different. The Pact are moving troops with alarming precision, almost as if they can predict our deployments and disposition. And you believe this is the work of a machine? An unfinished machine, a predictive engine warp enabled. The Sekites have been developing infernal technology for years. They do so usually in isolation, seconded to out-of-the-way sites and remote laboratoria, both to reduce the possibility of discovery and also to limit collateral damage. Our forces have uncovered several of these locations, and duly sanctioned them with purgation. The stronghold south of Lawton, that was the intent. They were stalling, Rigara concluded. The pact never wanted Godsword, not to hold it. They had something else, something worse, and we came close to discovering it. Ren Saint didn't answer all but confirming everything Regara had said. The Major continued. Sacker and his men went on a seek and destroy, and didn't return. Again, no answer from the Commissar until he said, The Lieutenant's lock beacon is still transmitting. Regara felt a nub of cold form in his gut like dirty ice. An expedition will be formed, said De Vere's. He had been a statue until that moment, exploratory only. I assume the prisoner has nothing useful to contribute. He was part of Sacker's fire team, said Barbastian. He's also why we have a signal to follow, subdermal implant tracker. Whatever the lieutenant and his men encountered, it did this to him. Reconnaissance, that's all. Ren Saint reassured Regara. You hardly need my approval. No, but I would like your agreement, said De Vere, stepping in again. It is preferable that we are all rowing in the same direction, Major. Less chance of turning in circles. Volunteers only, that's my stipulation. Do that, and we are in agreement, sir. De Vere's held out his hand, and Regara detected the slightest tremor before the general stilled it. Then you had best find some capable men, Major. They had found a narrow cell in which to put him. The walls glistened, slick, as if the stone had begun to sweat. No chains, just a heavy door with a grate through which to observe. He had been given food and water, meager but sufficient. His jailers had said little beyond giving him simple instruction as he was escorted to his cell. They had stripped him of the uniform he had stolen 
and the weapons he had taken. For a fleeting, shining moment, he had been something more, a hero. He had even held a flag, a propaganda poster brought to life. A mill-serve he remained, cold, afraid, defiant, though he had not fought as they had arrested him. Rough fabrics garbed his body, a thin blanket his only comfort. Noises from the camp drifted to him on a lonely breeze. He caught snatches of conversation, but nothing more. It was enough to discern that a celebration was in the offing. Victory at Lawton, the victory he had helped to win. Awaiting judgment, his mind wandering to Lena and wondering if she was all right and safe, Darian almost missed the shadow that eclipsed the viewing slit. He tensed, the bruises on his flesh still sore, the lacerations barely scabbed over. There was a knock against the heavy wood, a bolt scraping against its catch, the door creaking on old hinges. On the first night he had received a visitor, or rather an observer, who had watched for a few moments beyond the slit before sealing it shut and not returning again. This was not that visitor, for he was far less subtle and eager to make his presence known and felt. Evening, Deg, uttered his tormentor, as he had done every evening since Darian had been incarcerated. Darian stood up on shaking legs, the aches and pains returning as he straightened. He balled his fists but wouldn't fight. His tormentor was wide as a tank and less subtle. Rolled up shirt sleeves revealed brawny arms, a pugilist's arms. A guard outside held the officer's jacket and hat, a glorified Volponi clothes horse. You won't break me, swore Darian. That's all right, said Isaac Schiller, cracking his knuckles as he closed in and blotted out most of the light. I don't need you to break. He grinned. He would enjoy this. I just need you to know your place. Chapter 19 It had begun with a feast and music, rippling through a dead town determinately resuscitated. Barring the sentries and those unfortunate enough to be on guard duty, the entirety of the Volponi army and its auxiliaries gathered to celebrate. A massive auditorium had been given over to the Imperials and decorated with their regimental banners. A roofless agora, it stood open to the stars and the silhouette of Godsword hung over all like the metaphorical blade of Dimash. Tables stood in ranks, laid with meat, wine, and plenty, a banquet in all but name. Despite the ostensible comradeship, the lesser orders had been segregated. The auxiliaries sat with their own, enjoying lesser fare. The Volponi arrived polished and trim, the officers more so. They shared a table with the commissariat, but were otherwise sat apart from the ranks. Though dignified, the 4th Oric had no parade uniforms, but had made themselves presentable as had the 10th Pardus. Only the Slokans, wearing polished silver breastplate and crimson velvet, attempted to compete. But the gilt-edged peacocks of the 37th had so few men left that it made little impact. De Viers had seated them with the 19th Talpa, who arrived reeking of kappa root and scarcely clean, let alone polished. They had made some effort, however. No place had been made for the Martian priesthood or ecclesiarchy, both having politely declined the invitation. The former were tasked with the restoration of the macro-cannon array. De Vere's decreed that it be functional before the army marched again. Last of all came the Agrians, a solemn troop, dark of mood and becoming increasingly insular. They spoke in murmurs, drank little, and kept to their own. It was only later, during the festivities, that they appeared more animated. 
De Vere's announced the celebration with a short speech, reminding all present of the brave sacrifice that had seen the town and Godsword retaken. He gestured to the weapon, and soldiers craned their necks to worship before victuals and libations were served. Kulkis drank sparsely, his taste for wine somewhat dulled after his recent encounters. At every sip, he tasted ash and copper, not fermented grape. He wondered if that would ever change and grew maudlin. Sitting here, raised upon a stage that overlooked the ranks, he felt conspicuous and unworthy. He ate, but it scarcely enticed him, despite the sizzling auroch hide his companions enjoyed. He noticed Captain Aramis farther up the table, but she didn't acknowledge him, which frankly was just as well after his faux pas the previous evening. There was no sign of Schiller, and he wondered what the cruel bastard was doing. At least he couldn't terrorize the mill serves, who swept around the Volponi tables with swift and unobtrusive civility. A girl carrying a silver ewer made to refill his goblet, and Kulkis had to cover it with his hand. He shook his head, and the girl smiled politely and withdrew. He had seen her before in the Medicaid tent where he had found Darian. As he watched her disappear into the throng, he wondered what had become of the lad. Stealing from the barracks, impersonating a trooper, it did not bode well for him, but the thought of the severe punishment Darian would receive sat poorly with the lieutenant. It had never bothered him before, this kind of thing. Why did it gnaw at him now? Are you feeling lonely, lieutenant? Kulkis scowled. Fink. His fellow lieutenant sat across from him, a dinner knife in his hand. No more than any man here, Kulkis replied, determined not to rise to Fink's goading. I heard you had a run-in with the captain from the 86th, or was it a run-at? How in the hells did he know that? Fenk had spies in every quarter, it seemed. Either that, or he was following him. Neither answer was particularly appealing. Define run-in, said Kulkis. Fenk smiled, leaning back in his chair, though he kept hold of the knife. It was silver, with a serrated edge for meat. The general hubbub of the feast sufficiently smothered their conversation from eavesdroppers, each officer engaged with another or listening to De Vere's as he held forth at the head of the table, though this only reached the ears of the upper-class officers and was not the province of the lieutenants. "'Ever the romantic, eh, Armand?' said Fink whose wintry gaze gave nothing away. "'I heard your men took a beating at Lawton,' came the riposte from Colchis, keen to turn the subject to the battle. "'And yours,' Fenk replied, though his posture had stiffened. "'I was sorry to hear of Corporal Redfern's death. He was a fine soldier.' Fenk sniffed, rocking forwards again, and digging into his fillet with the silver knife." He was an animal and a bastard, so, yes, a fine soldier. It shut him up, at least, though Colchis would later regret his callousness. He spoke little after that, though he let his gaze wander. Schiller arrived belatedly, evidently having been given sanction by De Vere's, whom he saluted before taking his place at the table. His counterpart in Captain Brandreth had a haunted look about him, and he kept glancing in Fenk's vague direction. But Colchis had no clue as to why, nor a desire to find out. Several toasts were made, and soldiers rose to their feet and chinked goblets at every long-winded declaration. It was a night of self-congratulatory backslapping. De Vere's did so love to revel. It dragged on, and Colchis felt the disquiet within him growing in tandem with his boredom. Matters became interesting again with the fights. Festivities, de Vere's had called them, a boxing match, several in fact, would have been a more accurate description. 
The banquet ended, the tables and detritus cleared by a veritable army of mill serves, and in their place was built a roped-off square of sprung canvas. A harsh sodium lamp glared directly above it, the other lights doused in order to focus the attention. Tiered seats were erected, and in so doing a temple to pugilism was raised and anointed. Amidst all this, Rake and Dresk were huddled together like conspirators, pooling coin. Twenty-seven pieces, murmured Rake, and snapped out an arm to tug on the jacket sleeve of Hanmar, who sat in the stands next to them, smoking. Another ten, Hanmar? Piss off, I'm saving it. For what? asked Dresk, idly rolling a gold hrook across his knuckles. Ever the nimble-fingered showman, it was Agrian currency, another imperial analogue, but then this was Agria. None of your thrice-damned business, snapped Hanmar. But look at him, Kor, cut in Rake, gesturing to the burly figure of Grice, stripping down to breeches, vest, and braces. Dresk had stopped messing around with the coin and had begun to bind Grice's meaty fists with cloth. He's a beast, is that not right, Sarge? Grice gave a huge, knowing smile. The man says it as he sees it. Dresk fitted a padded glove they had found in the Munitorum stores, then the other, and Grice smacked them together pugnaciously. If you injure anything, Grice, said Colchis, watching the whole affair from the tier above, you'll find no lenience from me. You'll hold a lasgun like any man in the platoon, broken fingers or not. Right you are, sir, Grice replied. That said, Colchis began, and fished a coin purse from his pocket. It was heavy and clinked as he tossed it to Rake, who caught it gratefully. Don't bloody well lose. Honor of the regiment and all that. He winked, and Grice nodded. Several blackboard placards were displayed prominently in the stands, the fighters, their regiments, and their odds were written on them in dusty chalk. A clutch of Munitorum logisticians took scripts from soldiers eager to bet their coin and engage in a little distraction for a few hours. Every regiment was represented, a matter of honor and an antique saber donated by De Vere's himself the prize. The general had decided to slum it with the ranks, though he sat in the high tiers alongside Regara and a handful of other officers. A clarion sounded. The first bout was all but ready to commence. A roar shook the crowd, resonating around the auditorium and turning Colchis's arms to goose flesh. This he could enjoy, he decided, a diversion and a welcome one. Don't you find it all a little barbaric, Lieutenant? posited Hanmar, smoking a delicately flavoured cigarillo. Even the man's tabac was refined. Rake and Dresk were leading Grice down to the ring, the hulking sergeant swinging faux hooks and uppercuts to the delight of a belligerent crowd. Fighting men need to let off steam, Cor. All that pent-up violence. It doesn't make good sense to stopper it. I quite agree, Lieutenant, said a voice Colchis instantly recognized, and he felt his sphincter tighten just a fraction. But what of the women? We are all one under the eyes of the Emperor, are we not? Aramis passed by with a waft of jasmine and sandalwood. She gave a stern look at Colchis, who felt his cheeks burn. Right you are, Captain, he said. Indeed I am, Lieutenant, she replied, her voice fading in the crowd as she found a place up tier to watch the fight. Indeed, I am. Hanmar's eyes were a little wider as Colchis turned back to him. That was her? Yes, Cor, that was her. Holy throne! Not a word, soldier, not a word. Hanmar mimicked a lock and key to his lips, but still muttered, Perhaps... This will be more entertaining than I first thought. Colchis barely heard him. Another face in the crowd had caught his attention. 
the Gulliver, Macaulay, her Cossacks, and a hefty Agrian contingent surrounding her. She had been observing him as Colchis met her gaze and gave him a mock salute. Caught between two strong women, one whom he had offended, the other whose intentions were murky at best, the lieutenant shrank back into his seat and willed the evening to be over. Aramis found Hennessy in the upper tiers, the adjutant having saved her a good seat, and made her way over. She soon learned she wasn't the only field officer in the gallery. I don't blame you, said Schiller. He was sitting alone, a flask in hand, stinking of cheap amasek. For what, Captain? Aramis replied congenially. She had met Schiller during one of the briefings, quickly sizing up the man and forming a strong opinion about his character. Schiller smiled, his eyes narrow and hard. Come now, I'm not one to place much stock in camp rumors, but I heard about your parley with Colchis. He flailed his hand around, lazy with the drink, as if to preempt a denial Aramis had not made. A handsome fellow, I grant you. He has weak piss in his veins, though. Is that right, Captain? And what might you have in yours? Shit whiskey? Schiller's face reddened, not embarrassed, angry. He wiped a bead of sweat off his upper lip, his mouth contorting into a sneer. He was a heavy man, not all of it fat and broad like an anvil. Don't mistake me, warned Schiller. I have no interest in a woman like you, a waste of good breeding, if you ask me. Aramis felt her jaw stiffen, and she balled her fists. I earned my commission, Captain, and the rank that came with it. I don't deny it, and you are clearly of a house of decent standing. But your place is not war. It is back on Volpone. Cleaning up after the men, you mean? Or running it, keeping the tithes fulfilled? Tell me, Schiller, where is it exactly you believe I am better disposed? Schiller gave a low chuckle, mirthless and dismissive. Your emotions get the better of you, Captain. He wiped a hand across his mouth. And I think I was right about what's in your blood. Vinegar, piss, whiskey, and little else besides. Cloaked by his own sense of superiority, Schiller wouldn't be baited. You're fortunate he said, slurring the word a little. You'd see what's in my veins if I took the ring. Aramis made a surprised expression, but there was an edge to it. Perhaps I have been too hasty in judgment? I'm a fighter, he said proudly. Won the regimental tournament four times in my youth. It looks like you've been fighting already she said, gesturing to his scuffed and bloody knuckles. Schiller looked down but showed no remorse. Beating up mill serves worked up a bit of a thirst, did it, Captain? Schiller's lip curled in derision. I'll do more than that, he promised, eyes murderous. I feel luckier already. Aramis left him to his whiskey and misogyny. I have a feeling uttered Hennessy as she finally took her seat next to him, that Captain Schiller is going to have a disappointing evening. Aramis smiled thinly, barely keeping her anger in check. I do believe you're right, Gavid. Her gaze traveled up to the shadow of God's sword. Regardless of the battlefield, she thought, they're just men playing at being heroes. This was his battlefield, one of many. He could adapt, had adapted. That's how you stayed alive in the war. An ever-changing equation that had more than one answer. Only some were more profitable than others. Thus far, they had chosen poorly. That needed to change. 
Ren Saint removed his leather gloves. He was not a vain man, but he wasn't wasteful either, and the gloves carried a certain privileged expense he had no desire to besmirch. Then he took off his jacket, hanging it on a wide armature he had placed within reach. His hat sat squarely upon the mannequin's head, a strange simulacrum of a commissar forming as he dressed it. Rolling up his sleeves, he revealed military tattoos on lean but muscular arms. The year of his graduating class in the Scola Progenium, the indents of the regiments he had served with. The faded ink ran from wrist to elbow on both arms. He was alone, for this sort of work demanded solitude and focus, just Ren Saint and his guest tied to the chair. I need you to serve your emperor, he told the prisoner, pulling off the hood and watching the scion's mania return. You may not think yourself capable of it, he went on, but I need to determine if that is true. He cracked his knuckles, loosened his shoulders. I know you were trained to resist pain and torture. So was I. We very likely had similar training. That means I am simply going to have to try harder to undo what was done to you. The scion strained against his bonds, chest heaving, neck bulging. Pain is necessary, though please know I take no pleasure in this. I am not a sadist. I am a politician. I need to convince five thousand soldiers that what we are doing is worth fighting and dying for. I need an answer, a better one, and you shall help provide it. Sufficiently warmed up, Ren Saint slid the brass knuckles onto his hand and made a fist. Prepare yourself, he said. We begin. And the blows rained. Chapter 20 Grice lived up to his billing. He flattened his first opponent, a handy-looking OREC with a decent right hook but no stamina, and was presently about the business of dismantling his second, when a master sergeant from the Pardas, acting as referee, sounded the clarion to end the round. Sweating but puissant, Grice retreated back to his corner where his seconds, Drake and Resk, waited with Munitorum-issued towels and a water-filled canteen. In the other corner, a battered-looking Slocan was tended to by a regimental medic. Colchis thought the man had more bruise than face at this point, but he was refusing to give in. Stubborn, these Slocans, observed Hanmar. Can you blame them? They're hanging on to their last shred of honor. Would you be any different, Kor? Would I? Our man has the beating of him, said Hanmar. So engrossed, Colchis wasn't certain he had really heard him. The lieutenant's gaze drifted around the stands while the fight was in recess. A beast? Wasn't that what Rake said? A handful of officers had begun to leave. Amongst them, the milksop Brandreth, his blood a little thin for this sort of contest, as well as a few of the auxiliary captains, their interest waning at the same rate as their chances. A throaty roar rippled through the crowd as the fight resumed, and Grice landed a telling blow. Urging Hanmar to spring forwards in his seat, Colchis furrowed his brow. What happened to Barbaric? Hanmar didn't answer, too eager to witness Grice pummeling the Slocan. And he wasn't the only one. The Agrian cohort had become more vocal ever since the contest began. Their own challenger, a red oak of a brute, having dispatched the Pardis' best fighter with desultory ease. It wasn't just a rush of blood brought on by staged violence. Kulkis saw genuine belligerence striving to the fore. He was about to venture across the auditorium floor to let Regara know when Fenk pushed past. Kulkis swore, but kept his composure. Leaving already? I thought you'd appreciate the blood sport, Fenk. Oh, I do, he said, pausing on his way. 
Prefers to stab his enemies in the back, sir, murmured Hanmar, his eyes narrowed at the other lieutenant, who smiled back coldly at the veiled remark. How the hells did he hear that? thought Colchis. If called for, Corman, Fenk replied, but the truth is simpler. I prefer a fight with fewer rules and higher stakes. To know defeat means death. That's a strong motivator, and a good measure of a man's inner fortitude, the desire to live. This, he said, as if appraising the contest, this is just spectacle, with nothing more than pride at stake. With half an eye on the Agrians, Colchis wondered about that last part. Grice felled his opponent, the burly slogan hitting the canvas like a shot auroch. The referee called it, and Fenk slipped away amidst the cheers and adulation. In his absence, Colchis looked for Agara, but the Major had already left. Something amiss, sir? asked Hanmar, as the lieutenant rose from his seat anyway. Nothing, Kor. Too much wine at the feast, he lied. I'm just headed to the latrines. Colchis watched the Agrians every step, hollering as they pushed their champion at the head of a growing mob and towards the ring. It had been a long evening, and an even longer war, so it was with no little relief that Regara retired to his billet, an old townhouse once owned by a scribe or notary, if the ink-stained furnishings were any judge. It was small, rustic, but comfortable, Barlis had found material for curtains and hung them expertly. There was even a large steel tub next to a hearth, a fire crepitating behind the grate. Though he had tried, Regara could not put the clandestine meeting of the previous night from his mind. His thoughts strayed to it, to the faces of the men he had named afterwards. Not a one had refused, as he knew they wouldn't. Requesting only volunteers had been a foolish gesture on his part, a notion of free will. In the Militarum, a man is free to serve, and that is where his freedom ends. Only in death, he said, in a low, gruff voice, and thought of Voke, whom, despite his faults, had still died with his honor intact. Could any of us really ask for more, Balis? Death, my lord, or duty? The valet had begun to run a bath, a pleasant steam rising off the surface of the water. Thin of frame and face, Barlis had the plain features of a commoner, but there was nobility in his bearing. An old man now, greyed around the edges, he still went about his service with alacrity and purpose. Either, both, I'm not sure I discern the difference. Regara had stripped down to his uniform leggings and shirt sleeves, the rest of his attire slung upon the back of a chair for Barlis to tidy and iron. As the tub slowly filled, Regara reached for his godalka. He held the thin neck of the instrument pinched lightly between the fingers of his left hand, its bowl nestled into his lap, the right hand taking up the bow. Would you mind? he asked. It will carry across the camp as you go about your duties. Far from it, sir, Barlis replied with genuine enthusiasm. You play beautifully. You're my valet, not my flatterer, Barlis. It's true, he said. I have little ear for music. Regara laughed and felt a lightness that had eluded him for weeks. Barlis bowed, removing the major's uniform from the chair and taking it with him as the lilting refrain of the Gadalka played him out. As Regar applied the bow across the strings, he teased long, lingering notes into the evening air, a sorrowful legato to echo his mood. I never tire of listening to you play. Though he looked up at his unannounced visitor, Regara did not stop. He maintained the pitch, the shifting of his fingers and the angle of the bow, a careful choreography that drew out a gentle threnody for the dead. Barbastian took a seat and patiently waited for the musician to finish. I am out of practice, 
said Regara gruffly, placing the instrument in its case. It takes me back, though, Vasquez, to the old days. He had a bottle and two goblets. Regara raised an eyebrow. Is that the fifty-five? Part of a commemorative batch distilled for Slado's interment as war master, from De Vere's private stock. Well, well, Philip. Regara took a proffered goblet and let Barbastian pour a measure. Regara inhaled deeply, relishing the flavor, and held up his drink for the toast. Old friends, said Barbastian. His eyes flashed in the firelight, gratefully reunited. Regara nodded, a little reluctant but relenting. Old friends. He took a pull, smacking his lips and sucking through his teeth. He blew out a breath. That's bloody magnificent. I thought you'd approve, Barbastian gestured to the bath. I'm not disturbing you. The door was open. Not at all. Balis leaves it that way. He knows I like the night air. He gestured to the steaming tub. I think he must use a flamer on the water, though. It's bloody unbearable, unless I let it stand for an hour first. Barbastian laughed. It was a good sound. A fine valley. He is, Regara agreed. Been in my service for decades. A long time. And that is why you're here, Philip, to recount old times? I don't really know why I'm here, Vasquez he said, getting up out of the chair and walking over to where Regara's phonogram sat on his desk. I have one of these. He slid his fingers across the polished wood, tracing lines and angles. I've heard they're popular amongst the officer class. Barbastian half turned to look at Regara. Have you ever recorded anything on the cylinder? Speeches, briefings? That sort of thing. He smiled. Your music? Regara shrugged. Now and again. There was a moment of companionable silence between them before Barbastian said, I have missed this. Then his expression grew more serious. And I am sorry for the deception. Ah, said Regara, leaning back in his chair. So we come to it then. An assuaging of guilt. If that's the case, you can leave the bottle. Take the bloody bottle for all I care. Hit a nerve, didn't I? You're an obstinate man, Vasquez, and you hold a grudge like a damn greenskin. Regara did not deny it, but his feigned insouciance faded. I seek amends, that's all. Barbastian's sudden edges softened as he lifted his goblet. A friend in the war. You remember those? Barely. He chinked his goblet with Barbastian's and felt the bad blood between them ebb. Would you play another, a little less mournful, perhaps? Every man is a critic, Regara replied, but a wry smile pulled at the corner of his mouth. He began a frenetic staccato that saw the bow dancing like light across the strings. And then they heard the explosion from deeper in the camp, and all thought of music ended. Grice staggered as his head snapped sideways, blood painted canvas in a red arc. He dodged the next blow, a hammer aimed at his bludgeoned face. One eye had swollen shut, gummed with blood, he reeled, frantically backpedaling, trying to find room. Drake and Resk hollered from the sidelines, shouting instructions, warnings. He tried a counterswing, but his impaired depth perception saw the blow cut air. His opponent's reply was savage, pummeling the body until it resembled tenderized meat. Grice tried to use his arms to shield himself, but they sagged like leaden weights, and he fell. One knee hit the floor and he made the fatal sin of using his hand to support his weary frame. An overhead swing crashed into his shoulder like a pendulum, and he crumpled all the way down this time, until his face touched blood-stained canvas. Kulkis had stopped halfway through the crowd, 
more like a baying mob by now, a sea of roaring blue bloods urging their man to rise, to fight, for honor, for pride, and all that hollow sentiment that soldiers cleave to in their darkest moments. Colchis had become entangled by it, wading through the bloodthirsty throng. He heard Rake, a shout like the peal of a bell, so singular and loud that it pierced the static. It made him turn, stop. Grice had fallen. Thrown, he looked like hammered shit, his black and purpled flesh marking out continents of pain on the map of his battered body. He considered turning back, or heading for the ring itself. Hanmar had left his seat, the corpsman reacting by instinct. An injured man, a comrade, in need of his arts. They had to drag Grice back into his corner, a stumbling, punch-drunk mess that refused to yield. They fed powdered stims up his nose, and he brightened fiercely, a sudden jolt that tripped his heart like a circuit, and got him on his feet again. Hanmar was arguing with the others, Rake holding the corpsman back, whilst Dresk shouted into Grice's ear. But the large man kept shaking his head, determined to carry on. It was more than just the fiftieth. It was the blue blood's honor that was on the table. Volponi glory. Stop this, Colchis murmured, and even the crowd around him had simmered, as if sensing something. The Agrians roared all the more, and a few Volponi began shoving their mouthy arrivals, turning their impotence for the fate of their kinsmen into anger. The cooler heads of the line officers wisely intervened, but the thread binding the two sides together was fraying. The clarion chimed. Grice got three steps out from his corner and stumbled. His opponent looked unscathed, the brawny Cossack like a pillar of rockcrete, tan skin like beaten leather, a beard that trailed down his chest like a hangman's rope. He had a foot or more on Grice and several inches across the shoulders, an anvil of a man, and just as unyielding, just as pitiless. He had tempered Grice, the Volpone's champion, and now he would break him. Ensnared by the spectacle as much as the men around him, a terrifying thought seized Colchis by the throat and made it hard to breathe. What if it's revenge? Uzra's death had not been atoned for, and no culprit had been found. The Agrians wanted justice, but they would take retribution instead. It didn't matter whom. Searching the crowd, Colchis found no sign of Macaulay, so he had no idea if the Golover had orchestrated any of this. Finding anyone in the unruly mass would have been difficult. Even De Vere's had been swallowed by it. Grice fumbled his footing again, a slip that saw him almost fall. He got up by himself, but unsteadily, his eyes apparently far away as he looked to a horizon only he could see. After one further step, the referee intervened with a hand on the sergeant's chest. Grice scowled, ineffectively batting away the referee's hand with sluggish sweeps of his gloved fists. The Cossack, meanwhile, waited patiently, a killer dormant in the oak of his body, poised to act. Colchis found himself heading downwards, whilst the tension grew below as it did above. He reached the ring quickly, making far better progress when not fighting to cut across the tide. It was hot under the lights, and men sweated in their stripped-down uniforms. The stink of blood and body odor was heady, nauseating. Grice was swearing, but slurring his words like a drunkard. Emperor's bloody mercy, rake! Colchis snapped. How did you let it get this far? Rake and his cousin Dresk looked pale as Valhallen snow. He's stubborn when his mind is made up, sir. Taming a Balgren would be easier, Dresk cut in. Colchis ignored them, moving on to Hanmar, who had managed to get Grice to sit down so he could assess his condition. He's barely sensible, Grice was murmuring, incoherent. Up close, the punishment to his body looked much worse. He was stitched together with thread and scraps of ruddy gauze. But he pleaded, in the fleeting moments of lucidity, the one eye he could still open, saying, Please, let me fight. Colchis laid a hand on the big man's shoulder. It was hot like fire to the touch, and gently shook his head. 
Any more of this, Sergeant, and it'll be the morgue, not the Medicae. I can't allow it. Honor be damned, said the lieutenant. I'm ending this now. He turned, about to call over the referee when Captain Aramis intervened. I propose a substitution, she uttered simply, having made her way down from the upper tiers during the furore. The referee frowned. Take him out, sub me in, said Aramis, elaborating on the point. She had begun to unbutton her uniform shirt, revealing a vest underneath. Only now did Kulkis realize she had brought her adjutant with her, and he had a pair of padded gloves hooked over his shoulder by the strings. Ione, he started to say, but she cut him off. You address me as Captain, she said firmly, but without anger. Captain, Colchis corrected. You can't mean to do this. Aramis spoke to Colchis, but looked at the referee as the adjutant started to wrap her hand. Militarum Pugilism Code states that if the opponent agrees, then a substitute may stand in for another fighter if they are unfit to participate. Substitution is usually before a fight, not during, said the referee, clearly awkward at being spoken to by a woman officer. That's not explicit in the code, said Aramis, as her other hand was bound. The referee looked to Colchis, desperate for some help and unsure how to handle the situation. But the lieutenant had no leverage. Please reconsider, he said. Aramis pulled on a glove, her adjutant lacing it. I do not require rescuing, lieutenant. She donned the second glove and it was pulled tight. Not by any man. Then she stepped up, tying her hair back, making her intentions clear to the Agrians who watched with amusement. Well then, the referee shrugged, effectively putting the question to the other side. In a rare moment of emotion, the hulking Agrian smiled and nodded. Aramis entered the ring with a deft sort of grace that suggested she was born to it. Her second, a man Colchis had since learned was called Hennessy, looked calm but had an edge of apprehension, like he was holding his breath. Grice had been wheeled away on an old ammo cart, rake and dresk pulling, Hanma staying with them all the way to the Medicae. Up in the stands, neither de Vere's nor any of his cohort had made any sort of move. Colchis sensed the general wanted this as much as any of the Volponi stunned into abrupt silence. Even the Agrians had simmered, though a few made snide comments, gesturing to the obvious mismatch in the ring. She had to crane her neck to meet the Agrians' gaze, a child regarding a giant. It was like a fable brought to life. But Aramis looked far from intimidated as the referee laid out the rules of the contest. They broke apart, Aramis calmly retreating into her corner. Colchis caught her eye. He must have looked deathly pale, and she winked at him. He'll kill her, he thought. He'll kill her, and all this will turn to madness. The clarion sounded. Aramis quickly advanced, body low to present a smaller target. She weaved aside from a desultory right hook, planting a trio of rapid body blows into the Agrian's left side. He weathered them with barely a grimace, a shoulder barge pushing Aramis back onto her heels and off balance, so she barely dodged the follow-up swing. Kulkis saw the veneer of quiet confidence slip. Seizing his advantage, the Agrian pressed his attack, a flurry of blows that rained against air, but one glanced Aramis's shoulder and she staggered. A roar erupted from one part of the crowd as the rest held their breath or looked to their officers to intercede, but there was nothing de Vere's or any of them could do. They had allowed Aramis to commit to this course. She would have to see it through. The Agrian moved well for such a large man, his long strides covering the expanse of the ring easily and quickly. It severely impeded Aramis's advantage in speed, though she slipped in close to land a pair of jabs to the right flank. He let out a grunt, his movement slightly stiffening, but otherwise appeared unaffected. He flung her back, using his bulk and superior strength to boss her around. She was ready for it this time and danced away and out of danger. 
a haymaker veered close, its passage disturbing a strand of hair. A second swing followed the first, the Agrian putting in more effort, his face pinched with pain and then turned to stone again. Maybe she did hurt him. Then came a third swing, a thunderous cannon of a punch that Aramis had to use both forearms to block. She cried out, skidding backwards on the canvas, half slipping on Grice's still drying blood. Scenting weakness, the Agrian came for her, an overhead followed by an uppercut that she barely dodged. A rapid return jab caught him in the solar plexus and elicited a sharp grunt. He backed up a step, breathing hard. A cut above Aramis's left eye bled a jagged line down the side of her face, but she kept her eyes on the Agrian, who came on again as relentless as a storm, exerting his strength and superior size just as he had done with Grice. Unlike Grice, Aramis didn't try to compete in an arena where she was obviously outmatched. She ducked away again, skipping sideways, looping under the heavy blows that rattled like pistons, trembling the air. She landed another jab, finding a way inside the Agrian's immense reach, sharp and quick like a sting. He winced, a bruise rapidly blossoming in the place where she had struck. She darted back before he could counter. The clarion sounded, ending the round. Aramis returned to her corner, breathing hard and beaded with sweat. Hennessy mopped the blood off her face and tended to the cut above her eye. You've made your point, said Colchis. Stop this. I don't much care if you outrank me. What will it prove when this ends in your death? What part of I don't need saving did you fail to understand, Colchis? She said, staring down her opponent, who looked a little ragged himself. As his seconds rebound the wrappings on his hands and lathered unguents on his bruised ribs, Kulkis could tell the Agrian was reappraising the other fighter. You've played your cards now, Kulkis continued. You won't be a surprise to him any more. He knows what to expect. Aramis held off the cloth, wiping the blood from her face, so she could turn and look Kulkis in the eye. Who said I had played any of my cards, Lieutenant? Kulkis shook his head. This is insane. You're going to get yourself killed. And then this entire place will go off like an incendiary. Then you'd best be ready for when it does, she replied, as the clarion sounded again and the second round began. The Agrian swept in hard with a flurry of jabs that Aramis struggled to weather. She evaded well. The one punch scraped her shoulder and she dropped it just a fraction. A savage cross sailed by her head again, but rather than backpedal out, she crept in, inside the Agrian's guard. His arm pistoned like it was spring-loaded, but wrapped across the back of Aramis's neck, a wet slap of flesh instead of the bone-shattering impact he had aimed for. She shuffled around the Agrian's body, letting his momentum carry him off balance with the ferocity of the failed cross. And then she struck unloading a flurry of heavy jabs into the bruised ribs so fast it made it hard to count. A yelp of pain escaped his lips, panic slowly contorting his features. Aramis chained her punches, the flurried jabs blending into a sharp cross that struck her opponent across the jaw, opening him up as his guard collapsed, and a viper-fast hook hit his face even as it was turning from the first hit. Another cross, low to the body, Something snapped, releasing a pinched cry of agony. Then another hook into the stomach, his body jackknifed, surrendering to the pain. And as his chin dipped, Aramis unleashed a brutal uppercut. Bone cracked, and the jaw bent sideways, the left cheek bulging to accommodate a violent dislocation of the mandible. He didn't fall straight away, the mind too slow to heed what his body was saying. He faltered for a few seconds, listing this way and then that, before the legs bowed, then buckled, simian arms hanging limp and ineffectual. Canvas trembled, a felled oak brought to ground, his unconscious form unmoving. Utter silence reigned in an arena of over four thousand. 
A single shout stirred the tumult that followed. Volponi glory! Then they were all shouting it, a cry of disbelief and pride, but not Colchis. He looked to the crowds, to the Agrians who felt cheated, twice slighted in their eyes, denied justice and now vicarious retribution. In the end, it was too much. After what happened, no one would remember who threw the first punch, but a brawl broke out amongst the spectators. Agrian and Volponi, heathens against the genteel, though to Colchis's mind, the barbarity was equally apportioned. De Villiers called for order, but even his voice found little purchase on minds given over to fury. Grusman and a squad of guardsmen went with him, heaving men bodily as they strove to reach the heart of the violence and put an end to it. No one saw Rensaint stumble into the agora, disheveled, a gash upon his forehead. They saw his quarry, or at least Colchis did, a blood-stained man in slate-grey fatigues and a black vest, first son, tempestus scion, raving, madness in his eyes, he plunged into the throng of warring men. He broke a wrist attached to a hand that tried to hold him, then crushed a nose in the face of one who got in his way. He snapped the neck of a third, so fast Colchis was still processing what had happened, as he choked a fourth with a savage blow to the throat. Slow realization wormed its way through the crowd, and some of the brawlers stopped fighting, suddenly alert to this new threat. Sent to uh, me. The raving became words, but none that Colchis knew. He was moving to, making for the crowds, wishing he had a pistol. Sent to uh, me. An object in the scion's hand, small and innocuous, De Vere's headed to the cause of the commotion, Grusman and the others a step or two behind him. Sentua me! The object was a frag grenade, its priming light blinking red, red for danger, red for fire. Rensaint fired a gun, an old stubber that discharged thunderously into the air. It echoed, rolling through the agora, and soldiers turned to see him take aim. And what an emperor blessed shot it was, a single bullet, a heart shot that dropped the scion where he stood. And for half a second, Colchis dared to breathe. During his exhale, the grenade exploded. Chapter 21 They were laid side by side and in two rows. A grubby white sheet covered the bodies in lieu of a funerary shroud, barely hiding the disfigurements of their deaths. Twenty-nine dead, seventeen killed instantly, the rest dying of their injuries, and only holding on long enough to beseech the emperor for his mercy, or to wail for the loved ones they would never again see. Cold seeped into Hauptmann's bones as he regarded the quiet dead, who retained the shapes of men under that coarse fabric, but who would go to the throne absent limbs or facial features. An old salt store served as a morgue, the stone and its contents a natural preservative, but it couldn't rob the air of decay entirely. He hadn't been a part of the revels or seen the fights, he had been writing letters, facile words designed to soften the pain of grief. Strong drink helped to numb the hypocrisy of it. And he did that alone, too. He found no comfort in company, not even his own unit, though there were precious few of them left anyway. His citation for bravery had arrived from the office of the general, a piece of platinum in the shape of a two-headed eagle, a note written by an aide, but stamped with the bismond seal, declared the general was looking forward to his presence at the feast. Hauptmann had left it in the Pardus barracks, together with the medal, discarded on his bunk. This, though, this he had to do. Hauptmann didn't mind the dead. At least they kept their peace and their own counsel. Ever since the earth had turned to glass, and the world around him turned into noise and fire, Hauptmann had felt nothing but absence. 
He became an empty thing and so sought out other empty things. Closing tired eyes, he watched them die all over again. Roper thrashing as the fire caught on his clothes, a Promethean spill lighting him up like a pyrotechnic. His cries cut short as he choked to death on the smoke from his own burning flesh. Garrison upended from his mount, raging and kicking as the beasts fell upon him, then screaming as they started to feast. Mathis, annihilated in the blast, turned from a man to a grainy shadow where a man had once stood in the beat of an eye blink. Only Lennox left, a young man no more. A plume of breath shuddered from Hauptmann's chest, fogging the air, just another pallid ghost amongst all the rest. He held a crumpled pict. Fire had seared its edges. He crushed it close, standing in the salt store with his head bowed, and wept for everything and everyone he had ever lost. A light burned in the half-dark, bringing him to his senses, a blade of sodium brightness cutting through shadows and alighting on those shrouded faces in still repose. As the light found Hauptmann, he squinted, holding up a hand to ward off its beam. My apologies, Sergeant, said Aramis, her voice familiar enough to identify her. It is late, or rather early. I didn't think anyone else would be here. No need to apologize, Captain but I'd be obliged if you would stop blinding me. Yes, of course. She doused the light and came to stand by the cavalier's side. She walked stiffly, trying to mask her pain. He had heard about what she did during the fights. Back when we ran scouting missions, we would often be called upon to venture into enemy-held territory, Hauptmann said. We couldn't use lamps, and every bit of chrome or metal was dulled. The engines baffled to limit noise. No light, no sound. We were phantoms. You had to learn to adapt, see in the dark. Old habits, I suppose, when amongst ghosts. Unquiet souls, Sergeant? You think these men are ill at rest? I think they are dead, Captain. And it doesn't much matter either way to the living. A few moments of silence passed between them, until Aramis said, I never had an opportunity to speak to you after... Her words trailed away like a road abruptly cut off. Little to say. And are you... Have you seen the regimental priest, or... So many trammeled paths leading to nowhere. I don't think I ever left that fire, Captain, he said, voice thick with emotion. I close my eyes and I see it, feel its heat on my skin, then the screaming as their flesh burns and runs like wax until all that's left is ash. He turned, his eyes moist in the ambient light. Have you ever seen anything like that? The dead can't hurt us, Hauptmann. No, they only remind us of our failings and regrets. I make it a point to have neither. Hauptmann laughed, not bothering to hide his scorn, but his laugh became a racking cough shuddering through his body like a mortar barrage. Aramis made to help him, but he held her back with an upraised hand, his bitterness winning out. Spoken like a true aristocrat, he said eventually, and could almost feel the air bristle around Aramis. Her concern turned to irritation. Wealth and standing has its own burdens. You don't even see it, do you? He said, choking back the phlegm and wiping his mouth. The privilege. She became indignant. I won't be held to account for the place of my birth or heritage. It's right in front of you. On the back of every servant, every flaunted luxury, every advantage you're given. I don't have every advantage, she countered, but Hauptmann would not be persuaded. You think you are different, Ione. Yes, I know your name. I learned it out of respect should I ever need to use it. 
Can you say the same? Anger contorted Aramis's features, anger that warred with shame, anger at herself. I cannot. Vilas. It was my father's name and his father's before him. And my son, too, is Vilas. He is my legacy. I have no lands, no title, no privilege. Just him. And I should feel guilty for mine? No. But at least open your eyes and recognize it for what it is. Hauptmann left, checking his chrono. He had a duty to attend. Wings up in forty minutes. He patted his pocket, checking it was still there. A packet of parchments wrapped in twine rustled to his touch. Thrown, he felt bone-tired, hot and cold at the same time. He walked from the salt store, past the dead in their ragged shrouds, and then past nine other bodies. Only these had been draped in silk, with a laurel wreath anointing every brow, clutched in the outstretched claw of a gilded griffin rampant. The lamps burned low, casting little light, and feathering the edges of shadows. They hid him for the most part, his skeletal visage rendered grey by the light and his pallor still visible, but split in darkened symmetry. The darkness hinted at a large room, finely appointed with exquisite furnishings, but any detail bled into nothing beyond the warm corona of light surrounding the bed and its decrepit occupant. A claw reached out from beneath the bed sheets, wizened like a dried twig, the skin wrapped over it like old paper. Merciful throne, Regara made the sign of the Aquila. Since the attack, the transformation was arresting. De Vias had lost much of his former vigor. An emaciated thing lay in his bed, bone sharp and gaunt. Regression, the medics had said, brought on by physical trauma. After what must have been centuries, his rejuve had reached and surpassed its restorative limit. The years were literally catching up with him. A polished wood cane, vintage and expensive, lay propped against a padded wing-back chair near to the bed. Glancing at the door sentries arrayed around the general's quarters, Regara sat down in it. He had heard the explosion, heard it, and ran to it, as did so many others not in the Agora that night. Upon his arrival, he had found panic and carnage, dead men blown halfway to the hells, limbs and other parts estranged from the greater whole, a war zone, which had struck Regara as profoundly ironic in a bitter sort of a way. Medics scrambled, Rapid triage was enacted, and then he had seen De Vere's, wounded but alive, a pale imitation of the vital figure Regara had known. Perhaps his health had been failing before then, the truth of his inevitable decline hidden in the shadows of the machine yard and shielded by his entourage ever since. Grussman had dragged him away in short order, and between that moment and this, De Vere's had shrunken to a cadaverous version of his former self. At first he appeared not to realize Regara was present. The rebreather strapped to his face, covering much of his expression. But then he slowly turned his head, as if the bones might crack or crumble to powder. Rumi eyes narrowed as they aligned on the Major's face. A hand like gnarled, brittle oak pulled away the mask, and De Vere's let out a shuddering breath. Only in death, he rasped, his choice of words as chilling to Regara as they were appropriate, given he had spoken their echo to Balis not hours before. Is it heresy to admit I loathe that aphorism? De Vere's smile cracked his skin like it was emaciated leather. Not to a dying man, he said. Regara conceded with a nod, but could not reconcile the man before him with the one he had seen on the stage back at Ankishburg. How is this even possible? he asked. I have lived beyond the years of most men, Major, 
Even the miracles of Mars must bow down to nature at some point, and a cluster of shrapnel in the side is hardly conducive to a long life either. I admire your pragmatism, and is that all you admire? Even on his deathbed, he sought the adulation of his audience. Is that really why you summoned me here, sir, to flatter you? I am surprised Colonel Grussman is not present. He makes a better flatterer than I. A phlegmy chuckle hissed past de Vere's withered lips. That he does, and does well. I am sorry, sir, for whatever worth that has, it is no way for a man of your standing to perish. Ah, should it have been in fire and death, eh? A golden aquila gripped in my fist, a banner snapping in the wind, a thousand clarions proclaiming my glory. He drifted, suddenly wistful, and Regara wondered if his mind, as well as his body, had succumbed to the cruel vagaries of borrowed time reclaimed. I won't lie, Major, that would have been a fine end, but we are seldom given what we deserve. I have regrets, he said, eyes wandering again as if imagining another time, another life. Grossman, said Regara, in an attempt to bring de Vere's back to the moment at hand. Leadership will pass to him, I assume. It will, but it should not, said de Vere's, his candor disturbing Regara almost as much as his appearance. Grossman has been a friend to me for many years, but he is a blunt instrument, effective but unsubtle. He will need steering from his more reckless impulses. Another folk thought Regara disdainfully, arrogant and overreaching. Of how many of the more esteemed houses of Volponi could the same be said? Heredity could be a curse, but one that blighted others rather than the bearer. Then I pray for us all, for I find him an unworthy man and less than worthy officer. De Vere's laughed, a death-rattle cough that racked his body in spasm. A medic began to encroach on the scene, but was sent away with a stern look, the general having lost none of the potency of his influence. After a few seconds he recovered, bloody spittle drooling from one corner of his mouth that he made no effort to clean away. That's why I like you, Regara. Conviction. How liberating it must feel to be so bold. How... Limiting. Am I to hear all of my shortcomings, sir? No, said de Vere's, his mood abruptly serious. I would ask a favor of you, Major. Name it, sir. After a brief silence, de Vere's licked his lips. He spared a look at the guards, but they were statues all, ears as stone to any words he would utter in this place of death. Thin fingers ferreted around the rumpled bedsheets, searching, and pulled forth a scroll of parchment, emblazoned with the house Bizamond seal. An official document. Regara took it as it was offered, his thoughts reeling, but still utterly unprepared for what de Vere said next. I would have you hear my confession. A man would die tonight, Colchis knew this with absolute certainty as he moved through the camp. He had tried the barrack houses, the officers' quarters, the makeshift taverns, even the chapels, but found no sign. Ahead of him, a black slated silo that served as camp armory, one of several magazines Regara had seen established throughout Lodden. A pair of guards wearing slocan uniforms stood outside, stern-faced and tight-lipped. Colchis would interrogate them anyway, try to find a lead. If that failed, the Medicaid tents still had a large intake. 
The Slocan medic Morgan, he thought, had seemed reasonable back in Ankishburg. Perhaps he would know something. It hardly mattered now, as a glance at the sky saw night graying towards dawn. Another would have to be called to be witness. It sat poorly with Colchis, though he knew militarum law, specifically that of Volponi. The dawn brought death, unjust and ignominious. It was no way to reward a hero. The law be damned, thought Colchis, saluting as he approached the Slocan guards. An hour before dawn they took him from his place of confinement. He went accompanied, shackles placed upon his ankles and his wrists, a ragged smock to sheathe his body that did nothing to arrest the scything of the wind. Had he felt it, it would have chilled him, but his mind and his flesh had long since grown numb with the gradual acceptance of his fate. They had waited for the revels to end, not wishing to taint the celebration with the unpleasantness of what was to come. How civilized of them! But come it had, and five days after he had stood in the ruins of Loddon with a banner in his hand and shouting for glory, Darien arrived at the site of his execution. Ithor stood like a revenant in a bare muster yard, his boots muddy with the sodden earth from the rain that had begun in the early hours. He wore the black of the commissariat, so sleek and shiny it looked like darkly glistening skin. A peaked cap with its silver skull hid his eyes, but not the ghoulish smile curling his thin lips, the wizened flesh like that of a mummified corpse stretching to accommodate the twisting of facial features. He stood apart from the four-man firing squad, arms folded neatly behind his back. As his jailers took him through the archway that led into the yard, Darien saw the rest of his court. Schiller, of course, an eager look in his eyes, a heavy cloak slung across his broad frame to ward off the weather. Raindrops plinked tunefully against his helmet. Colonel Grussman, too, a ninth generation of the royal house of Ermentine, wouldn't have wanted to sully his hands with a deg's execution. Good form must be observed, however. Two officers in addition to witness the deed, Isaac Schiller doubtless first to volunteer for the assignment. His second had yet to arrive, an irritation the captain did not possess the decorum or self-awareness to hide. He fidgeted, rising up and down on the balls of his feet, flipping the catch of his pocket chrono in a vain attempt to make the hands turn faster. By the time the other witness marched through the archway, Darien had been pushed onto his knees with his head down. They left him shackled, the metal biting into already red-raw skin. He glanced up through lank strands of hair, the rain grown heavier and running in rivulets down his nose. Captain Ione Aramis of the 86th, fifth generation, a relatively young house, matriarchal. Her grim expression suggested she had no desire to be here or let this draw out. Darien could not blame her, nor did he. Schiller's wide-eyed expression suggested he had not been expecting her. The court of execution assembled. Commissar Ithor began the remarks of condemnation. We are brought here to this place of judgment in accordance with the tenets of militarum law and commissarial justice, he said, voice like a dry breath escaping a corpse, in accordance with the articles of Valponian military conduct, the accused has been found guilty of larceny and the impersonation of a soldier of the Imperium. The sentence is death by firing squad. Rough hands pulled Darien to his feet, ushering him firmly to a worn wooden post, the only feature in the barren muster yard. He saw other figures watching him from across the way, a pair of Agrians, a female officer, the one he had seen at the quarter in Ankishburg, and a hulking Cossack. Purplish bruising covered his face like a rash of birthmarks, and half-sewn cuts would leave scars. They didn't bother to hide, but stood in the open, their feelings inscrutable. A glance at the wooden post before he was turned and tethered to it revealed fresh burn marks, 
and Darian wondered who else had been executed that morning. He should rail against it, shout indignant protests at the injustice, but he knew Volponi, and he knew the men who cleaved to an antiquated code made to keep serfs in their place. Darian had stepped out of his, and his temerity would be severely punished. Have you anything to say before sentence is carried out? Four troopers wearing visored helms, and in full regalia stood to attention, their weapons shouldered, poised to be readied, then fired. Darian stared at them, examining the instrument of his death. I serve the Emperor, and meet him with honor. Schiller snarled. You have no honor, Deg. He looked at Ithor. Be on with it. Ithor gave a slow nod. He signaled to the executioners who snapped their las rifles into firing positions. The movement practiced and as one. Four priming capacitors sounded in unison, a shrilling chorus escalating towards a lethal crescendo. Crimson beam energy coalesced down the barrels, four sparks of light preparing to emit. They took aim. Darian closed his eyes and thought of Lena. I am his worthy servant. Wait! A stentorian voice rang out, and when the prophesied death did not come, Darian opened his eyes. Major Regara had entered the yard, clutching a roll of parchment. He had come alone, but in a hurry, judging by his pained expression and reddened face. He exchanged the briefest of nods with Aramis. Explain yourself, Regara, Grossman demanded. Sentence is imminent. Read it, Colonel. He held out the parchment, which the colonel took with a displeased glance, and proceeded to read after he had broken the wax seal. He hesitated just before unfurling it, noting something significant on the seal. But it was deftly done and scarcely noticed. Silence fell as the colonel digested every word, Schiller growing more agitated by the second but powerless to intervene. When Grossman had finished, he read the letter again and looked up. He had paled in the cold weather. A stiffening of his posture that had grown so taut his spine looked ready to snap. Is this everything? he asked. Regara nodded. Everything he gave me. This is impossible. I heard it from the general's lips himself. His signature confirms it. But his son... Regara nodded. Darian felt struck, a sudden lightheadedness making him glad he was bound. Thoughts spiraled off, only to return and cascade into one another. His son. Grossman ruminated, as if chewing at some old piece of food recently dislodged that he didn't like the taste of. Cut him loose, he said curtly, as Darian's mind reeled, and stalked from the assembly yard without another word. An old shrine, like those often found at a roadside, stood in the lee of a gnarled, ankish oak. A winged statue of a primarch was its only feature. A ring of candles arrayed around it, worn down to the nubs, their wicks extinguished. It was far from the main camp, right at the edge, Colchis had only found it, because a few of the troopers he had questioned had told him they had used it themselves, a place of quiet reflection, solace for the mind. One can never know the travails of others. It is seldom obvious in a look or a word. Such things are hidden, because they are made thus. Weakness is a form of heresy to some a failing to be papered over and false resolve painted atop, layer upon layer of denial, a dam against the horrors. So when Colchis looked up and saw the stout branch and its burden, he wondered at what horrors the dam had held back and why it had broken so thoroughly. A man had died tonight, but not in the executioner's yard, he had died here, alone and in the shadows, hanging by the neck from a gnarled ankish oak. What horrors, Colchis thought, 
looking at the fear etched so profoundly on Archibald Brandreth's lifeless face. Chapter 22 Darian sat on a bench in an old grain house, eyeing the dusty floor, his hands down by his sides. They had taken him here after his reprieve and left him, doubtless trying to decide what to do with him. He was alone, a flickering lumen lamp on a table, the only light source, the darkness a blanket across his thoughts. He barely registered the knock against the half-open door when it came, a crisp, clear rap and a silhouette suddenly standing in the archway. Son. For a moment, Darian dared believe his father, the great and vaunted general of the Volponi, Orator Donesk de Viers himself, had come to explain his newfound heritage and answer the myriad questions swirling in his mind like a gas grenade. But it wasn't him and the speaker realized Darian's disappointment. Hanma, he said, canting his head by way of apology. Darian recognized him from the barrack house, an olive-skinned man, possibly from the Punab region of northern Volponi, with a dancer's poise. He brandished a neatly folded uniform in his arms. Brought you some clothes? Belatedly, Darian realized he must look like something of a state, clad in little better than sodden and dirt-encrusted rags. Thank you, he said, accepting the gift. There's a decent pair of boots, too, Hanma added with a glance at Darian's mud-black bare feet. Should fit well enough. Why is this happening? asked Darian. Why am I here and not dead? Your father... Hanmer ventured awkwardly. I thought you knew. That they had told. They did. I don't understand, though. The clothes sat on the bench untouched, the boots on the floor next to his cold feet. I'm not sure I am the best person to provide an answer. I can try to find the lieutenant. He'll... My mother, Darian began, she never told me about him. Never said. She was a camp follower, a, uh, I think the polite term is courtesan. I knew what she did, what she had to do to keep us alive. I never judged her for it. I loved her. But I wished she could have told me, said something. I'm sure she would have wanted to. Were you young when she died? Darian nodded. Her name was Meris Armitage, a low-born daughter of a low-born man. I never knew my grandfather, but I knew he had little, just as we had little. She got sick. An illness of the blood, said Darian, his gaze drifting back to the haze of pre-adolescence. I remember the sisters of the chapel taking me away through dingy corridors that smelled of counterseptic and death, I think I knew then what was going to happen, that I would be left alone. I still feel alone. I can't speak to any of that, said Hanma, but I do know Lieutenant Kolkis, and that he is a good man, and if he vouches for you, then that is good enough for me, and it's good enough for Grice and for Dresk and Rake. We'll take you in. I know what it's like being an outsider. And what if I'm rejected? If I have no place amongst you, or my own kind, what then? Some will, said Hanma, frankly but not unkindly. They won't want to see a lowborn wearing that uniform, or carrying a las gun. Some may even hate you because of what you represent to them, but I promise you this now. If you fight for us, embrace us, as your brothers, then we will do the same, and you will never be alone again. Darian nodded, tears in his eyes, and looked at the bundle of clothes. Hanma unhooked a scabbard from his belt. It was ornate, well made, and antique. See this, he said, and edged out the blade a few inches. The silver plating shimmered in the light, refulgent with tongues of captured flame. 
This sword is an heirloom. It has been in my family for generations, handed down always to the eldest son. I have a large family back in the Puna. I'm here fighting for them. And I had six older brothers, all dead. This blade came back from the war, and they did not. I had hoped to be a scholar, but I knew when I set eyes upon this sword that it was mine by birthright, and that I had no choice but to join the tithe and the crusade. I left my home, my family, everything I knew, forever. I felt alone, but I found a brotherhood, and so will you. We're all orphans here, Darian, complicated or not, and we fight for each other, for everything we hold dear, he said, reverently sheathing the blade and reattaching the scabbard to his belt. This reminds me of who I am and why I am here. For his own reasons, your father has spared your life. You can question that, or you can use it. He smiled, warmly and compassionately. Now get dressed. You're supposed to report to the drillmaster for basic training. You wanted to fight? You're going to get your chance. Hanmar left, leaving Darian in contemplative silence. For years he had known his place, even though he railed against it sometimes and looked on the royals with envious eyes, at least he knew his part and how to play it. No more. The ground had shifted, his once firm footing teetering at the edge of a precipice into the unknown. A hundred or more questions, the fog obscuring his path. But Hanma was right. He could either let those questions devour him from the inside out, or he could use the second chance he had been given. I want to fight. Darian got to his feet and started to strip away his old clothes, like a skin that no longer truly fit. Much later they moved through a low mist that clung to the ground like sulphur. Ahead, a forest of shorn trunks, the trees beheaded in some cataclysmic blast from earlier in the war. Stumps remained, hefty and fire-blackened, rows upon rows of them. Darian took position behind one the shattered old oaks large enough to hide a fire team if they crouched. He kept his head low, Laz's rifle pressed up against his chest, listening in the eerie twilight. The air smelled of churned earth and loam, with an overly ripe aroma of wet mulch and leafy matter that made him feel sick. He thought about reaching for the rebreather hung around his neck, but none of the other soldiers wore theirs, so he held off, wanting to fit in. A little peaky there, Private, said Rake, a playful tone in his low voice. His cousin Dresk not two steps behind, a heavy stubber slung over his shoulder like a piece of swaddled lumber. Hanmar slid in beside them, a comradely glance in Darian's direction. His three chevrons marked him as acting sergeant in Grice's absence. Four days in the Medicae, and he was still not fit to carry a rifle, despite the lieutenant's assertions that he would make him, broken fingers or not. This Darian had learned in the Chimera's troop hold, in the long transit through Mireland. The convoy had managed sixteen miles through mud and swamp before they had reached the dead forest, the sundered bowls too wide and too thick for the Pardas to cross. A centaur support tank had attempted to uproot a stump with a dozer blade and tow cables, but it was slow and effective work. Sappers had been deployed instead, shoulders slung with axes and blasting charges to remove the hindrance. Godsword effectively covered any approach, the Martians having restored and re-blessed the ancient weapon back to function. Though visibility was greatly obscured, so any assurances the rank and file drew from that were minimal. There had been no cause to use it, though. Every outpost, every settlement the forward scouts had found, was either abandoned or destroyed. They are pulling out, Grusman had said. An overheard conversation between officers around a map table in the middle of a scratch camp ten miles into Myerland. The bastards! 
We have them on the run. Not everyone agreed with that assessment. Dissent came from eyes and exchanged looks, not mouths. But Darian had seen it all the same, as he had passed the officers returning to their regiments after the briefing, him snagging crisp salutes at every gaze that fell his way. They recognized him, or some did, those that bothered to look. Disdain, respect, cool disregard, all came his way. A few mistakenly still thought he was Unsworth, who had raised the banner at the victory of Loddon and become a hero. Darian didn't feel heroic. He was just relieved to be alive and in a uniform. He felt cold and wet as the mist sank into his bones. The stench, he said, grimacing. What is it? War, said Rake glibly, hefting the ammo box he carried onto his shoulder to keep it from the groundwater amassing underfoot. That's how it smells, like death and shit. Thick enough to chew, is it not? said Anmar with a smile. The olive-skinned corpsman ever urbane, even in this wretched swamp. It will be worse further in. He patted his rebreather mask. Then you'll need this. You have been appropriately oriented in its use. Darian wasn't sure if appropriately was the right word. His training had been cursory and hasty from the regimental drill master, but he felt he had retained most of it. In truth, he had always felt born to this, to soldiering, to war, and in the last few days that had turned out to be accurate. He had yet to meet his father, though he suspected he had encountered him without his knowledge at the time. The memory of the mysterious visitor to his cell returning often during the night hours. Rumors persisted of the general's failing health, many asserting a shrapnel injury from the tragedy in the Agora had laid him low and catapulted Colonel Grussman to overall command. Others suggested a heart attack. In either case, he was not on the field and received no visitors, nor asked for any. His absence left a curious hole in Darien, one he still wasn't sure how he felt about. On Monthax, second tour for the 50th, we fought for six straight days in dense jungle, said Dresk, his voice reasserting the present. Mud and filth and undergrowth, like wading through wire. Lagoons as far as the eye could see, foul, brackish waters, insects as large as your hand and hungry as the hells. Mean bastards. Remember that, cousin? I thought my feet would never be dry again. Air that tasted of rank sweat, worse than grice after a long march, so thick it actually shimmered and heat like a heavy cloak. As I recall, your complaints were vociferous, Rake. Colchis crept back into formation, having slipped out to confer with Regara and Command, who occupied a refused position sixty feet from the line. He patted Darien on the shoulder. You'll adapt. It's the guard way. Darien nodded, only slightly reassured. He liked the lieutenant. Kulkis had a firm, fair manner, just as Hanmar had intimated. A second son of an esteemed house, he was known for his handsome looks and good humor, but demonstrated strong leadership and tactical acumen that Darien had come to respect in his short tenure as a soldier. Not everyone fostered the same opinion. Several dirty looks had come their way from the Agrian sappers they had been charged to protect as they cleared a path for the tanks. Directed, Darian was sure towards Colchis. Rake and Dresk had spoken of it a little. The two troopers loose-tongued, especially after a few glasses of Vresk. A feud, they had said, a slight not forgotten, related to a dead Agrian hetman called Osra, that Kulkis had locked horns with on a couple of occasions. The grudge festered. A bird call arrested further introspection, echoing down the line, and saw Kulkis give the order to advance. Two platoons moved as one, their pace steady but unhurried, put at ease by the all-clear from the forward scouts. Darian felt far from easy, though, as he waded deeper into the mire, the mist thickening around him. 
The OREC ranged ahead, disappearing into the banks of mist as the Volponi followed in their wake. As soon as he had set up sentries, Colchis issued commencement orders to the Agrians, and a horde of labor gangs descended with pickaxes, debt cord, and sticks of explosive. They worked efficiently within the guard cordon established by the Volponi, all eyes outwards as the diggers toiled in the swamp heat. Almost all. A pair of Cossacks, two he recognized from the Golliver's retinue, sent their ire his way. He would speak to Regara about it when he had the chance, but command was stretched after Brandreth's untimely death. His agonized face still haunted Colchis, like so many other dreams of darkness he had accrued. A surfeit of horrors he would gladly be rid of. He rubbed at his leg, the injury sustained to the wirewolves, for he could not think of the creatures dispassionately enough to refer to them as K-weapons, acting up in the damp. A faint chuckle passed his lips. In idolizing Regara, he had hoped to be like him. Suffering from a similar injury had not been what he had in mind. A round of charges went off, splitting a wide tranche of stumps for the axemen to rend. Steel plating followed, evened out with sandbags underneath, and so a makeshift roadway formed. A hetman whistled, signaling his approval of the work, and the Pardas vanguard rolled out. They moved slowly and ponderously, their weapons turning in lazy arcs, the tankers jutting from the turret hatches wary and quiet. A few chewed on thick cigars and puffed aromatic smoke that only partly obscured the reek of the forest. Colonel Ganza led them out, barrel chest outthrust as he surveyed the land ahead like a fearless explorer bound for the unknown. He nodded to Colchis in passing, a king upon his war altar, deigning to acknowledge his subjects. Let him feel superior. His most recent meaningful action had been retreat. Colchis saluted him anyway, in concession to his rank. The Agrians had almost finished. Kulkis engaged comms. Garno! A momentary bout of static preceded the Master Sergeant's voice on the other end of the box. Nothing but mist, my friend. Is there an end to it? I hope so. I can no longer feel my feet. I have spare boots in the Chimera, about three miles back. I think your boots might be a little small for me, eh? Though your officer's cap would be plenty big enough. Mine is leaking. Pity. I'm already using it. Perhaps we can share it, Lieutenant. It is, how did you put it, camaraderie. Kulkis gave a wry smile. A lofty word for a shared hat. I tell you what, Orek. I'll give you the name of my haberdasher when we're both back at camp. I swear if you had just insulted me, I would not know. Kulkis laughed, finding solace in Garnu's good humor, but felt Schiller's eyes as the captain prowled the back of the guard cordon. Hurry it along, lieutenant. You can fraternize with the commoners when we're out of this bloody swamp. Colchis cut the vox, lingering only long enough to confirm his platoons would hold until the OREC had scouted ahead. They're here, you know, Colchis, said Schiller, having moved close enough for the smell of his alcohol breath to pervade. The pact, a damn battalion somewhere in these woods. He stared into the mist, as if trying to find them. It's a large region. Our paths might not cross, Captain. Like two leviathans drifting through the same ocean, Schiller said, quoting a line of Volponi poetry by Sturk, his voice briefly far away, as if softened by remembrance. It was a slim hope, thought Colchis, lost in his own thoughts then, and the road ahead was long. The gloaming made shadows of men. Even the tanks looked like slow-moving rocks, grinding laboriously through a river of mist. 
Regara's gaze found Darian amongst the throngs of troops moving carefully through the sundered forest. A son of an esteemed royal of Volponi, the Bismond House of Konisberg, no less. It beggared belief, but the proof of it was before him in Volponi Grey, a praxis pattern lasgun in his hands. It had stirred grievances, the pardoning and subsequent commission, and not least of those was Grussman's, who had always hated the Degs, but was loyal to De Vere's. It had tied him in knots, and still did. He masked it with duty, devotion to his newly attained rank and position, a blunt instrument determined to beat the war into submission. That thought terrified Regara more than any wirewolf or traitor Astartes. How many miles, Major? Regara turned at the naming of his rank, a scowl on his face at the slow progress of the army. Two, sir. He had taken to calling Grossman sir, for though Regara despised him, and recent engagements with the man had not persuaded him otherwise, he would observe the appropriate manner and measure of respect. His breeding demanded nothing less. They stood in close proximity, in the back of a command salamander, peering out over the armoured lip of the forward glasses. Heathens, Grossman cursed under his breath, Lackwit oafs. Commissar, he snapped at Ithor, the desiccated corpse of a man turning towards the inquiry. Muster the discipline, masters. Let's push the lash to them. See if that doesn't hurry things along. Whipping the Agrians will only antagonize them, said Regara. Grussman raised an imperious brow, but Regara wasn't about to give him another, sir. One was more than enough. Nonetheless, the colonel still expected an answer. Our alliance with the natives is thread-thin as it is. We need them on side and willing. Grussman was about to object when Rensaint interceded. I've observed these people, General. They are proud and would not take well to humiliation. Very well, Grussman uttered at length, a slight sneer stretching and deforming the scar across his cheek earned in the agora from the frag grenade that had killed over twenty men and injured dozens. How else to stir them, I wonder? Regara had yet to ask Rensaint what he knew of the attacker, but apparently the man had got loose and begun babbling before the killing started. Sentiwa may. It was not to the knowledge of the Lex Savants, at least one of the arcanate languages or dialects, but they knew so little of it, and understood even less that this was hardly a definitive statement. Something had overcome the scion, broken him, and his death had sent several others to the morgue. Regara, said Grussman, a cruel smile turning his features again as an idea formed. I want you in an advance post alongside the troops— his eyes widened with sadistic amusement, knowing how the damp and moisture pained the Major's injured leg. Keep order. You have a way with the common born and their like, and even the diggers respect rank. Inspire them. Regara saluted his assent, his expression studiedly neutral, as he was about to climb down. An adjutant made to follow, but Grussman's words stopped him. The corporal, I will have use for him. As you wish, sir, Regara replied, exchanging a meaningful glance with Rensaint. He's all yours now. Remarkable, isn't it? uttered Grossman, loud enough for the major to hear as he departed. How a deg can become a gentleman and escape a firing squad but for a lucky chance. I wonder he continued, his voice slowly fading as Regara got further away, if the position could be reversed. Tugging his collar up around his neck, Regara strode into the forest and only breathed again when his hand had left the hilt of his saber. Chapter 23
The Valkyrie flew with engines baffled, running dark and staying just above the cloud layer like a night bird gliding on the wing. Hauptmann had rolled back the side hatch, clipping in to prevent any mishap should the aircraft need to bank or manoeuvre suddenly. But the skies were clear, the Veduak patrolling elsewhere or having quit to some other part of the island entirely. It was a mercy, for the Arcanate air carder were ruthless and tenacious. He closed his eyes, letting the wind buffet him and fill his senses with white noise, a voiceless thunder that smothered his thoughts and left his mind a peaceful blank slate. No screams, no smell of burning, at least for a while. His hand found the clutch of parchments in his uniform pocket, and the dead returned, as if summoned by the ink on paper that told of their ending and offered hollow consolation. Old feelings of loss resurfaced, like bodies left over long in a river, bloated with regret. The crumpled Pict wormed its way into his gloved hand without Hauptmann realizing, and he thought of Chari, her hair swept back on a frontier wind, their son cradled in her tanned arms. I drink, said a voice from the hold interior, the tunnel rat, 19th Talper. Hauptmann thought his name was Pick or Pack or something like that. Remarkably, he wore a lieutenant's badges, and Hauptmann wondered briefly if he had stolen the ragged jacket to which they were pinned. I beg your pardon? The Talper had a greasy flask in his cloth-wrapped mitts. A sloshing emanated from within, the liquid redolent of physaline. Hauptmann politely refused. Good for forgetting, said the Talper, scratching at the tattoo on his cheek, a mournful shadow passing across his dirty face. And blindness, thought Hauptmann, but kept that to himself, smiling instead. Or oh, I smoked the kappa, he bared licorice black teeth. Neither vice sounded particularly appealing. Hauptmann spared a quick glance to Lennox, hoping for moral support, but the sniper had his feet up on a bench and was snoozing peacefully, an easy smile on his face. Oh, to be young and less burdened. He showed the Talpa his picked. My family, he said. The Talpa stared at the faded image for a long time, eventually nodding. Tis good, he said. How so? That you are here and they are not. No place for a family, this war. Hauptmann found no argument there, but it didn't ease his grief. A grubby hand hastily wiped on grubbier fatigues came his way. Pack, uttered the Talpa. Hauptmann, Hauptmann replied. The Talpa smirked. Funny name, and swilled back his illicit grog. It took six more hours to find the Loke Beacon, one of the first suns pouring over the signal returns on a radar unit that turned his face the color of sweaty emerald. Here, he said curtly, his counterpart Sion in charcoal and black sitting up and hurrying over to the dulcet screen. Hauptmann had learned their names were Zarek and Venator. Apart from their hair, one fair, the other dark, they could have been forged from the same mold, their ruthless edges left untrimmed. There was a potent physicality to both men, even more so than the Blue Bloods, who had thoroughbred bodies like slabs of perfectly wrought muscle. This wasn't breeding, though. It was grown, actually crafted. Hauptmann could almost smell the stim sweat wafting off them. They had not elucidated about rank, or much else, really, beyond the fact that Zarek was in charge of the operation and Venator his second in command. The remainder of the seven-man team was made up of a pair of slokens in warm crimson and silver carapace armor. These two didn't speak much at all, though happily conversed in their own tongue, often sharing a joke that more than once Hauptmann had thought was at his or the Talpa's expense. Confirm reading said Zarek, his chiseled face rendered like green marble in the radar light. The ping from the unit perpetuated, getting steadily louder. Venator corroborated the loke ident and nodded, his eyes fierce and exultant. Throne, we have him, 
Zarek turned his cold eyes on the others. Even Lennox was stirring. Arm up and be ready. We move as soon as we're down. It appeared they had found Lieutenant Saka. Eddies of swirling dust obscured the departing Valkyrie as the troopers marched out. The first sons took point, Zarek out front, a tempestuous volley gun held in a low grip. Venator was at his shoulder, clutching a hell gun. They moved fast and smooth through the rugged terrain, almost like automata, and further dehumanized by their rebreather and visor-masked helmets. Hauptmann's own rebreather hung around his neck, the sergeant preferring a scarf to ward off the grit on account of it feeling less claustrophobic. A breeze had kicked up from somewhere, its catabatic zephyrs sending dust in all directions like a lazy sandstorm. It chafed, but was otherwise no more than a mild irritant. He coughed, surprised to find a little blood flecked on the edge of his scarf. Everything all right, sir? Hauptmann nodded to Lennox, the lad a few feet behind him and to his right. Must have bit my lip. Lennox had brought his sniper rifle. But it was piss-all use on the move, and in these conditions, Serge remained slung across his shoulder, a combat shotgun favoured instead. Park roamed the other side, his position similarly refused. He had an axe, a pick hooked to his belt, and a shit shovel of a las carbine on a strap that he carried one-handed. Possessing neither rebreather nor scarf, he kept his head low against the wind. Rearguard was the two slokens, both trailing crimson cloaks that had yellowed at the edges from the dirt, the heavy-armoured bastards like small tanks and wielding siege-grade autoguns in their gauntleted fists. Each man wore a fright mask, a snarling death visage meant to inspire fear. They did not look so fearsome slogging through the dirt in their ornate panoply. A hand signal arrested the march abruptly, Zarek's clenched fist apparent to all. He gestured ahead, a hand just above his eyes in a silent instruction to look. It took a moment, Hauptmann peering into the mustard haze, just the faint song of the wind lamenting in his ears, and then a structure began to appear, an outline at first, but then more detail, as he discerned architectural characteristics from mere silhouette. An old fort, it had dilapidated crenellations, the merlins and embrasures of the walls sunken down to rubble in places, in spills of tired old rock. Despite the disrepair, it appeared solid, a combination of stone and metal, bleached starkly by the elements. No outer wall, no gate, just a roundish tower jutting from the earth like a sword. No sentries either. Looks deserted uttered one of the slokens, a brutish sort, dark eyes glittering behind the anonymity of his mask. The voice came out distorted, a feral resonance worsened by the inbuilt breather. He and his compatriot had moved up from the back ranks to stand upon the edge of the shallow defile that looked down on the fort like all the rest. Zarek stared a moment longer, a handheld Auspex scanner pinging softly before turning to Hauptmann. Bardus Mechanized is a scout unit, isn't it? Hauptmann nodded, amongst other things. Not any more, said Zarek, and it took all of Hauptmann's resolve not to strike him. I need you to reconnoiter that fort. Draw out any trap or sentries, you mean. Call it what you will, soldier. That's Sergeant Cavalier, Hauptmann replied indignantly. Not here, it isn't. He gestured for the Pardus to move out. Hauptmann obliged. It was either that or kill him. Puck started after him, head low against the wind. Where are you going? asked Zarek, but he didn't intervene. Stretch my legs, he looked around the barren wastes. Nice weather for a walk, he said, and followed Hauptmann into the defile. Stay close, Hauptmann murmured, Puck trailing behind him, and glanced up to the edge of the defile. The first suns and slokens had spread out across the ridgeline, but a sniper sight watched every step the scouts took, Lennox waiting patiently at the other end of the scope. 
Hauptmann gave a small nod to his friend and countryman, that easy smile again in return. You think it's deserted? asked the Talpa. No, I do not. They trudged on. The drifts had gathered here, collecting in shallows of dust and grit that rode up to the ankle as Hauptmann approached the fort. A round wall presented itself, an iron-bound door the only entrance. It wasn't sealed or even properly shut, and banged gently on its frame, hinges creaking like scraped piano wire. He nudged it with his boot, Puck observing keenly and as silent as a shadow. He nodded to Hauptmann, his readiness unspoken. No pressure plate, no trigger cord. The door opened, revealing an unadorned circular chamber and a lozenge-shaped metal hatch in the ground. Faint ambient light caught its edges. The hatch led down, and it was sealed. Hauptmann used the Vox. Bring blasting charges. A few minutes later, and everyone stood around the hatch, a few feet back, hugging the edges of the room, with the exception of Venator, who was rigging a line of debt cord. A bandolier of crack grenades hung off his body as he stooped, but they wanted the hatch breached, not the fort collapsing. He scurried back, eyes on the group, and counted down with his fingers. Three, two, one. A plosive spurt and the hatch fell loose, shorn from its frame. After a few seconds, it hit the ground below, the noisy clang echoing back up a narrow shaft. Zarek's stab light strafed the darkness, revealing a ladder leading down to a grated deck plate and nothing else. He waited, listening until long after the echo had faded. Still nothing. Venator had the ore specs now. Its signal returned silenced, but an urgent screen pulse indicating the Loke Beacon's proximity. He gave a shallow nod. The Slokans went first, heavy armor to the fore, auto guns slung on their backs as they descended rung by painstaking rung. It took over twenty minutes for everyone to traverse the ladder. Hauptmann arrived second last, just ahead of Lennox, who was a few feet further up the shaft, as the sergeant cavalier's boots touched metal. What became immediately apparent was how much larger the footprint below was compared to that above, as a vast subterranean chamber spilled out into seemingly endless darkness. Cold, hissed one of the slokans, breath pluming. Stab lights ventured outwards, their grainy beams crisscrossing and overlapping in a gulf of blackness. Eventually, one found a wall, the condensation on it shining like glacial ice. They left Lennox at the ladder, guarding the only known egress, and he gave Hauptmann a look as the sergeant cavalier glanced over his shoulder as he was departing. Watch yourself, it said. Using the wall, the rest followed the periphery of the chamber, but when they found nothing, it became obvious they needed to move inwards. After several more feet, Venator checked the ore specs. The dull light barely lit the screen, its soft pulse quickening like a heartbeat in cardiac arrest. Venator panned the device, but static rippled across its face, the depth fouling the signal until it cut out completely. Deeper in, and the darkness began to feel almost residual, its soft tendrils clinging like it was darker than it should be, or the stab lights were losing power, but Hauptmann thought it just a quirk of the chamber, which was metal throughout like a ship's cargo hold, or a meat locker. They reached the center, and it felt pretty far from where they had started. Hauptmann assumed they must have passed a column or support, because he had lost sight of Lennox. Guns up, whispered Zarek, and the company obeyed as one, a flurry of ineffectual stab lights preceding their advance. The light barely reached ten feet, one of the Slokans wrapped his lamp's casing, but Venator hissed a warning and he stopped. The beam flickered, as if passing through a patch of interference, but stayed on. Old burn marks seared the metal underfoot, which rose up in a wide and expansive platform. How big is this place? Hauptmann heard a Slokan murmur. He had been wondering the same thing, and tried Lennox on the Vox, but the signal was dead. He made this known to the Scions, who exchanged a stern glance with each other. I saw no Valkyrie in the vicinity, 
offered Venator, still baffled at the blank auspex. Maybe Saka shed his loke beacon, and he isn't here. He sounded worried, which sent a chill through Hauptmann and an urge to bolt that he fought down. Zarek stared wide-eyed, caught on the threshold between decisions, before moving them onwards. Streaks and blemishes on the metal continued, but appeared too thick to be made by fire. Puck stopped to run his finger through one. It came back dark and glistening faintly. Shang, he said, sniffing fervently like a rat sensing danger. The air grew colder, freighted with a wet copper odor. They came upon the first of the machines shortly after, disused, dormant, like nothing Hauptmann had ever seen, not Mechanicus, edged and spiked, a metal frame with straps and articulated limbs, like a torture rack. Saka was bound in one, bloodless, emaciated. He had the stillness of the dead. His neck had been arched back, a studded iron circlet across the forehead, preventing movement. Both arms were strapped down too, and the ankles. Two metal limbs extended from the back of the machine, and ended in three articulated talons that attached to Saka's eye, pinning the lid open. Venator had been about to move in when Zarek put an arm across him. He was looking at the ground, his lamp straying to something daubed on the deck plate. Sentiwa me, or more precisely, es sentiwa ma ai. An outstretched hand lingered at the light's penumbra. Hauptmann swept his lamp over and revealed another of Saka's men, dead, stripped back to fatigues and vest. His head had lolled on the side to reveal overwide eyes that would never close. The rest of the missing scions lingered nearby, trapped in the machines, heads back, eyes held open, looking upwards. Puck craned his neck, and Hauptmann followed the Talpa's gaze and found his own face staring back at him. A mirror ceiling arched above them, huge, vaulted. It was made up of shards, mismatched flecks of glass fused together into a patchwork mosaic. S. Sentiwa ma I. I am a witness, said one of the slogans, the truth of the message revealed in reflection. A witness to what? thought Hauptmann. To the all and the everything, the darkness answered. Chapter 24 Vauga, the Imperium called him. Regara had read the man's file, thin as it was. A Damagawa, he had a reputation for sadism and ritualistic murder. Not uncommon amongst the Pacted, but Vauga also registered on the assignment, though his actual rating on the Morianic scale had been redacted by the Ordos. According to Militarum Intelligence, he had occultist ties to a minor sanguinary faction called the Tongues of Cherish, and was allegedly a former student of Heritor Asphodel, or a petty imitator. Claims differed on that part. Though the late Magister had been slain during the Vergast conflict over twenty years ago, a war in which the Blue Bloods had played a significant role, Men like Vauga ensured his legacy endured. Vauga had come to Nostis, and his army stood between the Volponi and passage through Mayaland, and the first Regara knew of it was the Red Swathe. It crept under the mist, a veil beneath a veil, heavy at first, then rising as a bloody fog. It unfurled across the army with eager virulence, like rippling red fabric, an Orek died first, choking on the poison before he could lift his mask. He fell back as if shot, his death caught at the edge of Regara's magnocular lens. The Major turned, only quick enough to see the scout's splayed fingers swallowed by the swathe. Others followed, gurgling and rasping their last breaths, a dozen or more by Regara's count, before the order sang out, Masks! Masks! It resonated through the ranks. Men dispersed amongst the severed trunks, relaying fear down the line as sure as any contagion. 
a gas attack, that insidious horror, and the promise of an ignominious death. Fingers trembled, some slipped. Regara pulled on his rebreather and heard the quickening of his fear rebounded back at him through its plastic confines. Already stifling in the sundered forest, it only grew worse behind the partially fogged lenses he now looked through. He raised Kulkis on the internal Vox. Sound off, Lieutenant. Vox good, Vox good, sir. It came back crisp, close. That was something at least. He reached the platoon, took command. Schiller had third and fourth platoon and huffed across the closed system Vox, slurring his vowels. Bloody gas, the blackguards. Regara's response was curt, as it needed to be. Captain, signal the advance. A horn blast rang out. Schiller's breath filtered through a facial vent. Then two more. Then they were moving to engage, quickly adapting from guard to assault positions. The well-drilled Volponi doing what they did best. The Agrians fell into disarray, many fleeing the gas attack, their masks standard issue and only partially effective. A few strays collided with the Volponi units, who barged them aside, putting their well-nourished physiques to harsh effect. Others rallied, a handful of Cossacks and their Golliver maintaining order. In either case, the diggers were in retreat. Regara pushed on, unwilling to be distracted. His only instinct was to push forwards and engage. The world had feathered around the edges, sound and light dictated by rebreather mask, perception shrunk to a pair of ocular lenses, and the death rattles of men too slow or too ignorant in the face of danger. He couldn't find the enemy at first. The air was too thick, too red. Lazfire whipped out, ending all that. Sporadic at first, it chimed against the armor of the Pardus tanks, leaving burn scars but little else, then intensifying like gentle rain that grew into a deluge, irresistible once it peaked. Then Regara saw them, edging from the mist, the red swathe parting like some gossamer veil of hell, admitting its demons unto the world. Brutish, scarred, they wore iron helmets and spiked metal cuirasses over ox-blood flak armor and uniforms. Grotesques glistened, the faces of old nightmares anointed with blood. The air had become an eldritch gloaming, soft light lending the pact's advance an eerie, unreal quality. Vanguard forces had engaged, some hand to hand, such was the suddenness and proximity of the attack. Mostly Orek and the scout carders, a few Talpa, the vicious bastards and some plucky Agrians caught on a limb when the attack hit. Cries ululated, dulled and flattened by the crimson fog, like men dying at the bottom of a well or in some half-heard ethereal place abutting reality. They had to push up and reach the beleaguered vanguard, consolidate, fight back. A stray bead flashed Regara's shoulder, searing his uniform. He snarled. Return fire! Savage light erupted from the Volponi ranks, and the air succumbed to heat and fury. Regara sweltered, the mask sticking to his skin, adhering so tightly he thought it had melted, become part of him. He saw a private wrench off his rebreather, suffocating in his own terror and then suffocating for real, spewing blood and matter as his organs liquefied and his flesh ran like wax. Others wizened, their emaciation evident in the concavity of their cheeks, reduced to husks before they fell. Every death held a different grim story. The red swathe funneled on, crashing like a dread wave against the militarum forces, a primal hunger drove it, a terrible animus that wanted only suffering and pain. It drank of it, expanding, reaching. Throne, it's coming for us, Regara heard Schiller over the Vox, willed him to gather his bloody wits. Fight them, he roared, urging on the blue bloods. Get to the vanguard, form up and make ranks, fight! He didn't know how many the pact had, but he doubted it was equal to the Volponi and their auxiliaries. The ambush leveled things, but only for a time. Restore order, retaliate with strength, and the battle was theirs. Gazing through steamed-up plastic, he saw his rallying point, the tanks. 
The Paras had closed all hatches, hermetically sealing themselves up in their war machines, but they were strung out, too far ahead of the main forces and vulnerable. A few fired off sponson guns, but the swathe was fouling auto-targeters and most of their shots skewed astray. Turrets boomed, as Ganser fought to make their artillery superiority count, sending spouts of dirt and water pluming, bodies too. Out of the fog, another threat. They ran low and fast, like rats. Lighter armored than the other pactors. Regara shot at one, but it jinked away, as if presciently warned. Metal flashed, serrated and sharp. Scarred hands gripped a grenade. An explosion bloomed, the side of a battle tank blown out in a cascade of smoke and shrapnel. No one staggered out. The crew died in their seats, drowned by the swathe. Ganza pressed on, his conqueror trying to forge a firing line, but the road the Agrians had raised was narrow. Tank tracks fouled on mud or ran up against hefty stumps and stalled. It was a mess. A second tank blew, fuel reserves cooked off. Regara threw a hand up to ward off the sudden flare of light, a powerful blast knocking him onto his back. He felt a hand grab his forearm and lift. Kulkis looked back at him, eyes firm through the dirt-flecked lenses of his mask. To the pavis, grated Regara, still catching his breath. The tanks were being torn apart. Another explosion lit up the twilight, casting dead faces in monochrome. Long shadows stretched like rubber, only to recoil a few moments later. Aramis ran through the dark and light, her troops at her heels. She felt every ache anew, every blow she had taken in the ring. Thrown, it hurt like the hells to push herself. But if she didn't, then brave men would die. Her platoons ranged across the far left flank. The captain's hurried route, an intercept with the Volponi Corps but they were too far out and needed to close. A few skirmishers roamed this far, but they were outriders, and soon fell back before determined imperial opposition. Aramis cut one down that had dared to loiter in her path, slitting them from crotch to crown. Burnt meat tanged the air, mudded through her breather. A squadron of sentinels advanced with them, the long-limbed engines better suited to the terrain than the bulky Apardas engines, but not as hardy. A missile struck the chassis of the forwardmost walker, turning it to scrap, and leaving the dismembered legs standing ponderously, bereft of their body. Underslung multi-lasers from the surviving machine stuttered in reply, raking the pactors and pushing them back. She heard a regimental priest shout a blessing to the emperor. Aramis kept pace with the walkers, her breath huffing inside her mask. It was hard going, slogging through the mire, boots splashing, slipping on mud. One man fell, impaled himself on a fallen branch. She didn't go back or even slow. They had to drive on, consolidate with the core. The ambush had come at the worst moment, as all ambuscades invariably do. The Volponi were strung out, disorientated, coalesce and they could mount a viable counter-attack, remain broken up as they were, and the enemy would take them piecemeal. Not on my damn watch, she growled, huffing through her mask, then louder to her men, move, move. She had 8th and ninth platoon of the 86th, Hennessy at her side. Her men shot on the hip, Laz guns held low with one hand bracing the stock, chattering on rapid fire. Then she saw the flank of the enemy army revealed before her, and the robed magister at its heart, and her objective changed. She vox cast orders to all her platoon leaders and sergeants. Priority target in the field, on my marker, Volponi Glory! Kulkis knew these warriors, bastards every one. He'd fought them on Titus, and old memories of that war stirred in his gut like rotten oysters. Blood-packed grenadiers, Jaegens. Each one had a dead man's trigger, designed for shock and awe. Different by degrees to the more formal military stylings of the death brigades, the Jaegens roved in loosely dispersed packs and had more in kind with their ancestral hunter-barbarian forebears than most of the common pack did. 
long blades for close work, akin to a dirk or trench knife, and a bandolier of grenades. Disorientate, terrify, fall back, repeat. Against the Pardus tanks, they would wreak utter havoc. A Yagen slipped out of the fog, and he nearly missed it. An instinctive shot took the warrior in the throat. He went up like a tripped landmine, broken apart like kindling. Ten more feet of hoofing through the mud, and first and second platoon reached the Pardus. Six more tanks had been destroyed, their hulls agape, the crew within shot or gassed to death. Twenty or more remained in the vanguard, left in train to defend themselves or in the throes of trying to escape. Colchis followed Regara through a graveyard of vehicles, their inner parts spilled from their mortal wounds like organs. Fires lit a false night, redolent with burnt flesh and hair. Risking a glance over his shoulder, he saw Hanmar and the others coming up behind, even Darian, the lad pale behind murky eye lenses, but his eyes fierce. Protect the tanks, bellowed Colchis, his voice muffled even across the Vox. Then consolidate this position. A pack of Jaegans sprang into a side alley made by the flanks of two sundered vehicles, knives out and bloody. Colchis fired off four quick shots, all mortal wounds. Another six made it through and Darian got one, spearing it through the chest with his lasbeam. Regara took another, a bolt shell turning the grenadiers up a torso to blasted meat. The rest went for the major, having spent their payloads and trying to take out an enemy officer. They hadn't reckoned on Hanmar. His antique blade danced like silver light, and it was over in a rapid flurry of deft sword strokes. Four dead Jaegans lay piled up around him, Seconds had lapsed, the merest distraction dealt with. They moved on, sixty men or more, weaving between the scorched black carriages, a hull-down labyrinth of narrow avenues and dead ends of torn metal. Other Jaegans roamed the cluster of tanks too, darting away after delivering their devastating payloads. The Volponi rooted them out, firing snapshots down the false thoroughfares of adjacent vehicle walls. It took almost fifteen minutes before they cleared out the rest of the enemy grenadiers. A few scattered back to the lines, using the red swathe to their advantage. But the fog was thinning, its integrity decaying. Rake and Dresk chased after them with rounds from the heavy stubber, but caught only a handful of stragglers. Really crawling out of the woodwork, Major, commented Rake, as he slammed another box mag into the heavy stubber's breech. Like roaches, only uglier added Dresk, his eye pressed along his iron sights. As ugly as Grice, anyway, said Hanmar, and most of the men laughed. Regara didn't. Kulkis saw his face, as severe as hot iron, his gaze searing. A sortie, nothing more, he said, though the last storm had ebbed in recent minutes. The bulk of the enemy are up ahead. We have to push up behind the pavis. A hatch was thrown open, arresting further orders. Ganza leaned out of his conqueror, face flushed and angry. He sped a glance for the Volponi, but the colonel's blood was up, and he bellowed an order to advance on the main army emerging from the fog. Armor forward! Chest puffed, chin up. He had an aristocratic sneer to put any blue blood to shame. Enough makeshift road had been laid for three tanks abreast and Ganza led the pavis like he was the point of their armoured spear. He drew and levelled his sword, a fine silver-bladed spather with a chased gold hilt, evoking the spirit of a cavalry charge of old. Engines roaring, increasing pace, the conqueror rode hard, its battle cannon thundering in rapid succession. Hefty divots chewed through the blood-packed ranks, scattering bodies and turning men to mist. Amongst the infantry platoons, stork tanks roamed, and their pulse lasers lashed at the pavis armor, but found it hardy and near inviolable. He'll ride right through the major, Colchis had seen the fury in Ganza's eyes, the indignation. He was a proud man, and he had been battered for much of this war. Now he yearned to hit back, to clench his mailed fist and smash aside whatever was in his way. 
Get on his heels, then. We'll ride the cover the tanks provide, use them to reach the pact. On them! On them! The order rang down the line, and companies came together, pushing hard. Slowly, slowly, the Volponi and their allies started to consolidate. Schiller's horn clarioned, the infantry flooding after the tanks to exploit the imminent break through the arch-enemy lines and a moving shield wall. Colchis ran on, caught in the surging madness. The pact held. That was the thing that struck Aramis as she came in on their flank. They occupied a defensive position, a partially raised embankment with a low revetment ringed around it. Heavy shelling had ripped out sections. The craters swiftly filled. The dead either trampled or heaped up like makeshift sandbags. Razor wire glistened, knife sharp and bitter. Aramis reckoned on at least five hundred men, barring any losses from the Pardus barrage. Hit the flank at the same time as the core of the army, everyone coming together as one. Overwhelm in one swift assault, that was the plan. She had made good ground, her and her troops. She felt it in the burn of her muscles, the sweat down her back. And there was still that magister to consider. For now, though, her eye was drawn elsewhere, as the pavis came on with ironclad fury. Thrown but Ganza raised down on them like the nine devils of Horus, his armoured stallions given their head, voices crying thunder and death. Yet the pact still held, dug in but bleeding, weathering the storm. They replied in kind, heavy weapons chugging out rounds. One of the tanks suffered an unlucky hit, a blow to its tracks that turned it sharply and exposed its lighter flank. A collimated beam from a battery of Laz cannon skewered it and sent fire spitting into the sky from the resulting explosion. The rest drove on, glory in their hearts. A few stray volleys came her way, and Aramis gave the order to take cover and advance before her platoons took too much fire. She was not alone. A lieutenant, Fink, she thought was his name, had two platoons in his charge, nearly a hundred, and the priests in addition to that. The main thrust moving up behind the armor had five times that. Another hundred or more on the other flank, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Barbastian, God Emperor, it had looked simpler on a map. Three forces, two ranging wide, run the flanks, meet in the center, textbook. Here, in the mud and the terror, it was anything but. Fink sent a look her way, and she gave the signal to move up. We take their flank, she told Hennessy, needing to voice her thoughts, to hear something other than her rasping breath from the pain in her ribs. And keep on going. Roll right across them until we hit Regara's contingent. If Barbastian does the same on his side, we'll crush these bastards in an imperial vice. Volponi glory, Captain, replied Hennessy, his face almost as pale as alabaster. Volponi glory, said Aramis, slashing down with her sword and ordering the charge. His legs felt leaden, his overtaxed muscles burning from the effort of hefting the four pounds of mud clinging to each of his boots. They never told you that, thought Darian, as the las beams zipped overhead like lethal fireflies, and he tried to keep the tanks between him and an early demise. The drudgery of war, the sheer mindless slogging before you even get to fight. Throne had seen soldiers die trying to cleave the mud off their boots before even raising a las gun. Ignominy, the reward for succumbing to the drudge. He had lost count of how many of the enemy he had killed. He remembered the first one in this fight, her grotesque smiling in parody of her savagery. She had guard fatigues, stolen from some corpse, or else she was a traitor, though he didn't recognize the uniform. Daubed in blood and unnameable filth, he doubted it resembled what it had once represented. He had shot her in the face, the split mask revealing she was female. Such hellish fury in her bloody eyes and mouth. It had made a mess of her, that first lasbeam, cauterizing skin and burning flesh. 
Parts of her lips had fused, but still she raged. A shot spat from her weapon, a bullet that whipped by Darian's ear, a high-pitched insect buzz that seared the lobe. His second shot killed her, the last bolt finding her eye and bursting it in a welter of vitreous matter. It cored out her skull, flash frying the brain inside. He'd barely had the time to register her death before he had killed his second and his third, and on they went. It felt different to Lawton. That had been frantic, terrifying, but it had had a shape to it, a scheme he could understand. God Emperor, he would never forget the traitor Astartes, the smell and heat and presence of it. But this was another thing entirely. He had heard the term meat grinder many times in his tenure as a mill server around the camps. Only now, in the sucking morass of Myerland, did he fully understand what that meant. The tanks were advancing at pace, Colonel Ganser exhorting his machines to charge. Everyone was charging, all running towards the packed army, towards death, hearts afire with glory and adrenaline. Darian felt it spike in his chest, that urgent thunder of it running through his veins. It overcame the drudge, kept his legs moving, gave him strength he didn't know he possessed. Through gaps in the armored shield wall, he caught glimpses of the horde beyond. They occupied a raised defensive position, ranked up in firing lines and giving the Pardus hell. At the center, surrounded by the stoutest defenses and a cadre of heavy armored death brigade, stood a robed figure. He had a mix of flak armor and mesh chain veil beneath, his grotesque, a much more ornate version of the ones worn by his cohorts. Every scrap of bare muscular skin bore the evidence of scarification. This man was a Damagower, an officer of the Pact, and in this fight, their leader. He climbed the reinforced revetments as the tanks began to close, seemingly unperturbed by the massive ordnance, which unerringly bent around him or simply dissipated into iridescent powder. Darian squinted, sweat in his eyes, his vision retarded by the smearing on his goggles. It must have been the smear that tricked him into seeing that impossible shimmer distorting the air, that unearthly radiance that negated every shell, withered every blast. Not a field of any kind. Darian knew what those looked like and remembered the ozone reek after every activation. It wasn't that. A force field left a mark, a sort of temporary imprint on the air, something that could be gauged and understood. Physics. This put him in mind of an opening, a doorway into another place, an unplace, like a reflection against glass. It remade the shells and energy blasts, or unmade them, as if they didn't exist, or had never been deadly munitions at all. It only seemed to enrage Ganza, who drove ever harder as the gap between the Volponi infantry and the Pardus armor widened. He wanted to crush them, grind the enemy's bodies under his tracks. Tank shock had broken heavy formations. Darian had read about it. But those were men, or Craven Xenos. The Damagawa had something unfathomable at his disposal. He inhabited both the real and the unreal. And he wasn't alone. A coven of hunched, robed women clambered up after him, they were tall, despite their obvious disfigurement, their thin frames mummified in form-fitting leather. Each wore a grotesque, like the rest of the pacted, but theirs were narrower to match the angle of their faces. A sickle-shaped opening just below the nose revealed a slash of a mouth the color of intestines. His acolytes. The Damagawa raised his arms, hands reaching as if clutched around some imagery globe, the witches emulated him. Lieutenant Kulkis cried out just as the Damagawa brought his hands together. Blood vein! Darian didn't know what it meant, but he figured it must be bad. Red lightning sparked across the Damagawa's muscled body, and the witches died as one, collapsing like empty cloaks that had slipped their coat hooks. The air resonated like a pane of glass about to shatter. The tanks disintegrated, pushed together like a concertina. 
Metal folded like paper. Turrets collapsed. Tracks crumpled. Crewmen were reduced to mulch and ground bone. It took a few seconds for the explosion to hit, a long, drawn-out moment that lingered like an opera singer's top note, dramatic and terrible all at once. Everything slowed in that sliver of a moment. Colchis springing off his heels to try to shield the Major from the blast, Drake and Resk throwing their bodies to the ground, Hanmar falling to his knees as he began to pray. Darian moved, too, shrinking down instinctively, making himself small, turning his face from the firestorm. The infantry charge collapsed. The tanks were all but gone. A split second of silence followed, then a roar, so loud it deafened meaning. Then the earth fell away, plunging and shaking as a wave buffeted his body and cast him like a kite untethered into mist and shadows. Chapter 25 A shot whined over Hauptmann's shoulder as he plunged through the darkness. It struck someone behind him, a low grunt presaging the thud of a body hitting the ground. He gave a silent prayer of thanks to Lennox, the sniper's night sight watching them from somewhere ahead. He had little sense of direction. This place smothered it, but he ran anyway, the stab light on his weapon jerking spasmodically. One of the Slocans had died first. After that voice, the man had turned, heavy auto gun raised and about to strafe. His head disappeared. It simply broke apart, like a grenade had detonated inside his skull. Hauptmann still felt the flecks of matter and bone chips clinging to his uniform where they had stuck to him. Venator let off a burst, hot Laz streaking the darkness. He hit nothing, his beams raking metal and stone. More scorch marks to add to the rest. An impact to his chest spun him. He made an ungainly half-pirouette before Hauptmann saw the charred remains of his torso, like something had taken a bite out of him. As he collapsed, Hauptmann sounded the retreat. Puck needed little convincing, cracking off shots in indiscriminate panic with his shitty Laz carbine. The other Slocan tried to stand his ground, pride and a burning need for revenge fixing his feet. He got off two shots before the flames took him, and then he was just burning meat. Hauptmann caught a glimpse of them then, as the fire flared and faded, definitely packed, but of a different cast to the others. Good armor, better weapons, and something else— long-limbed and hunched, lurking behind the warriors. They ran, because what else could they do? Another shot clipped the metal deck plate, clanging madly with his frantic footfalls, and Hauptmann changed direction. Puck went with him. Zarek was gone, dead or alive, he didn't know. Then he saw the glint of a sniper sight, like a lighthouse beacon, and made for it. A slew of hard rounds pranged in front of him, forcing Hauptmann to turn again, but he had found his North Star now and rallied to it. They are trying to hurt us, he realized belatedly, as Puck got siphoned off in a different direction. Hauptmann called out to him but got no reply. He was on his own. Him and Lennox, cavaliers to the end, retreating to fight another day. Hauptmann was a pragmatist above all else. He'd take discretion over valor any saint's day. That glint again, and another sniper's bullet whipping fast and near. It put down another pursuer, the figure crumpling noisily to the deck. The ladder loomed ahead. Hauptmann could just see its edges and the narrow halo from the shaft. He ran harder, though every breath burned like a hot razor. Thrown, it felt like miles rather than yards. Another round coughed from Lennox's rifle, another kill. The lad had a knack and an iron nerve Hauptmann knew he personally lacked. Some men are made for killing. They're just naturally disposed to it. Others have it thrust upon them. The need to survive, forging something callous in them that enables the taking of another life. Hauptmann was the latter, but Lennox had a rare thing a soldier's cold instinct without loss of humanity. He fought for his emperor, as all good soldiers of the Imperium do. 
but he also fought for his wife back on Padua, for the sons and daughters he wanted to have, for hope and an end to war. Lennox was the kind of man who would put away his rifle when the fight was done and take up tools instead, create and not destroy. So young, so gifted, let him have peace, thought Hauptmann. God Emperor, let us escape this hole and let him have peace. So close, the ladder resolved fully as if proximity to it, to what he knew was real and true, bled away the unnatural darkness. He didn't see Lennox and assumed the lad had mounted the ladder and was on his way. Hauptmann made for the halo beneath it. Another few steps and he'd be there. A light flared, so sudden and bright he staggered. The ladder disappeared for a few seconds behind magnesium brightness. When he had recovered, Hauptmann slowed and stopped running. They had Zarek. He was on his knees, hands bound behind his back, gagged. Puck knelt beside him, afraid, frantic. Then Lennox. His eyes held an apology, but Hauptmann gave the slightest shake of his head. The lad had nothing to be sorry for. A packed warrior was tying his hands, as another appraised his rifle, weighing up the spoils. Three more stood behind him, one for each man. They wore heavy armor, blood-stained and daubed in sigils that hurt to look at for too long, like the rest of the pack did, but better made. An officer stood apart from the others, his scarred hand on the pommel of his sword. A row of spikes crested his helm, and his grotesque gleamed like polished silver. He rasped an order. Hauptmann didn't understand the guttural dialects of the sanguinary tribes, but he knew an ultimatum when he heard one. Surrendering to the pact was ill-advised. He had heard stories, seen the cruciform bodies lashed to iron octeds. They hadn't killed them yet, which meant they needed them for something. Hauptmann took no comfort from that, but alive at least they could still fight. It's not your fault, lad, he said to Lennox as he lowered his weapon. A rifle stock to the back of the knees put him down like all the rest. Rough hands yanked his arms back, Wire bit into his wrists as his bonds were tied. He wished Lennox had never come to this war, that he'd never left his young wife. Never the last ride, he said, just as his captor applied the gag. Lennox smiled that easy smile of his, like warm sun on a cold day. One of the pact had asked a question, the words a collision of hard consonants and cut vowels, the officer answered in low Gothic, so Hauptmann and the others could understand. We only need three, he said, and shot Lennox in the head. Chapter 26 The leg was severed. The old phantom pain remained, accented by fresh agony, as artificial sensors bonded to actual nerves fired off like flash flares in Regara's head. He glanced down, ears ringing, dimly aware he was lying on his back, surrounded by debris. A piece of shrapnel had missed him by inches. Heat still radiated from it. Others had been less fortunate. Fire crackled nearby, and the air was heavy with the smell of burning Prometheum. The realization of what had happened was beginning to dawn when Regara felt himself lifted up, his bionic dangled by a stubborn wire, sparks sputtering from the ruined biomechanical interfaces, and dragged after him like a dutiful hound on a leash. Cut it, he growled through clenched teeth, biting down against the pain. Colchis appeared in front, his uniform torn and a gash across his left arm. This will hurt, sir. It bloody well stings a bit right now. He sliced through the wire with his bayonet, one sure blow. Unable to stop himself, Regara cried out, but at least the pain had ebbed. Are you injured, Major? said Hanmar, the corpsman at his side, as he jabbed a morphia vial in Regara's shoulder. Just the leg. They got him behind a chunk of broken tank armor and stopped, 
Lazfire whipped past, forcing Dresk to duck as he tried to set up the heavy stubber. Taking advantage of their enemy's disorientation, the pact had started to advance, moving up through fields of destruction to finish off what the Damagower had started. Beyond the scant cover, it was carnage. Every tank in the Pavis vanguard had been neutralized, many outright destroyed. Regara heaved himself up onto one leg, taking a metal spur from Kulkis as a makeshift crutch. We have to rally our forces, restore order. How, Major? Regara turned to fix Kulkis with a glare like ice. Any way we can, Lieutenant. The Volponi assault teetered on the edge of disaster, split down the middle by the destruction of the Pardus, scattered and broken. A few units had already started falling back, the Imperial forces hemorrhaging men as well as blood. Others fought on, but it was hardly coordinated. They had fought through the ambush, taken out the tank killers, only to fail anyway. Snapping his fingers, irritated, Regara called for the Vox. Schiller! Captain Schiller, respond! There were a few seconds of static before Schiller came back. Major, this is Schiller. We are royally shafted here. Bits of Pardus everywhere. Weapons fire rattled in the background from both sides. We are holding, for now. He paused, then asked, What was it, Vasquez? Psycho weapon. Vaugus on the assignment. Now we know why his rating was redacted. Schiller swore colorfully. At least the explosion had sobered him up. He sounded composed, alert, and afraid. Reports were coming through as the Volponi tried to string together some kind of response. Flanking forces under Aramis and Barbastian are on the way, Regara told him. Have you managed to raise Colonel Grossman? Not yet. We need those reserves. He'll commit them when he's ready. For now it's just us and the flankers. We need to coalesce our forces, get them back up the middle again, hit when the flankers hit. What's your fighting strength? Another pause, as Schiller consulted an adjutant. I can scrape up four platoons. Regara had three. Give or take a few men here and there, it would have to suffice. A gulf of fiery wreckage stood between one half of the Volponi army and the other. Of the Pardus tanks, there was almost nothing left. A few crewmen had managed to escape the destruction, but most of them crawled or lurched a few uneven steps before collapsing. In the panic to escape almost certain death, Darian and a handful of Volponi troopers had become separated from the main force. He couldn't even see Kolkis or Agara. He heard the distant bellowing of Schiller some way behind him. That bastard. Darian saw the hatred in the captain every time he set eyes on him. The man's knuckles had not yet fully healed from the savage beatings he had dispensed. It didn't matter that Darian had royal blood coursing through his veins, that his father, a man he had never met, let alone knew beyond the propaganda reels, had acknowledged him out of some belated sense of guilt or reparation. To Schiller, he would always just be a lowly deg, unworthy of his respect. For hurting him the way Schiller had, Darian hated the man back. For hurting Lena, he wanted to kill him. God Emperor, Lena. He hoped she still lived. Retribution would have to wait. Schiller was busy mustering the platoons, trying to forge some kind of military strength to throw back at the enemy. They were moving, of course, the pact, seizing upon their sudden and devastating advantage. Darian looked to the twelve men around him. They had gathered behind a broken trunk, one tall and thick enough to hide them. An assortment from different squads. One of the men had a sergeant's rank pins and appeared to be in shock. Sergeant, Darian ventured, pulling a las carbine to him that wasn't his, but at least had some charge. Sergeant! A low fire exchange had already begun, but it was half hearted. The pact wanted to engage close quarters and gut the Imperials where they stood, scattered and afraid. The sergeant had a narrow face, blonde hair and green eyes. Name of Crozer. He was gasping for breath. 
a mask strung loose around his neck, cradling his sidearm in both hands. Sergeant Crozer, Darian crept towards him, careful to keep his head down. Sergeant, we need to... Crozer pushed the sidearm under his chin and fired. Several troopers recoiled in shock. Blood flecked the side of one's face. Darian took a moment to compose himself. Schiller was still way behind them, shouting orders. He glanced through a gap in the trunk, the tiniest aperture affording him a narrow view of the battlefield beyond. Ganza lived. Something was wrong with his legs, but he had raised himself upright on his elbow, ornate sword in the other hand, but without any leverage to really swing. Ahead of him were the Damagawa and his men, stalking their prey as the rest of the pack did, fanned out, hunting their own kills. Looking back, Darian quickly surveyed the troopers and found what he was after. Corporal, he said, I need that vox. The corporal returned his gaze, half his face washed with Sergeant Crozer's blood. He blinked, and the absence in his dark eyes fled, replaced by something else. You're Unsworth, he said. You fought at Loddon. A lot of us fought at Loddon, the Vox, Corporal. He handed it over, something like awe in his expression. And I'm a De Vere's, Darian corrected, taking a moment to familiarize himself with the boxy device. The son of Orator Donesk De Vere's. It felt strange to say it aloud, and even stranger to acknowledge the truth of it. Several of the troopers bowed their heads in recognition. Darin ignored them and focused on the Vox crackle as he got the thing working. Schiller barked at him immediately. Crows are wearing the shitting ass of Sebastian Thor, are you? Sir, Crozer is dead. This is Private De Vere's. How? Sir? How did he die, and how are you in charge, Deg? Darian bit back a response, reminding himself of the pressure Schiller must be under. Self-execution, sir. Schiller murmured something unflattering at the other end of the vox. Then louder, he added, Well, where's Corporal Ackner? Holding the vox. Then tell him to get his ass back to my position immediately. I need every man, Private. Even you. We're pushing back, regrouping with Major Regara. Sir, it's Ganza. Who? The Pardus Colonel, sir. Are there any of those poor bastards left? A handful, sir. He's here close by, sir. If I don't do something, he'll die. And such is bloody war. Tell Agner to get his ass back here and use sorry excuses for soldiers with him. You and I will discuss your conduct later. Darian knew what that meant, but he didn't let it distract him. Sir, it's the Damagawa, sir. I can see him. He's right in front. I don't give a gentle shit if he's Horus himself. Here, now, that's an order, Deg. The Vox cut off, leaving Darian to rage silently into cold static. What do we do? Akna didn't look ready to slog back to Schiller, only to have to return. He looked like he wanted something else, purpose. And just like that, because he had picked up the Vox, they were looking to Darian for leadership. He glanced through the knothole in the trunk, Ganza framed by its ragged edges, and the Damagawa looming over him like in some classically painted imperial tableau. As Darian watched... The Damagawa grunted to his men, who pressed on, leaving him alone with the colonel. He had a ritual knife in one hand, the blade savagely serrated. It was only when he clenched the metal talisman around his neck and looked up to the churning heavens that Darian realized what the Damagawa intended to do. Ganza was to be a sacrifice, one meant to attract the eye of the gods. There was only one god, or so Darian had been taught, he who dwelt on terror in eternal watchful slumber over the souls of all mankind. He had seen things, though, heard rumors as all soldiers do of other gods, older gods that the blood pact revered as fervently as the Imperium did the master of mankind. 
and though the commissars would execute him for admitting it aloud, Darian believed these gods had power. He remembered what he had seen when the shells and beams dissipated before they had struck the Damagawa and his cohort, like a film laid across what was real, offering a faint yet terrifying glimpse into an else world, a doorway, one that opened out rather than in. Ganza is a colonel in the Astra Militarum, said Darian, knowing what must be done. It is our duty to try to save him. A pale-faced trooper spoke up. With a dozen of us, how can we? The rest of the army is coming, Darian pointed sharply behind them. Then let them rescue the colonel. He was young, the trooper, a shadow of downy hair framing his chin. They won't reach him in time. You're not in charge, the youth went on. Our orders were to fall back and regroup. Why should we listen to you? Because it's our duty, soldier, said Akna, and I have rank here. Captain Schiller doesn't have boots on the ground here. We do. He exchanged a look with Darian and gave a slight nod of respect. De Vere's, you a vanguard? Lead us out. Darian saluted, a foreign feeling growing within. At once, corporal. He realized then, as the men formed up behind him, that it was pride. Her charge had faltered, having met unforeseen resistance, the pact galvanized after the humbling of the Pardas. She had given up on the Magister, having lost sight of him in the madness that followed whatever he had done to the tanks. Reserves had begun to move, but they were too far back to make a damn difference, and the rest of the tanks were trapped behind the burning mess of their vanguard and would not deploy. It was up to those on the field to wrest this back from the shit heap it had become. Aramis surveyed the ragged battle line through scopes, her myopic view unable to properly convey just how much trouble they were all in. One decisive blow had rendered the armor useless, split the core of the army in half, and hindered any immediate reinforcement. The flanks had been left dangerously exposed, a well-crafted pincer reduced to a scrappy, misaligned and failed assault. She saw men regrouping and reckoned on it being Regara's doing, but it was slow and the troops were badly scattered. As her gaze alighted on a figure estranged from the wrecked vanguard, she tightened focus. It was Ganza, crawling backwards, one hand on the hilt of his sword, the other clawing at the earth as he dragged his useless legs after him. The Damagawa followed, imperious, threatening. His robes caught in a breeze, flecked with ash and flaring chips of cinder, parting to reveal his military garb beneath. Chainmail armor, a pistol, blade in a leather sheath. She could only watch, her impotence a leaden weight in her gut. The pact had stepped up their aggression, and her platoons were being held. Several men were dead, caught in the open ground between both sides, some of them priests. The order to withdraw and hold cover had been bitterly given. It was that, or risk a total rout. A hand on her shoulder got her attention, but her eyes remained ahead. We're strung out, Captain, said Hennessy, roughly a hundred men in uncertain condition. And, Fink, the lieutenant is still with us, holding on the right. He reckons on forty left in his charge. Aramis swore. Have him ready his troops for assault. Ganza's out there, though it may already be too late. She lowered the scopes and looked askance at a kneeling priest. A large chain blade sat on a cloth in front of him. He prayed to it, the catechisms tripping over his murmuring lips like incantations, preparing his soul for the emperor. Can you feel that, Gavid? she asked, as soon as Hennessy had finished speaking over the vox with Fink. The air had changed, grown thicker and heavier, like in the moment before a storm. Clouds boiled overhead, tinted red in the strange twilight fallen across the battlefield. Hennessy didn't answer, but made the sign of the Aquila across his chest. Aramis had fought the Infernal before. She had seen what the witch kind could do on both sides. 
She thought of it as a well, a great and fathomless well, within which resided the power to bend and reshape what was known, to cheat natural law. She had no understanding of it and no desire to learn, but it was dangerous and could be drawn upon in different ways, ritualism, for instance. She didn't need scopes to see Ganza's fate, as the Damagawa bore down on him a toothed blade in his hand. Ganza screamed as the knife bit. The Damagawa straddled him, knees pinning the colonel's arms, his muscled frame hunched over like a feeding predator. He carved, slowly, intricately, murmuring an imprecation with every deliberate stroke. Smoke exuded from the wounds, just a trickle at first, but thickening with every second. Ganza writhed, almost beyond the capacity to give voice to his agony, the proud man reduced to a wailing shell. He screamed, and it was as if an echo overlaid the sound, a second deeper voice uttering alongside the first, only slightly out of sync. Fifty feet or so separated the dozen guardsmen from the Damagawa. They scurried at first, Darian moving quickly but cautiously as he tried not to draw attention. Halfway across the wreckage-strewn earth and the Damagawa's head jerked up, as if warned by some unearthly prescience. He was not alone. Three heavy-armoured pacted lurked just below and out of sight until the Volponi had broken cover. They reacted now, as the Damagawa called upon them, his voice a reverberant basso of guttural edges. The air between both sides grew hot, threaded with killing light. Darian felt it sear his cheek, bit back the pain, and pushed on. A last storm engulfed the Damagawa, but splashed ineffectually against some unseen barrier like rain hitting a pane of glass. The pack did killed ten of the twelve Volponi before Akna finished the last of the bastards with a frag grenade. He died a second later, shot through the eye by the Damagawa's sidearm. Only Darian remained, close enough to stab with his rifle's bayonet. The blade shattered on impact, turned aside by the Damagawa's wards. A knife slash nearly opened Darian's throat, and he fell back hard, his enemy so close he could smell the blood on the man's clothes, his armor, his every trapping. The cloying stench of warm iron suffused Darian's senses. Overwhelmed, he gagged and would have died to a ritual blade had Ganza not rammed his combat knife into the Damagawa's side. A trembling of air, a sudden, near imperceptible shimmer of a warding broken. Ganza died his neck slit so wide it yawned like a second mouth. Scrabbling, Darian found the hilt of the dead colonel's sword and swung it in the emperor's name. The blade hacked into the Damagawa's neck, an ugly cut lodged in bone. A muffled cry issued through the grotesque, resonant and metallic. Bracing a boot against the man's shoulder, Darian heaved the blade free and swung again. Red matter sprayed him, swathing the front of his uniform, his face, his hands. Still the head remained attached. He sawed it loose, releasing flints of bone, and at the third stroke took Vauga's head, and with it the Battle of Myerland. Chapter 27 Colchis stood amongst the dead, watching the priests dispense mercy to the wounded. An eerie quiet had descended over the battlefield, which not so many hours ago had rung to the sound of fire and fury. He found another lying nearby, face down in the murk, and rolled him over. Not him. Pain contorted the dead man's face, and made claws of his fingers still clenched in the throes of frozen agony. Please not like that, Colchis murmured. Sir? ventured Rake. Keep looking, Colchis replied, and on they went. Hanmar raised a hand to get everyone's attention. More over here! They had dispersed over a wide area, sifting through the blood-clogged dirt and ruddy channels for the dead. There were plenty of them, for the badly wounded a stretcher, and if not that, 
than the gentle peace of an ecclesiarch's silver athame. Summary execution, desultorily delivered, awaited the packed survivors, those that seemed worthy of capture. Most were not, and even those found ways to commit suicide before questioning. Vauga's death had broken them, and as the triumphant declaration of Volponi glory, Volponi glory clarioned around the field, the enemy had lost heart, falling into disarray and retreat. The berserkers fought on, too maddened to relent. Heavy weapons teams put them down like dogs. Colchis and the others had emerged from cover at the sounding of Schiller's war horn, and they had found a soldier on a ridge, a foreign officer's sword upraised in his hand and bellowing for victory. It appeared Darian had not strayed far from his father's noble roots. Though a bastard, the thickness of his blood and his courage was beyond doubt. It was quite the sight, Colchis had reflected at the time, the lad standing like that, his enemy dispatched at his feet, so armed, worthy of the propaganda reels. The charge that followed had been decisive and merciless. The reserves, though committed by then, had not been needed. It was a slaughter, and Myland was won. But at a cost. Ganza's body had been amongst the first removed, the last remnants of the Pavis forming an honor guard for their slain colonel. They wrapped a powder's flag over him to hide the horror of his wounds. One of the men took care to hold up Ganza's head. Rumor had it the neck had been all but severed. The wreckage of the Pardus tenth's desolation was still being cleared. So utter had the destruction been that it would take days. Another task for the diggers, thought Colchis. He followed to where Hanmar led them, the urbane corpsman at odds with this drudge and filth, but taking it in his stride nonetheless. He stopped at a clearing, a clutch of bodies there. A few floated on their backs like driftwood, the barest traces of putrefaction fattening their flesh with corpse gas. They were Orek, all of them, a cadre of scouts caught unawares by the red swathe. One had crawled, another man lay beside him, his face shot out and gaping like an excised pit. His would-be rescuer remained face down in the mud, and Colchis stalked over to him, possessed by a sudden and all-consuming desire to know this dead man's identity. Hand shaking, he turned him over, and his skin grew cold at the sight. Colchis sagged onto his haunches, then slipped to his knees as he met the face of Honoganu, a look of quiet repose upon his features. If not for the lack of breath and the grey pallor in his skin, one could almost believe him asleep. Who was he? asked Dresk, as he came in to stand beside his cousin. One of the Orek, said Hanmar. A sergeant, I think. A friend, Colchis corrected. Please, he said, rising to his feet. Help me carry him. The Volponi hesitated but a moment. Then, with somber dignity, bore Hanaganu from the fields of the dead to his final rest. Fenk roamed the battlefield alone, far enough away from the orbit of priests and the other mercy killers. He knelt, careful to keep his uniform dry of the brackish water in the shallow trench, and closed the dead private's eyes with two fingers as they glided across his face. He did so without looking, Instead, watching Colchis as the lieutenant and his men lifted a dark-skinned Orek from amongst the slain. He recognized him. Fenk had a good eye for faces, but didn't know the soldier's name. He watched as they carried the dead man from the field in solemn procession, struggling every now and then as a boot became stuck in the mire or Rake stumbled over his own feet. How reverent you are! Armand, he thought, all that guilt you carry as well as that cold body. Fenk's eyes scoured the field, ever vigilant, but there was no one nearby or even getting close. No one saw him, an invisible shade haunting the sundered forest. His gaze alighted on a group of Agrians watching Colchis and his troops, 
a dark look on the natives' faces. He knew these men too, though not their names. They had such unusual names, the Agrians, that felt strange on the tongue. They were Cossacks, and one spoke quietly to his neighbor as the others looked on, apparently at their labors. A great road had begun to take shape that would ferry what was left of the Pardas tanks across the Mireland and further south into Agria. Shouldering hammers and picks, one with an industrialized nail gun, they made a possible attempt to appear engaged in their work, but in truth they were hunting. Fenk recognized the look they had. He had seen it before, knew it intimately. A desire for murder. As Colchis and the others moved out of sight, the Agrians broke up as if at some unspoken pact and left for other parts of the field. Fenk watched them go, quite happy in his little trench with the dead. He glanced down at the private, and a glint of something caught his eye, partly smuggled beneath a lapel. A leaf-shaped pin from Akastat, if he wasn't mistaken. The lad hailed from the Volponi Veda, the southern greenbelt land responsible for the majority of its crops. Fenk took it, and as he was rising put the pin absent-mindedly into his pocket. The wind stirred, flecks of rain chilling the air, and Fenk pulled up his collar and canted down the visor of his cap. He couldn't leave, not yet. The grey host was calling, and he was powerless to do anything but answer. Chapter 28 Word had spread swiftly around the camp. Darian returned weary from the battle, wanting nothing more than to bathe, then sleep, if he could. Men stopped him as he walked. They wanted to shake his hand, clap him on the shoulder, as if he were an old comrade reunited, bask in his reflected glory. A crowd gathered on the way to his barrack tent, soldiers he didn't know, they smiled warmly, sharing jokes and anecdotes. Darian was struck dumb by their adulation. He smiled, too, echoing the men around him, laughing when they laughed, falling silent when they grew solemn. It was a dance to an unfamiliar tune. They are saying you slew Vauga with one blow. It came from behind him, as the first of the crowds were dispersing, a woman's voice. Did you? she asked pointedly. She was tall, broad-shouldered. Her silver helm was cradled in the crook of her arm, long red hair bound up in a tight bun behind her head. She was striking, and obviously formidable. Darian fought to bring forth his words, awkward and slightly cowed by this woman. I can scarcely remember, sir, said Darian. She smiled a satisfied smile, neither warm nor cold. Some are saying, you are brave for what you did. I agree. The Blue Bloods need brave men. And women, she smirked. And women. Darian glanced past her, at a clutch of soldiers standing at the periphery who had not partaken in the theater of histrionics. These men muttered under their breath and threw venomous looks. He knew what they called him, what they would always think of him. Schiller lurked amongst them, but didn't linger. Not everyone sees it as you do, sir. She followed his gaze in time to see the captain tromping off, ruddy-faced and doubtless in search of a drink. To them, I will only ever be a deg. His voice was bitter, his eyes narrowed and hard. I could slay Horus himself, and they'd still think that way. Prejudice is ingrained, and men of standing, justified or otherwise, do not like others encroaching on what they perceive as theirs. He knew then why her troops followed her. He would have followed her in that moment. She had presence, and a worldly wisdom Darian found reassuring, inspiring. They would rather I be in the ground, another pauper in a grave, like all the rest. I am a cheat to them. My father's influence the only reason I am in this uniform. She laughed wryly. 
And how do you think they ended up where they are? Their ranks, their stations? She began to walk away. I think I like you, De Vere's. You have your father's unassuming charm, but none of his learned arrogance. Hang on to that. Darian watched her depart. She was Ione Aramis, an officer of the 86th. He didn't know her heritage, but her bearing was noble. He hoped he could aspire to it. A few of the soldiers still called his name as he passed through the rest of the camp, and he raised a hand in acknowledgement or gave a swift salute in reply. Unease fomented within him. I am no hero, he thought. He had watched Ganza die, throat opened like a kit bag, red as a sunrise within. He had taken the man's sword and killed the Damagawa, hacked off Vauga's head in three messy blows. His skin still itched with sprayed blood. It was far from triumphant or heroic. It was ugly and desperate. He had been trying to save Ganza. Afterwards, he couldn't stop shivering, and Kulkis had lent him his cloak. It still draped around his shoulders like some greater hunter's mantle. Only Darian knew the lie of it. The lieutenant and the others had gone back into the fields of the dead, looking for slain comrades, or else to help the priests give the dying a merciful death. Others had gone too, though by the feral look in the eyes of the Talpa, Darian wondered if they would not be scavenging instead. For every moral act, war gave up a base one to counter it. Cooking smells, faint on the air, drew him, and he found one of the few mess tents. Dingy lamps lit the interior, the atmosphere close and subdued. An OREC mess sergeant stirred a large drum of meaty broth, and even the Volponi were eating it, though it was a far cry from filleted steak and sautéed greens. Darian noticed Grice, the burly sergeant, eating eagerly from a large bowl. His face was bruised, and sutures cross-hatched his skin, but he was otherwise hale. Grice beckoned him over, and Darian was about to join him when a table of Pardus tankers recognized him and rose to their feet. They began to clap, though their expressions remained solemn. Others in the mess tent took note, turning to regard Darian as a murmured hubbub gathered momentum around the room. One man cried out, For the hero of Loden and the saviour of Myerland, Volpone glory, they rejoined. Volpone glory! Feet stamped, mugs rapped on tables. Volpone glory! Even the Pardus shouted now. Darian hastily nodded his appreciation and left. He headed away from the heart of the camp, not stopping until he reached the baggage train. Much had already been unloaded, the tents and supplies, clean water, victuals. Darian watched the servants work, his old life feeling more distant than ever. They kept their eyes down and on their labors. He might not be officer class, but to them he was still a royal, and thus a man to be wary of. A girl struggled, carrying a heap of sheets and blankets, the fine material marking it out as destined for Volponi barracks. She stumbled, half blind, face hidden behind the towering linens, and Darian reached over to help her. Steady there, he said, before he saw her face, and his heart caught in his throat. I apologize, sir, she uttered profusely, eyes downcast. Please, I didn't mean to touch you. I'd get on my way. Be more careful in the... Lena, said Darian, his voice a half-whisper. It's me. The girl blinked, her expression blank. I'm sorry, sir. I don't think I know you. He took off his private's cap. It's Darian. The scales fell from her eyes, but her elation swiftly faded, and she looked away. What you must think of me? Darian took the sheets and blankets, setting them down on the storeroom floor. Think of you? I have done nothing else, Lena. He held her face gently, turned it to look at him so she could see his sincerity. 
Tears rolled unfettered down her face. God, Emperor Darian, she wept. I thought you were dead. His face darkened briefly. I almost was for a while, he smiled. I'm in the army now, Volponi 50th, she frowned. How? What happened? I don't... I tried to find you, but so much has changed. He licked his lips, choking back tears of his own. I have so much to tell you. But Lena shrank back, ashamed by her servile condition. You shouldn't talk to me, Darian. It won't go well for you. You're royal now, though I can't begin to fathom how. But know that no one is more pleased for you than I Lena, please. He went to reach for her, but she stepped back again, the shadows of the storeroom enfolding her. He was about to step again when an overseer shouted at her. You there, girl! A logistician in Munitorum Olive Drab bellowed at her from across the storeroom. He had a data slate crooked in one arm, taking inventory. Pick those up, he began, but paled when Darian intercepted him. Sir, I didn't realize you were there. Darian berated him, tearing strips off the logistician, who quailed before his anger, apologized profusely, and left for some other duty, whether he had one or not. When Darian turned to find Lena, she had already fled. Chapter 29 the med tent reeked of chlorine and counterseptic. Regara's leg had been removed, or what was left of it anyway, his flesh stump cleaned and dressed. It had taken a couple of days to get him to visit the medics, his desire to see the battle through and manage part of its aftermath greater than the need for pain relief. A tech priest lurked nearby, his mechadendrites shaped like a pair of calipers, he had just taken the Major's measurements and sent instruction via Binharic Lingua Technis for a replacement limb to be made according to specification. Such augmetics were rare amongst the common soldiery, but not to an officer, and certainly not to a Volponi. A thing of chrome and gilded beauty would be forged, calibrated and fitted in relatively short order. Regara merely had to wait. Through an open flap in the tent, he watched the Agrians tramp into the field again, tools slung over shoulders, materials dragged on iron sleds as they took up axe and hammer. More rain today, though it was light enough, but with the sky's darkened promise overhead. A road would be built, regardless of weather, the wreckage of tanks cleared, and what was left of the Pardus would be able to advance. It had taken three days so far, and Grossman seemed none too keen to linger. But he had little choice, as he needed to regroup and plan. The loss of the Pavis was a blow, no other way to regard it. They numbered a handful of war engines now, idling in a dwindled pack, waiting for the miles of flak board and steel plate to be laid and relayed. A second lieutenant called Bragger was in charge now, what with Ganza killed in action. They had burned him, as was their way. The shame of it, such decimation of their former strength. How they still held their heads up, Regara did not know. He glanced away, unwilling to share in their degradation, even vicariously, and alighted on the only other inhabitant of his med tent. You will get used to it, he said. A woman in vest and fatigues looked up at the sound of his voice as she bent and extended a fresh bionic in slow repetition. Gannica, isn't it? Regara went on. Ren Saint's aid. We met at the quarter back in Ankishburg. Yes, sir, Gannica answered, trying to make a salute with her arm but falling just short. She scowled. Regara smiled. It will get easier. I would give my body for the throne, she said, but I had not imagined doing so one piece at a time. That is how we serve in the Militarum. Didn't they teach you that at the Scholar Progenium? 
Gannica grimaced in what may have been an attempted smile, then gestured to his missing limb. Regara patted the stump. Nasadon, many years ago, when I was a younger man, still aches when it gets cold. Yours will too, probably. She regarded the bionic like it was a foreign entity. They said they'd calibrate it, the red priests. I dare say they'll murmur a few prayers, sprinkle it with unguents. Gannica cocked a brow. You sound disdainful, Major. Merely ignorant. The mysteries of the Omnissiah are profound and unfathomable to a man such as I. It is better to conceal one's knowledge than reveal one's ignorance. Barbastian strode across the camp, his half-cloak catching in the breeze like a banner. Or so I have heard it said by some imperial scholars— Tousled blonde hair trailed across his handsome face, and he swept it away with a velvet-gloved hand. He wore sparse armor, limited to a silver shoulder guard, and favored a fine gray waistcoat under his uniform jacket, though the former looked reinforced. He had a quiet confidence, did the lieutenant colonel. A cultured man, he knew much about victuals and wine, music and art. He had more martial talents, too, of course, swordsmanship, skill with pistol and rifle. The soldiers under his command followed him because they loved him. The equation was simple enough to fathom. Philip Barbastian had an air about him. He provoked hope. Deep down, most men in the guard just wanted to live, to survive the next battle. Barbastian instilled the belief in them that this feat was possible— he had sent men to their deaths. Regara had seen him do it. But they always went willingly, as if following the siren song. And which am I doing, Philip? Regara asked, and nodded to the man who accompanied him by way of greeting. Gannica sketched a quick salute, wisely using her flesh and blood arm. Ren Saint ordered her at ease. A little of both, I'd say the Lord Commissar answered for the Lieutenant Colonel. He wore his black long coat, a silver-headed walking cane in one hand. Regara noticed it at once. Having trouble, Lord Commissar? Caught some shrapnel during the incident. Hurts when I walk for too long. Incident? Ever politic, eh, Owen? I have a silver skull on my cap, for a reason, Vasquez. He gave a wry smile, but they all felt the bitterness of memory, of sifting through the aftermath of the grenade blast. It still defied meaning, as did the mindless babble of the man who had pulled the pin and unleashed death and blood. Perhaps they would never find out why. Regara praised them both, a motley pairing of Volponi Dandy and Avian Perfectus, I assume you're not here to school me on philosophy, gentlemen. Ren Saint gave a sharp but surreptitious glance to Gannica, who left the tent and went on her way. The red priest had long since departed into the shadowy depths, chirping in fits and squalls of harsh Benharic, and so the three men were alone. Regara gave a thin smile. Not a social call, then, Philip? Barbastian looked down at Regara's missing leg. I always did hate that thing, the metal, the wires. It wasn't you. The old leg is dust, just like Nasedon. He waited patiently for Philip to elaborate, while Ren Saint quietly kept his peace. You're off the line until the leg is replaced. The fiftieth will be under Major Aramis, until further notice— Regara paled. He thought he'd be taken off field duties, but assumed he'd still fulfill strategic and command. Major Aramis, the female officer from the 86th. Field promotion. She's the replacement for an officer called Pallard, said Ren Saint. Pallard has been dead for weeks. The Lord Commissar could only offer an aphorism. The wheels of imperial bureaucracy grind ever slow. Granted, 
But where then am I to take up a post? asked Regara, carefully bridling his anger. The auxiliaries, said Barbastian. I'm sorry, Vasquez, I tried to dissuade him. That's the bloody diggers, Grussman, that bastard. He shuffled to the edge of the bed where he was sitting and reached for the metal crutch leaning against the frame. Barbastian gave him a despairing look. Throne, Vasquez, don't be rash. Regara slid off the bed, picking up his jacket and slinging it over one arm, the other draped over the crutch. I am never rash, he replied coldly. Never, and proceeded to belt on his pistol and sabre. The blade rattled with sympathetic anger in its sheath as Regara jerked it around his waist. He jutted his chin at Rensaint. Is that why you're here, to stop me from shooting him? Are you? Am I what? About to shoot him. I actually came to offer moral support and see to my aid, but now you mention it. If he dies, he dies the Volpone way. Ren Saint stepped forwards, his expression serious. What does that mean, Major? Nothing, snapped Regara. I'm letting off steam. On Volponi, honorable men settle their differences with a duel. Ren Saint frowned, nonplussed. You'll duel the colonel? Of course not, it's a figure of speech. Barbastian crouched to help Regara with his boot, lacing and clasping it tightly around the major's ankle. It seldom comes to bloodshed, he explained pointedly, though his eyes were on Regara. Attempts are first made at reconciliation. It's rare for one man to kill another. You mean like I killed his damn uncle? That rare, Philip? Rensaint's eyes narrowed. There's history between you. It was over fifty years ago. I was a reckless boy, said Regara. And there's history between most royal Volponi households. My father settled the debt. Blood wage was averted. The silence held an unspoken question, which Barbastian answered as he finished up with Regara's boot. It literally means balanced by blood, a vendetta. If an accord cannot be reached, one man cuts another's cheek like this. He mimed it, his thumb standing in for the knife. Just a nick, nothing deeper, to signal the slight is not forgiven. A duel follows. Yours is a violent culture, observed Ren Saint. Barbastian made a face suggesting you have no idea before he got out of Regara's way. The Major limped purposefully from the med tent, bound for the camp interior. I promise I won't kill him, he said to Ren Saint, or you can shoot me yourself. Grossman was sitting at his desk when Regara entered the command structure. Major, the colonel began magnanimously, not looking up from his quill and papers. His brow furrowed as he reviewed a stack of reports, an auto-quill dancing lividly over a piece of parchment, consolidating all the pertinent information. What can I do for you? he added. I hope you're feeling recovered. You have revoked my command, Regara stated flatly. Grossman kept his eyes on his work. I have merely suspended it. There was a barely-touched bottle of Vresk on the table that looked like one of de Vere's private stock. Regara wondered what else Grossman had pilfered. As well as the desk, there were cabinets, a hololith table, and several wall-mounted maps and charts. No phonograph, no books. The colonel was all business in his elevated role. He had a private weapons rack, an armature for his uniform, but that was all. And the field promotion for Aramis? asked Regara. Overdue, she has excelled. I have no disagreement with that. Grossman at last looked up, setting the autoquill to dormant. Then what do you have disagreement with, Major? His eyeglasses perched at the end of an aquiline nose, his hooded gaze as green and dark as an ocean trench. I am being sidelined. 
It was bold, but Regara was angry. You are recovering from trauma. I accredit your current behavior to this factor also. They're my command, the 50th. Aramis is a capable officer. She is overstretched. It is what's best for the regiment. You'll return soon enough. And when will that be, might I ask, sir? As he had made his way through the temporary array of prefab billets, munition silos, and cook tents, Regara had learned the Magos had been dismissed. Without his expertise, the fabrication of a replacement bionic would take weeks instead of days. As soon as you're back on your feet, sorry, foot, Regara caught the curl at the edge of Grossman's mouth, felt his jaw clench. A situation which would be dramatically expedited by the presence of our Magos. Ah, said Grossman, glancing at the chrono in one corner of the desk. An undertaking that could not be avoided delays the Magos. The lesser tech priests will stand in, of course. Until then, you're with the auxiliaries. I sent Barbastian to relay the order. I assume he missed you. Regara could tell by the quirk of Grossman's lips that this was a lie. He took a breath, unclenched his fists. The crotch dug into his armpit. It ached all the way to his shoulder and chest. Grossman had no chairs other than the one he was sitting in. Visitors were expected to stand in his presence. Regara's voice grated. There's no honor in it. And you are half a man, Vasquez. It was the first time Grossman had raised his voice during the exchange, but he softened his tone quickly as if suddenly remembering his position and therefore what was expected of him. I cannot have a Volponi officer invalided as you are on the front line. A cripple cannot lead men. They will not follow you. He smoothed his moustache, licking his lips as he glanced at the bottle of Vresk. Service to the Militarum, and by extension the God-Emperor himself, is honor enough, he said, his voice placatory. But Regara could tell he was enjoying this. Or it should be. I understand your upset, Major, but I have to balance the needs of the army, not one officer. Regara wanted to say more, but it would be a pointless exercise. He'd done what he came here to do. Look Grossman in the eye and confirm what he thought was true. Anything else would be reckless and foolish. Of course, sir, he said between clenched teeth. I understand. My desire is to serve the Imperium. Grossman smiled, and there was something triumphal in the curve of his mouth and the narrowing of his eyes as he did it. Regara was careful to keep his hands firmly locked behind his back. The colonel glanced again at the chrono just as an adjutant appeared at the entrance to his chambers. Grossman shooed the corporal away, saying, Yes, I'm ready, then turned his gaze back on Regara. You might as well stay for this, Major. The door to the prefab command center lurched open, and several officers began to file in, Barbastian and Rensainter amongst them. Regara gave a curt nod, then looked away his knuckles white behind his back. The entirety of the Volponi Upper Echelon Command waited patiently. At length, Grossman came to stand in front of his desk, facing the semicircle of officers, a king in his own court. He gestured to his adjutant, who engaged the hololith table, revealing the militarum officers of the western and eastern fronts as flickering and grainy projections. It began prosaically enough with the reports from Colonel Stadish of the West Army Group. Vogner Stadish had replaced De Vere's when the Southern Front had been deemed of greatest strategic importance and the General's redeployment had followed. Stadish was a veteran with several campaign honors. He had the broad, well-nourished frame typical of Volponi stock and thick, dark eyebrows. Even without the hololith vox output, he was quietly spoken, hinting at some old injury that had ravaged his voice. Evidently, the man usually wore a vox amplifier, a grisly mechanicus augmetic that turned his face into a cybernetic horror, but the device wouldn't sync well with the hololith's audio. 
Raw scarification hinted at through the grainy resolution suggested he wore it painfully. Stadish spoke of a trying few months and little headway. Voke's missteps earlier in the war had left him with bare bones as far as fighting men were concerned. Compounded by further casualties to guerrilla attacks, the operations to disrupt packed supply and reinforcement had only been partially successful. Major Enghart of the East Army had a similar story, though he expressed doubts at how reliant the packed forces were on resupply, seeing fewer and fewer forces of significant military strength, and citing that most of their engagements had consisted of frustrating and costly skirmishes. A younger man with a haughty disposition and a carefully groomed moustache, he punctuated his words with bombastic vim and vitriol, trying to catch Grossman's eye so he would perceive in him something others evidently had not. Given the East Army was largely confined to chasing down stragglers, and overseeing the security of imperial-held assets. Then matters turned to the South Army, and here Barbastian took the stage. Our losses have been severe, he began grimly, not least of which the Pardus, the Pavis comprising the majority of our armoured strength in the region. He looked to Grossman, who stood like a statue, his face permanently stern. Despite the victory at Myerland, it is a blow, and a hard one to recover from, considering the road ahead. A few eyes went to Braga, the de facto leader of the Pardus remnants, and one of the few non volponi in the room. But the man kept his gaze just below the faces of the other officers, his expression pinched. Resistance is entrenched, light but well organized, Barbastian went on. I won't dress it up, General. Our resolve is at a low ebb. He flicked a glance at Rensaint at this remark, but the Lord Commissar gave nothing away as he listened pensively. Conventional wisdom would suggest we consolidate our gains and await reinforcement, offered Stadish, his voice ghostly through the box. Barbastian agreed and said as much to the General. There are reserves to the north and others on Nostis at large that could be called upon. Grossman shook his head, a gargoyle defying the apparent immobility of its own form. We broke them at Lawton and at Myerland. I won't countenance any further delays and waste this advantage. We must stay determined and end this war on our terms. Barbastian was quick to make amends. No one here disputes the military efficacy and commitment of our troops, Colonel, but those victories were costly, the loss of the Pardus alone. Grossman cut him off. I have spoken, no relenting. We push now, and we push them all the way to Carcass. That's it. If we let up, they will punish us for it. Aramis, freshly minted in her elevated role, spoke up. Gannad will be a much harder prospect, sir. Loddon was a battered and shell-blasted town, mile and a scrap of marsh, with a few hastily dug entrenchments. Gannard is a fortified position and will be well garrisoned. Are we to shirk every time we face stern resistance? asked Grossman, though he turned his mild ire on the room, not just Aramis. I won't deny the pact have given us the runaround, but to fight them man to man, our strength matched against their defenses? I would take that opportunity. To do otherwise would be to accept defeat before a shot is fired. No one here in this room is advocating that, General, Aramis rejoined. But as Lieutenant Colonel Barbastian asserted, she exchanged a quick glance with him, the morale of the men is low. They are fighting in dirt, dying in filth. War is dying in filth, Major, said Regara, the first thing he had uttered since the council had begun. He tried to keep his tone civil, but Aramis's askance look suggested he'd spoken with more bite than intended. In the end, Schiller rescued him. Not for the Volponi, it isn't he said, a palpable heat radiating from his ruddy cheeks, the air around him thick with the smell of cheap amasek. 
We're above all that. Perhaps it's time we weren't, Aramis replied. Meaning, asked Regara, meaning we've fed off our lessers long enough. I have no issue getting mud on my boots. Nor I, said Regara, engaging despite his better judgment. Have you issue with your heritage, Major Aramis? I once told a man I would not apologize for it, but now I am not so sure. Sympathy for the commoners is one thing, slurred Schiller, but surely you're not saying they're our equals? A few chuckles at this. Even Barbastian raised a wry smile. Braga of the Pardus said nothing. We inspire, said Regara, act as exemplars to our lessers. Grossman interjected content at first to let the discussion play out, but eager now to press on. All the more reason to tilt hard at Ganad, he said. Victories inspire confidence, even more so once the Volponi standard is flying over that damn stockade. We have lost ourselves in the mud and filth. We need a reminder of what Volponi glory means. That begins with the end of Ganad. He turned his attention back to Barbastian. What's our strategic position? According to Militarum Intelligence, there are several minor outposts en route to Ganad. These will have to be sacked and cleared before we can press on to Vigath's Moor, and then the bridge itself. Then we find a way, said Grossman flatly, temper just fraying at the edges, I do not care how. It must be done. I won't fail. We won't fail. We cannot. Our honor is at stake. What of God's sword? asked Schiller. Can that be brought to bear? It is a symbol and nothing more, Regara said bitterly. It doesn't have the range to reach Carcass. Barbastian nodded. Its purpose was to anchor Lawton and hammer the pact as far as Myerland, a purpose it never served. Do not concern yourselves with God's sword, said Grossman, a secret behind his eyes that he wasn't about to reveal. Tell me how we breach carcass. Barbastian went on. We believe the pact have withdrawn most of their forces to Ganad and the border wall at carcass. This will be heavily reinforced. We don't yet know why they have been pulling their troops back. Perhaps it relates to Scylla. But it's clear their plan is to bleed us slowly with feints and raids. If that continues, we will not be in a fit state to take Rakespeare. Which brings us back to reinforcements from the other fronts, said Stadish in a rasping vox crackle. Enghart looked about to contribute, having gauged his moment carefully, when the audio fizzled out and then the visual feed, much to the young officer's mute annoyance. The last sight of the major was Enghart ferociously berating his staff outside of projection range. Barely anyone noticed. If we wait, we only give the pact even more time to dig in and fortify their position. We have the ascendancy here. Grossman smacked a fist into his open palm for emphasis, warming to his role as orator. Let us take it and send these bastards back to the hells. It had all the verve of De Vere's, but not the flair or the common sense. Grossman suggested a hammer, bluntly wielded, when they needed a careful incision into a place of weakness. Rensaint cleared his throat, the pipe he had been smoking cupped in the bowl of his hand and lightly smoldering. A glass spear, however well-tempered and thrown, will always splinter when it strikes rock. What by the nine devils is that supposed to mean? said Grossman, becoming increasingly exasperated. Only that we hold the glass spear and the pact are the rock. But I agree that we cannot wait— Cessation of hostilities will set us back months, even years. Beltane and Thrake, it could all end up being for nothing. I am not a military strategist, though I have the training. 
I do not possess the experience here in this room, but I understand the hearts and minds of soldiers and what motivates them. He paused, a clever moment to ensure he had everyone's attention. We must turn our glass into steel, he said, his gaze touring the room. And as his regard reached Regara, the major caught a true measure of the man for the first time. Ren Saint's eyes caught the light and flashed with a vital luster. Now, let me tell you how. Chapter 30 It took a while before Colchis found the right barracks. Night had drawn in, after casualties had been tallied and individual squads dissolved and absorbed into larger bodies to make them militarily viable again. Recognizing the old shape of the regiment had been almost impossible. It had been days, and still he kept getting lost. This was it, though, the part of the camp devoted to the 86th and 50th Volponi, a soup of some four and a half thousand men scattered across prefab barrack houses and tents. The light in Fenk's lodgings remained doused. Kulkis had been watching it for the last several minutes, ostensibly warming his ungloved hands on an electro-brazier. It wasn't a lie. Ice in the air gave it a bitter chill, and he tugged his collar up a little higher. An added benefit was that it also hid his face from any passing troopers. No one bothered him. He kept his eyes low most of the time. After a sufficient duration had passed, Kulkis pulled on his gloves and walked across the camp grounds. Upon reaching the barrack house, he paused momentarily to listen and then entered. Darkness met him, and he cursed as he banged into a chair. Eyes adjusting to the gloom, he made out a sparsely furnished room, neatly arranged and everything in its place. He'd need to be careful and he worried briefly about the chair he had dislodged, but quickly dismissed it as paranoia. On the table there sat a simple shaving kit, the bowl and razor cleaned, the cloth graying with use but washed and folded. A metal mug stood next to a can of recaf, again washed and tidied to one side. Getting down onto his knees, Kulkis searched under the bed and found a standard-issue kit bag, Inside it were spare socks, a storm cloak, and spare uniform. A plastic case briefly aroused interest, until it turned out to be nothing more than a utensils kit. An ammunition belt and bandolier were slung over the chair back, but done so neatly, across the exact middle of the backrest. Empty, then. Kulkis stood, letting out an exasperated sigh. He sat on the bed, hoping a different perspective might yield something he had missed, and considered risking a little light from the sodium lamp on the table. Then he felt it, a creak of wood, certainly something yielding to his weight, not the frame, it was metal and sprung with wire. A thin mattress was upturned easily enough, but revealed nothing in its absence but the floor of the room, nothing under the blankets either, but Colchis had felt it, hadn't he? As he had sat down, the frame had shifted and... Leaving the mattress upturned and resting against the wall, he sank back into a crouch and proceeded to run his hand around the thick frame. He did it blind, his hand under the bed and searching by touch alone. When his fingers brushed against the wooden box, Colchis knew he had found what he was looking for. Carefully removing the tape that had been used to fix the box in place, he brought it slowly into the ambient light. Even in darkness he could see it was ornate, Volponi red oak like hardened vermilion. A simple brass clasp held the lid shut, also locked. It would have been so easy, his knife under the catch, a little pressure, but then Fink would know, and it might be nothing. He cursed, knowing there was nothing else to be done, and left quickly, only lingering long enough to put the room back in order. Everything was returned as he had found it, even the red oak box. Colchis only took his baseless suspicions with him. He had no proof, only a feeling, 
and one could not accuse a man, especially a fellow officer, on such a basis. He needed more. Colchis had been considering the means of accomplishing that, as he hurried back through camp when he noticed the Cossack in front of him. The lieutenant had taken a circuitous route in an attempt at maintaining his anonymity and had strayed into a part of the camp reserved for the magazine and munitorum stores. It was quiet, and at this hour seldom travelled. The boxy silos created narrow alleyways and cramped thoroughfares from one store to the next. Colchis was caught between them. He hadn't thought to bring a weapon. Even his knife was back at the barrack house, along with his sidearm. A glint of steel revealed the Cossack found himself better prepared. Colchis turned on his heel, too savvy to risk a confrontation in such close confines, and found a second Cossack behind him, similarly armed. He knew both men, of course, at least by sight, Osra's men, and they had come to kill him. Colchis backed up slowly, careful to keep both Cossacks in his eyeline. They advanced with deliberate menace, eager to draw this out, make him suffer, make him fear. After the wirewolves, Colchis had no fear left to give. These men didn't scare him but that didn't make their knives any less sharp, or his chances of survival much greater. I suppose it would not matter if I told you I had nothing to do with your hetman's death. Condemned men will say anything to save themselves. As emphatic a reply as any, Colchis murmured under his breath, tensing for a fight. He edged closer to the first Cossack, hoping to goad him on. The lunge was fast, the blade skidding across the lieutenant's midriff as he sidestepped, tearing his uniform and drawing a thin red line in its wake. Kulkis winced at the sudden pain, but trapped the Cossack's arm and smacked his forearm hard against the man's wrist. Disarming him, the blade clattered on the ground. His ally was already coming, though, having seen through the lieutenant's ruse a little too late, but not so late he couldn't slash at him when Kulkis was off balance. Deeper this time, the cut raking his chest and eliciting a sharp cry. The second slash carved left to right, forcing Colchis to flinch back or be gutted. A well-placed kick to the armed Cossack's leg sent him howling, the kneecap shattered. Thick arms wrapped around the lieutenant's shoulders, and the air was punched from his lungs as the first Cossack tried to crush him. No, not crush him, hold him. The other Cossack might be lame, but he still had a knife. Blood rhymed the jagged edge, his blood. Kulkis pushed back, staggering the man holding him, but couldn't get loose. He kicked out at the aggressor in front instead, and the knife man reeled, his nose bloody. It won't buy you peace, Kulkis raged. This is murder, unlawful killing, you'll be hung, neither Cossack answered. They didn't care about the rope. It was in their eyes, Kulkis saw it, the desire for a dress. One of ours for one of theirs. The arithmetic of revenge was banally simple. Kulkis struggled to die like this in some backwater place. He searched for a light, for anything, but refrained from shouting out. I will have my dignity, he said to himself, and thought of all the things left undone, of every regret. Then he saw the knife again. A flash presaged the Cossack, dropping the weapon in a hiss of pain and pulling his wounded hand against his body. The stench of seared flesh filled the air, the rapid burn and cauterization of a las gun, the telltale shriek already fading. Nice evening for a walk. Fink appeared from the end of the camp that led to the former battlefield of Myerland. He aimed a las pistol. His long, tapered fingers hung loosely around the stock and trigger. A gentle coil of smoke unfurled from the barrel mouth. He held it outstretched like a duelist, almost lazily, as if he knew he could kill these men as easily as breathing. Colchis tried to breathe, too, but a darkness lived in Fenk's eyes, an abyssal black reserved for deep-ocean predators on the hunt. He could not determine if he were now in lesser or greater peril. The Cossacks apparently felt the same trepidation. 
The one with the burnt hand didn't move. The other, who had his back to Fenk, tried to turn and lessened his grip. I thought I was the only one abroad tonight. He said this to Colchis before his gaze fell upon the others. No moons, no stars, he continued, just the endless void above us. Fig off, uttered the Cossack with the injured hand, belligerent despite the gun in his face. No business of yours here. I have a fondness for knives, Fenk went on, as if the other man hadn't spoken. Yours looks sharp, that serrated edge. He sucked in an excited breath. I bet it really tears, doesn't it? Pears skin, flesh from bone, a filleting blade. I wish I had a knife like that. Something like avarice flashed in his cold eyes. All the while he kept the weapon trained. The effort of holding it must have been straining his arm, but Fenk showed no sign of discomfort. See this? The Cossacks exchanged an incredulous look. M.G. variant Laz pistol forged on Akatran. It's a heavy sidearm. High energy expenditure. Very powerful, but no recoil. That shriek when the coils charge and release. The scent as it burns skin. I mean, you know, he said, nodding and smiling, goading the wounded Cossack to agree. Then in a more sinister tone added, don't you? He reasserted his grip on the stock, grew still. At this range, a Laz pistol will flash fry the contents of a man's skull instantly. Have you ever smelled cooked brains? It's quite something. Rancid, of course, but something. The first Cossack released Colchis, a nod to his partner, and the two men backed away. Keep knife said the one with the shattered kneecap, his friend helping him to limp away. See for yourself how it tears. I think I might, Fenk murmured. As the Cossacks fled into the camp, he lowered and holstered his pistol. Did you find what you were looking for? he asked. Kulkis felt his heart lurch, acutely aware of the hurts to his body and not relishing the thought of taking on Fenk right now. He could have lied, said he was performing a patrol or getting some air. Not yet, Fenk smiled, an adder's mouth curling at the edges. It didn't reach his eyes, which remained predatorily cold as he stooped and retrieved the knife. That's a pity, he said, rising again. I don't think those men like you too much. They think I murdered someone. Oh? They have the wrong man, Fenk frowned. Is that so? They didn't appear to care overly. Fortunate I came along. And where were you, Lieutenant? Kolkis asked, looking past Fenk's shoulder to the darkness at the edge of camp and the old battlefield beyond. Fenk's smile returned, broader than before, but with less mirth. I've always liked you, Armand, he said, easing by the other lieutenant without a second glance. Always, he uttered, voice swept off by the shadows and the night, leaving Kulkis with his wounds and his life. Darian had eaten alone that night, uncomfortable with the attention in the mess hall. He didn't feel like a hero, far from it, he had managed to scrounge up a little grub from a clutch of Agrian natives, who seemed uninterested or indifferent to his name and ancestry. The anonymity was comforting. He wandered now, a full stomach still something of a novelty, roaming the camp. <laughs>
के संगे अभी है मिल तो बाबा तुरा दिन में 
Darian regarded the weapon clutched in a dead hand, and the blank-eyed officer with half his face missing. The gun remained, but he could not. He hefted the belt of canteens across his shoulder and trudged on. It had been a decent trek back to town, and from there a return to the trench, its long and winding course like an arterial vein, poised to be severed. Darian passed the burnt-out shells of tanks in the mustard camo of the Pardus Armoured, slumped like lonely metal bunkers, distant islands in the fog, eerily still and inert. A ministorum priest murmured solemn words over a row of quiet men lying on their backs, seemingly unconcerned with what was coming. A band of tunnel rats in dirty ochre fatigues and bucket-shaped helmets ran the other way. They were grinning. Darian looked back despairingly as he watched them disappear into the fog. He hastily made the sign of the Aquila to the priest to show that he was pious and hurried on. As he worked his way deeper into the trench network, he passed other men, some in the rugged drab of the diggers, others in plainer uniforms wearing the caduceae of medics. A second platoon in ragged forest green came his way, stern-faced and swarthy. Darian didn't recognize the regiment as they trailed past, headed towards the sounds of a distant skirmish. There were so many auxiliaries, reduced to bits and pieces in an ill-fitting puzzle. He saw spotters and riflemen, a few crews served heavy stubbers and missile tubes, a voxman tinkering with a boxy comms unit, but eliciting only static. As the bombardment persisted and the guns answered, most of the troopers with more mediocre weapons hunkered down and waited. Few paid Darian any heed. As a mill serve, he was largely beneath their notice, a servant and a non-combatant. Most didn't understand his purpose, but no one reached for his canteens. They all knew not to do that. 
His cargo wasn't for them. Even the burly diggers, fearsome and headstrong as they were, knew the pecking order. And the blue blood sat at the top, the bastard royal Volponi. They didn't stir as Darian entered the Volponi part of the trench. Not the sentries who had been posted there should the enemy get this far into the trench, nor the ranks who kept their hooded eyes forwards, waiting for something to materialize out of the fog. Standing in line, their finely made las locks gleaming, their grey uniforms pressed and nigh pristine, their fine armour and iconography shining. What proud popinjays they were! But rigidly focused, no casual chatter here, or fatalistic camaraderie. Darian kept his eyes down nonetheless. The trench opened out, chambers breaking up the labyrinthine monotony, the edges reinforced with additional steel revetments and flakboard. It delineated the entire southern edge of Lawton, the fortified town they had occupied for the last six months. Several firing holes had been cored out, tripod-mounted heavy bolters sitting snugly within, all praxis pattern, well made. Three more gunnery nests were in process. Diggers hacked at them with shovels and picks, dark sweat patches under their armpits like old bloodstains. The Volponi watched but did not participate. Menial work was not for the Blue Bloods. Though a few of the sergeants congratulated the diggers on the quality of their labour and had stronger drink brought down the line to them. A phonograph was playing, the sound tinny and the needle scratching. The rousing strains of Volponi on to glory led Darian to the officer's bunker where some of his lords had amassed. An ornate electro sconce hung over the room swaying as motes of dirt spiraled from the ceiling like dying moths. The light flickered, illuminating a map table, three chairs and several charts affixed to the wall. A sweaty-faced adjutant was pulling files from a cabinet and stuffing them hastily into a large pack. Another mill serve stood nearby, ready to receive it. Lena. She gave Darian a quick smile, and he felt warmer despite the chill air, returning the smile when he thought the officers weren't looking. The officers stood together. There were three of them surrounding a vox, listening intently to a scratchy broadcast. A cadre of silent adjutants attended them. All had grim faces. It's done then uttered one as the broadcast concluded, leaning across the map table to switch off the vox. We're giving up the town. We've lost the guns. Fair-haired like many amongst the Volponi, with a sharp nose and clear grey eyes, he was the youngest of the three and the least scarred, a lieutenant called Armand Kalkis. He had a strong bloodline and a good family history, fourth-generation blue blood. His family were amongst the middling nobles of the Volponi aristocracy, hence his officer's rank. Darian knew the history of all of the officers in the 50th. Not an insignificant number, but it was wise for a vassal to know his kings and which of them he should be wary of. Shitting hells, Schiller growled and started pacing, I need a damn drink. A slab of a man, Isaac Schiller had the hooded eyes common to the Volponi aristocracy, with shoulders like the bulwarks of a fortress, and a red beard that framed a portcullis of a mouth. Schiller was sixth generation, a captain, and from a long line of high-ranking military men. He had lofty aspirations, but bad habits. As he paced, Schiller looked up and caught sight of Darian. His expression changed from disconsolation to annoyance. Ah, you're here at last, just in time for our disgrace. Schiller glared, 
taking in Darian's disheveled appearance. And look at the state of you, a bloody shambles. I should have you reprimanded. Darian murmured apologies into his dirt-caked boots as he gave a canteen to the red-haired officer. Schiller took a swig, swallowed, and then scowled. What's this piss? he snapped, and tossed the canteen back at Darian, who caught it. This only irritated Schiller all the more. Give me spice wine, you useless dig! In the background, Lena looked afraid. She had been on the receiving end of Schiller's temper before. Darian raised his hand surreptitiously to signal it was all right. A bomb hit close, shivering the walls, and sent a decanter crashing. Glass shattered. Schiller swore. He was still writing himself when Darian offered the wine. Fegging dig, Schiller spat, his gaze like a lance thrust. Kulkis interjected, Is that strictly necessary, Captain? Turning his ire on the lieutenant, Schiller looked about ready to unleash another barrage when the third officer, Major Regara, took an interest. He had been reviewing the map table intently, lost in thought, stoically bracing himself against its sides when the room shook. Decorum, Captain Schiller, he warned, and glanced at the canteen, and also a modicum of restraint. If that explosion and the snap fire I can hear not so far away is any indication, our withdrawal is imminent. I need you sober. I'll have good order when we leave. Schiller called immediately, his respect for the Major ingrained. Some of the color returned to Lena's cheeks. Of course, sir. Where Schiller was thick, Regara was trim and sharp as a knife edge, with graying hair that made him look distinguished rather than old. He also wore fine armor and carried an artisan saber, his left leg was a chrome-plated bionic. Darian didn't know how Regara had lost it, possibly the same war that gave him the scar across his face. Vasquez Regara was thirteenth generation and could trace his lineage back to the Makarian Crusade, upper-tier nobility. And give that man a drink, will you? He snapped, turning his attention back to the map table. He looks like he's run ten miles. Darian blinked. Well, go on then, urged Schiller, when Darian didn't immediately partake. Take a pull of the water, mind you. Can't have the degs rolling around drunk now, can we? The word deg meant degraded, and was a slur some of the officer class used to describe the mill serves. It was frowned upon, but had yet to be stamped out. Darian declined with good grace, though he was parched as a dry desert wadi. Suit yourself, said Schiller with an irked glare, and drained the wine, supping it like milk from his mother's teat. Kulkis stepped into Regara's eyeline. Sir, what is our course of action here? Regara took a calming breath, a vein pulsed in his neck. We have no choice. This position has become untenable. We'll reoccupy the town, said Schiller, the blue blood in him reluctant to accept defeat. They're in the bloody town, Captain, all over it. We have to withdraw from Loddon entirely and retreat, as per Voke's order to mark a nine. That's Ankishberg, sir, Kalkis interjected. I know where it bloody well is, Lieutenant. Marker nine, he repeated. Platoons to fall back along the town outskirts. Keep them in staggered formation and do it by degrees. He muttered an expletive, stretched across the length of the damn map. And have the Agrians mind the trenches. I want the damned Arcanate writhing in blood and earth when they retake it. And the guns, sir? Can they be spiked? Do we have time for that? The Magos reports that we can wreck the turning mechanism and limit their function, but that's all. Regara swore under his breath again, then said, 
Have the Martian do it. We don't really have authority to destroy them anyway, or the time to seek approval. I want us long gone before the Pact get them facing in our direction. Schiller, you've got Lance and Shield Company, the Second and Third Auxiliaries, and the Pavis. Have the tanks maintain a barrage for the rank and file to retreat under. Put some heavy metal on the east flank. It might slow the collapse and give us more time. And get the bloody platoons back together for throne's sake. Schiller gave an ugly smile. I'll have them pounded to the hells and back. See that you do, Captain. Regara stood up straight from the map table. They were spread out, too far. Voke had tried to match the Arcanate line to engage on every front. It had left them vulnerable and the town at risk. The entire Ankish line. Regara shook his head. It won't stand he said bitterly. It won't bloody stand. Then he walked over to Darian, took a canteen of spice wine, and drained it. The leg ached. Despite the fact it hadn't been there for years, it ached. Old memories returned of Nasidon and everything Regara had lost there. Some pains didn't go away, not really. Are you all right, sir? asked Colchis. The Major waved off his lieutenant's concern, though he knew he must look grim. His eyes drifted to the sky, and the silhouette of the Arvus lighter slowly disappearing as it spirited away General Voke and his command staff. Regara had declined a seat, preferring to see out the retreat on foot with his regiment. Besides, Major Pallard was dead and an officer of rank was needed to coordinate the withdrawal of the other Volponi companies and the auxiliaries. It had seemed a noble gesture at the time. Now, with his leg hurting like a bastard, he couldn't see past the folly of it. They were half a mile from the extraction zone, lodden well behind them, and trudging through sodden earth and persistent rain. It was sparse terrain, a few farms and outhouses the only structures. Chimera transports trundled past, fighting through the mud, and flanked by teams of Agrian 22nd sappers, in case they needed rescuing. Regara watched the armoured carriers with undisguised longing. He had also refused the offer of a ground transport when Colchis had managed to scrounge it up, leaving it solely for the ferrying of the dead and injured. Even then... The armoured carriers weren't enough, and trains of stretcher-bearers trailed through the ever-worsening conditions. The entire regiment was strung out, weary and defeated. They kept good order, even the auxiliaries, though most had been reduced to scraps. Damned leg, he admitted, scowling at the state of his boots as he lumped through the mire. Martian-forged, chrome-plated, but 